Hello Dampers and welcome back to another Slice of Life podcast. Yeah. YouTube, while I was literally in the middle of uploading the previous Slice of Life podcast, uh, added a, f- a podcast's feature to the website. And so they are now linked in the podcast section of my channel, which is, I suppose, notable. Other interesting things include the fact that that 12-hour podcast took three attempts to upload, and those attempts are very long given how long it takes to upload and process a 12-hour podcast. That is like multiple hours per attempt. The first time, I cut the video down so that it was exactly 12 hours, which actually slightly cuts off the end of my sentence, as you can hear in the like final upload. I cut the video down so it was exactly 12 hours. What I didn't realize is once you upload that to YouTube, YouTube doesn't tell you this until it's done uploading, which takes about an hour with my upload speed, and then done doing the processing to SD fix, uh portion of of its its whole process then it says video is too damn long and forces you to delete it so that's a little annoying um so then i had to cut it down so it was on uh i i tried to cut it so it was on the last frame of eleven fifty nine fifty nine, and that shows up as being exactly 12 hours on youtube youtube adds one second to the video for some uh reason. I don't really understand it. Uh, but I cut it down so it was exactly 11.59.59 on the exact frame, uh, and then tried to upload it. And then uh, YouTube, it went fine, but then during the processing stage, it there's a bug on YouTube sometimes where videos will just like be processing for forever. And it, it got, you know, I, I could click on the video for my channel, and it said the video is processing up to HD thing is the video like it's so it wouldn't publish it. it wouldn't let you publish it uh even though i could watch the video on my channel and the video isn't in hd <laughs> it's not rendered in hd so it doesn't need to get processed up to hd but i could watch the video on my channel but it wouldn't let me publish it because it said it was still processing so i had to delete that and then re-upload it a third time and this time I got lucky and it worked. So that was a pain in the ass. The second thing is, do you remember the end of the last podcast? The last thing I talked about was uh, how amazing it was that I could make my own Mexican food at home instead of going to uh, a delivery app and ordering it. Well, <laughs> uh, update on that situation, that went fucking horribly wrong. I'm not going to tell you the details, because I, I don't even know what I was thinking. Putting this thing, I don't even know exactly what happened, but whatever I constructed was genuinely disgusting, and I couldn't eat it, because it was that bad. <laughs> uh, maybe I should like look up a recipe or something next time, instead of just buying a bunch of vaguely Mexican ingredients and shoving them together in a, in a wrap and assuming that that's going to work. It was absolutely fucking disgusting, and I couldn't eat. It made me feel sick. I was taking poison damage. I was taking bites, and then I was sitting here like, ooh, 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 ooh. You know, taking poison damage like it's Minecraft. I had to fucking... I didn't finish it. I had to throw it away. I, I hate throwing away food, but it, it was literally that bad. Uh, so, <laughs> maybe my whole rant about how like terrible it is to pay for a restaurant to do this for you is maybe slightly more re- reasonable than I thought, but... The thing about Mexican food, and like especially, I mean, in some kind of circumstances, I think it's 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 more reasonable. Uh, but stuff like burritos specifically, which is my favorite uh, Mexican food, it's not really practical to make at home if you're one person because it just has so many different ingredients that each need to be prepared separately in different ways. That I feel like it only makes sense if you're making it in bulk for like a, a larger group of people, because it's not the sort of thing that stores for a long time. You know, you you can't. I mean, you I guess you can store most of the individual ingredients, but that's not really what I, you know what I mean, right? You can't, 
it, it doesn't really make sense to to be like I'm gonna make a burrito and then you have to make what like guac, uh, rice as uh, some sort of uh, you know, uh, carne asada or something like that, uh, some sort of sauce, right? Uh, at the wait, was I say carne asada? What the fuck's the thing called? I don't remember. You you guys know what I'm talking. Like some sort of sauce, some rice, beans. You have to cook the beans separately, and you have to cook the the meat separately. Right? Like it's kind of a, annoying. It's a bunch of different ingredients that all need to be prepared individually. Vegetables separately. You know, it's not like totally impractical. Like it is doable, but it's just quite an intense thing. Uh, so you know, maybe if you you're making Mexican food at home, you should just stick to like simpler stuff like enchiladas uh but i don't know i want to talk about london transport for a second very niche subject to start this video off on but one of my favorites um and in particular i want to talk about the environmental aspects uh of of london transport it's a quite complex issue there's a push there's been a push since the 2000s roughly uh, maybe even the late 90s, to uh, make the uh, London's transport network uh, be lower emission, lower the emissions of London's transport network, which basically is just make the buses things other than standard, you know, petrol engines. Um, and they've done a pretty decent job of it. Uh, about half of uh, London's buses are either fully electric, hybrid electric, or hydrogen powered. Um, only a small number are hydrogen powered. Now, hydrogen buses are cool in concept as like a technology, right? Like hydrogen powered stuff is, is cool. Uh, and they seem to be, you know, they're pushing it still. They're, they seem to be expanding the number of, because they've created these double-decker hydrogen buses that used to just be single-decker ones. Uh, now there's some double decker ones, and I think they're trying to expand how many are being converted, like how many double decker routes are being switched to hydrogen, which it's cool, right? Hydrogen fu fuel is like a cool technology. Uh, however, uh, my my contention with it is that um, the more hydrogen powered vehicles there are in the capital, the more that requires the building of a a whole new supply chain to sustain them. And that supply chain itself is most likely not going to be, you know, electrified or, or uh, low emission. So in reality, you're just sort of offsetting the emissions outside of the capital to, to other parts of the country, transporting hydrogen into London. So I, to me, it's questionable how effective this actually is at reducing emissions on a national scale rather than just on a local scale like it, it kind of feels like it's just offsetting this stuff because building out these new supply chains is going to emit a whole bunch of uh co2 anyway uh so but you know there's also definitely an argument to be made if you're not talking about necessarily the global warming consequences but just general air quality that maybe it's a good thing to spread you know maybe it's still a, an admirable goal or a reasonable goal to try and spread the emissions more evenly across the country given that London's air quality is you know not the best in the world and maybe it maybe it is fine if it's just offsetting it to somewhere else because getting as much of that those emissions outside of London is good for the air, air quality so that I think that's a you can make arguments both ways for this and again they are a cool technology uh, but, you know, in reality, I think electric buses are probably uh, uh, better in the long run because the electricity infrastructure already exists. You don't have to build it, so it just is kind of easier. And generally, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, electric vehicle manufacturing is a, is a lot more of a uh, well-researched industry with a lot more robust supply chains and so on than, uh, hydrogen powered vehicles so uh yeah but you know when talking about this there's one big aspect that i think is is going to get left out and that's the fact that like the real problem 
if you're getting more people on public, like, the real problem with emissions isn't necessarily, not that it's a bad thing, but isn't necessarily how energy efficient or polluting the buses are. The real problem is trying to get as many people to stop using cars as possible, because no matter how, even if the technology powering buses is exactly the same engines as powering cars, they're still going to be way better for the environment simply because they transport more people. And then on top of that, trains are still going to be even better than buses because they transport more people, right? Like, uh, and so the real problem here is, in my opinion, uh, well, it's a few different things. Firstly, it's the lack of uh, really good cycling infrastructure in the city. There needs to be a, uh, you know, Boris tried to do this and ran out of funding halfway through ages ago, and it ended up being an absolute disaster with his idea for these, or I don't know if it was his idea, but these cycle superhighways, which ended up, you know, some of the early ones are proper, you know, what what all the YouTubers who talk about city infrastructure and cycling and stuff will tell you, like proper bike lanes that are separated from traffic, sometimes include shortcuts, you know, that the cars aren't allowed onto. They have their own traffic lights. You know, some of them are really good like this. And then as the project went on and they started to run out of money, eventually they just became strips of blue paint on the highway right next to cars going through dangerous intersections. There's a famous example of a particular intersection which, uh, you know, previously had very few cycling deaths. They painted one of these big blue cycle superhighways on it Suddenly, it became a fucking nightmare where cyclists were getting hit by cars all the time and dying because the 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 image of the cycle path gave people a false sense of security that it was safe to cycle there and that then uh, in reality it was a dangerous, busy intersection and I believe the cycle path was eventually removed. But obviously cycling is the lowest emission form of transport, uh, so if you can get more people cycling... That's going to be good for everyone. It's also good for public health. Cycling is basically the optimal thing. I don't cycle in London because it's just too dangerous. If I lived, if, if it, like, I would be so happy to cycle everywhere if uh, there was just really good infrastructure that I felt like I could rely on and not, I wasn't in danger of getting hit by a car. You know, cycling in the city is just too dangerous. That, so I think that's that's like a big priority that should be focused on is um, trying to get the cycle infrastructure up to snuff with some other parts of Europe. That would definitely be a big improvement. And it's not like people don't cycle, you know, that even though the infrastructure fucking sucks, you see cyclists everywhere. You know, a lot of train stations have big or like relatively big, uh, you know, like cycle parking, bike parking sections. And they're always completely at capacity. I've never seen any of these with like space in them. That so clearly a lot of people are cycling all the time. You know, just you can see it. Uh, but it, it, you know, that those numbers can always be pumped up, and that's always going to be a good thing to invest in. It's also relatively cheap compared to like building a building out the Elizabeth Line, for example. Which is great, don't get me wrong. I have some problems with the Elizabeth Line, but I think, you know, generally speaking, the Elizabeth Line is amazing. Um, let me check how much that cost. Uh, Elizabeth Line cost. Uh, to build, not to ride. 25 billion. I think if you pump 25 billion into cycle infrastructure, you could do that shit properly. Especially if you, like, maybe outsource some stuff to, like, uh, European companies that have experience, maybe hire someone who helped in, out in Germany or the Netherlands or Oslo. You know, I feel like it's very doable. Uh, so that's, like, the first thing that I think needs to be a priority over everything else is cycling infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the second thing is... Uh, like, one of the reasons why cycling is so important is that it's free. Like, once you buy a bike, it costs no money to cycle, right? Uh, and that's very important because the number one th reason why people don't take the tube is because poor people take the bus because it's cheaper. Uh, the tube would be the... I mean, it's objectively the superior mode of transportation. Buses are slower, louder, stinkier, 
and uh, that they, they suck, but they're also cheaper. Whereas trains are the tube is relatively exp- well, I say relatively expensive. The tube is very expensive. It's the most expensive. You know, we have the most expensive trains in Europe. Uh, it's absolutely shameful. So getting those costs down to ride the tube would be, you know, uh, uh, also a really massive step in the right direction. Not just in terms of improving people's daily commutes and life experience, but also in terms of what's best for reducing emissions. Because, as I said before, trains are more efficient than buses. They carry more people, therefore they emit less. You know, they they waste less energy per person that's transported. Uh, so, like that should be a number one priority. And lowering the cost of train tickets is something that's a little difficult, right? Because that literally just means, well, it means a lot of things, right? Um, the 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 reasons why we have these really high train fares are quite complicated, especially because uh, TFL is still recovering from COVID. When people weren't traveling, they lost a shitload of money from that. Um, and they still haven't quite recovered. Plus, building out the Elizabeth line cost a shitload of it went massively over budget and cost um uh, what was it billions twenty five billion right, which is not exactly cheap. Um, so getting asking them to make fares lower is is a pretty big ask at this point. However, you know I also think it's reasonable to expect that. It, people shouldn't be paying out of pocket to travel, and if you really want people to stop using cars, and then you have to make it cheaper. You that you you know, that that's the number one thing. Like buses, one of the reasons they're so crowded and busy and stuff like this is because they're cheaper than trains. Um, I mean, maybe they're always going to be cheaper than trains to ride, but, uh, you know, making those train fares cheaper is definitely going to be a step in the right direction. Improving cycle infrastructure is also going to be a step in the right direction for people who, for poor people. Let poor public transportation should be for the public. If the public can't afford it, it's not serving its fucking purpose. There are plenty of European cities where, uh, you know, uh, public transportation is free, right? Like I mean, it's already free for over sixties in the UK, or in London, I mean, uh, and it's free for people uh, under a certain age as well. It's free for children. It's cheaper for teenagers than it is for adults. I mean, I suppose it makes sense that like the, the people in who are not you know in working age are paying more, makes some sense. But also, uh, you know, <clears throat> I feel like lowering the fares just flat across the board. It yeah, it's something that I don't know. I feel like it has to happen, but I don't. I can't really explain how to do it, where the money's going to come from to let people do it. Uh, so that's definitely a thing. Maybe if these fucking TFL board members stopped going for uh, dinners that cost thousands and thousands of like fancy ass like, company lunches that TFL pays. This is all public on their website, by the way. You can find like they they legally are required to publish their expenses, and you can find their like they publish that they you know these execs go out for like these these like company uh, restaurant field trip type shit and spend thousands and thousands of uh, this is like public money it's insane that they can get away with this i mean obviously when compared to billions for building out new rail networks and stuff it's kind of a drop in the bucket but still it's kind of insane that they can get away with this stuff um yeah i tfl's a whole complicated financial mess uh i think they waste a lot of money i think they have a pretty inefficient system built built up kind of a bloated bureaucratic system. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that happens. Uh, so yeah, I think really the number one, if you if you really want to lower emissions, you don't necessarily need to go around replacing your entire bus fleet with hybrids and hydrogen buses. Um, you know, uh, they might be cool, but really the best thing you could be spending money on is cycle infrastructure and lowering fares for the train. Uh Oh, yeah, that's my rant. Okay, so after looking it up, it turns out the reason that London's transport costs are so fucking expensive is because the government just doesn't subsidize them, which I think is, I didn't even think was an option, because in every other European city, the government subsidizes transport costs, sometimes 100%. 
uh, sometimes just for residents. I believe in parts of Switzerland, there are places where maybe it's Luxembourg or Liechtenstein, one of those little fucking mountainous countries in the middle of that area. <laughs> There's like 100% free transport for everyone, even if you're not a resident. But in a lot of cities, I know in Germany, I know in Estonia, uh, in a lot of different places, if you're a resident of the city, you get free transport. Uh, but you know, all of these places are subsidized. It's insane. Why is the transport not subsidized? <laughs> what the fuck? If you don't know how it works, by the way, uh, the transport in London is run by a, uh, a essentially a government contractor, I guess. I, a, it, I guess it's a state-run company. I don't know what to call it. It's a it's a, a, a company called Transport for London, or TFL, which is supposed to be a non-profit. So they're supposed to... Uh, all of their investment that they all of the money all the profit that they make one year is supposed to get reinvested the next year into into the, like they're not supposed to make any profit and they are uh owned by the government i guess um i'm a little confused on this yeah they're owned by uh, well that can't be right i guess so but the, they're basically owned by yeah, they're owned by London. They're owned by by uh by by the 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 whole the the Greater London Authority. The 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 stuff. But you know the mayor of London. You know Sadiq Khan. I know a lot of Americans really freak out about Sadiq Khan. I think it's because he's Muslim, but he's actually based. Like he's he's in he he's way more based than any of the people who are like in Parliament. Like this guy is like in terms of the stuff I care about. He is like, you know, cares about exactly the same stuff I care about. He's like really into transport. He introduced a bunch of like transport schemes that are generally pretty good and well liked. Um, and uh, he uh, is he's he's the only like mainstream UK politician who is like outspoken advocate of UBI. Right? Like, that's a fairly radical policy still. And he's an advocate for it. Right? Like, the guy's based. Uh, but yeah, that that the whole, like, side of the, the, the London Authority owns TfL. But TfL kind of runs as a company that is supposed to be a non-profit. But what needs to happen is that the fucking Westminster needs to be subsidizing people's transit costs it's in, i didn't realize that, that it wasn't subsidized at all that's insane and it, it's what the fuck do people's taxes pay for i don't understand where do these taxes go they just disappear <laughs> they, they, they don't do anything well as always near the beginning of these episodes i'm gonna respond I say as always, as is now always, I'm going to respond to some questions in the comments as they come in. Uh, I only posted the previous episode today, so we only have one comment so far, uh, which is from Sia, or maybe maybe it's C, Sai, not sure. Uh, comment for your comment interaction. I have two questions. Have you played Team Fortress Classic? And do you have any favorite source mods? Uh, I have not played uh, TFC, although I do really want to. I I keep thinking I'm going to try it, but I'm worried I'm going to have a similar experience I had when I tried playing um, Half-Life Deathmatch, which is that everyone is ridiculously cracked and it's impossible to do anything. And also every there's only one server with anyone playing, and it's where all the people who have been playing since it came out are still playing. So I'm worried it's going to be a situation like that. Uh, I know that to being good at Team Fortress 2 doesn't... Not that I'm good, by the way, I'm still uh, intermediate level uh, at TF2. Um, but being having experience in TF2 basically does not translate at all to TFC as far as I understand, because... The I mean, I've seen gameplay of people playing Classic, and it's fucking insane. The grenade boosts and b-hops they're doing. I mean, I like to think I'm relatively good at b-hopping, but this shit is, like, on another fucking level. But I do really want to try it out, uh, just because I have a love for Gold Source and Source Engine games. And movement-heavy games as well, so I definitely want to check that game out. <clears throat> and I probably will at some point. In fact, I almost certainly will at some point. I might even stream it. I don't know. Uh, but yeah... 
I'm definitely excited to play Team Fortress Classic when I get around to it. Uh, it does look pretty fun. I mean, in the same way that I've played... Uh, well, actually, I'll talk about that in a second. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> um, I've also not played uh, TF2 Classic. Um, I haven't played either of those. Uh, or Fortress Forever. But I have played Open Fortress. Which was kind of fun, and then I got bored of it. Um, and for your other question, do you have any favorite source mods? I mean, frankly, not really. I don't really play that many of them. Uh, if you include Gold Source, I guess. Um, well, Counter Strike One Point Six, maybe. That's a good game. Quite a big fan of that game. Um, Sven Co-op, maybe, if that counts. But no, I'm not. I haven't really played. Um, played many of uh source mods i would i would like to get into it like if there's there's a couple of like i've i've been really wanting to get into the half-life one and also quake and also doom uh like modding and custom map scene especially doom wads like that's such a long running scene and i feel like making your own doom wads is like relatively easy and something I could definitely get into and have a lot of fun doing. I really want to get into making Doom. In fact, maybe that'll be my mission for today. Maybe I learn how to make Doom words. Uh, but making, you know, I've, I've also wanted to learn how to make a game in like, I've, I've for, for like two years now, maybe even longer, I've wanted to make, uh, a Half-Life one map. I have like a vague idea. I don't really have that many ideas, but I have like a, you know, it wouldn't be anything special. I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to try and make anything crazy ambitious or anything, but I want to make like some, in some retro shooter engine, which would probably end up either being Gold Source or Doom. Uh, I have this idea for like a fun little gimmick thing to try out. It would require making like a couple of custom assets, it, it, nothing too crazy, but uh, that's kind of the thing that's holding me back, and just learning the tools. Anyway, that wasn't really your question. <laughs> um, no, I haven't really played any source mods. Uh, I guess Gary's mod. I played some Gary's mod. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, pretty lame in that respect. I do. There's a YouTuber I really like called Pat Bites. He doesn't post very often, but he does videos about custom gold source levels a lot of the time, and Half Life One videos. Just gold source in general, uh, and his, his stuff's really interesting. Definitely got me interested in the gold source engine more. Well, not not that I will. I mean, already Half Life One is one of my favorite games. I'm one of those people that prefers Half Life One over Half Life Two. I used to speed run the game very, very, very badly. Uh, I've played it quite a lot comparatively. Uh, it so I've always liked the game, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Putting in, like, I, I, I want to, you know what I'm going to do? I keep saying I'm going to do this. I'm going to email Gaben. I'm going to email Gaben and I'm going to ask him, why haven't you open sourced the gold source engine yet? Because someone said they would do it ages ago and they haven't done it. I've just discovered that one of my favorite YouTubers, Patricia Taxon, <clears throat> has a podcast called Boat Knife. Uh, and that's cool. Big fan of Patricia Taxon big fan of podcasts as you can tell uh so i click on the the most recent one because there's there's quite a few normally i normally the way i listen to podcasts is i listen to the most recent one because oftentimes the first episode is like they're trying things out if i not just podcasts if i if i find something new like a youtube series i normally listen to the most recent one first or what's the most recent one first because you don't want to start from the beginning straight away because it might be like they're just trying new stuff out they haven't got the format down and so on so I normally go with the most recent one where they've like got practice or whatever. So it is the most recent one. Then if I like it, I go back from the beginning and go through until I catch up. And uh, I'm so glad to have listened to this most recent episode of Boat Knife. Because, uh, you know, the first half of the episode they're talking about a movie that I didn't really care about hearing them talk about. It was, I guess, kind of interesting. But the second half is them shedding on Jacob Collier. And oh my fucking god, I am so fucking happy to hear 
other people shitting on Jacob Collier who actually know music. Now, I've been I've said this before. A lot of Patricia Taxon's music, it's not really my thing. Some of it's good. A lot of it I don't particularly like. That's fine. They can do whatever they want to do. <clears throat> they definitely have uh, good takes on music, though. Every time I hear Patricia Taxon have a take on music, whether it's a particular artist or something about the philosophy of music or talking about music theory or any of these things, they are absolutely fucking based. Um, and hearing someone who I know has good takes on music agree with me is always good. And man, Jacob Collier sucks. I'm surprised I don't talk about this more often. It's because I don't think about him anymore because the hype wave for him has sort of died down. But when the initial Jacob Collier hype wave happened, I made a video. This is before most of you were subscribed. I don't even think the video exists anymore. Uh, let me see if I... Let me actually go into my creator studio and see if I privated it or something. Um, let me actually check that. Uh... No, I don't, I don't know what happened to that video. Oh, well. Uh, hold on. That's weird. I definitely made, did I just delete it off of the internet? That would be odd if I did this. I mean, it wouldn't be that odd. Uh, because I got a bunch of hate comments on it. It was the first video I made that got hate comments from random people. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I can't find it here on my channel. I'm pretty sure it was before this era. So yeah, I think I must have deleted it for some reason. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I made a video about how Jacob Collier sucks it eight years ago. And got, like, hate comments from random people, and I guess I must have deleted it, because I was a pussy-ass bitch back then. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've always, I've always, look, as a guy, look, I don't, I don't really care about him as a guy, I'm not even going to comment, uh, not on his personality. I mean, as a, from a technical level, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should make this clear. If you don't know who Jacob Collier is, um, he is a musician who sort of blew up uh, a lot in the the music sphere. He's one of these musicians who mainly makes music that other musicians like. Um, and he blew up a lot because he has a very, very deep understanding of music theory and is able to make very intuitive statements about it that reframe common uh, attitudes or understandings of harmony in new and very intuitive and interesting ways. And he is undoubtedly extremely talented. He is a very talented multi-instrumentalist, and he has a very, very deep understanding of theory. Um, you know, he's an excellent singer. Well, actually, he's an excellent singer from a technical level. Like, he can definitely hit very precise notes and hold those notes and do all the technicals like, like a robot. But... Um, <clears throat> So he kind of blew up because of this, because he plays like every instrument you can imagine and he plays them not just like he can play them, but he plays them all like pretty fucking well. Um, he has like a, and he has this very intuitive uh, understanding of harmony where it feels like it just sort of flows like he's so deep in harmony that it, he doesn't even have to think about it anymore. It's all very natural to him. Um, to which led to a lot of people calling him. But he's also very young. So a lot of people call him like a prodigy. And in terms of talent, in terms of, like, raw talent, I would agree. I think he's, like, he he is incredibly talented, incredibly skilled with various instruments and skilled with music theory, understanding, and application in some aspects. Uh, he also uh, gained prominence for a couple of other things. Uh, if You've probably seen him if you've seen that he, he made a video on Wired called, like, explaining harmony in various levels of difficulty or something, right? Um, 
which a lot of non-musicians in the comments like freak out about uh, bec because uh, it's like oh the final stage when he's talking to Herbie Hancock it's like they stop talking and they just communicate through pure music even though Herbie Hancock is like a million years old and he's just playing like triads <laughs> it's really weird because Jacob Collier is playing all this fancy schmancy shit that he always does and the, the other guys just fucking play in triads it's wild anyway uh <clears throat> um so this guy he is incredibly talented and very popular online and makes garbage music this has been my take since day dot he his uh he makes like shitty dream theater core like every like like uh fucking prog pop I don't know what to call it. It's like a re It's like, you know, every decade some white guy reinvents prog and thinks that he's changed music forever. Like, it's the worst thing ever. It's just like, throw every genre with no understanding of, like, the context that those genres carry, right? Like, completely stripped of any meaning. Uh, none of his songs have anything to say, you know? Like, he always talks about music as, as storytelling, I don't think he's ever told a story in his goddamn life, you know, like, all of his lyrics are all about nothing, uh, the songs, they just jump, for, like, he's a terrible at arranging, he just has songs that they just jump from one, like, each fucking, it's, it's somehow they're too long, and yet each section is, each section goes, each section of his songs goes on for ten minutes, and then just stops and goes it becomes a completely different song that doesn't sound like it's by the same person it's all mixed terribly it is and it's all incredibly fucking boring like he can somehow use the most advanced harmonic techniques in the world to make the most boring music ever conceived of it's elevator music it's corporate nothing it it doesn't sound like anything no one would listen to it for fun like, I don't understand why everyone likes this guy. And so many musicians, including friends of mine that I've had, freak out about this guy because of he's, like, so talented and whatever. And it's, like, I've been mad about this for ages. I fucking hate this guy's music. It's unlistenably bad. Are there some really neat chord progressions in there? Yes. Is some of his a cappella stuff pretty good? Yes. I think his a cappella stuff is by far the best stuff he's ever done. Uh, his more recent stuff with, like, full instrumentation is just absolute garbanzo um yeah so that's the context of jacob collier and i'm so glad that the people patricia taxon and the other person in this uh podcast who i'm not sure who they are but that person i'm glad that they agree with me based <clears throat> uh You know what happened recently here, a couple of weeks ago, or whatever? The coronation. The king was coronated. The UK, or England, Great Britain, whatever the fuck it is, is that one of only two countries in the world that still does a coronation ritual. The other one is some, like, tiny, tiny island nation. I don't even remember what it's called. <clears throat> but the, basically, the, the Britain is the only country that has a a big coronation ceremony that anyone cares about. And, you know, there are many ways in which it's cringe. Predominantly, the coronation ceremony is boring. That's, like, the main takeaway here. It was... It's very long and boring. Um, and it's a bit goofy, because it's all these guys, again, dressed up in all these weird, wacky outfits, and putting a hat on a guy. You know, that's kind of the whole deal, is... I'm gonna put a hat, big fancy hat full of stolen diamonds on this guy. Right? It's kind of the whole deal. It doesn't need to take as long as it did. Could have been five minutes. Right? They kind of drag it on. But, you know, I'm also someone who just is captivated by things that are very old. I like things that have been going on for a long time. And the coronation ceremony is one of these things. It is literally older than England. It goes back to before England even existed as a concept, before there was like a unified concept of what England was. It's, it's that old. 
right? It's It goes back to pre-Christian times when kings were given their power from being descended from Odin, right? Or Woden, as as it, he was called here, right? Wod, Woden's descendants crowned as king. It was then adapted, you know, that ceremony was then adapted by Christians to be, like, ordained by the Christian god. And now the ceremony has been, like, secularized with the the recent one. There are lots of mentions of, like, and people of all faiths, you know, like, th- these sorts of things. Uh, and that's not particularly strange, the fact that it's been... Yeah, I, I'm sure there were some fucking crazy Christian right-wingers who were like, oh, how could they say that in a... Th- th- look, th- this thing is not a Christian ceremony as much as it is a pagan ceremony... But it's also a Christian ceremony, which has changed because it's been going on for thousands of years and it's continually adapted with the times. That's just how it works. It's a living ceremony that keep, keeps changing. And I like that. Look, I like. I just like the fact that there are old things. I like, you know, I, I, feel, I feel like it's a pushback against Americanism. These, these Americans, they didn't have a country until like five years ago, right? And, they're, and they, I like... I like things that are that are significantly older than America. It it, may, it reminds me that there was a time before America existed, and there will be a time after, and that's great. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, I I like the fact that like that that there are like fifty churches in London alone that are older than America. There are pubs in London that are older than America, and I've been in some of them. Like this is just a a fun little. I don't know. It's cool when things are old. Is it not? Is it not cool when things are old? It's like, this thing has been around for ages. I'm like, yo, that's dope. This thing's been around for ages. It's just still here. That's cool. I like that. Look, I don't think the coronation ceremony it's co- itself was that cool. It was generally boring. And uh, the British monarchy is a bit of a weird weird thing these days, right? They, they don't really serve any purpose. Uh, you know... I feel like if you're going to go through the whole shebang of having a monarchy, you could at least have them be in charge of something. No? I mean, can't be worse than fucking Rishi Sunak, right? Uh, You know what I like about the king? Listen, maybe it's just crazy. Maybe this is crazy. But you know what I like about the king? I like the... Like, the queen... Right? She, She was just sort of a nothing as a person, other than, like, a state mascot she was just a mascot character she didn't really have any ideas or principles or anything like this right she was just sort of the queen that was literally the whole of her personality (laughs) sorry excuse me whereas this guy the king right like he actually has an idea he has ideological beliefs like he actually has an ideology which is nice, you know. I may not agree necessarily with with a lot of his ideology, but the fact that this guy has directly cited Rene Guénon as an influence on his personal politics multiple times, like, yeah, if you're the fucking king of England, you you're the sort of guy that should be into Rene Guénon. You know, you're that's like. That all these fuckers online who are talking about going on and being traditionalists or whatever, these guys are laughers. But you're the king, right? Like you should be into Gwenon. You're the the right kind of person to be into this sort of thing, right? That's what I like. He has a very, you know, king style ideology. He's a big traditionalist. Like yeah, that's that's appropriate for the king to be. You, that you know what I mean. You can't call it a lap. It's exactly what what he's supposed to be. You know, I may not agree with that position, but I'm glad he has some sort of position. And I, in in terms of you know other things that he's sort of publicly campaigned for, I actually agree with a lot of it. He's really big into uh, British farming. You know, not that right. Like he he's he's uh he's done a lot of campaigning to. Uh, and successfully so, to bring rights and funding and support uh, British agricultural industry, 
that's pretty good, right? Like that's that's he's he's big into this. He's like, you know, he he he's he's big into like supporting small smaller independent British farmers, uh, and that seems like a reasonable thing to be supportive of, you know. So like, I'm glad he has some sort of look as wacky and goofy as it is to have a king, right? It's pretty pretty goofy. I'm I'm I feel better about it than I did about the queen, because she didn't really she didn't really have any thoughts or ideas or anything. She just sort of sat there. At least this guy is like stands for something, and it's something that makes sense for a a guy who's a fucking royal to stand for. Am I I don't know. Weird, right? But like, this is why I'm like. You know, I, even though I'm a lefty, generally speaking, at least economically, I'm definitely a lefty, right? Socially, I'm also, I guess, a lefty, because I'm not right wing. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think we should kill all of all of the minorities. So I, I guess that makes me left wing. Uh, you know, I, ostensibly, I should be uh, against the monarchy. There's a part of me that just likes old things that have been going for a long time. And, I mean, you can say what you want about the British monarchy, but it is an old thing that has been going on for a long time. Uh, and that's kind of cool to me. Yeah, although it's, it doesn't really serve any purpose anymore, it's still an old thing that's been going on for a long time. Uh, so a weird fucking situation, though. It's a weird, weird situation in the British monarchy. Uh, other monarchies, they all modernized. We were just like, nah. <laughs> the, you know, the, the other, other kings in the world, they they wear suits and shit, right? The, these guys, they're like, nah, not for us. We're going to keep dressing in our goofy-ass outfits. And, I, you know, it's a bit wacky, but it is what it is. Hello, fellas. Uh... <clears throat> I'm feeling pretty good today. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm feeling pretty bad because I'm hungover. Because I, I was hanging out with a little crazy bitch yesterday. And I just woke up. <sighs> but anyway, other than the hungoverness, I'm feeling pretty good. And you know why? The reason is. Because I'm making money. I <laughs> get your money. I'm not your funny. You hear me? You know what I'm saying? I'm making money. Let me tell you what happened. So I, I I'm I'm late to this party, right? I'm late to this party. But uh, since Counter Strike Two was announced, uh, every CS:GO item is worth more than it used to be. And so last night while I was drunk. Or like falling asleep, basically. I just sold. I just went through, because the way you have to sell things on Steam, you there's no like bulk selling. You have to go one by one, slowly. And I sold a a, a bunch of my cases. Not even all of them. I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna keep selling them today. But I just sold a bunch of cases. Literally just cases, like. This this isn't stuff I ever paid for. This is stuff that like just I got dropped, you know, like just just naturally dropped for free over my time playing the game. Um, and I I made fucking eighty six bucks. Isn't this insane? I mean, I wish it was in real money that I could actually take out of Steam. That's kind of annoying. But. That's real money, you know, well, it's not real money, because it's stuck in Steam, but you know what I mean? That's a decent amount of money. People are buying these cases that I'm just putting up, and it's like each one costs maybe 50, 50p to pound fifty, somewhere between that. Some of them are more expensive, some of them are cheaper, but around that much money. But, you know, I had like 100 cases or something, so I'm making money. Which is, I don't know, it's pretty insane to me. Uh, 
Let's see how much is this one. Zero pound looks like it's going down. So I'm gonna put it at zero pound sixty-three pence. Then I'm gonna get buried up real quick. <coughs> and we keep going and we keep and we do that. This one's one pound forty-nine right now. But it looks like the line is staying stable. So we'll put it on sale for one pound forty-eight. Because well, who gives a fuck about one P? This is what I do. This is what I do. I, I'm a genius. I uncut, undercut the market by by one P. That's how I sell my shit. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm pretty sure there's just bots that buy this stuff up. So you undercut the market by one P. Sell your shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm a genius. <laughs> I don't think it's very genius at all. I just pick it random. Sometimes I charge over. Sometimes I charge under. By like 1p. I don't know why. Keep it interesting, really. This one looks like it's going up. But, fuck it. Okay, £1.86 would be charged for that one. Exciting, exciting. It's crazy. It's actually ridiculous that I'm selling pixels right now and making money off of it. Isn't that crazy? It's not even... It's pixels I got for free. It's not even pixels I had to pay for. These are free pixels that the game gave me. And other people are willing to spend money on this. And individually, they're only spending, you know, a small amount of money. But when you add it all up together... I'm making bank... I just want to say, I've made £90 now, just from selling the CSGO cases that I got dropped. Like, this is insane. I If only there was a way to withdraw money from Steam into your bank account. Because now it's just fake money. What am I even going to spend £90 on Steam on? TF2 Cosmetics? I have no idea. I guess I'll buy some TF2 stuff. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, nine. That's that's a lot of money, man. It's crazy. Fuck. I was gonna say something else. I think I'm gonna watch Repo Man, uh, because I saw it in a cinema during an all night movie marathon, and I really really enjoyed it at that marathon. But I was also fucking barely alive because I was like three movies in. And it was like, I hadn't slept in ages. So I'm going to watch it now with a clear mind and see if it still holds up. Okay, we're going to respond to some more comments on the last episode. Um, so uh, someone said, I'm enjoying the TF2 stuff, but then again, I have been playing the game off and on for a few years. Good, cool. Um... Tanaka says, Don't know much about UK gentrification, but when people move out, they also leave their communities, leaving their financial and mental support systems. And for black people in the US, no one values their labor other than their community. Race and class are super interlinked in the US, so it's not good to want most black people to go rural from a US perspective. Oh, I 100% agree. Um... I think a lot of the... So I talked a little bit in the previous podcast about, um, uh, you know, hopefully not too spicy, some some race politics stuff and class politics stuff. And I think, you know, since recording that, I've realized that the thing I'm actually frustrated with is not really any of the stuff that people are saying. It's just that, generally speaking, it feels like I only hear the US perspective on this. And that there's quite a big difference between uh, U.S. race politics and European and even more specifically British and even more specifically London race politics. Like, obviously there are similarities. There are things that, that can be drawn, conclusions that can be drawn and are relevant everywhere. I think some of the stuff I was saying was really me trying to express frustration at this side, that at the fact that you only ever hear about like a, a lot of this stuff from a U.S. perspective, um, 
yeah so i don't know i i don't know what i was talking about gentrification there probably some stupid shit you see the problem with me in politics right is that um i have a like relatively consistent political view it's sort of cooled down over the past few years um you know i used to be more strongly call myself an anarchist these days i'm a little more blackpilled sort of on a long long term like i feel like politics can kind of be split into two camps it's not like it, it, there's there's definitely a gray area in the middle but i feel like when you, when you're talking politics you can sort of broadly divide into uh short term sort of policy goals you know like like very actionable stuff like raise the minimum wage or uh you know lower taxes or these these sorts of things right short term policy goals like stuff that is very much within the current setup and then you can also there's the second camp which is where politics becomes a bit more abstracted and a, a closer to philosophy uh where you can say like uh there should be no state or we need a communist revolution or um you know full automation whatever right and uh i feel like in the in the the previous camp like in the the more practical solutions you know like very stuff stuff you can do right now kind of camp like i think a lot of people have a lot have trouble um uh drawing lines from the short term immediate policy goals to the long term more abstracted philosophical goals um so uh, sometimes it gets to the point where you have a lot of communists um and anarchists who reject all forms of uh you know these sorts of short term things as as basically reformist and not really solving the problem uh which you know true or untrue as that may be and that used to be me uh you know i don't think that's very useful or maybe i don't know whatever but uh, and then there are other people who completely disregard the long term far future th- theoretical speculative philosophical stuff and say no 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 if you're doing politics you have to talk about policy and that's it um and then uh definitely i think the majority of people are sort of somewhere in between where they have both camps and they are sort of trying to draw a line from one to the other and sometimes that line's a little squiggly and a little vague uh <coughs> so um you know when it comes to the short term kind of policy goals kind of stuff i think you know as as kind of cringe as it might be i'm still basically just uh i think i basically share most ideas with like like a sock dem or like a dem sock i don't know what the difference is between them but you know i just generally have like pretty uh lefty but not like communist not like revolutionary lefty but like you know democratic lefty socialisty policy goals in most cases not in every case but particularly in cases of economics um you know i feel like i've tried to do my research on economics and actually you know reading papers reading books watching lectures to try cuz you know i'm it you constantly see lefties not know anything about how economics works so i really don't want to be that guy but unfortunately economics is incredibly fucking boring and also doesn't make any sense a lot of the assumptions people have about economics the sort of stuff you learn in economics 101 <clears throat> it's a really weird system cuz you go through your econ 101 class and then the rest you know after you finish that your first year of econ the your next years of econ are all of the reasons why econ 101 was wrong um which is like a really weird way to to do teaching a subject uh <laughs> but uh so that's kind of a hard thing to get through <clears throat> but i've tried my best to have like a sort of a well-rounded view of economics and i think i've come to the conclusion that pretty much the uh I think lefty economics is just correct. Uh I support proposals like UBI. I mean I've I've said this before but I basically care about free policies. UBI or something similar um there are other options but 
let's just say UBI, um, public transport infrastructure, and um, copyright abolition. Some of those are or intellectual property, some sort of like curtails on intellectual property law so it's not running rampant and crazy like it is right now, um, which also kind of blends into free software stuff. Uh, but then when it gets to like the long-term policy goals, the sort of things where someone might say, we need communism, we need anarchy, we need to smash the state, we need whatever, like at this, you know, to this point, I feel like I'm basically just uh, an accelerationist, like Lansdale, where I just don't think that humans really have any control over that. I don't think it's even really worth, you know, this is why I think it, the, the this like EAC, effective accelerationist movement it, is just completely wrong. Uh, I don't know where they're getting this from. They 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 use a little, lot of Nick Land when they talk about this sort of thing, but then I feel like they haven't actually read it because uh, if there's one thing that Land uh, is big on, it's it's like the idea that human agency is kind of meaningless in the grand scheme of things, and it's really this deterritorializing power of techno capital that is the driving force of history, not human beings. <clears throat> so that's kind of what I believe. Um, so, you know, making prescriptive statements about how the future ought to be organized is a little redundant to me. Um, so, but then the other thing that's a bit annoying is that I am diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I don't know if you know that, but I am, I am bipolar. And uh, so while I do, if you push me, have consistent political standpoints uh what i'll actually talk about does vary a lot depending on how manic or how depressed i am at the time i can go very doomer mode or i can go very you know schizo mode and it, it can happen so sometimes i say stuff and i look back at it and i'm like what the fuck was i talking about um but hey that's just we, we have a little bit of fun okay it's not like anything i say really matters right it's not like i have influence on policy or anything like this so at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters, but it's fun. Okay, that's enough politics Politics talk. Sorry, I talked about that for way too fucking long. Uh, now for a, a schizo post. This is from Artekis, who says, Statistic is manipulation tool. Identity and self-expression obsessed folks, obsessed fools, seek advantage and capitalize on it. Fashion in 80s was at its peak. After that, it's only arrogant riches, aliens, and plastic dolls. Capitalism is bad, but there is no excuse of why it cannot be better than it is right now. Evil preaches tolerance until it is dominant. Then it tries to silence good. I'm going to be real. I have no fucking clue what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, Madeski says, of course it's unwatchable. It's a podcast, dummy. Or is that the joke? That's the joke. Uh, are there any custom TF2 maps or game modes that you particularly like? Um, I like Har Harbo, Harbo Hotel um, and the Mario Kart map, you know, the classics. I like Higher Tower. That's really fun. Like, the ridiculously tall High Tower maps are always fun. Um, and the custom game modes. Honestly, my favorite custom game mode might be a little weird. My favorite custom game mode is 24-7, instant respawn, 32-player... Dust Bowl uh, servers because that's what real war is like. Uh, Juseri says, Can you timestamp these the text time? I think he or they mean the next time. Uh, listen, as much as I would like to, if you think I'm going through fucking 12 hours of, of audio to timestamp it, you are smoking crack. I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> <laughs> that I will timestamp other videos, but that is too fucking much work. Okay, I'm not getting paid for any of this shit. If you want me to timestamp, hey, listen, if you want me to timestamp these things, patreon.com, okay? Give me money, I'll consider it. I'm not doing that shit for free, you crazy? No way. Oh, by the way, I, I, wanted to, I, did, I forgot to talk about Repo Man. Movie's great. Great fucking film. Love, love Repo Man. Definitely as good as I remember it being when I was fucking delirious. Although, I feel like being absolutely delirious was a more appropriate way to watch the film. But, yeah, Repo Man was really good. Uh, it's in my top ten for a reason. Uh, 
By the way, you guys interested in hearing my top 10 movies? You guys interested in hearing my top 10 movies? Yeah, give me your opinions on media. Yeah. Hey, YouTube man. YouTube man, give me your opinions on media. <laughs> um, well, my, my top 10 in no particular order are Robocop, because it works on every level. Electric Dragon, 80,000 volts, which is just a great fucking movie. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen it, it's probably the most obscure film on the list. So, I, I gotta hype it up. Electric Dragon 80,000 Volts is a fucking great movie. It's short as fuck. You can blow, it's like 90 minutes or something. It's, it's fucking, actually it might even be less than that. How much is it, how much, how long is it? Let me, let me check, let me check. It's, I just remember it being short. Uh... Does it say? Oh, whatever. Who cares? It's a short movie, shown black and white from 2001, about a noise guitarist who... If you, if you like Tetsuo the Iron Man, it's like Tetsuo the Iron Man's cooler older brother or something. I don't know. It's got similar vibes. I mean, it's also part of the Japanese cyberpunk film movement, like Tetsuo the Iron Man. Um, and if you like noise guitar, you'll like it. If you, you like noise music, you'll like this movie. If you like Tetsuo the Iron Man, you'll like this movie. Um, if you just like weird Japanese shit, you will like this movie. It's fucking amazing. It has some of the coolest shit to ever happen in film. There are some moments where just things are happening and it's just cool. And it's the coolest thing ever. Okay? You gotta watch this film. Electric Dragon 80,000 Volts. It's fucking great. Um... I mean, it's called Electric Dragon 80,000 Volts. How could that movie possibly be bad? Uh, then, Synecdoche, New York, because I'm fucking lame. Uh, Wild at Heart, my favorite David Lynch film. The Big Lebowski, which has been on my list forever. Um, the problem is, each time I try and take it off, I rewatch it, and it's still just as good as it ever was. It's a fucking great film. Um, Ugetsu, aka Ugetsu Monogatari, goes by both names, which is a really good Golden Age Japanese film by Kenji Mizoguchi. It's like a, it's just, a, I think it's almost like a perfect film. And like, the way it's put together, it's like every shot is like the exact perfect shot for what it's trying to express the story has this air of, like, fantasy, but more, like, almost, like, folklore, folktale, more so than, like, modern fantasy, you know? Like, it feels like you're watching a folktale unfold, because, like, this period piece that is based on a lot of Japanese folklore, and it really captures the, the, the spirit of, like, that kind of story in a way that I don't think any other film really has. Like, it captures the emotion... And the characters, I don't know how to explain it. It's just fucking amazing. It's it's a, it's a perfect film. It's, yeah, everyone hypes up, you know, everyone, look, there's like the three great Japanese filmmakers, right? You got Ozu, um, Kurosawa, and Mizoguchi, right? Everyone fucking hyped, look, Kurosawa, everyone's watched Kurosawa films, they're amazing, right? Ozu, also pretty hyped, right? Uh, my favorite director, maybe one of my favorite directors, definitely top five, uh, probably top three, but, but fucking Kenji Mizuguchi gets overlooked in the West. I don't know why this guy's films are legendary. Do yourself a favor. Watch, watch, uh, Ugetsu. It's, it's one of Martin Scorsese's favorite films. If that means anything to you. Uh, Yeah. Okay, next, this one, I'm I'm not sure if I want to keep it on, but I don't know what I replace it with, I need to think about it, which is Stop Making Sense, the, 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 like, the best tour movie, show movie ever made, Talking Heads, um, fucking brilliant, but the only reason I'm questioning it is because it's not really a movie movie, it's a movie, but it's also... I don't know, it's, I mean, I love the Talking Heads, 
like <laughs> I feel like it's kind of not fair because I just the Talking Heads is my favorite band, so it's like I may as well just it's anything with Talking Heads in it is just gonna be fucking good, and it just adds to it that it's the best, um, you know, live show movie ever made. But I don't know if it necessarily belongs in a top ten list of movies of all time. I'm not sure. I might have to re- rethink this, but it's on there for now. I mentioned Ozu being one of my favorite directors. Tokyo Story is the next in my top ten. I've said Tokyo Story is my favorite film. Um, I think it probably is. Then Repo Man. And finally, Naked Lunch, the David Cronenberg adaptation. Gotta have a Cronenberg on here. Love Cronenberg. Um, and Naked Lunch is a great fucking film. Uh... Of an unadaptable novel, somehow adapted perfectly. Uh, yeah. I I guess if I were to replace Stop Making Sense with something, it would probably end up being... Maybe They Live. Or some John Carpenter movie. I think it would probably be They Live. Or Escape from New York. I'm not sure. Big Trouble in Little China, that's a good movie. I don't know, I'd have to I'd have to think about it. But that's my top ten, not that anyone asked. Uh, please tell me I'm, how cool I am in the comments for having good taste in movies. There's so many good films out there, man, it's crazy. Uh, speaking of watching media, you know, I did a poll, right? I talked about this, I did a poll on my channel uh, to see how many people identified as otaku like how many people who watch because I make a lot of videos about anime and and otaku otaku lifestyle stuff I suppose Um, so I figured well I'm actually curious to know you know how many people are actually otaku in my audience and the poll is about 50-50, slightly more than, than not. But, uh, you know, let's let's call it about 50-50. So if you are an otaku, um, I feel like you owe it to yourself to expand your... You owe it to yourself to expand your outlook beyond just anime and manga. All, our, all of us Western otaku... We're fucking lame. We just, we read manga and we watch anime and we don't do anything else. At the very least, expand your horizons. Listen to, uh, re- read some fucking visual novels. And then, and not just Higurashi, okay? Not just Higurashi and the, the, the mainstream, you know, popular ones that are like quote unquote good. Read the ones that are called like... Y- you know, there's a, there's a billion visual novels called stuff like Nyan Neko Cafe 2, you know, and it, it's the best shit ever made, I'm telling you. If you're a Moe Otaku, read some Moe ge- Like, you will understand a lot about how Moe came to be in anime once you realize that it all basically evolved out of the key visual novels in the, like, late 90s and early 2000s. Like, the the entire attitude of early Moe anime is pretty much derived entirely from dating sims in Garuge and Eroge. Uh, and prim- primarily, well, going back to, like, uh, Two Heart, really. Uh, Two Heart kind of established a lot of this Moe stuff, and then uh, Key with, like, Canon uh, kind of, you know, also were very central. And you'll get a lot of the essence of early moe and you get to see how that got translated into anime and then how that anime style of moe merged with the slice of life manga stuff that was already existing um which was also influenced by those visual novels and then evolved into the moe boom and then now we're on the sort of end of it where moe is just subsumed into everything and it's hard to know what's moe and what's not anymore you know what i'm saying right the shonens have moe in them the moe has shonen in them 
like we're in a post where we live in post moe times uh an example of a, some post moe anime might be uh Azoken. uh but yeah definitely worth checking out some earlier visual novels for that but also modern or more recent visual novels are also worth checking out um you know check out some yuzu soft stuff they're all pretty great everything by yuzu soft is pretty great um yeah don't just don't just read the like good stuff but you should also read the good stuff like let, let me clarify you should also read subarashi kihibi and cross channel and you know probably I, personally i think grisaya is massively overrated grisaya is like massively fucking hyped by everyone I liked the common route in Grisaya, but honestly, the individual character routes were not that impressive to me. Grisaya is kind of overhyped, in my opinion. Um, and Cross Channel is massively underhyped. So read Cross Channel and read Subahibi, and you know, do do just. Do, but this is all. This isn't even what I wanted to talk about. Get into some visual novels, but what I actually want to talk about is the the real part of otaku culture that is criminally overlooked by Western fans is tokusatsu, okay? And to be fair, tokusatsu is less popular in Japan now than it used to be. But go watch some Kamen Rider, man. Like go go. You know, I I haven't watched much to- tokusatsu stuff, right? I'm I'm not like a big tokusatsu fan, but I watched Kamen Rider W, and that shit is fucking great. Like, they're not playing around with this shit. It's it's not even hard to get into. Like, go watch Carmen Rider W. It's so good. It's actually... So, it's like a... It's it's really good. I'm not joking. Like, I'm not exaggerating. It's just good in any way you could imagine it being good. Like, watch watch Carmen Rider W. It's fucking sick. Get into Tokusatsu. You don't have... Just to experience it. Because it's, 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 a, it's a core part of otaku you know and and we over here in the west with our plebeian ways we're just fucking watching anime and reading manga as if that's the whole of the story that ain't shit man you know what i'm saying i don't know am i being judgy or weird i'm saying there's loads of stuff out there that's really cool what i'm trying to say is if you like anime and manga and stuff you're 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 fucking yourself if you're not if you're not also looking at this all this other cool stuff that also inspires it like and that's that's also cool, and you will you will enjoy it, and you will be a happier person for having experienced the breadth of everything otaku culture has to offer. You know, I forgot how ass mainstream TV is. Okay, let me tell you a story. So I'm, I don't even know why I was here. For some reason, I I went down a Wikipedia rabbit hole where I was clicking on links. I don't even fucking remember how I got there, but I ended up on the. List of biopunk, uh, like media. I don't remember what it was. Like list of biopunk media Wikipedia page, um, just going down this Wikipedia river. And I ended up there. And I was scrolling through because I, I like biopunk. You know, maybe there's some stuff I haven't heard of here. Uh, most of it was stuff that I, I don't know. It's kind of not what I generally think of when I think of biopunk, but I guess it technically counts. And then I saw in the TV shows section. Uh, Orphan Black. Now, I'd, I've heard of Orphan Black before. Uh, like, I know a lot of people like that show. So I thought, hey, you know what? I, I have a vague idea of what the show's about. Like, if I remember correctly, it's about, like, clones. Like, this girl who finds out there's a bunch of clones of her. Um, so maybe I'll check it out. So I got to watch the first episode of Orphan Black. And, like, I don't know how it's possible. Like, I forgot how awful TV is. Like... You turn the episode on, and immediately, you get terrible generic TV music. Like, that. this probably doesn't bother most people, but to me, this is, like, instantly, all I'm thinking is, oh, this is, like, temp music, no one in this show cared enough to, like, write a proper soundtrack that had any, like, uniqueness or vision to it. It's just filler music, to fill the... It's, like, plinky-plonk music, you know? It doesn't do anything, it doesn't... It just, it, it's just the least possible effort music you can put in a TV show that sounds like every other TV show so that everyone knows they're watching a TV show. And then I, you know, I look at it and the fucking, the main character, she's rifling through this, this like purse or this like handbag and she's taking stuff out and she, she takes out two phones. She's alone. 
She takes out two phones and she says, two phones. And she takes out, like, uh, uh, an ID card, shows the camera what the name on the ID card is, basically, and then reads the name out loud. And it's like... This show is made for retards. <laughs> Who don't realize that someone having two phones is notable. So they have, they're like, well, what if the audience doesn't realize that th- this is going to be an important detail later? I know. We'll have this character for no reason alone say out loud clearly, not like muttering under their breath, just in normal speaking tone, two phones. That'll make sure that they'll remember it. Yeah, I'm not watching this fucking shit. Okay? <laughs> You've lost me already. The, you got plinky plonk music and characters talking to themselves for no reason to point out obvious details that you don't expect the audience to notice because you can't just emphasize it with direction, for example, you know? Like, if you want to emphasize that someone has two phones, that's what insert shots are for. You do an insert shot for that. You you use some framing. You, do so, you just have to show it and then treat your audience with some level of respect. I don't know. You've lost me. The music is so bad. You've lost me. The real problem with cinema is that no one's ever gonna beat that scene in, like, in that nature documentary. I think it's Planet Earth 2. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, but the, the scene in, in Planet Earth 2 with, with the fucking lizard that escapes, like, 50 snakes and and then, you know, it gets caught at one point and then literally escapes the snake and then fucking dodges snakes pulls off crazy jumps up the rocks and survives that is arguably the best moment in cinematic history you guys know the clip i'm talking about right you do you definitely know it that is that shit goes hard now i don't want to break the illusion for you guys but if i had to guess I can't tell one lizard from another lizard. I know people... Nature documentaries are more about constructing a narrative than presenting the truth. It wouldn't surprise me if that sequence was spliced together from multiple different sequences with different lizards escaping from snakes. This is the sort of thing that nature documentaries do a lot. Like, a surprising amount of nature documentaries is... I don't want to call it fake, but bending the truth... um, I mean, just as an example, basically every sound you hear in a nature documentary is added in post. Uh, almost none of it is actually recorded in uh, in the field. Um, and once you notice that, it becomes really distracting, <laughs> which kind of fucks me up every time I'm watching a nature documentary because the sounds are, like, masterfully done, don't get me wrong. Some of the best Foley artists in the business, but it is still... Foley, and you can definitely tell once you're paying attention for it. Um, and they do a lot of, like, I remember watching the behind the scenes of Planet Earth 2, there's a, there's stuff where it's like, hey, this shot looks like it's just footage of this particular little rodent running across the floor. But to get that shot, what they actually did was build basically a a stage, like a set in the middle of the desert, they built like a little miniature set with sand on it and dressed it up to look like the rest of the desert, shot against the background of the real desert, then placed the rodent there and got him to run across so that they could get the particular camera angle they wanted that was super, super low to the ground uh, with these these macro lenses. Um, and they do stuff like that a lot. Like they'll splice together stuff to tell a narrative, They'll create sets, They've all the sounds are fake. Like, a lot of nature documentary stuff is fake. Or, because the point isn't to purely just capture nature, the point is to make make a narrative out of it so that you can tell stories about the natural world. I'm personally okay with this. I think every person's going to draw a different line where they, what they think is okay or not. In the end, it's a film, more above everything else. But that scene, I don't give a fuck how fake it is. It works, and it, it's fucking amazing. So for some reason today, I was just feeling like I wanted to watch a TV show. I don't know why. don't really watch TV very often. Um, 
but uh, so I tried to watch Orphan Black and dropped it within the first 30 seconds because of the aforementioned reasons. So I just went on Google and searched for like best recent TV shows because I, I don't know how people find stuff to watch and I'm not in touch with culture enough to know what people are enjoying. And um, one of the first ones that popped up was a show called You. And I remember hearing people talk about this show. I think Northern Lion might have mentioned it or something. No, maybe he didn't. Some YouTuber mentioned it, I think. I don't know. I don't know why I heard about it. But I heard, I've heard about this show called You before and people talking it up. So I thought I might check it out. I watched the first three episodes of it. Um, I thought it was, I mean, definitely better than Orphan Black um, in terms of quality. Like, it felt, feels like people put effort into it. Not really a show meant for me. I feel like I feel like, um, you know, to be very kind of overly harsh on the show probably doesn't deserve this level of criticism. But to be overly harsh on the show, uh, it feels like a show that is um, forced tension for to stretch out every episode because really the point of the show is so that. Uh, white women can look at it, or I, just women, I don't know why I said white, so it's so that women can look at the main guy and be like, I can fix him, that's the point of the show, like, the the, the point of the show is they cast a very attractive, uh, young actor man as psychopath violent stalker guy, so that women can watch the show and be like, oh my god, he's so hot, I can fix him, that's the point of the show, I'm pretty sure, I'm 90% sure that's the point of the show. I don't know the the goings on in women's minds, but that's the vibe I get, which is fine. You know, I like a I like a yandere as much as the next guy, so I get it. There's nothing nothing wrong with that. Um, but just not really not really for me. I thought it was well put together. Don't get me wrong. Like the dialogue was pretty good, I guess. <laughs> Tight. Um, the direction was generally fine, you know, they had some interesting stuff, a lot of good framing, POV shots that put you in the headspace of the main character, it was, it was, you know, good fundamental filmmaking, it's good, it's good, it's good, I don't really have any problems with it, I would say the thing I have a problem with is just the premise, really, which is just like, the premise of each episode is he's doing weird stalkery stuff, and, you know, the layers of weird stalkery stuff are going to be building up, right, they're going to build, it's kind of like a web of lies type of situation, like a web of lies type situation where each episode he's having to cover up and go deeper into the stalky behavior, um, and, you know, eventually, spoilers, it gets to the point where he kidnaps someone and, you know, keeps them locked up in a basement, And it's like, you're wondering, has he done this before? You're getting some flashbacks of his past. And every moment, it's like, oh, what's he going to do? Does he have some sort of grand plan for what to do next? Is is he like a Sherlock Holmes genius psychopath guy? Or what's going on here? But in reality, the point of, like, really every episode is he has to, it has to spiral a little bit. And then the episode spends the whole time jerking you off like, oh, no. Something something happened, which looks like he might get caught. It might get revealed that he's a weird stalkery guy. Oh, he ran into his old friend at the party. It might get revealed that he's a weird stalkery guy. Oh, he he, the 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 little kid ran down into the basement. It might get revealed that he's a, like that's the main f- source of te- oh he broke into her house and now he's hiding in the shower while she's standing right next to him with his silhouette clearly visible through the shower curtains, he might get caught, but somehow doesn't, um, right, like, that's the whole show, and eventually, and I'm assuming the last episode, or towards the end of the season, is just gonna get to the point where he does get caught, and then it's like, oh no, he got caught, I'm, I'm not, not super engaging for me, so I decided to drop that show, and I picked up another show, which is, uh, called Severance, and it's on Apple TV, and this show's uh, pretty good, um, it reminds me of a Netflix show I watched 
a while ago, which I really liked, and I believe it was called Maniac. Yeah, with Jonah Hill and Emma Stone. I feel like this show, no, I, I never hear anyone talking about it. I thought it was really fucking good. I really liked Maniac. I can highly recommend Maniac. Maniac was better than Severance. Um, they're not that comparable, but... Shady company with a big brutalist building and kind of retro future aesthetics. Um, doing weird medical experiments on people. That's kind of the, 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 the gist of the similarities. It doesn't go much deeper beyond that. A little bit of psychological horror thriller elements, but you know, other than that, the shows are tonally quite different. Maniac's kind of more of like a dark comedy kind of situation. And a little more sci-fi focused. Um, I don't know. I like. I really liked Maniac. It was really good. Um, this one is a little. It's definitely more straight laced and serious. Um, and I'm kind of amazed the show, like, it's. It feels like kind of a big risk to take on a show because, like, compared to average TV. The show is quite slow paced. And I know there's like a big crowd for like slow burn horror these days. Um, but but I just wouldn't expect it. And the thing that really makes it feel slow paced to me. Not that I'm saying it's a bad thing. I think it's paced appropriately for what the show is about. Um, ish. Uh, I, like I don't think it's, it's badly paced. I think it's methodically paced. Let's just say that. It's very much so methodical. Uh is that each episode is like an hour long. So it's kind of a slog uh, for my ADHD ass. <sighs> but oh, I think it's genuinely pretty good. Uh, so far, at least I'm on episode four, which means I've fucking been watching this for ages. But yeah, I think it's pretty good. Uh, great performances, lots of intrigue. A little bit worried. Here's the thing I'm worried about. Here's the thing I'm worried about, because I know it's coming, and I'm not going to enjoy it. The thing I'm worried about is that this is, like, the setup to be season one of, like, some long-ass show, and that, you know, a lot of the show is kind of built on mystery and intrigue, and you're going to get to the last episode, and they're just going to reveal a little bit, and there's just going to sequel bait without telling, like, without revealing any of the deeper mysteries, and that's going to fucking suck. Because then you'll have to wait, like, two years before the, the next season comes out. And by that time, I probably will have forgotten that the show exists. So I really hope it's just a self-contained story and not going to have weird sequel bait stuff in it. Because that would be fucking annoying. That's something I'm definitely worried about. Um, and now, you know what's weird? The evil Megacorp in this 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 TV show. I'm currently looking at a like pulled out, like helicopter shot of the evil Megacorp's central building. And I think it very clearly parallels the real life Apple Park building in that there's a prominent circular motif in the design. And it, I, isn't it weird how companies keep doing this? <laughs> like, this, this, I mean, this is on Apple TV. I don't think it's a mistake that this clearly looks like, like, bears some resemblance to the Apple headquarters. And then you had Mr. Robot, where the evil company, who was called Evil Corp, was definitely supposed to be Amazon, at least in part. It's like, why do they keep doing this? Like, there's something weird going on there, and I don't really understand it. It's like a psyop type thing. I think it's like one of these, uh, like 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 you know in hypernormalization, when Adam Curtis is like, ah, uh, but the the Russian government they fund their opponents publicly so that even the opponents you don't really know who's really an opponent because they're fun. So I think it's like a situation like that where all of these m corporations fund art that's critical of the corporations so that you can't really know. What's what? I don't know, it's fucking weird. Um, I think the point is just to confuse you, and there's not really any point beyond that. So that's what's, that's, that's odd.
but uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty good show. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll have more details when I get more involved. Because again, being on episode four, each episode being an hour long, I really know fucking nothing about what's happening in this show. It's very much keeping its cards close to its chest, which is what's got me worried about this like sequel bait thing. But I guess we'll have to see. Okay, so I watched the first season of of um, Severance. And yeah, pretty much exactly what I expected when I was w- worried about the fact that this wouldn't be a self-contained first season, that this is the first season of a show that they hope to continue. I fucking hate TV. I hate TV. Just make a self-contained TV show. I don't know why this is like such an impossible thing for people to do, but whatever. I guess the whole point of all of this is just that everyone wants to get renewed for a second season. Whatever. I fucking hate this shit. But... Other than the fact that the story isn't concluded because TV is retarded, it was genuinely pretty good. It was, uh, actually, I'd say very good. Um, the show takes, I mean, it basically focuses around one sci-fi concept. And really, you know, I when I first heard about this a while ago, I wasn't that impressed with the concept. I was like, that sounds a bit goofy. I don't know what there is to really talk about with that. But there's a lot like this. This particular concept of of severance that the show is based around, they really do like explore a lot of angles of like what it means and how it would affect the world and the people it happens to and so on. Like it's very well. It's honestly well thought through and well done. You know, like you have this idea, and it's, I think a lot of people would have thought of this idea and just sort of used it as a goofy gimmick as part of some bigger sci-fi narrative with maybe but no like they genuinely explore the the ramifications of of severance as a concept um and you know something else i really appreciate about the show is the fact that the actors look like real fucking people and not like they're not all suspiciously beautiful i really hate that about american tv when all of the characters are suspiciously attractive uh I don't, I, I prefer, I prefer, it makes it easier for me to relate to people when they just look normal instead of looking like a bunch of Hollywood types. Uh, so that was good. That's a good thing about the show. Glad that decision was taken. Um, all around the performances are just amazing in this show. Like you, you don't, there's no, not a moment where you're thinking to yourself that you're watching actors on a screen, you know, it, they really, they really did do very well. It's very good. And the music, you know, I complained about Orphan Black's music uh, being super generic. Um, Severance has a little bit of the generic uh, prestige show aesthetic going on. But generally speaking, I think it has some memorable light motifs, some memorable themes, uh, a a consistent aesthetic that's strong and fits uh, with the aesthetic of the the visuals, I think it, it worked, the music really does work pretty well in this show, um, and yeah, each episode is like an hour long, I already mentioned this, so it's kind of a slog, but I think that works to the show's favour, because it sort of feels like, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood, where the whole movie is kind of one really, really long build-up to this final big explosive scene, the show's kind of like that, where it's very methodical in its pacing, as sort of one big build up to this final episode where they, uh, well, a, a, a bunch of things are revealed and happen and stuff. Although they're not conclusive, they're more like, uh, just answering more, que- opening up more questions rather than answering questions that already exist. Which does, again, make me worried because now instead of just having one good season of television that makes sense, we have to fucking. I don't know, if you want to do this, if you want a, a show that is going to keep getting... Just make episodic TV. No, episode... I, I, my favorite TV show is Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay, a perfect episodic show. Like, I don't know what the fuck happened to episodic TV shows. They've just vanished, but whatever. It makes me mad. But anyway, this show's good. And, and I think one of the things that's really good is the, the directing and the cinematography. Like, it has a a consistent uh, look to it that's unique and tonally appropriate, but then also 
it it lets the camera display emotion and do you do you understand what I'm saying? Like it's you know a, a a decent show is one that like takes advantage of basic cinematic technique to heighten emotions and to reflect the character's inner world in the the framing and the camera, right? But then great directing adds uh like more on top of that, right? Where you you you're able to still do that while also having a unique visual style that is like purpose built for whatever thing you're making, right? Does this make sense? Like, like it fits both the story and the narrative and the world, it reflects the world while also being able to do basic, you know, narrative telling and reflecting the characters inside worlds, right? And I think this, yeah, the, this is, there's definitely good, well, well executed in Severance. Um, the last episode was very stressful, very stressful time, very tense. Um, and yeah, I don't know what to say about it beyond that without giving, I mean, I can't, it's not really possible to give away spoilers because they, they didn't fucking say anything about what's actually happening in, in the plot. It's all still a mystery, but it is pretty, it's a, it's a, it's a good mystery. I just, I just hope that they don't fuck up the reveal in like five years when the end of this show finally happens. The musical gods have enlightened me once again. The gods. Thank you to the gods. Shouts out the gods. Ayo. Ayo is me. No, thank you. Shouts out the gods real quick. I'm going to have to shout out the gods before I start off real quick. Shouts out the gods. Um, I, I realized. So here's what was going on with me. Here's what was going on with me. I think I can explain from the beginning. Uh, there I was watching Severance, and I finished Severance, and I went over to my YouTube page, and what did I see on my YouTube page? But Mewa Denki, having posted two new videos of a new model of gum base. Uh, the gum base, if you don't know, you can watch the video on my channel about the gum base. But you probably already saw it, because it got a bunch of views. Uh, for me, at least. For my standards, it got a bunch of views. Um... And I saw the new type of gum base, and I was like, ooh, that looks nice. And then I thought to myself, base. Maybe I should get my base sorted out. So then I went on Reverb.com, right? I went on Reverb.com, and I started looking at bass guitars. I was looking at these bass guitars, and I was like, you know, I've always wanted a Rickenbacker, right? I've always wanted one. They're fucking sick. One day, I will buy one. Um, But... I was looking at it, they're still very expensive, and I was like, I don't know, I don't know about that, I don't know, a little expensive, um, they're a bit crazy, right, they're, they're talking like three grand here, I think I will eventually one day cave and buy a Rickenbacker, uh, but I would probably do it in a shop, not on Reverb.com, um, Anyway, there I was on Reverb looking at bases, and then I was like, well, hold on a minute. Maybe I can just buy the part that I need to fix my base. So I went and I was like, what's my base called again? So I went and grabbed it to see the name at the top, which is Martin Scott. So I was looking for Martin Scott bases, and couldn't find any parts I don't don't really know how to look for the specific because what's broken on my base is the uh the little in the okay it's kind of hard to explain so you got the tuning peg right and then attached to the 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 bit that you turn is a gear right at the back of the 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 top of it (laughs) at the back there's a gear that big gear is broken it's the, 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 the teeth on the gear are bent out of shape, so it doesn't work. Um, just on one string. I, I don't know what the fuck to search up to find that. So, you know, I'm looking around, and then I'm looking around, and I have this my bass just in my hands, and I'm like, well, hold on a second here. Three out of the four strings still work. Maybe I'll just see if I can, like, still play something with these, like, three strings. And the other string 
now that I'm here, so I'm like, let me tune it. So I go into, I open Logic, plug it in, open Logic, get the tuner up, and I start tuning it. And then I'm like, well, actually, it just so happens that the the string with the broken tuning peg is actually a perfect B, which is not the correct note that it should be. It's a very strange note for it to be. It That note being, that string being B, it's supposed to be G. Um, no, it's supposed to be D, I mean. <laughs> Fuck. It's supposed to be D, but it's B. Uh, but at least it's a note. At least it's in tune. Maybe I can do something about this. So I just start recording. Anyway, I've been basically recording all fucking day, and I've made like three and a half songs. Well, m- maybe three and three quarters songs. I've ma- I made th- three completed-ish songs. They're not mastered, but three songs... And one where the instrumentals all recorded, but it doesn't have any lyrics or vocals yet. And I, uh, it's like 10 and then off. I need to shout for the vocals and it's like 10 p.m. So I don't really think I can do that right now. So I'm going to do that tomorrow. Also, my voice is shot because I was doing vocals all day. Anyway, and I've got this thing and it's like, d- damn. This went from like, let me just pick up the bass and see what happens into, I think I'm making a new album now. <laughs> I think the next No Thank You album's on the way. So that's neat. That's a cool thing that happened to me today. I also tried to play some TF2. And man, the internet being fucked is just fucking me in my fucking ass. Like, it just drops. It's like every maybe f- minute, once a minute, they, it will just completely cut out for about 20 seconds. Maybe longer than that. Like, once every three minutes, it will just completely cut out for about 20 seconds and then come back. There's no, like, general high ping or lag or anything like that. It's, like, it's perfectly fine, and then once every, like, few minutes, it completely cuts out for 20 seconds and then comes back perfectly fine, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, So, I don't know what the fuck to do about this. Like... I don't know if I gotta call them. I don't know what to do. It's it's a pretty fucked up situation, really. It, I mean, it's nothing on my end because it was fine until they fucked something up. Like they texted me to say, like, "Hey, we're doing repairs in your area," even though nothing needed repairing. The internet was fine. They were like, "Hey, we're doing repairs in your area, so you might experience the internet cutting out." And the internet was out for like four hours, and it came back, and then they were like good news, the internet is fixed now, but then it it never actually got fixed, like, it kept going out constantly since then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the internet situation, make playing TF2 very annoying, but, in the good news, it means that I am making music, which is like a better version of playing TF2, uh, Making some noise rock. Noise rock. Uh, speaking of which, okay, now now we're getting into something interesting, which I've been thinking of, is Patreon. So I have a Patreon, right? I have a Patreon, and I'm thinking of pushing this Patreon harder. Uh, because having a sustainable financial situation is kind of useful in life. <laughs> you know? It's kind of a useful thing to have is a sustainable financial situation. Um, and I think I've been I've been slacking on it because right now my shit's okay. But in a few years my shit will not be okay. And so I shouldn't just be using this time to be completely do whatever I want. I should use this time to set myself up so that by the time a few years comes around, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Um, right, so part of that involves Patreon. Um, I don't I don't think I'm going to ever make a shitload of money on Patreon. But mostly, it's just that like I have this thing, and I actually, you know, I'm kind of even framing this in the wrong way. Because the real thing that, that is pushing me to do this is that I feel kind of 
weird about it because people give me money there and they, they don't really get much in return. <laughs> like I post music there whenever I have spare music to post there. Um, uh, right. Which, but I don't, I don't know. It's like I'm doing mi- minimum work kind of, well, it, maybe not minimum work. It's more like, I don't know if I'm giving them a good value proposition for what they're giving me, you know? Like, maybe, like, I need to be doing... I I guess they're giving me money willingly, but I feel like I need to be giving them something more in return than just a track every once in a while. Uh, so, I don't know what I'm going to do about that. i got to think, think this through. I've also... I think I, I have, like, way too many fucking... Tears on my shit, um, like, like, I don't know, I, I feel like my, my Patreon isn't set up very well, and I could probably make it better, um, oh, damn, Patreon just gives you everyone's email who subscribed to you, what the fuck, that's crazy, Anyone who sometimes, anyone who's ever su- support, anyone who's ever given me money on Patreon, I have your email address. That's fucked. That feels like a violation of privacy. What the hell? Literally every single person who's ever given me money on Patreon, I have your email address. Damn. I didn't know this. I didn't know that was the thing. Well, I will never use them. Don't worry. The, your secrets are safe with me. I will never email you. Um, cause that's fucking stupid. Yeah, I think I should record another episode of the Patreon podcast, but I don't know what it would be about. I really wish I could somehow spread the gospel of... Well, listen, it's not that it has to be TF2. It's just... TF2 is the only, as far as I know... Unless Overwatch has this, but I'm not aware that it does. What I'm trying to get at is... The the lost feeling... That you get from hitting projectile weapons in an FPS. So, we're talking grenades and uh, rockets in TF2, mainly. There are others, but those are the main two. Almost all FPSs are hitscan only these days. Which is, you know, I don't have any problem with that. Especially when the game is built around it. But, there is a level of joy, euphoria, that you get from hitting uh, projectiles on enemies, that you just, it can't be matched, because it requires reading the play, the other person's movement, and seeing, and timing, seeing, like, someone land a a crazy air shot rocket in TF2, is just the most satisfying thing in the universe, and the fact that that's got kind of missing from, from games these days, is a little bit of a shame. I'm going to be responding to another comment uh, on the previous podcast. Um, This one comes from Kyla, who says, I'm curious about your current perspective on rating systems. You've done several tier lists in your videos, but in 2020, you also had the radicalized against rating systems conversation with Dotesmite. Is it just a matter of choosing a tight enough set of comparable objects your moderated position in rating systems videos, or do you think tier lists specifically are different for some reason? One reason I think the latter might be variable is because the tier lists are not just tier lists, but tier list videos, where the main point is the justification for each evaluation, to which the tier list format might be especially conducive for, not the final outcome of the generated tier list itself. If there is something that separates tier list, what would you have to change about rating systems in other domains for them to meet the proper criteria? Though maybe you don't care about this at all anymore, lol. Edit. There's also the math is math angle, 
and it will be interesting to hear about what difference, if any, you see between A tier and 4 out of 5, for example. Well, thank you for your question, Kyla. I will explain my current position on rating systems. Um, I base my... When it comes to a numbered rating system, I base my numbered rating system on myanimelist.com, which if you go to myanimelist.com and you try and rate something, it will tell you a number, and then next to that number, it will show what that number is meant to represent. So uh, let me just pick a random anime here so I can read them out. If you select the that of 10, 1 is appalling, then horrible, very bad, bad, average, fine, good, very good, great, masterpiece. The only thing I have a problem with here is 5 and 6, 5 being average and 6 being fine. I don't really understand the difference between those two things. Also, like, average is kind of a loaded term, because it's, like, average compared to what? It's a bit... That I kind of have a problem with. I feel like I have an intuitive understanding of what that kind of means. Um, but five and six can be somewhat difficult for me to um, differentiate in my mind. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there's I have a problem with anime specifically, where sometimes I watch something that's a six, but it's so good at being a six that I like, do you know what I, I don't know if this, this makes sense, so my, my criteria for being a, like, what the epitome of a 6 out of 10 anime is, like, like, the, how I differentiate between a 5 and a 6, my, my criteria is that the, the epitome, the archetypical, um, 6 out of 10 anime is Nyanko Days, okay, I don't know if you've ever seen Nyanko Days, Nyanko Days is the archetypical 6 out of 10 anime. If I can compare every other anime to Nyanko Days, and it's about the... It's definitely a kind of an abstract vibes thing, right? If, it, if I feel like, you know, a 5 is a 6 without feeling. That's how I, I put it. So it's like, um, take... Like, the difference between a 5 and a 6, for me, is the hardest to make a clear differentiation about because a four is easy because a four is the beginning of I didn't like it whereas five is like meh and six is also kind of meh so that those are like the hardest two to differentiate for me the way I see it is like a six is a five plus feeling it's a five but with the idea that someone involved somewhere in the production had some emotional connection to the work like Nyanko Days it's not good like it's not particularly funny it's not particularly interesting or whatever. But, like, there were ideas. Someone tr someone actually tried. You can tell. Maybe not in the animation department. I mean, it was probably pumped out for cheap, like most anime, uh, whatever. But, like, someone somewhere was passionate about these, these little weird cat-looking girls, right? Like, somewhere, someone cared about it. And that's what, that's what pumps it up to a six. It's like a five, but you get the feeling that someone actually cared. Anyway, so that was kind of a digression from your actual point. So yeah, my position on rating systems is that the numbers just represent these words. So like, uh, even though I still hold my position on 10 out of 10s, that uh, a 10 means it's, I'm just autistic, right? Like, there's a there's a fundamental difference between 1s and 10s. Um, uh, where uh, 10 means you can't go any higher, right? So... Like, there's no 10.5, like, there is 9.5, and so a 10 is the upper bounds. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it wouldn't, if you're doing a list of from 1 to 10, uh, 10 is a very special number in that situation, right? Because, um, you know, you could have, let's say, a high 6 versus a low 6 out of 10, or, you know, a high 7 versus a, a mid 7 or whatever, strong 7, whatever. You could have. Uh, a 9.999 or a 9.1, right? But you can never have a 10, 10 and a half. You can never have, a, a, it's a high 10 because that means it will be above 10 and the list is 1 to 10. So that's my opinion on 10s, uh, which is why I don't give them. Because a 10 means there can't possibly be anything better than it, which I'm not sure exists. 
Uh, but maybe I should switch my usage of 10 over to just mean something I consider to be a masterpiece rather than some more objective math as math as you put it type of situation. But when it comes to tier lists, I, I think uh, it's a similar thing. But tier lists, are, okay, it, there is actually a fundamental difference to me. Why why tier lists and rating systems are different. Um and you said that the point is that tier lists are about the justification for each valuation. I agree with that, but I think it's actually more more than that, which is that it's about the purpose that the medium serves. So for me, a rating system serves two purposes, like a numbered rating system. The one I generally interact with is my anime list rating system, so I'll just use that as an example, right? So the point of the my anime list ratings is twofold. Firstly, it's so that I can remember what I think about a show at a glance. So I can go through my mouth and I can be like, oh yeah, I have a vague recollection of that show. And I can look and I can see, oh, I gave it a seven. Okay, I guess it was pretty good, right? And then that jogs my memory about the show and I can remember my actual detailed opinion. And the second um, purpose that rating systems serve is that they're universal and so you can, they're, okay, they're not that universal, but they're generally universal. So if I say to someone, like, I thought it was good, but I'm talking like, you know, maybe like an 8 out of 10 rather than a 10 out of 10, people can understand what I mean when I say that. And so it's a, it's a good shorthand for expressing your feelings about a, a piece of work if you uh, or a, a piece of art. If you don't want to have some super long nuanced conversation where you're like, well, I really liked the voice acting, but I thought the animation in some parts was lacking, and certain characters lacked motivation, but on the other hand, you know, this particular character was really... Indi- like, if you don't want to have this whole conversation every time that you just want to give an offhanded remark about a show, it's a good way to begin a conversation, because oftentimes I'll get in, in a discussion about some movie or something, and I'll say, I liked it, but I liked it kind of like a 7 out of 10 rather than a 10 out of 10. And then the other person will be like, no, it's at least an 8. It's at least an 8. And then we but go into the conversation about what we like or don't like. That's the purpose that rating systems serve, is to give give it like a general communicative expression of how much a work appealed to you. And then you can build off that into discussion. Whereas, so it's, it's, it's very much so like subjective. Whereas tier lists... As subjective as they also may be, there's also a level by which tier lists are, rather than trying to give you an impression on what you feel about a particular thing, it's about categorizing. It's it's much more like, I don't think about 6 out of 10 shows or 4 out of 10 shows or whatever as a category of thing, because they're all very different from each other. Whereas when it comes to like uh, the melee, cause the tier lists were invented by melee, right, the melee community. Uh, at least in the form they exist right now, right? Like, the the popularization of tier lists came from the Melee community. When you think of the Melee characters, they are categorized strictly into tiers. Like, it's not just saying, this is my subjective opinion about what this character does. It's, here are the, like, as far as we can uh, objectively determine it based on matches, based on the best performances these characters have had, this is like the categories that they fit into. And so it's not necessarily like, for example, it might be really fun to play um, some lower tier melee character, Dr. Mario or something, might be really fun to play, but he's still in the lower tier category, the mid tier category, versus, you know, Fox and Falco, who are going to be in the top tier category, right? And the, the difference is, it's not about uh representing your opinion about a certain thing it's about categorizing different groups of thing into like this uh you know fox belongs to the same category of thing as falco does uh and i think that's how i view tier lists in general is not you know maybe the melee one is more objective than the ones that i'm normally doing but or the melee character tier list is more objective but when i'm doing a tier list i'm not thinking about like rating something on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of preference, I'm thinking of, like, categorizing it with like things. So, so like, uh, I don't know, I did a the, the TF2 maps tier list, I think. So I'm, I'm, I'm comparing, but rather than saying, like, I like this map a lot, 
I'm saying like this map fits in to the same category of, of, of types of map with these other maps, you know? And, you know, these, uh, there are certain TF2 maps that are very divisive, like Dust Bowl, for example. Some people think Dust Bowl is the best map ever, like me. Some people think Dust Bowl is the worst map ever. Um, but there are also maps that are very much agreed upon. Everyone loves Badwater and Upward, pretty much. Uh, so, th- clearly, Badwater and Upward, they share a bunch of characteristics. They're both payload maps. They both have really open skyboxes and a lot of p- potential for movement. They both have uh, uh, interesting lasts. They both have very open uh, first and second points and then kind of a closed off, uh, a more closed off or narrow third point, at least in certain aspects, like, uh, and, th- like, they they share a lot of characteristics of what makes these maps good, is they, they have a lot of openness, they have a lot of interesting terrain, they have a lot of interesting angles, there's no, like, super oppressive sniper sight lines, there's no super oppressive sentry spots until last, you know, like, they, they, sh- they are very clearly in the same category of thing. If you like, I, I don't, I think there are very many people who like one but don't like the other like they kind of come together whereas whether you like bad water and upward has very little bearing on whether you're going to like dust bowl because they're completely different maps they're 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 not in the same category of thing now i don't know what i rated these on my list but you know i if you put up if you're putting dust bowl in in like double s tier you're probably trying to make a statement, right? You're you're saying, like, uh, I don't know. Does this make any sense? Uh, to me, rating systems are more about, like, numbered rating systems are about an individual uh, thing, an individual whatever you're rating, uh, and how it appeals to you, whereas... Uh, tier lists are about uh, collections of like things. You know, I've got this kind of interesting phenomenon. Uh, there's this thing that happens to people as they get older and they sort of settle down where their friend groups... Gee, I don't know, I don't know where I want to start this story off with. I guess I'll start here. Where their friend groups just sort of shrink and they spend less and less time with their friends because they got you know, in, in your, in like middle age times, right? Like you've got a kid or two to take care of, you've got your wife, right? Or your spouse, your significant other, whatever the fuck, right? And then, you know, you, and then you, you got work and that, that's pretty much it, right? Like you spend most of your time so that you're not going insane from lack of human contact. You know, you're definitely getting human contact in the form of work and your spouse and your kid and then you just don't really have time or you can be bothered to do stuff like going out with friends a lot and stuff like this um and this this I, this is a common thing that happens to people and it's not like most people who, who end up like this don't enjoy it they just sort of end up like this by mistake and then end up not you know it's not like they lose all their friends Sometimes it happens, but most of the time it's just that, like, seeing your friends, like, as a, like, late 30-year-old, 40-year-old or whatever, becomes uh, more of a rare special occasion, maybe, and it's also, because of that, it becomes a more formal occasion. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but middle-aged people, when they hang out with their friends, they tend to go for dinner or host a dinner. It's, like, semi, you know, more formal than going out drinking, right? It's, like, slightly more formal because it's a more special and rare event and so it becomes uh more formal and the weird thing for me is that i feel like this has just happened to me early right like it's like i have dolts tonight although they're not here right now i'm alone which is depressing by the way it's very depressing living alone in a house completely by yourself it's mostly depressing when i wake up because i wake up and there's just no one and it's just like, oh, here we go, another day. It's also kind of scary. I get ang- and like anxious. Like, what if, what if I like slip and fall and like break my neck and no one like, 
no one's there to call an ambulance or something. You know, that's that's definitely worrying. But anyway, that's enough about my personal insecurities. You know, most of the time, I just have very minimal friend groups, right? Like, I have two... You guys should know this already if you're fans of the channel, but I have, like, two IRL friends, right? Young Sai and Lil Crazy Bitch, as they're known. Um, and, you know, they've been, they've been my only two IRL friends for years at this point. Um, and... Uh, you know, I see them occasionally, less and less these days. Yeah, that's not true. There was a while where I didn't see meet up with Young Sai for ages, but uh, you know, we're, we're we're hanging out a lot more recently because he was outside of London going to university for a few years, but now he's back in London and finished uni. So, uh, you know, we meet up once every couple of weeks, once every week, somewhere around that sort of timeline. Uh, anyway. So, you know, me and Young Sai meet up, me and um, Lil Crazy Bitch meet up from time to time, and uh, that's all chill. Uh, but, you know, I feel like a lot, I feel like most people have more than two friends, but I don't know mo much about most people. Uh, or maybe they meet up more often, but uh, in terms of, like, online friendships, I used to be able to say, like, ah, yes, but I do have loads and loads of online friends, right? But in terms of, like, close online friends, I don't know, I, I really, it's, it's basically just Osaka at this point, which is kind of a strange situation to have been in. To, to, it's not like I don't have a bunch of other people that I know from the internet who I would call my friends. I have a bunch of people I know from the internet who I'd call my friends. But they're not necessarily close friends that I talk to every day and would feel comfortable, you know, sharing deep shit with, like Osaka. Um, yeah, uh, for a while I was kind of worried about this, so I used to be in a, a sort of a friend group that was oriented around like, so we, we all met, which includes me and Osaka and Dotesmite, we all met because we were fans of a particular anime YouTuber called Digibo. And uh, for a while, I was in a friend group of a whole bunch of people who were all fans of this guy, now a girl. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we hung out and this friend group fucking imploded because it was a bunch of autistic retards with no conception of how to, like, be normal <laughs> to each other. So everyone just, like, I don't know, man, it just blew up in, like, the most retarded, drama-filled way possible. Um... Not that I was really paying attention to it. Like, this is the weird thing, is that I, I feel like I was the only person who didn't pay attention to any of this drama nonsense when it was happening. Uh, not to complain about it, like, multiple years after like, the fact, but when this particular friend group uh, got shattered into a million pieces and scattered off into the dust... Uh, sc scattered off like dust into the wind, I meant to say. Uh, my... My, fa my flowery... Uh, similes <laughs> don't work so well when you have to repeat them multiple times. Uh, it seems like everyone had some sort of take on this drama, but I, I never, I'm the only person I know that never gets involved in internet drama. I don't know why. I feel like everyone else just enjoys it for some reason. Me personally, I never got involved in any drama. Not really. Um, anyway. That friend group was a kind of a strange situation, right? Because everyone there, only thing we really had in common was that we were all, uh, and not just like I'm still friends with some of these people, because there was one one of the 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 group split in two, right? And one of the groups decided they hated me, even though, well, actually, it was one particular person in that group who decided that they hated me, even though, you know, I wasn't involved in any of the drama it was because I was didn't want to break off friend. I, it was sort of a situation where one group was like you can't be friends with anyone from this other group and the other group was like yeah we don't care so I ended up uh you know hanging out with the group that said that we don't care um it's just because I didn't I didn't want to stop talking to these people uh 
you know what, maybe I shouldn't be playing TF2 while trying to record a serious diatribe about my life. I want to disconnect real quick. Um, but yeah, this group was fucking weird because because it, it was all focused around Digi, and Digi had this particular friend group of theirs called the, the PCP. Um, and like the PC, part of the PCP's whole shtick was that they kind of really supported each other and encouraged each other being like creative guys. So they were all like these sort of artistic guys and they all sort of were like, an, they, they almost were like an art collective where they, a lot of it was like everyone loved each of the other members' art and they all begged each other off about it and were like, this is so amazing. Everyone was like their fav- favorite artists in whatever medium were in that group, like they're people they were friends with, right? Um, and so I think because everyone in this particular group that I was a, a, a part of is very autistic and fans of this PCP, uh, they just sort of assumed that that's how friend groups are supposed to be. And so they just sort of emulated it. The problem was that I was the only person in the friend group who made decent fucking art. <laughs> and I'm not trying to listen. I'm not trying to hype myself up here, okay? Some of the stuff that other people made was kind of neat. But, like, to put it... Look, I'm, I don't... I don't. This wasn't even when I had rec- released a bunch of the albums that I think are my best, right? It was just very obvious to me that none of them were really... And I kind of hate to use this term, but none of them were, like, serious artists. <laughs> I hate to... It makes me sound very egotistical. But, like, it's it's sort of like... Look, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with making art for fun, making music for fun, or whatever. But, like, I, it's chill. And the music wasn't, like, that most of these people were making wasn't, like, garbage, absolute dog shit, unlistenable, or whatever. It's just, you know, what you'd expect for some sort of amateur guy who doesn't really make music very often, making music. It's just like, oh, this is kind of a generic rap album, kind of a generic, you know, whatever album. Or, like, this guy doesn't really know how to use the software and is making silly noises. I guess that's fun, you know, kind of situation. Or, like, hey, this guy, those are some drawings that you would see on the internet and scroll past, you know? Like, that's the sort of vibes it was. It was just, like, very average, nothing super special kind of um, art that people were making. Uh, Mostly, you know, I don't want to necessarily say, like, dog shit, but not great, <laughs> not, nothing special, nothing like that deserves like super high praise. Now, of course, I'm, uh, you know, it's cool that they were making this stuff. You should make whatever you want to make. But like, you know, there's a clear difference between someone who pirates a cop. I, I don't mean to big myself up here, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to sound egotistical. I've just been doing music for a lot longer than these people. So, of course, I was better at it than them. And I, I don't know. I also was the only person who played real instruments. Like, you know? And look, I don't, I don't think I'm worthy of, like, super high praise. I, I think, like, some of my albums are cool. <laughs> That's basically my opinion on my own music. There was a time period where I was very, so, well, not very, but more self-obsessed. And I considered myself to be, like, really good. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a hidden underground gem. But now I go back to those albums and I'm like, yeah, these are, like, interesting sort of concepts. But nothing too good, super crazy. You know, maybe 7 out of 10 kind of stuff. That's basically how I see myself. You know, I'm not on the level of any of the... I'm not even close to on the level of any of the albums I would put on my top 100. Right? Like, none of my albums would make it into my top 100. I'll put it that way. Um, so I don't, like, I'm not out here saying I'm the best musician ever to exist or anything like that. It's just that I'm a musician. <laughs> and these guys were f- fine for, like, friends making music to show each other, you know? But, uh, that's, you might be wondering, like, what, what's the problem here? Like, this seems fine, right? Well, the, the weird thing was that they copied bar for bar the PZP thing... Now, 
if you were not an, an ex Digi fan or a Digi fan or whatever, you might not really remember this. But actually, the people in the PCP, only like four of them actually like seriously made some sort of creative work as their main thing. Like, you know, Digi was mainly a YouTuber, Endless Jess was mainly a YouTuber, um, Ben Saint made a comic, and Hippo made a comic. Right? Like, that was it. And I guess, uh, Mage was an artist, but I don't know, yeah. But no one really cared about Mage on the podcast. Uh, but like, only four out of the group were really, you know what I mean? And I guess the best guy ever also made shitty YouTube videos that everyone claimed to like. Uh, but out of those, you know, only really, if we're being honest, you know, only really Digi and Endless Jess were ever any good, <laughs> right? Um, and going back and just looking at their stuff now, it's less good than it seemed to me when I was, like, 17. Um, but I'm digressing a lot, so... The thing is that Digi specifically was really into the idea of being friends with artists, being in, like, an artist thing, and really liked some of the stuff that particularly Endless Jess made, right? And so this sort of, I think, got misinterpreted into this idea in the the friend group I was in, that it's kind of weird if you're in a friend group with artists and those artists aren't your favorite of all time, right? Which never really struck me because well, they weren't. The music that they were making wasn't very good. The drawings that they were making weren't very good. The stuff they were doing was just not very good. And I think, like, people who were in that group with decent taste should have known this, right? People who have listened to a whole bunch of music and have seen a whole bunch of art and know shit. I don't believe you when you say that album is your favorite album. Right? I don't believe you. You just like the person who made that, and you're confusing that with the, the music being good. You just listen to it, and you're like, that's my friend. I like my friend. And so you, you, you're, you're saying you like the... That's not real, you know? And this was a really weird fucking vibe, where it was like, you weren't allowed to say bad things about each other's art. Like... You, you, even when it was bad. It was a very, I don't necessarily even want to say hug boxy. It was, it was circle jerky. Even even beyond hug box, it was it was circle jerky, situation where everyone was just constantly up each other's asses, sucking each other's dicks off about how great all of their art was, when really it was mid at best, um, you know. And by the way, I generally stayed out of this and I guess received the same response from these guys because none of them really ever talked much about my stuff I guess and some of them did it doesn't really matter the thing is it was a weird fucking vibe it was a weird vibe and it was a vibe that had to implode at some point because none of these places are ever actually as friendly as they seem and it did implode. I don't, honestly, I barely even know why it imploded. I think it was basically just one guy <laughs> who got mad for some reason. Uh, had a falling out with one other guy, and yeah, that was fucking weird. Man, anyway, so that friend group out the window. Um. And, yeah, since then, you know, I have a particular group that I won't talk about publicly that I have talked to regularly for longer than I've known any of these other people, actually. Um, But they're more like... I wouldn't necessarily say close friends. Well, they're close friends, but more like... Well, let's just say it's a particular forum that I'm a part of. Let's just say that, that I've been a part of for a long time. We all know each other, but we don't talk off of the forum. Um, That's the sort of situation it is. I'm sure you can imagine this sort of thing. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I just, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I have this small friend group. And that, so for a while there, I was trying, I thought like, I went into casual TF2's Discord. A casual TF2 is one of my favorite YouTubers and seems like a really chill guy. Yeah, I've talked to him a little bit. He seems really chill. He knows my music, so shouts out to him. Um, he has good taste in music. He's good at TF2. He makes great videos. Um, yeah, I love that guy. Uh, but I ended up, I, I'm in his, his Discord server. Now, look, I, I've, I've, I hang out in this Discord. I sort of lurk, right? Like, it's a, it's a chill place. Everyone there seems relatively nice. Uh, but, and it's centered around TF2, which is my current hyperfixation. However, um, it's, you know, I think the pro I've been trying to figure out what the problem is, is with me. Like, why, why I don't seem to fit in with this community. And I think it's literally just because I'm, like, the community is just too well established for me to break into at this point. That's what it kind of feels like to me. It's just like, they're, uh, these guys have probably all been friends for years and years. You know, I barely know any of them. I know the one YouTuber. I think that's the, the it's just that all of the relationships and friendships are all well established. There's also way too many fucking people. There's like well over 100 people in the server. I can't possibly, like, that's just too many people for me. Um... So yeah, I thought I could maybe make some friends in the server, but I, I don't know. If not that there's anything, you know, these guys are really chill. These guys, like, every time I've talked to them, they've been super nice. Even when, you know, I ended up playing my first game of sixes on this server, um, and I fucking threw and made my team lose, and none of them ever flamed me, none of them were ever mean to me, you know, uh, even though I didn't know what the fuck was going on, and it was, they're super chill. Uh, it's just... I, I kind of feel awkward trying to break into their friend group like I'm overstepping my bounds. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, if their weekly sixes uh, pugs were not on an American server where I have over 140 ping, I would probably play with them all the time and then become friends like that. But I... I'm simply not willing to undergo that experience again. That that time playing sixes with these guys was just too fucking painful for me. Uh, it does not feel good to to for that to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's definitely in the way of me making friends on this particular Discord server. Um, again, nothing against these guys. They're super chill. I like all of them that I've talked to, they're all super nice to me, um, and good at TF2, <clears throat> but yeah, what, sorry, what the fuck was I talking about, how did I get here, I have no, I was talking about this middle-aged thing that I'm trying to, like, make some tenuous connection to, honestly, I don't fucking know what I'm talking about anymore, man. I was uh, I think this what the point I was trying to make made more sense in my head than it did once I tried to start talking about it out loud. I think the point I was trying to make is that like really I just hang out with Dotsmite and then like that fulfills my socialization quota most of the time and I'm not like super sociable anyway. And I meet up with my two IRL friends once in a while and I have sort of one close online friend and that's it and that's sort of chill for me uh which saying that out loud, it actually seems like I have quite a few good connections, you know? And then, uh, also, I don't hang out with those friends right now because they're in another fucking country, halfway across Europe, or actually the entire way across Europe. So, uh, you know, don't, don't know what the fuck, don't listen to me. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Hey guys, and welcome to laying around the watching, uh... Today we're going to be laying around watching Strike Witches until I find something to enjoy about it. Um, <clears throat> so the story is with me and Strike Witches that, that I had previously dropped this show on episode 2 
and given it a 3 out of 10, which seems kind of harsh, right? But I did not like episode 2 of this show for whatever reason. This was a few years ago now. I don't really remember exactly why. I remember there being... Um, uh, forced melodrama, as the, the the phrase goes. I don't know. I'm kind of bored of saying shows have, are bad because they have forced melodrama. Because forced melodrama... I mean, I think it's descriptive, but I don't know if it's... Anyway, was this, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I dropped this show on, like, episode three or two, and I gave it a three. I didn't like it, but I'm going to give it another chance because I feel like Strike Witches is one of these... It's one of these things that is an uh, archetypical otaku property. It's about cute girls with no pants on flying around doing World War II shit against aliens. No normal or reasonable person would watch this. Like, this show was made exclusively for otaku by otaku, and... Yeah, it's not very good, but that shouldn't factor into my judgment of it. Whether it's good or not, doesn't matter. What's important here is that it exists. And it was made for me. And so I want to give it another try. Because, frankly, I think... A th- look, I, I saw that I'd given it... A th- I was looking for an anime to watch, and I saw that I'd given it a 3. And I was like... I remember not liking it, but I don't remember it being like, that bad. Like, a three seems pretty bad. Like, four, I would understand. But a three is, like, this is notably bad. Like, a four is, like, yeah, this didn't really appeal to me, you know. But I was, like, was it really a three level bad? So, I'm gonna give it another try and see what happens. The problem is my fucking internet is fucking up. This is why I'm here. I was playing TF2... But then I had stopped playing TF2 because the internet was too fucked. Because these fuckers at my ISP are absolute fuckers. And bastards of all types. And they fuck me over. And I pay them money and they give me nothing back. They barely... Like, I don't understand. How hard is it to just keep the connection going? It's not that hard because they were doing it for months and months. Then you don't have to do anything. You just leave it alone. It works itself. No? The wires are under the ground. You don't have to do anything. As I understand it, here's how ISPs work. You have your router, which goes through cables over to them. They have some sort of centralized hub. And then that centralized hub branches off into the rest of the World Wide Web. That's how I understand it. That connects you to, like, the undersea cables and all of this shit. I highly doubt their centralized hub is fucked up. It might be. But if, in that case, that's... F- how did they let that happen? I don't understand. All of this stuff just works. You don't have to do anything to it. You don't have to upkeep it. You're telling me the physical wires rotted away or some shit? I don't understand these fucking idiots over it. How do you fuck up being an ISP? I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. Bastards. They're bastards in hell. They're absolute bastards. And something needs to be done about them. I'm gonna start my own ISP with blackjack and hookers. Alright, I'm gonna be honest with you. I just, I just downloaded a torrent, allegedly of Strike Witches, and frankly, I have no idea how this is possible. The file sizes are crazy small, while the somehow the quality is completely fine, like it doesn't seem to be low quality at all. It's completely fine. They have subs. They're not even hard subs. And 
Then, this is the thing that's conf extra confusing. It came with a file that is only 3.7 megabytes, but then it is all of the episodes in a row in one really long video. I don't, how, how does that work? This is like some dot .mkv wizardry that I'm not aware of. I don't, I don't understand, I mean, maybe there's some magical things you can do where that long video is just pointing at the other videos. I didn't know that was possible, that's fucking crazy. Anyway, time to watch Strike Witches. It's always funny when this happens, but, uh, in this situation, the main character's save the cat moment is literally saving a cat. It's always funny when the save the cat moment is literally saving a cat, it's like, yeah, I know about that book too. I gotta say, the character designs in this show are peak. I am making the okay hand signal with my hand right now. Uh, it's weird how the main character keeps going like, I oppose war, like I'm anti-war or whatever. Because, like, I get what they're going for. But this is a war against, I guess, like, aliens? Who are just, like, violently conquering Earth for no reason, as far as I know. I don't know, I haven't seen the rest of the show, maybe they have a reason, but... This isn't, like, I'd understand if it was, like... A real war. <laughs> but this is a fake anime war. I understand why I dropped this. Because there's definitely a, a heap of melodrama shoved into the first two episodes... Um, but it's not as bad as I remember, honestly. It's very survivable, and, um, so far episode 3 doesn't show any signs of doing this. So I think, you know, honestly, I think I'm gonna try and finish this show. Uh, frankly, I'm kind of enjoying myself. I don't think the show's great, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's reasons to like it. Let's just put it that way. Uh, yeah. So yesterday, last night, while I was watching, uh, Strike Witches, actually before I was watching Strike Witches, but for, for a while, I, I decided I wanted to drink last night. Now, this might not be notable to most 90% of people, but for me, you know, I went, like, almost a year without drinking at all, because I, I used to drink a lot, and I just kind of got bored of it. Um, well, firstly, I got bored of it, and secondly, I was trying to lose weight, and so, I, and I thought, you know, alcohol has a lot of calories in it, so I, I shouldn't drink, and even, you know, I've, I've slowly started to drink a little again, um, no, nowhere near as often as I used, you know, I used to drink, uh, at least, like, one beer every day, you know, oftentimes, like, four beers, I used to drink a lot more than I do now, <clears throat> Though that I'd be getting hammered every night, but yeah, I used to drink uh, with with a, a fair amount of frequency. Then I went like a year without drinking at all, pretty much, and then I've been slowly being like, actually, you know what, alcohol is pretty fun. It's not like I ever had a problem with it or anything like this, right? Like it wasn't like I quit on purpose. I literally just quit because oh, I I didn't even quit. I just sort of slowly drank less and less often after a while, because it was kind of boring, and I was like, but I want to, I want to do shit, you know, I was like, I want to focus on stuff, I don't necessarily want to be drunk all the time, or not all the time, but I don't want to be drunk at night time, because I'm trying to focus on something, you know, and so I started drinking less and less often, <clears throat> until I basically stopped, but then recently, the past few months or so, I've been like, you know, having fun drinking again, not crazy amounts, you know, just, just a, a little bit, Mo mainly with friends, uh, but yesterday I decided to get drunk, uh, alone, which is fun, personally, you know, I don't think alcohol is that great of a social drug, I think alcohol is better as a non-social drug, I've said this for years, uh, <clears throat> no, there was a, there was a, a bit of a risky aspect to drinking yesterday, which you're, you're hearing right now, which is the fact that I have a cold, and I knew that this would make my cold worse, and I did it anyway. 
so sorry about this. But yeah, that was a, an interesting decision for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the other reasons why I massively cut down my drinking is because I'm older now, and so I get hangovers worse. Uh, and last time I drank, which was like a week and a bit ago, uh, I I had a really bad hangover the next day. I was basically out of action for like the first half of the day. <clears throat> which is weird, because I didn't even drink that much. But yeah, I had a really bad hangover. So So I wanted to make sure that I would lessen my hangover as much as possible today. Now, you're never going to drink enough to get drunk and not have a bit of a hangover but honestly I took as many precautions as I could and I feel as good as I could possibly have expected to feel the first thing I did was I went out and I bought some vodka because vodka has the fewest of these I don't even remember what they're fucking called but there's there's this particular chemical in like whiskeys and wines and these sorts of things that uh, makes it's, it's bad, bad. It's bad in your liver and it fucks you up. But vodka is, and like anything clear doesn't have it in it. So that's why I went with vodka because it's cheap and clear. So that's, that's going to help. So I tried to drink vodka. And the second thing is uh, hi- uh, hydration, right? A lot of being hungover is lack of hydration. So I made sure to drink just shitloads of water constantly. And then the second thing is, I mixed my vodka with Powerade. And you should have seen how this drink looked, because it looked like fucking Chug Jug from Fortnite, okay? I've never played Fortnite, but I've seen Chug Jug is like blue. It looked like that. I was mixing the vodka with Powerade, because I was like, Powerade hydrates the shit out of you. So if I mix the vodka with Powerade when I drink it, I won't get dehydrated as easily. And I think it worked. It didn't taste very good. It actually tasted really bad. <laughs> I, do, I, I wouldn't recommend this this cocktail, <laughs> this mixer. I wouldn't recommend using Powerade as a mixer if you want it to taste good. It tasted pretty fucking bad. Uh, but it seemed to keep me hydrated because I feel as good as I could be expected to feel. Um... And I actually bought two bottles of Powerade, one to drink in the night and one to drink now, which I'm going to do in a minute to rehydrate me. Although I don't, I kind of don't want to drink any more Powerade. (laughs) Something to keep me, keep my my electrolytes back up and shit, right? And then the final thing I did, well, there's actually two more aspects to it. Uh, the the second one, the the next one is food. The more you eat while you're drunk, the less hungover you'll feel. This is something that I've discovered. That you gotta eat. Even if you don't really want to, even if you're not very hungry, you just gotta eat. The more you eat, especially carbs and, and fats, it helps. I don't know why. But, uh, so yeah. So before, you know, when I first started drinking, I ate a big plate of wings. And then... Uh, you know, before I went to sleep, like half an hour before I went to sleep, I wasn't really hungry because I ate a lot of wings, but I forced myself, I was like, I got to eat something. So I just ate a crumpet, just a crumpet with butter on it, which was tasty because crumpets are tasty. Um, yeah, but by that point I was pretty drunk. <laughs> so I actually dropped my crumpet on the floor, butter side down. And I picked it up, I was like, fuck it, <laughs> I just ate it anyway. Uh, but yeah, that was that was kind of chill. So eat as much as possible. <clears throat> and then i got to eat something now as well to sort me out. Uh, I think I'm going to have eggs, because eggs are always good for a hangover. Uh, and yeah, I think that's the, the key. I, I, wait, f- the final thing is sleep. you got to, you know, I... I've noticed the difference between if I, you know, get drunk and I'm sleeping on someone's fucking couch and I wake up after like five hours, four hours sleep because it's like a shitty couch with like no curtains or the light streaming. Yeah, like that situation, you feel like ass the next day, right? If you get like no sleep, you're so fucked. Whereas you get a, you know, the more sleep you get, the better. So I slept for like, I don't know how I managed this. I guess my body just just believed in me, but... I went to sleep at some point 
I think like three. <clears throat> and then this was the most fucked up moment of my life. I woke up. I looked. I needed to piss. I woke up. I looked at my phone just to check what time it was. It was like 6 a.m. But I felt terrible. I felt so bad. I woke up like six. I felt so bad. I went to piss. I was trying to fall asleep. The room was spinning. The room was spinning. Right? Trying to fall asleep. You lie down. Everything's spinning. It's terrible. But I eventually managed to get back to sleep. And by the time I woke up, it was like 1 p.m. 2 p.m. Something like that. Right? And then I felt that's plenty. That's like more than enough sleep. That's like nine hours or something. Right? I felt great. I, felt, I don't know if I'd say I felt great. I don't feel great. But the longer you sleep, the better. Because, you know, you're basically what you're doing is you're offloading the worst parts of the hangover to while you're asleep. So you don't have to go through it while you're awake. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the play. That is my hangover minimization uh, lessons for you. Is drink vodka... Mix it with some sort of electrolyte drink and drink shitloads of water while you're getting drunk. Eat as much food as you possibly can. Try and just constantly stay full. <clears throat> and uh, get get loads of sleep. Get as much sleep as you can. What was the other thing? There's probably one more thing, but I don't remember what it was. Anyway, that's the play. That's how you minimize. And maybe none none of the stuff I'm saying right now might come as a super a surprise, but as the first time that I've really specifically tried to plan out my drinking so that I can minimize my hangover. You know, sometimes I think about it, but I've never like gone in from the very get go and tried to do everything in my power to minimize my. Hangover. And it seems to have worked. I mean, most of the stuff that I feel bad is is most of the badness I feel is because I'm sick right now. Obviously, I have a, I feel somewhat hungover, but I'm not too fucked up. So that's good. And the reason I wanted to get drunk is because I wanted to watch Strike Witches. <laughs> that's not really the reason, but uh, I, I felt like it. it was, oh, I'll tell you, I kind of fucked up. So this is why I fucked up, is that I missed, I didn't do my timings very well. Uh, I, I drank way too little, so I, the other thing is that I, I tried to start drinking six hours before I thought I'd go to bed, which was timed pretty well, so I started off, and for the first literally, like, three hours, I think I barely drank anything, because I barely felt, I didn't feel very drunk at all, you know, I, I drank, I tried to, like, pour myself these two mixed drinks, and I felt like they had plenty of booze in them, but they must have not had that much booze in them. Because, you know... Or maybe I was just drinking super slowly. Because I put a bunch of ice in it. To keep keep me hydrated as well. Keep the, the drink from tasting too strong. Because it melts and keep it cold. And a uh, bunch of Powerade. So, like, my theory is that actually over the course of, like, three hours. I probably only had, like, maybe three or four shots worth of alcohol. Which of course wouldn't get you that drunk so then i was kind of freaking out after that because i was like oh shit but i've been drinking for so long for like three hours now i barely feel drunk that's kind of annoying but then i tried to keep drinking and still i like underestimated myself or something because i'm a big guy for you you know i'm a big guy for you and then i was like fuck it so i just eventually got to the point where i just poured myself some straight vodka and just chugged it, <laughs> which didn't was not a pleasant experience, I'll tell you that much, uh, especially because this is like cheap ass bottom shelf vodka, it does not taste, it tastes actually like jet fuel, it's terrible, uh, and then I reached peak drunkenness, like an hour before I was going to go to bed, so I didn't even really get to enjoy it, I like I finally reached the level where I wanted to be at, where I'm like, Okay, I'm quite drunk now. This is nice. I'm like not just buzzed, you know, but which is like something that's kind of a casual. But I wanted to get quite drunk, so I was like, "Yeah, I'm quite drunk now. This is pleasant. This is where I want to be, right? Like, I I would like to hold this level. Problem was, I didn't even get to hold that level because I fucking fell asleep. Because <laughs> I I mistimed it. I would like to have done that. Like, I would like to have gone at least two hours out of that rather than one. 
You don't want to get too many hours of that because then you start feeling really bad. <laughs> like, you can't maintain that level of drunkenness for like four hours without starting to feel really bad. But, like, at least give me two hours of that before I fall asleep rather than one. So I kind of mistimed that. Uh, but other than that, I had fun. Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm telling you guys all of this. <laughs> Probably not very interesting. Uh, this is my, my hangover tips. The thing about Strike Witches is I would have definitely liked it much more the first time if I had just watched one more episode. Because all of the pointless melodrama in the first two episodes is just in the first two episodes. And it's also not nearly as prevalent as I remember it being. There's only, like, a few scenes, and they're honestly not that bad. Um, I'm currently on episode 8, and uh, I, while I can't say it's the best show I've ever seen, uh, I don't have any, like, massive problems with it either. It's kind of a... It's much more slice of lifey than... I remembered it being, at first, it's very, it's kind of laid back, you know, you kind of just, I I mean, it's, it's, or maybe I should say it's not like super heavily plot driven, like, I I sort of envisioned it being for some reason, Um, you know, there's battles that happen, but those battles sort of take up a small portion of whatever episode they're in, and they're kind of self-contained, um, And it's also come to my attention that there was a shitload of this fucking anime. Like, it's it's relatively popular in the West, but none of the... Like, on Mal, pretty much every season sits at around a 6 point something on, like, the rating score, right? Like, it's not super well liked in in the West. I mean, I happen to know a couple of people who do like the series, but I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's, like, really obsessed with it. Um, you know, I don't know any, any people who regularly post Strike Witches reaction images or have Strike Witches profile pictures or anything. Um, but I guess it's really big in Japan, maybe. It was endorsed by the Japanese government, so I heard. Um, yeah, so far, season one, I don't know, man. It's it, I'm more so interested in what the, the show represents, because to me, this kind of reminds me of, like, a Nanoha, or a, uh, um, what the fuck's, Kido Tenshi, is that what it's called? Fucking, um, I forgot what, the, yeah, Kaito Tenshi Twin Angel, yeah. Kaito Tenshi, not Kido, Kaito. Kaito Tenshi Twin Angel, which is a a franchise which I once did a deep dive on where I watched all of it. And these sorts of, I don't know how to put it, it's like these very otaku-centric franchises that have one, like, very particular niche that they hyper-focus on. And they don't, attempt to do any sort of broad marketing or anything they have a very specific particular world with a very specific particular rules normally centered around moe i mean obviously the show draws very it it draws a very easy comparison to um uh, girls and panzer uh you know both being sort of world war ii military cute girls shows uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, the character designs are great. I'll give them that. The voice acting is generally good. The animation, you know, some of the battle scenes are surprisingly good. Uh, in terms of the writing, beat for beat... Like, on an individual level, the dialogue is very much nothing to write home about, but that's kind of the case for most anime along this line. Uh, you're not going into... You know, I there's... You know, to, honestly, there aren't that many anime where dialogue is really a standout feature, like moment-to-moment dialogue. Like, I mean, the Monogatari series stands out, obviously, with a very stylistic dialogue. 
and there are others. I mean, Azor Ken, I remember having really great dialogue. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot. Ava, obviously, is like a masterpiece in that regard. Um, and all of my favorite, you know, fucking Hidemari Sketch has amazing dialogue. Uh, fucking, what's that show called that I'm forgetting the name of right now? Come on, brain. Work. What is it called? Oh, God, it's slipping. It slipped my mind. It's one of my favorite shows. What am I doing? It's the photography slice of life one. Tamayura. Tamayura. That's what it's called. Tamayura has great dialogue as well. This does not. It just, everything's sort of very plain. There's, it's sort of very, gets the job done, doesn't really do much else, just sort of explains the basics of, like, it fulfills its basic task, kind of special. And then you have this sort of, you know, grander writing rather than like scene for scene dialogue. We're talking like episode for episode, right? Dialogue or writing as in like the plot, basically premises, uh, the broader strokes. And that's also nothing super special. I mean, the best episode so far was episode seven because it just was weird because <laughs> the, the premise of that episode is 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 essentially um missing pantsu that through a series of comedic mistakes everyone's pantsus get stolen and and then they have to try and figure out what's going on and that's kind of funny it's not super funny it's kind of fan surfacey, obviously, as you'd expect. It's it's mainly just like interesting, because they they don't just like it wouldn't be that weird for that to be one scene. Like there's a lot of anime where that sort of thing, something like that happens, and that's it's one scene that leads up to a final gag. In the middle of an episode that's about something else, but for that to be the premise of an entire episode. They do. They honestly, they find a lot to do with it. It's not. It's not. It's not badly done at all. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say that this show ever goes beyond. Like for me, at least, I I don't think the show ever goes beyond. Like, meeting the mark. So far, nothing in this show has like, really, gone beyond. Good enough. That's that's kind of my opinion. Well, I think this is pretty much... I mean, I'm not finished with it yet, but so far, I'd say a 5 or a 6 out of 10, right? Like, nothing super special. However, I see... You know what the problem is with me? Is that I see, you know, all of these series... What, you've got the original OVA, which I'll have to watch. There's not an option for me not to watch it. Strike Witches, then Strike Witches 2, then the movie, which is supposed to be good, I think. Um, and then an, an, another OVA, which I think I'll, I'll probably end up skipping, but I don't know. And then the third season, which came out, I think, last year or something, which is called Road to Berlin. And that's, like, already five things... But then you've also got the Brave Witches spin-off, which is like, you've got Brave Witches, and then there's like a, a second Brave Witches season, I think. Yeah. I think? Hold on, I need to figure this shit out. Because this has a weird watch order. Yeah, you got Brave Witches, which is a spin-off, and I think it's more comedy focused, but I haven't done that much research on it beyond that. And then what's this? This is just a special. Okay, well is then is there a season two of Brave Witches? I thought I saw that. The Strike Witches season two. Okay, whoever's done this on Mal has fucked it up. All of the, like, you know, the, the related anime section on Mal? It's all completely fucked for the Strike Witches franchise and series. They haven't even tried. Okay, I need to... Tr so, let's figure this out. Let's... 
Okay, I was confused. What I was thinking of was not... So there's two spin-offs. There's, there's the Strike Witches, then Strike Witches Season 2, and then some OVAs and movies. And then there's Brave Witches, which is a spin-off, and that has an OVA. But then there's a new spin-off, which is just in 2022, and this is the League of Nations Air Force Aviation Magic Band Luminous Witches. This is the new one, which has... Only 4,000 users on Mal, which is kind of insane, because Strike Witches is, like, clearly a big franchise if it keeps getting fucking sequels. At least in Japan, it must be big. They're still making it, so it must be profitable. Right, and so the problem that I'm trying to get at is when I see this, the little fucking completionist in my mind goes off and is like, you gotta watch all of it, man. You gotta watch all of it. Now, am I expecting to enjoy any of these that much? I think Brave Witches will... I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of comedy anime, like especially sort of slice-of-life comedy sort of stuff, so I'm, since I heard that Brave Witches is more comedy-focused, I'm expecting to like Brave Witches the best. I will let you know when I get there whether that is in fact the case, but, you know, something in my brain is just like, you gotta watch all of it, you gotta watch all of it, because then you can database it, because then you can database all of it. And this fucking Hideo Asuma book, man, I don't know, I have problems with it, but I won't lie, I'm definitely a database animal. Um, but yeah, and also what's weird is they're all made by different studios, like, Strike Witches is, is, like, hold on, hold on, hold on, so Strike Witches is Gonzo, Strike Witches Season 2 is AIC Spirits, Brave Witches is, uh, what, Silverlink, and then... This League of Nations one is Shaft. They're all made by different studios. Like, I don't think I've ever seen an anime like this. It's very strange and unique. And it just makes me even more curious. I gotta watch all of it. But this is fucked, because I know... the. Fu- I, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to spend that much time watching mediocre anime, but I have to. I imagine I would have a higher appreciation for this show if I was, A, a military otaku, and B, like, a World War II history nerd. World War II history nerds are fucking lame, let's just all admit that. Um, But, you know, whatever. We're all a bit lame. Uh, But I've never really been interested in World War II. World War II is kind of boring to me. My particular, my particular historical period of interest is medieval Europe um I don't really know why but that's what interests me I'm particularly curious about the, the, um sort of the goings on in with like The, the 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 peasantry in medieval Europe. That's that's what I'm more interested in than fucking World War Two. Who gives a shit about what fuck you? Who cares? I mean, that's I'm being too harsh. I I'm just personally not interested in it. But I I imagine there are a lot of like parallels in this show, and like stuff about it. I don't really understand why, well, I do understand it, and it, it drives me crazy, it drives me crazy how, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, look, anonymous, okay, hold on, this is, that, that, that just, I just stuttering all over myself, because I, I keep recording with a sentiment in mind, without an idea of how to start, start off presenting it. Um, 
when it comes to creating a public place for discussion on the internet, one of the biggest problems you're going to have, you're going to run into a few issues, right? Your first issue is probably going to be, the first thing you're going to run into if you try and do this, is trying to get users, right? But once you have completed that issue, once you have people using your site, the next issue you're going to run into is moderation, that you need some degree of moderation. It It's just a fact. Every, once it grows, but even, even in a small, like relatively small sized community, you're going to need some level of moderation just for spam, at least, because someone's going to come along and start, you know, CP spamming and spamming links to all sorts of fucked up shit, you know, as a bot or, uh, you know, at the very least, that's what you're going to have to deal with. If not, you know, you're trying to maintain a certain theme or atmosphere or topic, people are going to be posting off topic. You get, People are just going to harass people. You know, you're going to end up with reasons why you have to moderate whatever thing you've made, right? And the thing is, this isn't a problem that scales very well. Uh, and no one's ever really come up with a good solution for it. No one's ever really done... Like, moderation is not a problem that is easily solvable. To the point where small, independent forums run by one guy have as much difficulty dealing with moderation as billion-dollar websites like Twitter. Right, like... This is just a universal problem if you're hosting a a public platform on the internet. And yet, somehow, this is going to sound crazy, but somehow, you know who's the best at, at doing moderation on the internet? It's anonymous image boards. In particular, I think the best example of relatively strong, heavy-handed moderation. Because, you know, you've got the 4chan model, and 4chan model is relative, is kind of renowned for being loose, right? They don't moderate very heavily. Um, but they still do moderate. And one of the main things that makes the image board format so effective is, and I've talked about this before, the concept of a containment board that like you know for that was my discord notification not yours um so for example if someone and i i think this should be moderated more strongly on 4chan personally um yeah let's say someone comes into your thread and starts talking about something that's completely off topic complaining or whatever you don't have to come up with rules to like you know, uh, oh, this particular thing is banned, or this particular, you don't have to do it, all you have to do is say, like, well, hey, look, there's actually a, a place you can go if you want to talk about this, just don't talk about this here, this is the board for talking about this subject, if you want to talk about politics, go to the politics board, if you want to talk about video games, don't come to the anime board to talk about video games, you have a video game board, you actually have, like, five of them, go over there, talk about it, right, like, that's fine, and the thing is, there's nothing you can complain about with this situation because you're just going to, like, the problem's going to solve itself. The people who who want to talk about politics or video games or whatever the fuck are going to just go to where you can talk about that freely and everyone else is also talking about it because what they want to do is talk about that thing. So you've instantly, you know, shut down the problem of off-topic discussion. And off-topic discussion tends to be what derails threads and, and shits up boards. So you just need to have a place to point these people and be like, please, you know, feel like you can, you can talk about this. I don't have a problem. Just do it over there. Just like, make sure that you're, you, you have this place where you're free to talk about this. And it's literally so effective that it's been used as a containment mode multiple times in the past. You know, when My Little Pony was first blowing up, there was a lot of MLP posters shitting up 4chan, who were being very annoying to the people on other boards who didn't care about MLP. And so 4chan created an MLP board specifically to satiate them. All of the pony posters went over there, and it solved the problem 
mostly. Um, <clears throat> you know, and now no one cares about MLP anymore, and that board is dead. But, you know, it's good that it existed in the first place. Same thing happened with VTubers more recently. VTuber posters shitting up JP make a VTuber board. The reason they're doing it is because they don't have anywhere else to post about this stuff. If you give them a board to talk about it, if you provide them with a place where they can, you know, actually have the discussions they want to have, they're not going to come into every other fucking place and shit it up. So you make you make the VTuber board, all the VTuber fans go over there and talk about their annoying fucking Niji Sanji bullshit, you know, in the place with other people who enjoy talking about that sort of thing. It's a great fucking system. Except, you know, this works generally when you have kind of a loose moderation standard. Because 4chan, yeah, it's loose. But what if you want, like, a little more of a comfy environment? Well, there's actually an anonymous image board in the same style as 4chan that has completely figured this out. Now, partially, it works because it has a small user base. And I don't know how well this method would scale up to a website the size of 4chan, let alone a website bigger than that. Although, there should be no websites bigger than that, let's be honest. Um, <clears throat> and this place is called Sushi Chan. And uh, Sushi Chan has a really great system where they basically have one big rule, which is keep it comfy. Uh, that, that you don't post uncomfy shit. And the the mod team whoever it is i i don't think it's very many people if you if you, it it doesn't fucking matter if the beginning of the thread if the op was comfy or not it doesn't matter if the thread starts getting uncomfy people start shitting it up you know it gets moved to the board called hell where uncomfy things exist and so if you don't want to see uncomfy things you don't go on hell if you want to if you and if you're in the middle of this discussion and you've started raging about politics or whatever bullshit you're, you know, getting uncomfy about, if you started raging, you can keep doing that and you can keep having your dumb internet argument and whatever, and everyone else can still see it if you're wanting to follow the drama or something like that, if you're getting, you know, enjoying watching people fight on the internet and you want to join in even, you can still do it. Like, no, no one's freedom or ability has been taken away. It's just, you just do it in hell, where it's been moved to. The thread has now been moved to hell, right? The hell board. And if you only want to see that, you can go to the hell board and browse, browse all those threads. But if you don't want to see it, no one else has to fucking see it. And that's how it should be. And then, for posts that are even worse than that, that are not just uncomfy, but, like, actively bad... From, for some particular reason, like, even worse than the post that would just be deemed uncomfy and moved to hell. And this thing is sometimes controversial, don't get me wrong. Like, sometimes threads get moved to hell and people are, like, get mad at it because threads that get moved to hell tend to die because very few people willingly browse hell. Although, very few people browse the site in general. The chances are, if you're, po if you're th I'm sorry, complaining to Sushi Chan users now who are fucking some of the retards, if you're complaining that your thread got moved to hell, maybe don't shit it up in the first place. If it got moved to hell, it was probably going to die anyway because people would have found it annoying and not engaged in it. But, for posts that are even more, I, I hesitate to use this very overused term, but toxic, uh, there's actually another board, which is called uh, Super Hell. And on Super Hell, this is the place where bad threads go to die forever. And um, in Super Hell, the threads get moved there, but they get locked. So you can no longer actually uh, reply, right? They just stay there closed. And this is great because you can still read them. And, and also, the threads in hell, you can toggle to show up in the overboard, which is like a board that, that shows posts from all boards. Threads from Super Hell don't show up in the overboard at all. Uh, and they get locked, so you, you can never reply to them again. And this is great, because it means you have a whole bunch of legal... You basically have legal precedent on an image board, where you can see the sort of posts that, that you're not allowed to, to talk about, 
right? You can see the post. Rather than just deleting things that that people don't like, you have a record, an archive of the shit that, uh, you know, is not appropriate. And uh, yeah, it's just there, and you can read through it. And sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes you see funny, like people who are going around schizo posting. Like there's a thread on Super Hell, which is just a, a a single post that immediately got moved to Super Hell, which is just a guy making a complete schizo post about the Bible, just like an absolute incomprehensible schizo post about the Bible. Um, and threads don't get moved here very often. You know, it's very, it's actually very rare that threads end up in, um, in super hell. Only the, like, worst of the worst, right? Like, like, uh, very obvious spam, stuff like that, very obvious schizo posts, or really, like, stupid, um, how do I put it? Like, obvious political bait posts, like, stuff I can't repeat on YouTube, um, generally speaking it's like religion and politics <laughs> a lot of it's religion and politics which are explicitly deemed uh uncomfy topics uh but yeah there are some threads on suji chan that i feel like are like fucking on the edge where it's like should they be in hell or should they remain in this board like i'm i look at some of these these threads and i'm like this is a little uncomfy i'm surprised this isn't in hell yet but the thing is, if the replies get too uncomfortable, it'll get moved to hell. And then it's there. And then I can't complain about it, nor do I want to. And all of this without accounts or identities. This is an anonymous image award. You don't have to sign up to post here. Isn't that great? You don't have to give some random guy your fucking email address to post. You can just post. That's great. That's wonderful. And it's It's great. <sighs> yeah, I think Sushi Chan basically solved the problem of internet moderation. You have your containment boards, and then you have the special containment boards for things that are like bad threads, and then an even special containment board for things that are like completely unacceptable. It's great. This is how everything should be. But the problem is not everything can be this way because I think, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know why the internet has gone. And I think it's because normies are retarded and unable to like think of their own interests. Like, like, like on an image board, you have to have an interest. So like you go to 4chan, you see the board list and you have to click on something that you're actually interested in. You have to be like, I want to read about uh, Japanese culture. So you go on JP, or like, you know what, I'm interested in conversations about extreme sports, you go on XS, right, like, you have to actually have an interest first, rather than just spewing, and this is why 4chan is like, people actually have discussions on there, right, and talk about, about stuff, whereas on like Twitter, you know, most of what you see on Twitter is just some random. Oh my god, I hate Twitter so much, and all of the and and the worst thing is Twitter is like the best of the of all of the social medias, and that's saying a lot because Twitter is really fucking bad, but you know it's not as vapid as like Instagram is. <sighs> I mean, Reddit is kind of like this, you know? Like, Reddit has subreddits. Um, but the problem with Reddit... Well, there's a bunch of problems with Reddit. Uh, that that lead to it being less discussion-focused is... Uh, firstly, they have endless scroll on your, your, your feed. Uh, endless scroll is the thing that ruined the internet. Uh, you can just scroll forever on your feed... And your feed is just OPs. It's just the first posts. It's not about discussion. Right? So that's that's a problem. And secondly, there are accounts and upvotes. And people do stuff for fake internet points instead of for discussion. Uh, which is fucking retarded. Because 
people on 4chan have been making high effort OC for well over like decades now uh, for, for no fake internet points or anything just because it was funny for a thread and they wanted to do it you know Look, I, I think, I, I wouldn't be against the moderation on 4chan being more heavy-handed when it comes to politics. This is my opinion. I think that, that generally speaking, board mods on 4chan ought to be more strict with keeping politics to poll. I, I don't think they're strict enough with it, and it's kind of fucking uh, bad. Which you know, I think that a, a better it would be it would be really nice if there was some way to like have a democratic moderation system on these sites, you know. Whereas instead of having, you know, mods that just have or jannies who have absolute control, and it's just by their discretion. Instead, you get like, you know, you can basically vote for a thread to be moved to a different board, or uh, you know, this sort of thing. I feel like that would be a good way of doing it. And then once it, like, reaches a certain threshold of votes, uh, then it, then it just gets moved automatically. That would, that would, that would seem to be a good system to me. Or something like that. Or, I don't know exactly how it would work, but some sort of automatic voting system. Uh, it would have to be, like, pretty tough to do. Like, because otherwise it would just be abused, right? Like, it would have to be relatively... I, I guess the problem is people would probably make bots to do this sort of thing, so it might not be tenable. Anyway, that's just my, my two cents. But yeah, Sushi Chan just has the best moderation system on the internet. And it only works because the, the website is small, uh, but all websites should be small. Okay, so I finished Strike Witches Season 1. Oh, animal. That was weird. There was like the sound of animals fighting. I, I guess it was foxes. Then there was another fox. I couldn't see the um, the main fight, but then there was another fox just standing there, like completely still for ages, just staring. And I couldn't tell if the fox was looking at me, because it would definitely have seen me out the, from where I was standing. But it was just standing there for ages just completely still anyway I, f I finished strike watches um honestly i'm kind of conflicted about this show uh the first like section of the show i'd say the first until they go to the like main base and begin the sort of training arc i guess uh it kind of sucks i wouldn't say it's like awful but it's not the height of the show for me. There's a lot of unearned emotions. There's a... It's sort of hard to judge what's going on. They definitely kind of shove you into the deep end. I feel like it'd be better... You know, I understand the function it serves as a narrative. It's, like, supposed to show how the main character like becomes... Goes from being someone who's not interested in war or fighting in any way... And sort of the emotional happenings in her brain, what she goes through that pushes her to actually become a, a, a you know, a strike witches. So, and it, it does, like, function, I guess. But it, it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't super work very well. Uh, I mean, it does set up her motivation and that stuff's not, like, terrible. But the context surrounding it leaves me a little unsatisfied. It leaves me kind of feeling like it was pointless. Like, all of those events didn't really matter, except... Like, they were just happening in service of the main character, rather than, like, existing in a world, you know? Um, and a lot of the emotion... I, I said this again, but, like, it, it definitely felt like a lot of the emotional stuff kind of was unearned. Like, there's a lot of big music swells and close-up emotion emoting face shots and stuff like that when it's like we don't really have a connection to any of these characters we don't really have any reason to care if they're in danger or really understand like what it even means for them to be in danger we don't really have an understanding of like power levels in the world yet like super well 
um, uh, the context of the war, like the, that the the kind of didn't work super well for me. Then you have like the the main thrust of the show, the mid sort of portion of the show. Um, and this stuff, I it's kind of more slice of lifey. Uh, kind of a little bit monster of the week kind of stuff going on where it's like kind of slice of lifey they're doing training they're hanging out with the facility the base kind of area getting to know each other a little bit of yuri fluff which is generally well executed the yuri stuff in the show varies it's either like sometimes it's just you know fan service it's kind of boring but sometimes it's genuinely effective and, like, cute. Uh, kind of quaint, I would almost say, in a good way. In an endearing way. Um, so I, I do like the, the Yuri aspects of the show. I don't think they were, they were done badly by any means. Uh, although it's not the main focus, I think uh, they, you know, other shows might put some Yuri stuff in the background just you know, as bait, was this show is a little less subtle about it, it's like, yes, these characters are gay, you know, like, kind of up front, um, especially the main girl, which is Kino, um, uh, but these episodes, while good, uh, they kind of aren't anything special, like, they kind of blend together, uh, there's a few standout moments. Uh, episode 7 is definitely memorable for just being particularly wacky. But most of them, you know, I can't even really differentiate from what, like, looking back, trying to remember. I can't even really differentiate one episode from the next. They kind of all, all are kind of like a blur. Nothing really happens, which is fine, because it's going for more of a slice of lifey thing. But... There's not really any, like, super meaningful emotional highs and lows. Um, There's definitely a lot of work going on in the background in terms of characterization in these episodes, which I think is generally well handled, well enough. Um, But nothing, like, super impressive or uh, something that would really resonate emotionally with me. Uh... You know, and it being slice of life doesn't mean you can't also have that sort of thing. You know, like, take, uh, I don't know, Tamayura, for example, very slow slice of life, nothing much really happens, and yet it's, like, super emotionally resonant and powerful in many different ways. Uh, if you haven't seen Tamayura, go watch Tamayura. Okay, the fir- the OVA, the first four episode OVA, is, is, you might not be into it after finishing the OVA, but just watch Hitotose and more, like just keep watching until like three episodes into Hitotose. And then if you don't like it, you can drop it. Uh, anyway. And then you get to the ending of the show, which I guess like the last three episodes. Where there's actually some pretty good intrigue. Um, like pretty well done stuff where it's like something is revealed because I this is like one of my problems with the show when I was during that mid section and even the the beginning section was thinking like I mean they're finding this kind of very generic bad guy who's just like alien with no feelings like it just kind of spoilers by the way um it's like they're finding this this sort of general nebulous force who are like ostensibly really powerful but they never really have much problem defeating them. Like, it's never really... They're never really in that much danger. So it's like, you know, this the force that supposedly wiped out all of Europe and, like, conquered most of Europe is, like, pretty easily wiped out by a few girls with, like, flying attachments and guns. It just seems a little strange. That's never really explained. Uh, I guess the point is that they're, like, fighting stragglers, essentially, like, individual stragglers, and that, like, the real invasive force would be, like, hundreds of these Neroi that they're fighting, which I guess would be pretty impressive and powerful, but they never really show the full might, which is a little unfortunate, even in the finale. (laughs) Like, 
the main when when you're watching like a a show about battles, whether it be a shonen or whatever, what you really want is for you want to be able to feel like your characters can actually lose, um, <clears throat> and that that way it's much better to root for them. It feels like the fights actually have stakes and so on. This is why Hunter Hunter is the best shonen. Right, because the characters it keeps the main characters weak through the whole thing. This is why everyone loves Jackie Chan films, because Jackie Chan always starts every fight from the bottom and works his way up until winning through pure determination. Uh, right, like he always starts at a disadvantage. Whereas, <clears throat> you know, the fights in this show seem relatively trivial. Um, they are well animated and well choreographed, though. I'll give them that. Um, but, yeah, the, the midsection of the show kind of blends. The final section does a, a good... Um, it's not a twist, right? It's more like a, some interesting... It's like the, the, the scope of the world expands in an interesting way. And, uh, <clears throat> well, it's something that isn't, like, super original or crazy, it's, like, fairly effective, I think, um, like, it works, um, like, it's not super smart, but it's not trying to be super smart, it's just, like, and, yeah, they, they pull it off, I think it's pretty, it, it, it works pretty well, I think it wraps up too quickly in the final episode, but, um, I guess there is a second season, so it didn't really wrap up, (laughs) Uh, but the the sort of arc they're going through kind of yeah yeah I think it kind of feels a bit rushed the the ending but uh, better rushed than to drag on for too long um, yeah so I think the show really peaks right towards the final three episodes uh, <clears throat> which leaves me in a bit of a tricky position because you know the main like you can assume the Sort of the peak of the show, I would give it like, like like the final three episodes, I would give a like a seven out of ten. The first three episodes, I would give like a four or a five maybe. And in the mid section, it's like a six. <clears throat> so I think I have to give the show a six, averaging it out, even though you know the peaks are actually higher than a six. Like, maybe ideally I would give it, like, a 6.5. But it's also kind of recency bias because I just watched the fi- the best part of the show and the, the worst part of the show was uh, yesterday. You know? Um, but do I recommend it? I mean, I, I'll, I'll say if you like... Hmm. I don't know. I think the show is definitely carried in some aspects by its aesthetics. Like, the visuals of, um, you know, you've heard of, (laughs) here, (laughs) you've heard of Girls und Panzer, now get ready for Girls and Pansu. Um, the, the, just the imagery of anime girl with kimono mimi and a tail with these weird-ass flying things that function essentially as, like, thigh highs because they create this zetai ryoki with the pantsu just flying around in the air carrying massive guns. Like, if that imagery is powerful, I, it's, a, it's just, like, a generally aesthetically pleasing image, right? Like, <clears throat> for an otaku. So if you're the sort of person that can be affected by that sort of thing, which I am, like, if if that sort of, just, on a sort of cerebral, or, like, post-cerebral, like, idea level, abstract level, (coughs) base, categorical level, maybe I should say, if you have a, if that, that seems like something that's, like, categorically appealing to you, then you should watch the show. If you, if that imagery does not stir any emotional reaction to you, to, within you, you, that you don't care about, like, seeing fucking, like, flying anime girls with cat ears and giant guns and no trousers or <laughs> in their pantsuit, if that doesn't 
cause you to have an emotional reaction from visualizing it, then you will get nothing out of this show. Um... But the jury is still out until I finish everything that exists in this universe, which I think will take me a few more days. You know what's a fundamental problem with the current standards of modern video games, AAA video games, and their realism? Is that because... And this is really only applies to third-person games, right? It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a first-person game, because you don't see it. But character animations, these systems are very advanced and realistic and, you know, responsive and simulated, right? Like, you watch a character moving around the world, and they seem to, like, you know, have a, have a lot of weight to them. They don't skid around on the floor, like... They're sort of moonwalking everywhere. They don't turn in place by, like, magically rotating, right? Like, they seem to actually have weight. Their feet don't clip through the environment and so on, right? They look a lot like real people moving around. The character you control. Now, the problem with this, and I've never seen anyone else talk about this, is that now that we have these super realistic-looking characters moving in very realistic-looking ways... It's the video game characters don't actually move in a realistic way. Because the way most people move around is to walk everywhere. And that's super fucking slow and boring in a video game. Video game characters run everywhere. And they run fast. So you watch, you know, clips. And this isn't a problem in every game. You know, some games... uh, I'm thinking about the Dark Souls series, for example. Like, Dark Souls characters, they may kind of jog... But they generally move kind of slowly as part of that game's design, Uh, right? But, you know, I'm looking at some footage of this new Star Wars game, and it's just so goofy watching this guy just take off at a full sprint. Just in every everywhere he goes, he just instantly takes off at a full sprint constantly. It's very funny, and I don't know, it's (laughs) it's a bit distracting, to be honest, you know? Like, watching this guy just full, like, sprint as fast as he possibly can around the world is just very strange. Am I crazy for thinking this? I've never heard anyone else bring this up. Uh, But, yeah. I don't know, man. Realism was a mistake. Okay, well, I got my daily gaming in for today played some, uh, you're gonna be surprised by this one, you're gonna be so surprised by this one, played a little bit of Team Fortress 2 today, actually, changing it up, switching it up, you know, <laughs> decided to play some Team Fortress 2 today, you'll never guess what class I was playing, I was actually playing as Demo Man, I know, I'm switching it up, I'm just trying to be more spontaneous, you know, make changes in my life, oh, but yeah, I did, did my gaming, I actually did, uh, some cleaning today, which I'm proud of myself for, but, not that proud of myself for, because, well, for two reasons. Firstly, I didn't do that much. I did some important stuff that needed to get done. I mean, I did my laundry, for example, which had started piling up. First time I'd done my laundry in ages, because uh, when Dotsmite was staying with me, that was their, one of their chores, you know, we divided the chores up amongst ourselves, and one of their chores was the laundry, uh, so this is the first time I'd done it in ages, but did that. Uh, I, you know, I've always been really reluctant to do, I, I don't mind putting the clothes in the, that stuff's all fine. The stuff, the bit that I have always hated ever since I was a kid is taking the laundry from the washing machine and going to hang it up to dry. And I only figured out, like, a year ago-ish, the like, the reason I really hate that particular chore more than any other chore is that it's, it's like an autism sensory thing with wet clothes. I also have it with wet hair. Like, I really hate the feeling of touching wet clothes and wet hair. It's very, very unpleasant for me. But, did it anyway. Uh, tidied up, just in general. The reason I mention this is because I'm trying to get into the habit of... I'm just gonna, like, when I wake up, I've purposefully placed my caffeine pills in the front room. So I have to get out of bed and go to the other room to get caffeine. Which is something I'm gonna do every morning. 
right? And that if I can then convince myself, once I'm in that room, which is where most of the mess is, to do 15 minutes, just 15 minutes of timer on my phone of cleaning every day, I think that's enough to just always keep me on top of cleaning. And if 15 minutes isn't enough, I can up it to 20 minutes or half an hour. But just like in the morning, as soon as I wake up, I go to the other room anyway because I need caffeine. It's like just take 15 minutes to empty the dishwasher or do whatever needs to be cleaned. right? And then maybe, you know, just doing bit by bit, eventually I'll end up having the room be uh, clean. And I can go from like, I'm I'm hoping that the 15 minutes is like enough by where I can both keep on top of everything and also because I think a lot emptying the dishwasher or stacking the dishwasher probably takes five minutes right um and that's the main sort of chore I guess and then that means I have another 10 minutes for other chore which could include throwing away trash and then hopefully you know vacuuming and all of the other chores that need to be so that that's my my goal is that, that in the morning I go to the other room to get caffeine I put a timer on 15 minutes and I do some cleaning uh, if that's not enough I'll raise it um, <clears throat> but anyway uh, it's time to uh, time to to, to to watch some Strike Witches season two uh, I'm gonna try and watch all of all of Strike Witches season two tonight uh, I think I have enough time to do that let's see it's ten. I would see like three, so what is that? Ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three. Yeah, perfect. Perfect timing that I can watch a whole season of anime. Um Fuck, I was gonna say oh yeah, so I've started working on this album, right? I I mentioned this. I actually haven't been working on it today, but I've been generally working on this album. And you know, I I've decided to, to try something new. Uh, I don't know if I should even be necessarily talking about this, but you know Valve, the video game developer? Um, one of the things that makes their games good is that they playtest more than any other studio. They do a lot of playtesting, uh, like early and and a lot. Early and often playtesting. And I'm wondering if maybe that's an approach that could work for music. Obviously games being an interactive medium it's going to be kind of different but i want to try and get some like negative feedback on some of these songs because i'm listening back to them and i feel like the mix is off but i'm not going to get any any useful information from people on the mix because no one who's not a music person knows how to like talk about that sort of thing um but maybe i can get some notes on composition or something that would be interesting I don't really know what I'm hoping to achieve, but I might go around sending this to a few people and just see what happens, because I like the idea of everyone listening to the album, all of my friends listening to the album at the, at the, for the first time at the same time, but um, yeah, I don't I don't know, I'd maybe just try it out, see what happens, see if the feedback I get is actually useful, if the feedback I get is not useful. And I'm not just saying negative, right? I want that. I specifically ask for negative feedback. If the feedback I get is just like very vague and not useful, then I will not do it again. But I think it's something that might be an interesting idea, because I do. I actually really want this album to be good. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna watch Strike Witches now. Well, I'm uh, halfway through the second episode of season two. I gotta say. I think this season looks way better than season one. Okay, I say, okay, it's actually marginally better, not way better. I think this season has better animation quality and uh, background drawings, uh, which is probably due to the change in studio. I can imagine that there's, you know, it's a matter of taste. I'm talking on a purely technical level, you know, in terms of how much I personally like either style they're kind of subtly different i think i like them both the same season two looks a bit more modern um but they both look fine um but i'm wondering if it's maybe because i was watching season one in like relatively low quality whereas this is like 720p um so maybe that's just the difference i'm noticing they also 100 percent poured they did the classic anime thing which for some reason seems to be common in this type of like otaku oriented 
like hyper otaku oriented franchise anime where they pack all of the animation budget into an a- into an action scene in the first episode uh but no i think the effects animation looks great the character animation is more expressive than the previous season and the backgrounds are, off, are more detailed uh you know in a lot of ways on a technical level i think this does look better um in terms of content you know this show does doesn't really have much plot going for it so i'm going to i'm going to leave my judgments on that until a bit later to any my anime list users listening i want to impart a fact on you and it's a fact that you're not prepared to hear about how to use this website which is i've i i, I the 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 episode count feature where you can mark what episode you're on ought to be used for which episode you have started not which episode you have finished because otherwise if you started watching a show at episode 1 and then you dropped it it would show that you hadn't watched the show you'd watched zero episodes which isn't true you have started watching the first episode like let's say you start watching a show and it's the worst thing you've ever seen so you drop it you know it, it doesn't make sense to say you haven't watched any episodes and yet you've dropped it you have to have watched at least started the first episode and then when you get to the end of the show you finish the t- you know it might be like well the 12th episode is weird then or the 26th episode is weird then because you would mark it as started then you finish it and you don't have the next episode to mark but that's why you have the completed tag you can then mark it as completed when you finish the episode when you start the episode this is i believe the objectively correct way to use mal when you start the episode you you add that episode and then when you complete the show you mark it as completed it's not the episode count doesn't count how many episodes you've completed it compounds counts how many episodes you've started this is how i believe the site should be used so i don't know if it's just that the series has like clicked with me or something but i'm actually really enjoying season 2 of strike which is um i feel like the writing is much stronger uh now that i'm like you know halfway through the series uh you know, again again i think the first two episodes were kind of weak kind of got off to a to a weak start um not that they were terrible but just kind of weak but the characterization feels way stronger in this season that like you know in the previous season each character that was defined by their like central anime trope and whatever right you got the sundere you have the right you and whatever right uh was in this season the tropes are still it's still trope centric but i feel like the characters are much more well rounded and i they're also more endearing like i want to root for them more um like it feels like i understand why they're fighting and like what they want to protect uh the fights with the neuroi are also more interesting like they've come up with more interesting gimmicks um for for the neuroi to sort of spice the action scenes up and the action scenes are more frequent and better ex- better choreographed and better animated. So yeah, season 2 is definitely an improvement over season 1. Like I would feel pretty comfortable giving this a 7 so far. Um, you know, it's definitely a lower end of a 7, right? Like probably like a um close to a 6 to an 8. But uh yeah, no, I'm definitely enjoying it. There are definitely a lot of like weird world building slash logic things in this show. I mean, the number one thing that comes to mind that is always very noticeable is that the entire world is very militarized because it's very like built into this World War Two setting, right? That like World War Two was was going on. I don't remember the exact setting either it was just about to begin or it hadn't begun yet or it, it was like just early days whatever and then the Neuroi came, came about right and everyone everyone put their differences aside to fight the Neuroi 
who are alien bad guys. But like the world's, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, they the like part of the point of the show is to appeal to World War Two history otaku with like cool ships and stuff, right? But these warships and planes don't fucking do anything. They are very clearly shown repeatedly to be utterly useless against the Neuroi. Only the witches have any hope at defeating the the Neuroi for some reason. It doesn't really make any sense because they're using... I mean, maybe the weapons that they use are like magical and that's why. I, I'll give them that. It doesn't matter. But in which case, you know, battle cruisers are fucking expensive. Warships are like one of the biggest investments an army can make. They're one of the most expensive single items in the world, right? And they require huge crews, all of whom are doing fucking nothing to actually fight anyone. They're just all repeatedly shown to be useless. Even the ones that are aircraft carriers, their aircraft launch and then just don't do it. They just get shot down and they're completely ineffective or ineffectual. What's the correct word there? I don't know what the correct word there is. It's either ineffective or ineffectual. One of them. Could be both. Uh, but only the witches seem to be able to actually take down the Neuroi. Which is just very confusing. Because there are very often situations where it's like, oh, there's a large fleet of warships in the sea. This happened in both seasons, right? And they, the witches have to come and protect it. This is how season one basically starts. This is how season two kind of starts. And then multiple other episodes in both seasons have similar kind of events, right? Where there's warships and the witches are fighting from the warships and protecting them. Because the warships are fucking useless. And they're traveling in a fleet. And the Neuroi's like laser beam attacks just like slice the warships in half like it's fucking nothing. Like they don't even stand a chance. So the question is, what are you, what are these fleets doing? Like, why are you there? You're not helping. <laughs> You're just sitting there. You have all these high-ranking military guys with crews of, like, hundreds of men on these ridiculously expensive ships sailing around the oceans as if you're doing a war, but they're completely fucking useless. Why are they still doing this? Like, they should just be sending... If the entire point of them is just to get the witches near to the Neuroi faster, if they're in the middle of the ocean... Just use smaller boats. There's no reason to have these gigantic warships. Because they're not doing it. They clearly don't do anything. Like, they're... I can't stress this enough. It's like the show wants you to notice this. Because they are repeatedly and often shown to be ineffective. To not be capable of defeating the Neuroi. Like, it's very strange. Like, it doesn't make any sense in the setting. Why is the like, all of this World War II military technology being deployed and actively used in a war that you never see because it doesn't exist, because all of that technology is repeatedly shown to not work, and yet they keep using it to do something. Like, when they're protecting the Yamato, right, most famous Japanese warship, right, the Yamato shows up and gets in a fight, and the, the witches have to protect it from the Neuroi, right? They're using their shield magic, and they have to defeat the Neuroi. The Yamato has big-ass guns, and it fires on the Neuroi, and it does some damage, like, like there's a bunch of explosion effects, but it's, like, to show how strong the Neuroi is, because in the end, it doesn't actually do anything, and it takes the main character to defeat them, right? Uh, <clears throat> which is how it always goes with these ships. And then, you know, they're like, oh, we got to turn back the Yamato because it's crucial for this mission, even though it means leaving these witches, which is like, I'm disgraced that I have to do this, but I have to turn back because the Yamato has to survive so that it can be, be here for this crucial mission. And I'm just thinking, what fucking crucial mission? This is one Neroi that your Yamato is completely useless against. What uses what is what is it doing? What mission? What could it possibly be useful for? Like, 
you're not transporting, you're, it doesn't even make sense as like just transporting troops because there's never troops that do anything. It's only the witches that do anything. And they can fucking fly. <laughs> so that whole aspect of the show makes zero sense when you think about it for more than two seconds. Un unless I'm missing something, but I don't think I am. I think that the, 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 the warships and planes are just there because it's World War II and they think it's cool. That, but it doesn't make a lick of sense in the actual world of the show. Very strange decision, in my opinion. Um, and now for a much more specific nitpick. In Season 2, Episode 9, the main conflict or thrust of the episode, the, the inciting incident of the episode is that one character, uh, there's a, uh, a a particular bridge somewhere that's broken, and because this bridge is broken, it means the children from one side of the river can't get to the other side of the river to go to school and meet up with their friends. And this makes this one character very sad, and so she's trying to do stuff to raise money to repair the bridge, right? It's kind of a dumb plot point. It doesn't really matter. It's just to drive the fun adventure romp where they go looking for treasure, right? Which is a fine episode. But the problem is, again, it doesn't make any sense because if they just need to cross the river, that you just need to knock down one tree and lay it across the river. Or, you know, it's not very difficult to build a temporary bridge. Like, sure, it might not be as safe as a full stone and brick and concrete and cement bridge that was there before, but, like, the gap that's broken isn't that big. Like, you could easily just repair it with, like, freely available wood. And, you know, even a tr one tree. Just fell one tree and just lay it across the river. They're fucking children. They can crawl across a, a fallen tree to cross a river. They'll probably have fun doing it. You know, I did that as a kid. Small rivers. <laughs> Stream, maybe puddle maybe <laughs> but like you know that's not that crazy that's like a normal thing to happen but instead she's like aha the only solution i must go looking for buried treasure to raise funds to repair the bridge and then the end of the episode you know the problem gets solved the children go off and they build their own fucking repairs out of wood without even none of it even mattered they just build a wooden repair section of the bridge so it's like the whole conflict of the episode didn't make any sense because, like, the main character has to forget about the existence of wood. It, it's it's a uh, like the episode itself, like the main thrust of the episode is actually pretty fun, but there's a bunch of these like details where particular incidents, particular plot points, particular beats of the narrative, just like completely don't make any sense if you think about it for a second and it's like a repeated thing in this show where there's like something will happen that just doesn't make any fucking sense and then it just but it just happens because it has to happen like there has to be something for the plot to happen but normally you know like these warships or this bridge as these two examples right it's never the central thing for the plot it's just something that is happening in the background to enable the main thing to happen. It's like, the main thing in this situation is the adventure to go find treasure, which, you know, all follows cartoon logic, but in a good way, like, it's fine. Or the warships, it's like, there's tension, there's stakes to this battle, we have to protect these, this fleet, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it adds stakes and tension, right? It's good. Like, it's never the main actual conflict that's broken it's just some surrounding detail that is massively broken it's like a a, a common reoccurrence in, in the show's writing which is kind of weird but i mean I, I can overlook it it's not like a huge deal it's kind of nitpicky to, to mention even but i mean it's not super nitpicky because some of this stuff is really obvious 
Okay, so maybe I should have picked a different ship to complain about. Specifically, the Yamato has a purpose in the show that is comes back in the last two episodes. Okay, specifically that one, but all the other ones serve no purpose. Well, it's quarter past 5 a.m. now, and I just finished Strike, which is season two. Um... I'm not going to go into too much detail, because if you don't, well, I don't know, but I'm just fucking tired, and I already talked about the show as I was watching it, but yeah, I think I, the show's definitely a small but noticeable step up from the first season, um, and uh, at some point, you know, this the show just really clicked with me, I feel like, where something about the characters just endeared themselves to me after spending some time with them uh, and while a lot of the stuff about the show might not be super well thought through, super robust uh, I think there's a, a a heart at the the core of of the narrative and of the characters especially it's very much character focused above narrative focused which is why like the narrative being kind of dog shit doesn't really matter like the entire the only interesting thing they did with the story is towards the end of season one where spoiler alert there's some reason to believe that there's more to the Neuroi than just faceless alien baddies. That they actually have come to communicate with, with humans. And they're capable of communicating with humans. And they actually have more complex wants than just to destroy the world. That's kind of the entire premise of the ending of season one. And then season two immediately does away with this concept and returns them to just being evil, baddie, shapeless, generic. I don't know if I can call it generic, but nothing. You know, no motivation, no depth. They're just antagonists who fill the role of antagonist for the sake of being antagonists and nothing more. Which is kind of lame, because it's like the one interesting thing the narrative could do Which is, like, the most basic, interesting thing a narrative like this could possibly do. It's not even asking that much. Just have the antagonist have some motivation or character. Uh, You know. The fact that they don't follow through with that, kind of disappointing. But, again, it doesn't really matter as much as it would in a different type of show. Because, really, the point of this show is the the main cast of the 11 girls who are the strike witches and uh it's it they 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 have a very solid chemistry you know and dynamics each individual characterization every character gets some strong moment throughout the show and uh it's generally well executed I mean, as I said before, if if the the imagery of the show doesn't appeal to you, then the show's not going to appeal to you. And um, if the if you don't have a categorical like for me, you know, part of my appreciation for the show is spurred on by my categorical attraction to Sukumizu. Right, Sukumizu is something I'm very fond of, aesthetically, and multiple characters in the show wear Skumizu all the time. And that is a big factor in my enjoyment of the show. That's the sort of thing that this is made for. It's made, it's not, that's not a fault of the show. That is on purpose. And I appreciate that. So I guess I go to next. I gotta watch the Strike Witches movie next. And then I'm I've gotta watch Brave Witches and then I've gotta watch the most recent season 
with the really long title. And that's it. Then I have beaten the game. Well, there's actually a bunch of OVAs that I skipped, but I will have beaten the game aside from OVAs. If I really, I mean, then if I really feel incompletionist, I will go back and watch the OVAs and specials. But aside from the OVAs and specials, I have the movie and then two more seasons of anime to watch, both of which are spin-offs. But the movie is the final strike. Well, aside from the three episodes of special OVAs, which take place before the movie, but were released after the movie, so I think I'm going to... I'm not generally much of an OVA and special watcher. At least I haven't historically been. I've been trying to get into... I don't know. We'll see what happens. I might watch those. Um, Yeah, maybe tomorrow I watch those OVAs and the movie. Um, That's probably a good idea. Yeah, and then... I don't know. We'll see what happens. I think I just had... Uh, a mild life-changing experience. I just woke up and did my promised 15 minutes of cleaning in the morning for the first time. It turns out 15 minutes is plenty of time to clean. Like, I got so much done, and I wasn't even, like, working super fast or hard. I just worked solidly for 15 minutes, and I got so much cleaning done. Like, it'll take two days, maybe three max, to clean the front room at this rate. And it'll be spotless. It'll take a week to get the entire house in shape. And then 15 minutes a day is easily more than enough to keep on top of the mess. That's insane. One of the things that's been keeping me from cleaning this whole time is that in my head I'd imagined it would take me like an hour to clean the whole place. But it turns out... It didn't even take that long at all. One of the other things that's stopping me from cleaning is is vacuums. Because they're too damn loud. They're too damn loud and I don't like it. However, I can do it. So, tomorrow I'm going to vacuum, I guess. Yeah. Is crazy wazy. I saw a post that said, We have actually long surpassed the income inequality that sparked the French Revolution. And that is true, but it's also a little confused. Because the French Revolution happened not because there was a sharp increase in income inequality, but the opposite, because... Uh, Labour was more valuable in the run-up to the French Revolution due to everyone dying of the fucking plague. Uh, Everyone died of the plague, so there weren't enough workers around, which meant the labour supply went down, and so the value of labour went up. And it went from a situation where people, peasants, were stuck sort of working in their field and had zero bargaining power to a situation where lords would basically headhunt For peasants, they would say, like, well, you're working for this lord or this baron, but you can come over here and work for me, and you'll have to pay less tithe, you'll have better land, you'll have be treated better. And they were literally headhunting for for peasants to work their land because there weren't enough of them. And the peasants could demand better um, standards of of labour, basically, standards of living. Um... And that's what actually sparked the French Revolution, is that suddenly all the peasantry realised that they actually had a lot more power. Um, uh, As in, there had been plenty of peasants' revolts in the past, right? The entire medieval period is a series of failed peasant revolts. Some of them worked, um, but most of them didn't see any lasting change you know the the you know how there's all these revolutions that have been happening um in the middle east for the past like 10 20 years and they're always like some youth grassroots revolution that overthrows the previous rulers and replaces it with someone who turns out to be just as bad that's basically how every peasants revolt in history has gone except for the the big liberal revolution like that's pretty much how it always goes um 
But in this situation, it, it was a combination of a bunch of new philosophical ideas from the Enlightenment um, in France, gaining popularity, and the fact that labour was massively more valuable than it had been prior to the plague. Uh, that's what really enabled the French Revolution to happen. Uh, it wasn't the fact that everyone got so mad that their income was low or that their their, their, their wealth inequality was so extreme that suddenly they had no choice but to rebel. It was the opposite. Income inequality had reduced, people's lives had started getting better, and that's when they realised, oh, we can actually demand more than this, right? Like, these guys are desperate. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so you may have heard, you may have, if you're in, if you're tech uh, interested, there's, there's a, a small buzz around a new web browser. The web browser is called Arc, and it's created by some people called The Browser Company. Um, now, I'm in favor of, um, you know, diverse uh, competition in the web browser space, because right now, you're either using a Chromium-based browser, which, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, you're either using a, t a Chromium-based browser or you're using Firefox, that's it. There are no options. Basically, every browser is either Chrome, is, every browser is Chrome, except for Firefox, and that's it. And Firefox only exists because it is funded in part by Google so that they can get away with uh, not being pulled up on by monopoly law. Uh, um, partially. It's a little overstated how much that is. Most of the money Google gives Firefox is just to keep Google as the default search engine. Um, but I, we can assume that some of that money is, you know... It benefits Google to have Firefox exist because that way they don't have to get worry too much about monopoly laws. Um, so it's probably both factors are a thing. But anyway, I'm 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 you know this browser. I'm glad that there's innovation in the the realm of web browsers. Um, you know they seem to have some relative. They they have a really good marketing team. This is their their number one thing. They have a really good web presence, marketing presence, and so on. This is good. Um, I will say, and they also have some really good features. Uh, they have some, some definitely interesting features. Um, one of these things that, that seems to be one of their new features is um, uh, a very user-friendly way to essentially have custom style sheets for websites. So built into the browser you have the ability to, uh, you know, do stuff like changing color schemes of websites, uh, removing elements that you don't like. Like, for example, in the video, they, they, uh, it's called a zap. So you, I, I, I believe you just uh, right click or left, left, right click and then put click zap element and it will, it will remove that element from the, the web page. Um, yeah, and you can change the color scheme of websites and change the, the font and the, maybe even the layout to some extent. Uh, you know, this is stuff that is all doable with existing tools, but they've sort of consolidated it and make it, made it really user-friendly. This is something that I think a lot of people are going to be surprised about because people don't realize that when you render a web page, it's rendering on your browser and you can do whatever the, whatever you want with it because it's on your computer. You've downloaded it, basically. Um, people don't realize that, that the web works like that, I think. Normally you think that web, web pages are web pages and that's it. Um, but... Uh, <clears throat> that's one of their features uh, they have a bunch of other features like um, uh, they have they have some sort of built in translate uh, maybe feature um, and I think one of their biggest things is that they, they have this uh, <clears throat> this uh, like they they have a, a whole tab system that is supposed to be really clever. I don't know that much about it, but it's supposed to be like good for people, the sort of people who have like a million tabs open all the time. Like this sort of, they they have a very 
clever tab management system kind of thing. Like there's a bunch of like little little neat little stuff. Um, now they and they also have like a semi privacy focus. Like it's not their main thing, but they do talk about it a little bit. Um, about like certain privacy stuff. I mean, I I believe it has an inbuilt ad and tracker blocker, uh, which is basically ought to be standard for every browser these days. Uh, and you know, they it, it's it's not like terrible. I think it seems like a relatively interesting project. However, I will now talk about why it is terrible, which is it's not fucking open source. Are you retarded? What are you doing? You're making a browser that is ostensibly customizable. I mean, they their their tagline it, that they said it, for the the their newest release is, "What if the internet was actually your internet?" Well, I'm sorry if it's not open source. I don't even own the web browser on my computer. You still own it when it's running. I'm renting it from you. That's not my fucking internet. Give me the fucking source code. If you're going to be privacy oriented, you can make all these claims in your privacy policy. But if the source code isn't there and no one can audit it then you may as well just be lying and no one would ever know, right? If you if you, if it's not open source, what's the goddamn point? I'm not switching to your stupid bloated web browser that's supposed, supposedly customizable. You know what's actually... So listen, if you want an actually customizable web browser, let me tell you, one exists. Actually, many exist, but I'll tell you the one I use. It's called Cute Browser. Now, this is extremely extensible and customizable. You know, I people see my Cute Browser... Uh, set up and they're like what the fuck browser is that that shit looks crazy you know it's all set up super smooth for me to use it's got ad block it's got privacy features it's got tracking block you can turn off javascript if you want and it's not giga bloated with a bunch of features i'm not going to use you know you use the features that you actually need you implement them as you need them uh, it has like the basics, you know, pretty much what it does out of the box is it renders web pages and, and does all the stuff you want a web browser to do. That's all based on the, the, the whatever Chrome engine it is, um, right? And then it does tabs uh, and then there's a bunch of, it has a config file. Uh, that's pretty much what it does. And it has a bookmark system. I think that's pretty much everything. Everything else you configure if you want other features like ad blocking there's inbuilt ad blocking services but you can extend them and configure them to be however you want uh you know you can block very specific hosts if you want and stuff like this right you can it has built-in keybinds for literally everything everything is a keybind vim style which you can customize to your heart's content and do whatever you want with the way the browser looks is completely customizable. You can change any aspect of how the browser looks from the config file, which is also a Python file. So you can put Python code in the config file if you so desire. Um, every aspect of the browser's behavior is configurable with the, the config file. And it's all open source and you can do it yourself. And it's made by just basically one guy, uh, and it's the best web browser, pretty much, if you're on Linux, at least. And you like a keyboard-focused approach. You know, maybe not, not super great if you're on a desktop and you like a very mouse-focused workflow. Maybe pop, maybe maybe Cute Browser isn't for you. But if you're on a laptop, and maybe a low-end laptop where you need something that's more minimal, Cute Browser is extensible. It's, it's amazing. I love Cute Browser. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, I'm struggling to see the, the point of, I mean, look, you can change the font of individual websites. You could do that th through, co through Cute Browser. I literally do that. <laughs> I, I literally do that. I, I change website fonts to match my system font of every web. I mean, I, I don't, I've never tried to do it on a website by website basis. I imagine it's possible. It's kind of pointless but i imagine if you really wanted to you could figure out a way of going about that in cute browser um filtering out individual elements of a web page i don't know how you would do that in cute browser that's maybe something that and that's maybe something that uh you know is a is a feature Windows. that 
this browser has that Qt Browser doesn't. And that's because, you know, Qt Browser is supposed to be extensible. It's, it's built to be the minimum that you need. And then if you need more stuff, you add it later rather than, oh, it also supports user scripts. So yeah, because it supports user scripts, you can make a user script to do anything you want. So uh, yeah, you definitely can change the CSS of websites and remove elements if you want via user script. 100% you can do that. Uh, or add elements, you know, anything a user script can do can be done on Cube Browser. Pretty much, not not app, some are like browser specific, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like I use Fortran X on Cube Browser with zero issues. Um, right, like the point being, this is how software should be: is that when you when you install the software, you're not installing software with 50 million features, half of which you already have a program that already does it, right? Like I don't need my web browser to have a PDF reader because I already have a PDF reader, right? You know. Like that, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't need my web browser to have an MP3 player because I already have an MP3 player, right? That does it better, right? Like this is the sort of thing that I don't want a web browser to be. I don't want it to have every. It's not supposed to be an operating system. It's supposed to render web pages. That's what it's supposed to fucking do. Yeah, and so that's one of the. That's my biggest problem with this program is it looks incredibly bloated and it's not open source. If I mean that's the fundamental problem here is it's not open source. What there's no excuse for this. I mean maybe because it's still in beta, maybe they're planning to open source it when they re release the 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 final version or the full version. Uh, I've I've DM'd them on Twitter to ask about this. Um, they haven't responded yet, but we'll see if they get back to me. Uh, but yeah, there's there is zero reason to ever use a web browser that isn't open source. I mean, if you really want, if you want a more user friendly web browsing experience, just use Brave. Like, there's no excuse for using Chrome in this day and age, right? Brave or Firefox are your main two options, and Cute Browser if you want extensibility to a, a, an extra degree or a more keyboard focused workflow. Those are, like, the, other than those three web browsers, there is absolutely no... Oh, maybe, um, like, GNU IceCat, if you really are, like, a schizo about privacy, or Tor browser. Uh, th that's, like, the, all the browsers that you could ever need, right? You got, you got Brave and Firefox for very user-friendly, uh, relatively extensible, and uh, a lot of privacy features. Uh, maybe LibreWolf instead of Firefox, because LibreWolf is just, like, hardened Firefox but you can just harden your Firefox anyway. Like either hardened Firefox or Liberal, right? Uh, or Brave, which comes with a bunch of privacy features and is also hardened, able to be hardened beyond that. Um, and then uh, th th those are like your default user-friendly, give it to your normie friends web browsers or use it on a desktop. Uh, and then beyond that, if you want extra privacy or uh, then Tor browser, and if you want, if you're very schizo about not running non-free software, then GNU IceCat, right? Because it's fully free, free software foundation certified browser. Um, and then if you're really schizo about uh, extensibility and customization with a keyboard focused workflow, then Cute Browser is for you. Those are the only browsers you will ever need. Pick one of those. Don't the, like I don't understand the it's I don't understand <laughs> if if it's not open source what's the goddamn point? I just watched the Strike Witches movie and frankly I'm pissed. <laughs> I'm pissed because the the show and the movie had one ballsy move, one thing where it was like the writers taking a stand and making a impactful bold decision with the narrative. They've only done it once, and it was a big one, which is at the big spoiler alert, at the end of season two, Mia Fuji loses her ability to do magic, so she can't fly anymore, she can't do shields anymore, she can't do healing magic anymore, she's basically just a normie, right? Which is a big conclusion to her character arc, right? Which makes sense, for the ending of a show. And is cool. It's chill, right? She's my favorite character. And it's a little sad that her cool traits like 
you know, her cool fox ears and flying around and whatever is not going to be a thing. But it's fine because you had your first season, second season, arc, fight, and it's over, right? And then the movie comes along. And the movie is a really ballsy decision to still have Mia Fuji be a major character and explore how she's still trying to help people despite not having magic. That she's still a part of the plot. She still has has these crazy moments. Like, it's honestly extremely well done. It's the best thing about the movie by far, which is that she's, you know, even when stripped of her magic and no longer a witch, she's going to go to medical school to become a doctor so she can still help people. When there's some Neuroi threat emerges, her first response is to go and help people, right? Even though she doesn't have healing magic or anything, she does first aid on people. She fights a fucking Neuroi by herself with no magic and just a gun and a fucking, like, truck. It's insane. It's, like, it's not the best scene, like, fight choreography ever, but it's fucking sick, okay? It works by rule of cool. I don't give a fuck. She takes it down and she, like, suffers a fatal injury in the process. That shit is badass. It's, like, her final stand, even without powers, she's gonna take, she's she's just that cool. Like, from this meek girl at the beginning of the show to this badass by the, this this moment, right? It rounds out a character arc where it's like, she's so badass, she doesn't even need the magic and she sacrifices herself, right? And then, the whole time I'm watching this movie, I'm thinking to myself, thank fuck the writers didn't pull some bullshit and give Mia Fuji her magic back. Because that was like the most impactful part of the show and it's the most interesting part of the movie. Thank God they didn't pull some fucking idiocy and just make up some bullshit explanation as to why she has her magic back. And then the ending of the fucking movie, you're never gonna guess it, is her getting her magic back for no reason with a complete bullshit explanation. It's absolutely annoying. (laughs) It's so stupid. I'm so mad about this. Why would they, they... They fucking ruined it. Like, the one interesting decision you've made with your plot in the entire show. The by far the most interesting thing you've done. Which is, like, really strong characterization and a unique, bold move with the direction of the story. Uh, and allows for all of these interesting, badass, cool, and cute moments. And endearing moments. And you just undo all of it for no fucking reason. Because the show never got another season. It's like, what? So you can have her... Why? Why? It doesn't even really work as a climax. The, the, it's stupid. And there's no, like... You set up a rule in your world. This is like the death and return of Superman, right? You've seen the Max Landis video about the death and return of Superman, right? Where fucking... Uh, comic books, they were, like, dying, right? No one was buying DC Comics, and so they decided to make a big, bold move, and so they killed off Superman. And it was a big event. Like, it got reported on in the news. It was a it was a, a big event. People started mass buying comic books because of it. It revived this thing, right? Superman, the most iconic superhero of all time, officially killed off in the canon of the universe. Crazy shit, right? And then... For, like, a while, there's all of this stuff happens in the aftermath of Superman's death, which is kind of interesting and cool and, like, unique ideas. And you know how it ended? They brought Superman back to life by saying, oh, he was never actually dead. He was in, like, this deep Kryptonian coma and he's actually still alive. You know, ages after killing him off, actually, turns out he's back, right? And they killed him off in this big climactic fight with Doomsday and... You know, right? Like, it's a it's a big fucking deal. Right? Like, it's an ending to his character arc. It's cool. And then all of the stuff happens in the aftermath of his death. And they bring him back for bullshit, made-up, retconned reasons. And ever since then, deaths in comic book plots are ruined forever. Because you can just bring characters back to life whenever. You broke the rules of your own world. And now nothing has stakes. Because... Well, if Superman can die and then not really be dead, and we all believed it, then who fucking cares if any character's gonna die ever? Because the writers will just find some way to bring it back. This is what you've done, right? The most climactic, intense scene from the from the second season, and the, all of the cool shit from the fir- from the movie, it is like 
Okay, now none of it mattered. Who fucking cares? Because all it took was some bullshit explanation about the power of friendship for the rules of your world that witches have a finite amount of magic, which is a very strictly defined rule that is important in the in the world of the now it's in the world of the story. Like that, there's this this very clearly defined rule. You broke it. You didn't really offer a good explanation as to why. Like it wasn't like like I would have accepted it if. This was the whole point, that, like, uh, something along the lines of, like, it was set up really clearly, there was a lot of time spent, scientists are going around trying to experiment with how to bring powers back to witches. If you have the genetic line of a witch, you know, your powers still lay dormant inside of you, even when you've used, you've, you've burned out your powers, because we, and, and it's experimental and dangerous, like, they could have set this stuff up at least, even then I wouldn't have been happy about it, but I would have been less mad. The fact that it just comes out of fucking nowhere right at the end of the movie and it just has a bullshit power of friendship explanation that doesn't even make sense in the real world. It's so dumb. It's so bad. They, they, how, how could they fuck it up this bad? I don't know, man. That's a terrible writing decision. Aside from that, the movie is not that good, frankly. Like, the best parts of the movie are Mia Fuji running around without powers, helping people, it's very strong characterization. It's cool, right? But the main thrust of the movie is this tension between Mia Fuji and this new character who, like, looks up to her, but uh, she's, like, you know, they have, they have very different personalities, opposing personalities, and they have a lot of tension between them, and it's, like, uh, you know, the it's, it's this very uptight uh, trainee lower rank girl who looks up to Mia Fuji learning to be less uptight and, and more improvisational and more like Mia Fuji and, and stuff like that's my, mainly about her character arc which isn't executed very well and those scenes aren't that entertaining and then most of the rest of it is just like kind of plots that you know don't really matter just because that's the that's the whole show right like the actual narrow military stuff is just kind of inane and it always has been yeah pretty mid movie i'm gonna i'm gonna give this a, a, a five out of ten you know seem what's strange is it seems like people in general like the show that like strike witches fans like the the movie i mean but you know in terms of if if i just ignore the the ending and just focus on oh yeah there is a third season i forgot fuck <laughs> there is a third season okay, well, i'll come back to that later but so it seems like people in general like the movie strike witches fans like the movie i don't understand why it's just a mediocre episode of strike witches that goes on for too long and then has a terrible ending like that it's it's not even like super like the production quality isn't way better than the tv show it's like marginally better, but not enough to like. I don't understand. I don't understand the appeal of this this movie. It's kind of dog shit. I I might even give it a four because the ending was so bad. I kind of want to write a review of this on Mal. I don't know why. No one. No one ever read. No one. This. Whatever. Okay. Um. I guess. Maybe I should watch Operation Victory Arrow, which is set before the movie. Um, but honestly, it doesn't look very interesting to me. I mean, yeah, I guess I can burn through it since it's just three episodes. I really want to get on to... So, I, yeah, I really, I want to, I, I kind of don't want to watch Road to Berlin. I want to get on to the, uh, the fucking... A Road to Berlin's animated by David Production? Why is every Strike Witch series a different animator? 
a different studio, I mean. That's so, it's so, I've never seen a show like this where every single season is a different studio. It's such a weird thing. But yeah, I kind of just want to watch Brave Witches, but the, I'm, I'm, I got to be a completionist about this. This is my mission. My mission is to have completed every piece of Strike Witches media. And I gotta burn through it because I'll get burned out if I if I leave it too long. So I have to have to fucking speed run this shit. I mean, I might get burned out if I speed run it too hard as well. But I I mean, it, it basically my options are either get burned out or get bored. Like either I have to watch as much of it as quickly as possible so that I can finish it before I get bored, or I have to watch it really slowly so that I can finish it before I get burned out. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> I guess I watch Operation Victory Arrow, and then I'll watch Brave Witches at some point. And then I watch, uh, fucking Road to Berlin, and then I watch Brave Witch. wait, what? <laughs> it's crazy how few people watch this stuff. Like... The Strike Witches movie only has 18,000 users on Mao, and Road to Berlin only has 7,000 uh, users. It's, like, crazy small. Let me... Like, the Strike Witches... On... It's, it's, it's crazy how niche... You know, I was thinking about this. There's... There's... One of the best things in life is niche communities. In my, like, what, niche internet communities. Like, uh, as an example, there's a... Uh, a YouTube channel called A Game Scout, which is a he's a, a YouTuber f- involved in the uh, the any NES Tetris competitive scene uh, community, and like watching this channel really makes you fall in love with niche communities as a whole, like niche nerdy communities, because like just watching the all of the ne- absolute fucking NES Tetris nerds having so much fun playing the game, it just is very endearing, and, you know, I, I see it, and I'm like, these are my people, right, even though I don't give a fuck about Tetris, I'm like, this sort of thing is my vibe, but the problem is that my niche community is, like, the, the, is like, I, I don't know what to call it, I, I kind of call it moe otaku, but that term kind of doesn't mean anything, <laughs> famously, uh, but let's just call it moe otaku, you know, the, the type of otaku I am, that's my niche community, right, but the wider populace doesn't differentiate between, like, anime fan who watches, you know, mainstream shonen, versus anime fan who watches like the slightly slightly further than that right like teenage anime fan who watches you know beyond your major shonens into like your uh the stuff that's normally on the top of every mouse season like typical seasonal anime watcher right someone who keeps up with the top shows of every season the sort of person who's currently really into oshinoko as of the recording of this video and the sort of person who was really into Kaguya-sama uh, when that was a thing, right? Like, that the kind of... I, I don't know if I should call him a Reddit anime fan, but I'm going to, because fuck you. The sort of Reddit otaku, right? The people who watch... They watch the popular shows each season, and they like them. Chainsaw Man people. Chainsaw Mid. And I have nothing... I, I still, I'm going to read the manga one day, and then, then I can actually criticize it. Uh, I'm sure the manga's good. <clears throat> uh, slightly deeper than your uh, your guy who watches anime sometimes. Um, the sort of person who might self-identify as an anime fan. The most annoying people in the world. But then, like, that's what most people think of when they think of... of like, these are the sort of people who browse r slash anime memes, right? And this is the sort of people that everyone thinks of when you say anime fan. Because that's, like... Because they are dumb enough and young enough to, like, spread their shit to the wider internet community and be, like, obnoxious about it. And they have terrible memes, which are very notable for being, like, terrible. 
right? Uh, but then you get deeper than that, you get into the actual, the actual real guys, right? I, I consider myself an actual real guy. I've probably dropped more shows than you've completed. If you, if I haven't, then you're also a real guy. Um, and they, this is defined by categorical attractions, I think. So you have your mecha fags, right? Mecha fags are highly obnoxious, but I respect them nonetheless because they are somewhat the core of anime and anyone who denies it is retarded, right? Like I, I'm not a big mecha guy. I've watched like War in the Pocket. I thought it was pretty good, but other than that, I'm I, that's like the only mecha I've watched. Sorry, sorry guys, sorry slash M slash guys, but not super into mecha, but I respect it. So you got your mecha guys. That's one core. You've got your. Uh, I feel like, I I feel like. Umineko guy can be its own category for some reason, but yeah, <laughs> like maybe your Ryushikyo Seven kind of guys, your Toho guys, right? your your um, hardcore visual novel enthusiasts who are into the the real shit, right? I'm not there yet. And then your Moe guys, that's me. I'm the Moe guys. Um, <clears throat> and there's others, right? But there's this the, the the key aspect here is the the categorical attraction, that like. When you watch something, you're not just enjoying it for what it is. You're enjoying it for the category of thing it is, um, and how it aligns with other things in its category and outside of its category, um, which is not something that the Reddit anime fan does, like. They will watch a show and they'll judge whether the show is good or bad. If if you know what I mean. People who just watch good anime. These are the worst people on the internet. People who just watch good anime. Like, this is why... You, you know that old Digi video which is called, like, The Most Boring Taste in Anime? Um... The, the what that video is really getting at is if you if all the things that are your favorites are just the good things that everyone agrees is good, then that's doesn't tell me anything about your taste, right? Like, if my you know if if you go around saying like oh yeah I really like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know fucking, I was trying to think of a movie that is like universally regarded as good, and my first reaction was let's say Godfather two. Godfather 2 is my favorite movie. No one can be like, no, that movie sucks. I mean, it does insist on itself, let's be honest about that. But, like, no one's gonna be like, that's, you have bad taste, that movie sucks. But if you go around saying that, it doesn't tell me anything about who you are. It makes me feel like you lack any personality. Like, all you're judging the movie on is if it's good. You're not judging it on how it relates to you, which is really what art is about. It's about, it's about the interplay between the art and the, the observer was if you tell me your favorite movie is like fucking I don't know uh, Zootopia then at least I know you're a furry <laughs> like if you say your favorite movie is uh, you know what I'm saying if you say your favorite movie is I'm trying to fucking think of examples right now like like, Robocop or something, then it's like, that you're, I, I know who you are a little bit, I know that you are kind of unpretentious, and that you value good storytelling, in a, 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 like, good basics of stories, like, I, I understand some aspect of, you know, who you are, your, 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 like, why that movie would appeal to someone, particularly, you know what I'm saying, whereas, like, everyone likes Godfather too. But, and everyone kind of likes the Robocop, but the sort of person who would say Robocop is their favorite is like, that is like an individual personality kind of thing. And that's the, that's the thing. If you say, yeah, my favorite's Evangelion, Cowboy Bebop, Fully Cooley, Mushishi, etc., right? It's like, all of those shows are great, you know? But, like, 
everyone would agree that all of those shows are great. Where's the show that you connects to you specifically? Where's the anime that is like, um, this, I like this specifically because it has something to say to me. It doesn't speak, you know what I'm, sorry, I'm kind of getting fucking crazy off, off topic here. But that's the, this is the experience that the Reddit anime fan doesn't have. But the problem I was trying to get at is that like, there's, there's not generally separation between, um, there's not a level of separation between different kinds of otaku in the same way that other niche communities have, right? Like, even on A, which, if, if there's a place for people with similar taste to me, similar culture to me, it would be A. But even A, you know, you go on A and most of the threads, like... Most stuff is something that has very little relevance to me, right? Like Dragon Ball Super, Oshinoko, Draw Thread, fucking um, FMA, uh, Precure, Seasonal Bullshit I don't care about, Random Manga I don't care about, One Piece, Vinland Saga, and then Yuyushiki, right? And it's like, aha, the Yuyushiki Thread... That's where I belong. You go into the Yuyushiki thread and then you belong there. You have a sense of belong. You know, like, I went into this fucking... There was a thread on A. I think it was on A. It might have been a JP. No, I'm pretty sure it was on A. It, it's it's for a forward now, but it was like a, a week ago or something. Which was called, like, what 10-year-old, 10-plus-year-old 10, 10 anime, or what, something like that, has held up the best. And that thread was all full of people who were talking about all the best shows, it was like Hidamari Sketch, Lucky Star, you know, all of the, 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 the shows that have held up the best from that era were all the Moe shows that are, that I like, and that was a really comfy fucking thread, right, or you go into the, the Yuyushiki thread, it's super comfy, you go into the Hidamari Sketch thread, it's super comfy, you go into the Gotcha Yusa thread, it's super comfy, right, like, but it, it's not, it's still all on A, right, like, it's not, there's, there's not, it's not separated into its own community, which is, I guess, what's annoying, because you, you look at these shows, like Strike Witch, is the hyper-otaku-focused shows, and, you know, if I, if I go on, um, you know, like, the, 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 Strike Witch is, what, I said this already, but Strike Witch's Road to Berlin has only 7,000 users on Mal, right, and if I go on, hey, let me do a little bit of piracy, if I go on 9 anime, Right, you can see how many views the show has, and you know you get to the the. the... Oh yeah, that's actually not too bad. No, I'm gonna get copy striked. Uh, okay, it has two hundred thousand views, which is more than I was expecting because the movie, the movie only has eleven thousand, which is really low for, for nine anime. You know, nine anime shows off. Oftentimes, things have like tens to hundreds of millions. Okay, maybe not hundreds of millions, <laughs> but like uh, here, random isekai from this season that's not even super popular. Every episode has one and a half million views, and this is just on one particular piracy website. Right, like the fact that this movie has only eleven thousand views, it's clearly very niche is what I'm getting at here like this is a, a niche community of people who who like this shit this is I mean it's late night anime right it's the strike which is aired at like 1 30 in the morning but there's no there's no level of community I don't know how to fucking explain it you guys get what I'm saying there's the, the separation between the different cliques isn't is very unclear and 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 it's kind of a kind of a weird situation. Okay, I just made two discoveries. Firstly, that the Strike Witches, Brave Witches, and Luminous Witches franchise is called the World Witches franchise. So I will refer to it as such from now on. And secondly, that there is another piece of World Witches media that I wasn't aware of. Shut up, notifications. Um, which is called... Strike Witches 501st Joint Fighter Wing Take Off. And these are shorter, it's a 12 episode series 
of 13 minute episodes that are like more comedy, low budget comedy focused, which a lot of anime have these sorts of things, but normally they're not, normally they're shorter than like 13 minutes, but I might watch this just as a part of my completionist uh, shit. But then what's weird is the, the comedy chibi spin-off thing so that's like a common thing with anime right is that a lot of shows have like a comedy chibi spin-off but this comedy chibi spin-off then has a movie (laughs) a comedy chibi spin-off movie but the movie is only 30 minutes and then there's another season of the the takeoff variety which is called world witches takeoff world world witches hashin simas uh, Hashin Shimas, and this is both the girls from the five o first unit and the five o second. So brave witches and strike witches. There's just so fucking much strike witches media. It's ridiculous. Or world witches media. I did not know what I was in for. Uh, but. We're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna watch all of it. I have no fucking clue what to eat, and I'm stressing out about it because I'm a pathetic fucking retard. I'm sitting here, and I'm like, man, I don't know, man. Something's going wrong with my guts. My guts are all weird. I should just eat you. I'm worried it's the Huel that's fucking my guts up, man. That's what I'm worried about. What if it's the Huel that's fucking my guts up? In which case, what else is even better than that? Nothing, really. I think I just have Huel. Continuing my World Witches series journey, I watched Strike Witches Operation Victory Arrow, which is a series of three... It's an OVA series of... Three uh, 30-minute episode vignettes, uh, which follow uh, individual groups from the cast after they went back to their home countries after the end of Strike Witches Season 2. It's fine. Uh, Nothing much of consequence happens, and you don't get the... it, not my favorite part of the series. Definitely nothing special. Kind of lost. Kind of losing interest in it, to be honest. Uh, you know, I think today watching the movie and then this, not the peaks of the franchise. Probably be season two. Uh, not that it was actively bad. There was absolutely nothing that w- put me off about it. Like, the movie's ending was really bad, right? But, like, nothing in... Uh, Operation Victory Arrow. Oh, I get it. OVA, Operation Victory Arrow. It's <laughs> I just got it. That's fu- that's funny. Okay, I'll give them points for that. Um, but yeah, nothing in in Operation Victory Arrow was actively bad. It was all fine. It was just not particularly engaging or special. Uh, they're just sort of short little vignettes. Um with focusing more so on like individual relationships because the 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 groups are smaller right each episode's focused on one particular group of characters going back to their home country and yeah i don't really have anything to say about it uh there's really it's like a perfect 5 out of 10 i would say there was nothing really good about it about it and nothing really bad about it either i want I want to say, this is why I don't play MMOs, because when I feel like I want to grind something out, I, right, that doesn't take, like, active effort, like, in the same way a RuneScape grind is, like, you just sort of do a repetitive task, right? When I do that, I, I'm, I grind anime. Like, I don't... Strike Witches... Like, none of it's good. <laughs> or World Witches. Like, none of it's particularly good. Season 2 is the best so far. Season 2 of Strike Witches is the best so far. Like, at some point in Season 2, I was genuinely enjoying myself. But, 
like here I'm watching Brave, which is, I gotta say, animation quality, definitely a decline, right? Not as good as Strike Witches Season 2. Like, just not great. The art in general, there's the sometimes when you notice the characters are just off model for no reason. Um, the character designs I feel like aren't as strong as the the main five hundred and first division, the five hundred and second division, especially the main character, uh, Hikari, is not as iconic of a design as um, the the other bitch that I can't remember the name of the main character of Strike, which is not just not as strong of a character design, a little more generic, right? But that's basically everything about this. Like, I'm not... In terms of plot, I'd say... Or in terms of, like, premise, I suppose. It's pretty different. I think it's it's definitely more generic. Like, less unique. In terms of, like... The premise of Strike Witch is being that Mia Fuji, that's her name is, like, relatively strong and quite powerful with magic, um, but at first, you know, doesn't want to join the war because she doesn't want to fight. She doesn't... She just wants to help people. She joins the war to protect people, and that's her main MO through the entire show, is that she's all about protecting people, right? Which is, you know, not crazy unique, but, you know relatively unique where she's like semi-reluctant at first right and then the friendliness of her of the the strike witches right like the the relationship that she has with her fellow strike witches and <clears throat> the fact that she finds she can be genuinely useful on the battlefield it's quite an endearing way to you know introduce a character i like it Whereas this show is kind of going for the opposite in every way. The main girl is the opposite of reluctant to to become a witch, right? Like, she's desperate to become a witch. She basically lucks into it when she has no right to be, right? Because she wants to be like her older sister. She basically lucks into joining an actual unit. um, And she's by far the weakest of them. She's not really of much use, um, not, like, compared to the others. And, you know, while some of the other girls are nice to her, at least one is actively hostile, at least at first. I'm sure that she'll come around as the show goes on, right? Like, they don't particularly want her there. (laughs) She is just kind of needy and desperate, even though she's definitely not ready. Um... Which is, I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Like, I'm not saying I hate the main character or she's annoying or anything. It's just, to me, not as... It doesn't make me want to root for her in the same way that I wanted to root for Mia Fuji, where I was like, hell yeah, go protect your the, your people. Yeah, it wasn't even super that, right? But Mia Fuji's voice acting was better, her character design's better, the animation was higher quality, and her backstory and motivations were stronger in my opinion whereas Hikari you know the voice acting is nothing to write home about the animation is pretty piss poor um <clears throat> the character design is way less interesting or appealing in my opinion um and her motivations aren't as uh, strong emotionally they don't resonate with me it was emotionally uh, but we'll see I think what frustrates me is that um the girl who doesn't like her at first is literally right. Uh, like, it. I don't 
you know, in a, in a, a sort of typical anime protagonist who's going to try their heart, like maybe weak, but is going to try that. I'm always talking about how I want protagonists to be weak, right? But in this situation, it doesn't work because this is like supposed to be an elite squadron, right? And by being weak and com- just pure main character ism ending up here with zero logic um you're literally putting the other members of the thing in danger because they have to go out of their way to protect you and rescue you while you can't do anything like i'm sure that it will amount to a character arc by the end of the season and that'll be good better than nothing but i would much rather a situation like mia fuji had where she wasn't the strongest but she had one particular specialization in which she was good right in her case it was healing magic in the case of hikari it's just being able to run fast which is completely unhelpful and i don't really understand how it plays into anything i guess the show is implying that she has a lot of potential but she's there's really nothing endearing about this character (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I I'm not a big. Fan. I, I thought I would like Brave Witches, but I don't know who said that this was more comedy focused. I'm like three and a half episodes in. There's not really been any comedy yet. I don't. I don't know where I got it into my head that Brave Witches was supposed to be more comedy focused than Strike Witches. I literally don't know where I, I thought I got it from this watch order guide but I just went back and checked and it doesn't say that about Brave Witches although he does say in my opinion it's even better than Strike Witches so I highly recommend to watch it now I'm I'm not quite halfway through the show yet and I'm gonna have to hard disagree with this anime planet um, writer, uh, Brave Witches is kinda ass, I think there's a couple of good things, it's not trash, it's not complete garbage, I would probably give it a four so far, uh, because the Neroi fights and the war stuff is not what I'm here for, maybe if that's what you're here for, maybe if those were your favorite, favorite parts of Strike Witches, this is for you, but I'm here for the slice of life cute girl stuff. And that is massively toned down in Brave Witches. Brave Witches is mainly focusing on the the war stuff, which has always been the weakest part of the show, in my opinion. There are some battles with interesting choreography, some Neuroi with interesting gimmicks, and the best part is the cool weapons that the girls have and the cool striker units that the girls have, but definitely the best part. But, uh, it's still kind of boring. Uh, that's just my taste, though. Yeah, I will finish Brave Witches, but I will not enjoy it. I will finish it out of obligation, um, although I am excited to watch the OVA, which I know, I know for a fact is more slice of life oriented than the actual show. The Brave Witches OVA is 100% going to be, so I'm excited for that. Um, but yeah, I am, uh, this puts me at 6 out of 13 World Witches series complete, although of the remaining shows only one of them two of them are full anime series the rest are either specials or the um butai hashin series which are half length or ovas and stuff yeah okay i'm gonna finish brave witches in the morning or tomorrow whatever Uh, But I do want to point out that a lot of the characterization issues I was having with the main character of Brave Witches uh, do become less of an issue for me as the series goes on. 
mainly because uh, they just stop existing. As in all of the characterization that gets set up for the main character at the beginning of the show in the first three episodes are just completely dropped and never mentioned again, at least not so far. Maybe they will be later on, but they just disappear. They're just not relevant at all. So they stop being problems, but that's not... I don't know what's worse. I think like an hour ago, I mentioned the book uh, Otaku Japan's Database Animals, and I think I said it was made by Hideo Azuma, but I got confused, okay? It's made by Hiroki Azuma. Hideo Azuma is the guy that wrote Disappearance Diary. Uh, just a little self-correction there. Uh for something I said like a few hours ago <laughs> or something. It, it was like three days ago for me. Uh, yeah, no. Hiroki Azuma is the, the guy that wrote Otaku Japan's Database Animals. And Hideo Azuma is the guy, the, the grandfather of Lollicon who wrote Disappearance Diary, which is one of the best manga ever written, and you should read Disappearance Diary. Strange things are happening. Strange things have happened today. Today has been strange all around. Let me tell you the story of my day. So I wake up and, you know, hanging out. I'm hanging out mainly. I'm hanging out. And then I get a text from my friend who's like, hey, we still on to go see that movie at 5.45 today? Shit, I forgo. Not a problem. Plenty of time to get ready. It's all fine. So I'm um, I'm on my way to go see this this movie at this independent cinema that my friend is a member of. So he gets cheap movie tickets there, and they do lots of screenings of old classics and stuff, right? So we go see stuff there all the time. It's where I go see all my midnight movie marathons that I talk about and stuff like that, right? And this time. <sighs> The movie, well, you know what, I'll I'll save the movie, because I want to talk about the journey. So I go, I'm go, i on the train, and you know when you're on the train, and you're sort of, or like in many situations in life, you start having conversations with imaginary people in your head, right? My, my imaginary conversation was, originally, it started off that I was thinking about, uh, well, I, it's because I just recorded this thing about Hir, Hiroyuki Azuma, whatever the fuck this guy's name is. Um, the, the, the guy I just talked about, Hideki Azuma, who is it? I don't fucking, who fucking cares, right? You just heard me say the name. I was thinking about that because I just recorded this. I was thinking about that book. And then I started thinking about it and having conversations in my head about otaku culture and ota the nature of otaku right this was like the subject of my conversation in my head was, was i was thinking about like pause and select and academic writing on otaku and why i don't like it and i was thinking like pause and select is like good anime analysis in the same way that like and in my that independent cinema does screenings of Ghost in the Shell and Akira from time to time. Right? Like, it's good. It's Those are good anime. And Pause and Select makes good videos about anime, but has nothing to do with otaku, generally speaking. Right? That's, that was the, so, some of the things I was thinking of. And I was thinking about how, like, the otaku subculture is, like, almost as old as punk, really, when you think about it. And yet, it's, like, so weird, because it's, like, you you don't necessarily know what even counts, and you never, like, you see punks and goths and whatever on the street, but you never see otaku, like, you can't single one out in a crowd, unless they're, like, wearing merch or whatever, right? Like, there's, and even then, there's not really much consensus among, and anyway, I was thinking just all about this. And I get off the train, and I'm walking by these, just the crowd of people, I do a fucking, I do a double take, because I'm th I've just gotten off the train after having this long-ass train of thought about otaku nature, and I, I, I'm like, okay, conclusion reached, we get off the train now, and then I do a fucking double take, because I see a guy wearing a Toshino Kyoko Yuri Yuri dressed as a tomato shirt, 
and I'm like, what the, the what? I see it out the corner of my eye. I'm like, I literally do a double take in real life. I'm like, what the fuck? And then I he's next to another guy who's cosplaying as some shonen guy. I'm not even going to try and guess who it is because I have frankly no idea. And no offense to the guy, but it was not a very good wig or costume. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I see that and I'm like, huh. That's odd. That's very odd. That's strange, in fact. And so... And then, you know what's extra weird, is then I see other people... There's a bunch of people who seem to be on hen nights. And they're all fucking annoying, because they always are, right? Stag do's hen nights. I don't know, groups of fucking people being annoying. And then I see another group of people, and they seem to all be dressed as characters from Phantom of the Opera. And their costumes are actually really good. Um, but I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And so I literally, I'm just like, if there's an anime event on right now, cause like, why is there a guy in cosplay here? Why is there a guy in a Toshino Kyoko Yuri Yuri t-shirt here? This isn't, they're not just wandering around like this. There must be some reason they're dressed like this. Maybe the, the Phantom of the Opera people are related. Maybe they're not. I don't know. But these anime people, I need to know what's going on. Now, a reasonable person would have just gone up to them and said, hey, is there some sort of anime event going on? And then gotten an answer. But I am a pussy-ass bitch who's too scared to do that. So instead, I just followed them. (laughs) I just fucking walked behind them and followed them out the wrong exit of the train station, that not the one that I'm supposed to go to. And then they pause for a second to like talk amongst themselves or do something and meanwhile I'm like there and I'm like well I can't just sort of stop and stand here staring at them and then I remember oh I have to go see a film (laughs) so I'm like stuck between do I try and follow these random anime people and see what's going on or do I meet my friend at the correct time that I'm supposed to be meeting him so obviously I'm like as much as I would like to follow these random anime people, I have an obligation to not be late for this movie. So I go fucking see this movie. And on the way walking to the cinema, I see another anime person. I see a person dressed in the, the big robe from Naruto. I don't know what it's called, but like the, the big robe type thing. A guy, and he's just alone, just dressed like that. And I'm like, this can't be a fucking coincidence. There's no way. So anyway, I get to the the movie. We watch the movie. Now, this movie is called The Conversation. And it's by Francis Ford Coppola. And listen, I'm not going to fucking pretend for the sake of internet clout or for the sake of pretending that I'm smart. This movie sucked Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with you. This is, argu- like, definitely one of the most boring movies I've ever fucking seen. It is incredibly slow and boring. I understand what they were going for. It's not like the movie went over my head. I get it. The slow, boring parts are supposed to be atmospheric build-up to a big climax. And the climax is really fucking good. But you have to wait through an entire fucking movie of nothing happening to boring characters until you get there. And it didn't, it just didn't work for me. All of the, the paranoia elements, right, the conspiratorial paranoia elements of the movie just came off as, like, really surface level and bland to me. Like, when you're watching a movie with, like, paranoia about surveillance and conspiracies and stuff, you don't want it to just be really obvious that you're actually being surveilled, Right? (laughs) Like, I don't care if it's Francis Ford Coppola who made this fucking movie. Right? If... It's not interesting for someone to be like, Oh no, am I being surveilled? And the answer is obviously yes. It's not interesting for it to be like, Is there some sort of greater conspiracy at work here? But the... uh, Like, that's not even a question. It's like, There is 100% some sort of greater conspiracy at work here. You are 100% being watched. Um, everyone who's trying to do something to you is really, ob- like, okay, so there's a scene that goes on for just way too long, just just a ridiculously long time. There's a scene uh, 
where or a section of the movie where the, the main characters sort of got a bunch of people having a little small party with them and there's this girl that is just on his dick right there's this woman that is just really trying to fuck him and it's so obvious that she is gonna she is not trustworthy because she literally leans in and says you can trust me and it's like there's no way they would <laughs> that anyone who says that is trustworthy you've just met her now she's way on your dick and she's like you can trust me tell me your deepest secrets right and it's i don't know i don't know what the movie expects me to think but when she betrays him immediately after this it's it's not surprising it's not a twist or a surprise or there's no tension of like will she won't she betray it's obvious that she's going to and then so you there's this scene that just goes on forever and it's so boring and they talk about nothing and nothing interesting gets revealed there's no intrigue there's no characters that i care about the opposite i actively dislike all of the characters well it's not even that i dislike them they're just boring like they're just it, it it's not even in a sort of like you know there are, there are lots of great movies that are specifically about everyday boring people and doing everyday boring things and it sort of explores the beauty of mundanity right i mean that's what a lot of ozu's movies are about and those are some of my favorite films this is not that the main character is supposed to be wrapped up in something important right except it doesn't feel that way and the main character is just a, a i don't know i don't know i i had no i had no empathy for him I just had very little empathy for him. I I couldn't relate to him at all, really. I couldn't... Really... His performance is very flat, right? I think on purpose, but it means that it's kind of hard for me to understand what he's thinking at any time or how he feels about certain stuff until they just spell it out. I don't know. The movie just fucking didn't work for me. It was so boring. It was so boring. Because it's just set around this, like, one very specific event, and it just keeps going over and over this one very specific event. And the... I suppose you can call it a twist at the end. The climax slash twist. It works really well, okay? It takes you... It's something that you're not expecting at all. And then once it's revealed, it's like, oh, it was set up in that way before. Now that I have learned the extra context, now that I think back on the previous scenes they're reframed, which is what a good twist should do, okay, it's, it's, well, it's a good, that, that bit's good, that's the best part, that's, a, that's, a, that's by far the best thing the movie does, but the rest, but to get there, it's just a slog, it's not, like, there's, I would say the soundtrack was also really good, but I, I didn't think it was particularly impressively directed, in fact, sometimes the directing was kind of, like, I don't, it's not, distracting so for example in the scene where the the lady is trying to seduce the main character there's a moment where the camera does the same exact camera move three times in a row which is a hundred percent a purposeful decision but to me it's like every time the camera would cut go back to the first starting position and then do the same like sweeping motion again i, I would stop paying attention to the conversation because the conversation was boring and meaningless, and I would just be thinking, the camera just did the same thing again. Are they going to do it again? I would do it again. What the fuck? That's weird. That's a weird decision. What does this mean? And I honestly don't think it meant anything. Like, there's shit like that that's just just in the movie. <laughs> I know, some people are going to be mad at me. I'm sure it's Francis Ford Coppola, so probably people think it's a masterpiece. And... You know, there are some parts that work. I'll, I'll tell you how slow this movie is. I went to piss at one point. When I came back, nothing had changed in the scene. I had missed nothing. The same scene was still going on. So I get out of the cinema. We go get some food. And then I head home. And uh, I see more anime people. I, I, I go to... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking by the McDonald's and I see a lady dressed up in full Bleach cosplay. I have no idea what character it was from Bleach, but I recognized the character from Bleach. And it was, it was actually pretty good cosplay. 
just in fucking McDonald's <laughs> getting a burger. I was very confused. And that that was the point where I realized, like, I'm not just going crazy. Something's happening. And I just kept seeing anime people. I know I've only said there was three, but there was another one that I walked by on the street who had anime merch on. I don't remember which anime it was. But then, it's like, how much of this is, is just people liking anime? And how much of this is people going somewhere? But the cosplay, no one just dresses up as in full cosplay to just go out. So, so something's happening. So I start looking it up. I'm like looking for anime events that are going on today. And it turns out, Comic-Con is today and this weekend. Aha! That explains it. People are in cosplay because London Comic-Con is happening. Except... I was nowhere fucking near Comic-Con. Comic-Con is, like, on the other side of London. So why are all these people here? I, it makes... <laughs> it was very confusing to me. And then I kept fucking seeing this shit, because, you know, I come home and I'm closer to home, I see someone in a Squirtle t-shirt, and I'm like, is he one of them? Is he one of them, or is he just a Pokemon fan? Like, I don't know what's happening. Oh, and the other one I saw, the other anime person I saw, was a guy wearing a Megumin t-shirt with, like, a chibi Megumin on it who had a girlfriend, and his girlfriend was hot. There are Konosuba fans who will wear Megumin t-shirts with hot girlfriends walking around? What the fuck? How is that possible? That goes against everything that I know. Yeah, that was... I don't know what's going on. So, this this Comic-Con, it's still on for one more day, right? There's still one more day, and there are tickets. Now, I don't have any friends available to go to Comic-Con with me. So, if I was gonna go tomorrow... Wait, can I even go tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, I can go tomorrow. If I book tickets now, I can, I can probably go tomorrow. Right, but I would have to go alone... Um, it's not too crazy, right? It's, it's, it's something that's doable. It's a bit weird to go to a con by yourself, but it's not that weird, right? Like, I could do it. The thing is, I've been to this London Comic Con before, and it's got problems. The first time I went, I was really young. I mean, the main problem is it's unfocused. It's completely unfocused. Everything is there for no reason. Like, there's comics as a part of it, but then there's also anime as a part of it, and then there's also, like, YouTubers there, like, Tom Scar is always there every year, for some reason. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, and all of the shit there is bad. At least it has been in the past, because I went when I was a kid... And I was didn't really know. I went there specific at that time. I went there to meet Tom Scar, uh, the first time, and just to go to a, a comic con. I don't think I really knew it. I went with my dad. I don't think I really knew any of the medium media properties that were there, like any of the artist alley stuff or anything. Like, I don't think I went to any panels. I don't really know what to do at a con. I just sort of wandered around, bought like some random shit. I think I bought a bleach poster and a Minecraft poster. Yes, those are the things I did. I bought a Bleach poster, and I bought a Minecraft poster. Um, and, because I had read the Bleach, some parts of the Bleach manga at the time. Uh, and, um, yeah, it was mainly just kind of boring. I went again later, when I had watched a, a, a bit more anime... And I remember, I don't really remember much of this, because I was smoking weed at the time, I believe. Uh, so I was quite high on the weed. So I don't really remember much of it, except for the fact that they didn't, everything was really expensive, and they didn't have anything from any good anime. Uh, that's what I remember. But, you know, anime has gotten a lot more popular recently. Um, and, you know, we got a Megumin guy and a... Toshino Kyoko Yuri Yuri guy, so, you know, I'm assuming these people came from Comic-Con or were going to Comic-Con, so, like, some, you know, some people there have taste, 
So, like, what does that mean? <laughs> something must mean something. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to go on the, this fucking website and see what the hell is going on here. See if there's anything good. Because I might, it, you know, I'm always down to actually buy anime merch if there's anything good. Oh, yeah. You know what the most fucked up part was? Wait, I didn't even tell you the most fucked up part of me going outside. I'm never going out. Fuck going to this con. Okay, by the way, I looked up this con and I fucking went through as much detail as I could on their website. I'm going to be real with you. It looks like ass. I don't think they're going to have anything good. I'm not going. Uh, Not worth the money or time it would take to go just for the sake of maybe getting some merch that I could buy online for half the price. Um, <clears throat> so, fuck the con. There's more to my story of going outside. After the movie, we went and got Chinese food. We went to this Chinese restaurant, right? And we bought this meal, and the meal was, you know, about 20 quid each, 20-something quid each, right? Which is... Relatively expensive, but we're in the middle of London, you know, it's about what you'd expect, right? But then, they give us the fucking bill, and it's just service charge added £10. Ten fucking pounds! What the fuck? They just put £10 on the bill for no reason. What the hell? I'm never going back there. They literally just added £10 to the bill. Out, Like, no one told us we were going to have to pay that. How can they get away? How is that, like, allowed? I don't understand. It's bullshit. I, and I was like... We were like, what the fuck? And so when the lady came over to take our money, I was like, what's this fucking service charge? And she was like, uh, you know what? I I was th- I almost did an accent there. I'm not going to do an accent. <laughs> I'm not going to imitate her voice. <laughs> I'm not going to stick stay clear of that one we're not gonna do an accent but she was like uh that's a service charge and i was like yeah i know what a service charge is what surely that should i i was trying to be nice i said isn't that like included in the money we pay for the food and then i looked up at her and i was like it's busy she's a fucking waitress she's not the one that is in charge of this. I'm not going to bother a random fucking waitress about this. Fuck it, I'll pay the money and just never come back to this restaurant. So I was like, it's okay, fuck it, I'll pay, let's split the bill. That's what I said. Right? It was a, it was a, I said, what's the service charge? And then when she said, it's a service charge, I said, surely, like, we're paying for the food already. Isn't that also paying for the service? You know what, never mind, fuck it, let's pay the bill. That's what I said. Right? Maybe I don't know. There should this should, 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 should where the fuck is that? She doesn't have any control over it, so I don't want to bother her. I'm not gonna make a scene about it. But that's how they get you. They get you with empathy, right? You don't you don't want to make a scene about it. It's a busy restaurant. You don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, hold on a minute, I don't want to pay this ten pounds, right? You don't want to be that guy, but no one wants to be that guy. Except for the most annoying people, who are like, you know, the the sort of people that that Reddit would call Karens. Um, You don't want to be that guy, so I decided not to be that guy. But I will definitely never be going back to that place ever again. If you need more money, just increase the prices on the fucking menu. Don't have a hidden service charge that that is... You don't tell anyone about. That's insane. That should be illegal. I don't understand. That's ridiculous. Anyway, then, after the meal, I'm thinking... Oh, whatever. I I don't need to tell you about that, Pip. But, yeah, that was fucking annoying. Anyway, I was was looking on this con website, and, man, it's... It looks pretty bad. It's all... It's all, like... They have... It's, it's like, the most... Normie. <sighs> I don't know what to call it. I, I don't even want to say normie because it doesn't even describe it. It's just... 
they they have it's they have a bunch of just like it's it's not anime thing they have an a like asian culture section where they have like k-pop stuff and korean stuff and chinese stuff and like j-pop stuff and then like we're talking pokies we're talking k-pop we're talking there's like some random jujitsu studio doing a doing a demonstrate I don't understand I'm just gonna yeah it it doesn't look good so I'm gonna do something now that the people who run this con have never done which is marathon some more anime it's strike witches motherfucker brave witches we're gonna finish it today okay actually we're putting a pause on this strike witches thing because Max Landis just dropped Max Landis presents the society endangered species Two hour long Max Landis movie. Let's go. Um. Okay. So the Society Endangered Species was pretty good. I don't think I'm physically. Well, firstly, it's a little late, so I'll probably only be able to get like two or three episodes finished if I do watch Brave Witches. And secondly, I'm just fucking out of grinding energy right now because that was. I watched a fucking The World's Most Boring movie. And then watched two hours of slightly confusing, let's just put, say, slightly incomprehensible Max Landis movie. <laughs> Not that it was bad. It's just, I get the sense that to, to, to Max, can I call you Max? <laughs> <laughs> As if you're listening to this. <laughs> Can I call you Max? Yeah. Max. Um Mr. Landis, if you will. No, that's that's his dad. I get the sense that he uh you know, since he's been working on this Kryptonian epic stuff for like years now, and it's basically his full time job. To him, all of it's really obvious what's going on and who the different characters are and like all, all of them especially if, if you're like familiar with the comics right like none of it's confusing to me it's like there are like 50 characters sometimes there's like an a b and c plot all going on at the same time in different locations with different characters they're like oh you're supposed to they're all connect i don't know a little bit hard to follow in certain areas is what i'm saying some of the stuff could have been a bit more clear Uh, maybe that's because I wasn't paying enough attention, I don't know. But, yeah, fuck it. I'll, I'll, I'll finish Brave Witches tomorrow. I will say, I did actually watch one piece of Strike Witches media, which is the original Strike Witches OVA from 2007, before the first season dropped. Uh, and it's, it's basically an eight-minute pilot that just sort of introduces the world and, and the characters, I suppose. It's hard to even say whether it's good or bad, because it's sort of... It's basically a trailer. So, yeah, I don't really know what to say about it. It's not like something that's short can't be good. I mean, fucking Daikon is one of the greatest things ever made, and that's short as fuck, right? It's not the shortness that makes it, it's, it, there's, it, but, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to have strong opinions on. Hi. I, I think I'm gonna do something now that, uh, I've always avoided doing, because I thought that it was, I still think that it is, uh, somewhat narcissistic, and I also thought that no one was really interested. Now, these things might be true, but I think that there is some people who are interested, just based off of multiple comments I've gotten over the years that sort of tend in this direction. Um, and that is some sort of talking about the behind the scenes, some of my thought processes of making music and what I was sort of going for. Uh, I really hope this doesn't come across as, like, too narcissistic. Uh you know, hopefully 
the fact that I've avoided doing this for a long ass time is enough to, yeah, well, whatever. I want to talk about some albums that I made. There might be people listening to this, I doubt it, but there might be people listening to this who aren't even aware that I make music. Because I know there's a lot of people who found me from my uh, Nick Land video. Well, I guess if you've watched, you must have figured it out by now, surely. <laughs> um, I'm working on an album right now. It's coming along pretty well. I kind of, I think I want to, um, I think I, I'm not sure, sh- I've been thinking for a while about the album cover for this, this, the, the cover for this album, and I think, you know, I think I might want to commission someone, commission someone to do it for me. I have a couple of people in mind who, because I'm not much of an artist, you know, um, I mean, I can probably do something, but, yeah, I have a couple of ideas. Anyway, so off topic. What is it? Not really. Um, so I want to go through some albums that I made and talk about them. Uh, starting off with, uh, I guess we'll just go through, right, from Dead Form, maybe? From Akiba Trapstar Connect, the po- the point of Akiba Trapstar Connect was I was listening to Cemetery a lot at the time. I really like Cemetery's. I like I like Rainbow Bridge One. I don't really like anything else Cemetery's made, but I really like Rainbow Bridge One. And I and I was like, what if Cemetery, but instead of black metal, it was anime songs. Um, so that's what I did. <laughs> Nothing super crazy there. Uh, I was also when I make yes thank you albums I'm generally uh, I, I, I often get drunk while recording or it's more so the other way around it's more so that I, I am drunk and then I like I'm like yo what if I made music right now that's often how it turns out uh, dead form the idea of dead form there's a couple of things. Uh, it's kind of like a follow-up to To The Fairest, in my eyes. because You can see the album covers have, like, similarities. Uh, I don't know if that's, that makes any sense. But yeah, it's in, in my mind, it's kind of like a follow-up to To The Fairest. And it's inspired a lot, like that album, by... Um, Dodd Mark by uh, Death From Above um, by a lot of like punk bands that are, you know classics maybe it, it's not super obvious and definitely a lot of Crystal Castle's influence on this as well um, and my idea was you know most of, a lot of the music I listen to and the musical culture that I'm part of is it kind of falls under the umbrella of bass music or, or like bass is this big part of music as in not the instrument but the the section of the audio spectrum that like when you listen to a trap song with heavy ass 808s or a, a jungle song with really loud sub bass right or anything dubstep you know the, the tr- original classic dubstep like a lot of this stuff it all originates from Jamaican sound system culture uh and uh, you know it's it's such a big part of music that heaviness equals weight equals bass uh, and I feel like punk music is fucking terrified of the the sub bass range you know you listen to punk music and it's all taken place in the upper registers the kick drums they sound like 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 nothing you know the fucking bass guitar is all mid, so that you can hear the the melody, and then you got the the guitar and the the hi hats all fucking weird and yeah, there's nothing going on to give the whole thing, like like fucking heaviness, like I want from some doom metal for example. Like I'm really big into doom metal and drone and and stuff like that with these big heavy basses, 
And so I wanted to like take it and put it into punk, you know, take some of that mixing style, like where you you know it's it's kind of past its prime now. But there was a time period where it's very popular in like rap music to have eight oh eights that were so loud that they distorted the rest of the mix a little bit. And I was like, what if I made my bass guitar so loud that it distorted the rest of the mix a bit? And obviously that's not actually what's happening entirely. It's it's kind of trickery <laughs> with uh, a lot of production methods. Uh, one of the things I did in this album that really, like the moment that I discovered you could do this was the moment the album came together in my head really well, is that this is when I figured out that you can make a bass guitar sound crazy fucking heavy if you layer it with a sine wave in the, like mirroring it. It, uh, like either the same octave or an octave lower and then you make this bass guitar sound like impossibly thick so all the basses on this is double tracked and then layered with a sine wave to give this like bass pressure and that's why the bass guitar sounds so f incredibly heavy on this album like mixing wise I think this is my best mixed album if I had to go back there's definitely some stuff I would change like I think Decode, the song Decode, at the time, I was really into it. I was like, this is like the, the big pop single of the album. That's why I normally put that second, where I have like an intro track and then I have the big catchy pop single. For me, you know, listening back to it, the vocal performance kind of sucks. Um, and it doesn't really fit with the rest of the album. I don't know, the ending's good, but I don't know, I'm not super happy with that song. The best song on the album is definitely Running On The Spot. Uh, like, that's a hundred, that, that's a hundred percent the standout track for me. Although Knife is also pretty good. Um, yeah, and then the album gets weirder as it goes along because I'm still stuck in, like, the ancient times when uh, you know, albums used to have an A-side and a B-side and then you put the weird tracks on the B-side and the, the more poppy tracks on the A-side, I still try and follow, like, to me, that's part of how, how album feeling feels. Does this make sense? Like, it's like how you could make a, a video that is movie length, but it doesn't feel like a movie, you know? Like, to feel like a movie, it has to have certain, certain attributes, otherwise it doesn't feel like a movie, you know? And when you see, like, a video, like, makes maybe on YouTube or TV or something, that has these movie-like attributes. It feels movie-like even though it's not a movie. Do you know what I'm saying? To me, one of those attributes to make a collection of songs, not just a collection of songs or a playlist or a mixtape, but an album is that arrangement of A-side and B-side, the fact that there's this distinction between them. And uh, so, yeah, I kind of try and emulate that when I'm arranging tracks on an album. But I'm really bad at arranging tracks on albums. Like, I always feel like I spend ages, once I've finished recording everything, going through and trying to order it correctly. And when I finally come up with something that I feel is good, I come back to it, like, a week later, and I'm like, man, I should have fucking arranged the tracks differently. This sucks. Uh, so, yeah, I, that's, like, the, the thing I'm fucking worst at. <laughs> I really suck at doing that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I guess anything else with Dead Form? A lot of it was based on Crystal Castles, especially the song Do Deer, which I actually covered Do Deer ages and ages ago, uh, like back in 2018 when No Thank You was new. One of the first things I did was cover Do, Do Deer, um, one of my favorite songs ever. And I think I was, I've, you know, ever since then I've been trying to recreate the feeling that Do Deer gives me. And I think Running on the Spot finally did it. It's all about having this repeating uh, ostinato in the upper register and then reharmonizing it with a distorted bass line that goes for like two bars. That's like the, and then obviously punky drums and shouting. That's the, that's the Do Deer vibe. Um, I kind of wanted to make a whole out, you know, there's a lot of tracks on Dead Form that kind of sound like that. Just, but I was also, yeah, I could have made every track like that, but I was really trying not to, so that the ones that were like that would sound more special, if that makes any sense. Anyway, that's Dead Form. Then after Dead Form, I made ADHD, Acceptably Destructive Hyperdrone, which is a much less popular album. Um, 
Uh, this one, the idea was, what if I made... I mean, it, it, it starts with a pretty simple... It's kind of like the way people approach like indie game design is like... Like, you, you look at these indie game devs doing, like, devlogs on YouTube, and their games always start with, like, what if it was this genre, but with this mechanic? Like, what if this, but this? That's often how I approach music as well. It's like, what if this, but this, right? Like, um, yeah, the, the classic example of that is, like, super hot. What if it's a first-person shooter, but time only moves when you move, right? Like, or, uh... I don't know. You can think of your examples. I feel like this is a very common thing in like game, like indie development, is they they always they like take a genre staple and then twist it with a, a, a by like changing some base aspects of the mechanics. Um, so the idea of ADHD was what if I take a like doom metal album, but it has no drums. That's literally it. It's what if I make doom metal but no drums. Uh, and at the time, I was listening to a lot of uh, liturgy. Uh, so a lot of it has kind of a transcendental black metal kind of vibe in terms of being very melodic and harmonious. Um, and it's also inspired by uh, planning for burial. All of my music is inspired by planning for burial. But yeah, definitely got to got a gloom planning for burial thing going on there. And I also didn't want lyrics, I didn't want vocals. I wanted it to be just like, when I was making it, I was like, can I like flex my composition skills basically? So I'm putting pasta in a pot right now. I was like, I wanna, I wanna flex my, my ability to write compelling melodies and chord progressions basically, with, with nothing else except guitar and bass. And actually the guitar is just pitched up bass, so it's just a bass. There's no drums, no vocals. It's just like like Bach, you know. Of course, it's nothing like Bach, but you know what I'm saying. Just to, trying to get, it, trying to flex, make sure that speaks for itself. How successful was I? I think some of the songs are good. <laughs> um, Yeah, I think it kind of works. It's obviously this if Dead Form is a follow up to, to The Fairest, then ADHD is a follow up to End Cycle Futility. Right? Like, I feel like that's fairly obvious. But then, I didn't, I feel like, at least in my mind, I didn't make music for ages. So, ADHD was in 2021, and then I didn't make music until August 2022. Oh yeah, because that's because my mom died. <laughs> that's why I was like too too fucked up to make music for ages, and I was really I was really freaked out by it because I was like oh, I've lost the creative spark, like I because I had always imagined that if something like some tragedy in my life happened, I would use music to deal with it. But instead, for like six months after my mom died, and even for a time period leading up to it, I was just incapable of writing anything at all. Um, it might have been even longer than six months. Like, writing music, even listening to music, just kind of disappeared from my life. I don't know why. Grief is a weird emotion. Brains are strange. Uh, but yeah, that's why it's... That's why it, it, like, for me, obviously for, like, a normal person, less than a year or, like, a year gap between albums isn't weird. But for me, that's weird. Um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, that that's why there's kind of a gap. And then... I made Lama Yoroisku, which is in Estonian, and a bunch of people think I'm from Estonia because this album's names are in Estonian, but I was just in Estonia when I made it. I'm not actually Estonian. Um, Lama Yoroisku means lay down and rot, by the way. Uh, and honestly, I'm really happy with this album. Like, this is exactly the sort of black metal that I want to listen to. I'm big into black metal and have been forever. It's like I've made a bunch of black metal tracks but never really put them out except on Patreon. So for me it was like a big deal making a black metal album because I've had a long time to practice making black metal. I listened to a shitload of black metal, especially at this time. I'd been listening to nothing but black metal for ages. And I was like, 
stuck in this apartment in Estonia with a guitar and nothing else to do. So I was just, you know, fucking making this crazy DSBM shit. And to me, this is like really good. You know, I listen back to this album. This is like exactly what I want black metal to be. It's like fucking desperate, depressing. The vocal performance isn't bad. The guitar sounds good. The whole mix sounds like it was recorded on a toaster, as it should. Like, to me, this is really good. And for some reason, no one liked it or gave a shit about it. I feel like black metal is like this special genre. Everyone thinks they're special for making black metal. And it's like, if you're making black metal, you're not allowed to make anything else. And if you listen to black metal, you don't listen to anything else. Which is fucking weird. No one gave a shit about this album. Now, partially, this is because I gave it a terrible cover. And I kind of want to go back and change it. Because this, this album cover looks great for an album in a completely different genre of metal. This doesn't look like a DSBM cover, right? Like, I, don't, I just don't know what to make an album cover from. The album cover on this is actually by an Estonian surrealist artist. Because um, I was like, you've got to go hard into the like northern, northern Europe slash Eastern Europe vibes if you're making black metal. So I found like this is, and it, like, this is a cropped part of it, like a woodblock print he made. And I think it looks sick, but it doesn't look like black metal. Like, the, the red text especially kind of fucks it. Yeah, I don't know what I should have done. I don't know how, how to market this album better. I mean, it's like super lo-fi DSBM. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. But, I don't know. I think it's underrated as fuck. I love this album. Um, yeah. I don't know what else to say. It's just black. It's kind of exactly what I mean someone some people describe I, I when I when I first put it out I had the you know multiple people said it was like trad black metal and I was very confused by this because it has absolutely it's definitely not trad black metal it's like DSBM it's even like you know it's it's I feel like it's not trad black metal is not sound like this <laughs> I think it's just because it, the recording quality is really bad, but that's on purpose. I recorded it on the same mic I record everything on. I, it's all post-processing. It's all an illusion and a trickery. It's all crazy trickery. I'm, I don't know if I can... Anyone, if anyone uses Logic, I will tell you how I did it. So on the master bus, I, I literally went into the... Order. I tried like a whole bunch of different uh, like effects chains to try and get the perfect lo-fi black metal sound and what I ended up doing was incredibly simple on the master bus I just went on into um, modulation and then rotor cabinet I know rotor cabinet weird so when you go on the rotor cabinet and you just you you turn everything off so it's not rotating and you you make the stereo width zero and all of it zero right and then you just fuck with the, there's like a balance between the horn and the drum. I put it at about like three o'clock. Um, yeah. And uh, that's how I got that sound. So you, you can put that on anything and it'll sound uh, like that album. Um, yeah, you just have to turn everything down and then like yeah, and it sounds, I mean, it does a pretty good job of sounding fucked up, in my opinion, but, yeah, I don't know, I'm happy with this album, I think I fucked up the album cover, because, I don't know, I didn't want to dress up in corpse paint and take a picture of myself, because that's just, like, I don't, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't want to put my face on an album, it just feels weird to me, I don't know why, um, yeah, I, what I should have done is just gone into the woods and taken a picture of the woods in Estonia. It's not like they're hard to find. <laughs> Estonia is like empty as a country. That's what I should have... I could just do that. I could... I don't know what the... I don't know what the fuck I was doing, man. I definitely fucked it up. I, I would literally... After I recorded this album, it wasn't even that long after that that I was literally in a cabin in the middle of nowhere in Estonia, in the middle of the countryside, next to some woods. I could have just taken a picture of the woods or the cabin, put it in black and white, and that would have been the album cover. It was so easy. There's so many options. And I, I instead I like over-engineered it into this thing that looks like a good album cover for a completely different genre. 
But I don't know if that's what what fucking ruined it. I have no idea what ruined it. I have I have no idea why this isn't popular. I feel like this is one of the this is a good ass album, but whatever. Uh, okay, then finally, we got um, a, a Total Organ Failure Horizon, and uh, you know a lot of people say this is like the Cruelty Squad soundtrack, which is true. But it's something that I didn't realize I was doing until like halfway through making the album. About halfway through making the album, I was like, wait, this sounds like Cruelty Squad. Um, the actual, what I was actually trying to do, actually, hold on, let me pause so I can deal with this fucking thing. Okay, so the story of Total Organ Failure Horizon has very little to do with Cruelty Squad, and it's kind of strange. So really... When I started making the album, I didn't really know I was even making an album. I was just kind of messing around with some particular musical techniques uh, in the realm of a uh, big word coming up, big made up word coming up, Zen harmonicity. And what that is, is uh, so uh, some people also call it uh, inharmonic sounds, which I think is that's like the correct name. So I'm going to call it inharmonic. And what that is, is uh, every sound that you hear in nature is not just a root note, it's also a bunch of other uh, overtones above that note. That's what gives sounds color and timbre. That's why a violin playing E sounds different from a piano playing E. While the root note might be the same uh, on both instruments, the uh, overtones uh, will be in different volumes, basically. Um, But most sounds that you hear in nature and most musical sounds, uh, those overtones are arranged in the harmonic series, which means the first one uh, is double the one, like every, every one is half the distance as the one before it, if that makes sense. Um... Or something like that. Actually, that's not quite true. But you can look up the harmonic series and figure this shit out, okay? It's like 1 against 1, 2 against 1, 3 against 1, 4 against 1, 5 against 1, 6 against 1, basically. Uh, That's how they're arranged. But not all sounds are like that. Um, For example, bells uh, aren't like that, which is why sometimes bells harmony sounds a bit weird. Um, uh, And... uh, well, there's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go into it. But anyway, we have computers now, so we can create uh, inharmonic sounds by stretching the spectrum. And that's what I was trying to experiment with, is these weird-ass fucking sounds that have um, uh, overtones that you are very unusual, that you're not really used to. And because I was mostly experimenting with that, I wasn't really concerned with, like, getting it to sound good or using... uh, As in, like, getting it to sound clean or using, uh, you know, production techniques that would make it sound more modern or more put together. I was mainly just focusing on experimenting with these particular sounds and ways of generating sound. Uh, And and so it kind of just started sounding like it, you know, this sort of lo-fi, unmixed, uh, default synth kind of tones without me even trying. Uh, but just because I wasn't trying. And then, while I was making this stuff, uh, someone sent me a link to an album by someone called Lick Nand, who is one of the pseudonyms of Ellie Void. I listened to this album, and it was remarkably similar to the shit I'd been making. And so I went and did research into who this person was. I found that they ran a website called cybergrunge.net and it had a few sort of various artist names uh, all in this sort of cyber grunge style which was very similar to what I'd been making not in harmonic but in a similar kind of lo-fi ugly way and so I was I ended up continuing to use these inharmonic sounds and nudging the album over to sound a little more like Cyber Grunge, although with my own spin on it, like uh, some of the tracks a little more 
you know, a lot of the Cybergon tracks are more influenced by techno and house and electronic music, whereas I was trying to go for a bit more uh, synth pop or, uh, you know, rock music kind of vibe. Sometimes, although there are techno tracks now as well. I was just mixing everything together, you know. And then I was like, wait, this sounds like cruelty scores. <laughs> Oh, and the other thing I was influenced by was an album, uh, fuck, I'm gonna forget the name of it now. Let me find it. It's by one of the KFC Murder Chicks people. Uh, Pharmacy by Youth Serum. Go listen to this album, it's fucking sick. Uh, but yeah, this was also influential on me was Pharmacy by Youth Serum, or is it Youth Serum by Pharmacy? No, it's Pharmacy by Youth Serum. Yeah, so that all just came together into fucking Total Organ Failure Horizon. So I have a problem right now, which is kind of a stupid problem to have, and that is, uh, I was in a lot of Huel, right? And because of that, I basically stopped eating vegetables because, I mean, not entirely, but I massively ate fewer vegetables because the Huel has all the stuff you need in it. So I was eating a lot of Huel. I was eating like, you know, a third of my daily calories, if not more, from Huel for a while. And I figured, you know, well, if I'm doing this, that's like probably more than I would even get from just having some broccoli or peas on the side of my meal anyway, so fuck it, fuck vegetables, I'm just gonna eat Huel, then I don't have to eat vegetables. I was like, I've discovered the world's greatest life hack. Well, it turns out, a couple of things. Firstly, that's probably not true, now that I think about it. <laughs> this is clearly just an excuse. You have to eat vegetables. Huel is not a replacement for all vegetables, just because you're eating some Huel. It's probably better than nothing, uh, but it's definitely not better than something. <laughs> and the second thing is, that now I'm kind of bored as, of Huel. Uh, just, even though none of the flavors, even the flavors that I like, something about it just puts me off, and I don't know what it is. It's like my body just rejects it for some reason. Something about the texture, something about what, I don't know. Something about it is just very off-putting to me right now, and I, I need to take a Huel break, I think, or something like that. I don't really know. Um, I'm just not eating as much as I used to. I just want to eat normal, real food for some reason. But I, I, when I last did a, a, a grocery shop, a large-scale grocery shop, I was still a, under the assumption that I'd be eating Huel for at least one of my meals every day and that I didn't need to buy vegetables. Again, just to clarify, I definitely did need to buy vegetables even if I was eating Huel, but I was trying to, you know, find a loophole in uh, nutrition, which doesn't exist. <laughs> um, uh, so I didn't buy any fucking vegetables. Uh, I mean, it would have been so easy to just, like, buy frozen peas. Like, that's enough. That's all you need. And I did buy beans, because I'll eat beans on toast, right? Uh, but I didn't buy any, any like, normal vegetables. Beans beans are, like, sort of half a vegetable, because they're, like, a protein, right? You know, they're good, don't get me wrong. Beans are one of the best foods, actually. One of the best foods. Uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry. I'm getting distracted here. So I need to get vegetables is what I've been th the part I've for various reasons it's been impossible for me to buy veg for the past like few days like three three days three or four days I've been like I need vegetables and just not like something's gone in the way of me buying any which is really fucking annoying um and just now I had a, a bit of an epiphany which is the the what is the reason why I'm so anti-veg? It's not because I don't like the taste of them. I actually really do quite like the taste of vegetables. Actually, you know, the other day, I went out for Chinese food, the one that where they charged me a surcharge, service charge for no fucking reason that was just not even listed and evil. They just robbed me of 10 quid for no reason. Or 5 quid because we split the bill, but yeah. Um, those bastards... Like, you know, the, the main meal comes out and it's a bunch of small plates of things. And one of them is a small plate of vegetables. I ate almost all of the fucking vegetables, you know? I, 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 I like vegetables. I'm not a picky child. 
I've, I've got, I mean, some of them I don't like. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of, I mean, okay, I, I hate tomatoes raw. I can't eat them in almost any context, except for some reason I've discovered in Mexican food, it's okay. Why this is, I have no idea. I have never in my life been okay with eating raw tomatoes. I have tried recently, you know, to eat raw tomatoes and it almost made me sick. It's disgusting to me, except that I recently discovered that one of the burritos that I was eating when I was eating more of this expensive Mexican food that I was complaining about on the end of the last podcast had raw tomatoes in it. And I was like, this is fine. It's not great. It still gets, I still can taste the weird taste that makes me feel sick in tomatoes, like the disgusting taste, but it's very minimized and masked by the other ingredients to the point where I don't even mind it, which is fucking crazy. Nothing, this is like a crazy development for me, but I don't know how to capitalize on it, so I'm just gonna ignore it and still say raw tomatoes are a no-go for me. Um, anyway, other than that, I pretty much will eat anything. I like cabbage, I like lettuce, I like broccoli quite a lot, actually. I like a, a bit of a, a bok choy, one of the best vegetables, also kind of in the cabbage family, but yeah. Uh, asparagus, delicious. Uh, parsnips, they're all right. Turnips, they're all right, yeah. You know, radish, it can be good in the right context, you know? I wouldn't just eat a radish, <laughs> but I feel like, you know, when sometimes a radish is good. Beets, I even like beets. I know a lot of people don't like beetroot. Yeah, we, we over here in the, in the, the UK, we call it beetroot which is kind of weird because we don't call any other root vegetables root. This is the one that like, I'll give you this one to you Americans. Most of the time when it comes to English language, I think you guys are retarded. In this situation, it's us who are weird. We don't call it carrot root. Why is it called beet root? Weird. Anyway, I'm okay with calling them beets. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm generally good with most vegetables. The reason I don't make them is because it takes a whole extra pot and a whole extra mental work and effort to do vegetables. And they also go off really quickly. So if you don't use them, you know, in a timely manner, then they just rot and you have to throw them out, which fucking sucks. This is this is my big reason, is that, like, I don't... Uh, like, it's hard enough to make sure when you're cooking that the two... You know, like, let's say you're making something with with two ingredients that have to cook separately, they have to finish it around the same time, right? And then you have to get three ingredients to all finish at the same time. Like, adding this vegetable was an extra factor to finish at the same time. Like, I don't know, man. I just suck at it, and it's too much effort. But the main thing is that I, like, I just don't want to make another pot dirty that I have to wash up. I don't want to do any of this shit, right? That's, this is the main, it's mainly a problem of effort because vegetables are good. They don't add that much to the taste of the meal. Sometimes they do. And in those cases, I will go through the effort to make, to, to, to use them. But a lot of the times, vegetables, they just kind of add a little textural thing, a little something, but they're not super important for the main taste of the meal. Because a lot of the stuff I eat is like something on rice, you know, like, whatever. So I'm getting fucking distracted here. The point I'm trying to get at here, that was probably really loud for you, is I just realized I can just be eating salad. Because salad has zero prep time. You buy pre-washed salad mix at the, at the fucking shop. All you have to do is take out a scoop of that and put it on your plate. And that's vegetables, motherfucker. Why am I not doing this? So, uh, tomorrow I will go buy some salad mix from the grocery store. And then I will put it with the shit that I eat tomorrow. And that's how we're going to fix my diet. So, funny enough, in episode seven of brave witches which is still bad by the way just to clarify this show is very bad <laughs> uh, yeah this is a bad anime but in this episode uh what i take but is that what i'm thinking of did i just yeah what i take play uh, uh they ha they have a, a a pivotal role in the plot of this episode now, you might be sitting here wondering, what in the goddamn fuck is a warai take? Well, it translates to laughing mushroom. Warai as in uh, warau, warau, which is the, you know, Japanese, they type www instead of lol, 
That's the W from Warao. Laughing. To laugh. And Take, as in my Take or Shitake, means mushroom. Uh, so laughing mushrooms. And the subs translate them as laughing mushrooms. And the effects that they have on people in the show is they make them laugh. Because this is like a thing. And I happen to know about this because like a year ago, I read a paper about what I Take and their place in Japanese mythology. Because there is a popular Japanese folk tale about a group of um, nuns or monks or something who go out into the forest and eat what I Take and then go dancing and singing and laughing through the town. What's weird is these mushrooms in folklore aren't described as hallucinogenic, even though there are multiple varieties of psilocybin containing mushrooms in Japan that are native to Japan no one knows which one there's there's a modern type of mushroom that's referred to as waraitake right but no one knows if that's the historical one and no one that's just one of of multiple different Japanese mushroom varieties that contain psilocybin which is assumedly what what happened right but it's interesting that they're not referred to as hallucinogenic in Japan, they're cons- or at least in the folklore, they're considered to be mushrooms that make you laugh. And the reason for this might be that they contain these particular varieties don't contain very high concentrations of psilocybin. They contain pretty low concentrations of psilocybin. And that, that's, that might be something to do with it, but no one really knows what's going on with this. But anyway, it's interesting that they would randomly show up in this show in the middle of Russia... Um, and if you look at the mushrooms <clears throat> in the show that, that they demonstrate, uh, they look closer to Liberty Caps than the, the, they don't really look any, I mean, I guess they kind of look like, yeah, like psilocybin cubensis. Uh, yeah, which is, it's interesting that they call them what I talk, I don't know. But they don't really look... They kind of look like generic mushrooms, I'm going to be honest with you. They look a little bit like Liberty Caps. They look closer to Liberty Caps than they do to the Japanese... Uh, um, Gymnopilus letiophilus, filius, letiophilius, which is uh, the the modern Japanese waraitake. But it's... Inter- I don't know... It, I guess that's just what they... Anyway, it's weird that that's a plot point in this show is what I'm getting at. They go out to pick mushrooms, they accidentally pick fucking uh, magic mushrooms and get, and then everyone gets high. It's weird. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. And it comes out of nowhere. It's very strange. It literally just... It doesn't make any sense. This show is bad. This show is very bad. I'm gonna be honest. I really don't want to be watching fucking Brave Witches right now. But... Here we are, nonetheless, watching Brave Witches. And, uh, you know, I've decided this show is a 3 out of 10. I would say it is very bad. The main problem is that it's just impossible for me to find much to enjoy. Like, normally I can find something to enjoy in a show, right? There's not, like, nothing is good. <laughs> the animation, garbanzo beans. The the storylines, garbanzo beans. The setting, honestly... Compared to the other, look, the the Strike Witches universe is fine, but this particular setting compared to the other Strike Witches, Garbanzo Beans, the characters. There's one character that's, like, kind of neat. Every other character, I'm gonna be honest with you, Garbanzo Beans. The action scenes and choreography, Garbanzo Beans. It's shit. <laughs> <laughs> the show is shit. It's boring. The dialogue is bad. The writing is bad. It's just not good. The only character that I find even slightly endearing is the one is the 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 lesbian. 
Let me find out what her fucking name is. Walter do Krupinski. Walter do Krupinski. Waltrud Krupinski. Her. She's the only good character. The. The. The tomboy lesbian. Everything else about the show is ass. And even she is like surface level. I wouldn't even say she's a good character. She'd just be a decent side character in a in another show. But, yeah. It just happens to be that she fulfills a trope that I like. That's literally it. And it's not even, but it's not one of my favorite tropes. It's just a trope that I, like, kind of like. Anyway. Yeah. It's kind of fucking bad. I don't know how many times I can say it. But at this point, I'm, I, I, normally I would just drop this show, normally I would have dropped this show after the first episode, probably. Um, except for the fact that I had a different context, which was that the other, all the other World Witches shows that I had seen started off really bad and then got better after, like, episode three. This one didn't. It just continued to be bad in different ways. Um, so that's the first reason I didn't drop it. And the second reason is because I'm doing this thing where I'm trying to watch the whole everything. But I'm consi- I've am consider i been considering dropping it. I'm thinking about it. I keep thinking about it. I could just drop it. But, and, I don't know, man. If I don't finish it, then I can't say I've watched everything. You know? I hope everyone who watches my channel has learned this by now. On my anime list, okay, in the reviews section, sometimes you see a review that is shit, right? You see a review that you that you don't agree with or that you think is, like, particularly bad, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, for example, I've just looked at the, the mail page for Heavenly Delusion... Tengoku Daimakyo, which is a currently airing show that I think is pretty good, uh, but I'm, I'm not watching it. It's probably pretty good. You'll probably enjoy it, but it's not... I'm too busy watching bad anime uh, to watch good anime. Uh, <clears throat> and the top review... Um, well, I'm not going to go into detail, but it says some stuff that doesn't really make sense, right? It's just kind of a confusing review. And so naturally... Or, I don't know if I'd say it's confusing. It's just... It's it's not what I'd expect to be the top review, right? Because the show is very popular. Um, and it's basically a typical mal user complaining that anime has, like, any level of... Like, wait, anime characters can have sexual attractions to each other? How is that allowed? Oh my god. That's creepy. It's weird, right? It's the, that kind of mal review. Very, very typical kind of thing that you find on mal. And so I go down into the the ratings section, right? Like, it says, what do you think of this review? And it shows stuff. And I'm like, well, this has fewer thumbs-ups and love-its than the other two reviews at the top, right? So that's confusing. Until I remember, is this another case of people not realizing that Mal counts... So the only negative thing you can say about a review, you're, you're not allowed, like, Mal doesn't have a downvote system for comments. I don't, it's stupid. The way that reviews work. Wait, it's it's that anime snob? It's that anime snob? There's no way. Hold on. Oh, shit. It's like fucking midnight. I can't be shouting. It's fucking that anime snob? There's no way. It actually is him. Oh my god, I didn't even notice. It's fucking him. It, and unless this is fake, I think it's him. That's fucking wild, man. That's fucking insane. Yeah. It's him. That's crazy. That's fucking crazy. 
Anyway, I just want to point out, if you're on Mal and you see a review you don't like, do not mark it as confusing. Confusing is the only, like, vaguely negative thing that you're allowed to mark a review as, but it counts it as an upvote. So if you mark a review as confusing, it counts it as an upvote and more people will see it, and then you're going to influence more people's opinions because they're not going to know what they're not the average person doesn't know this right so they're just going to be like oh the top review is a not recommended review so i guess i won't watch it or whatever or this guy must have some good points if that many people vote right so if you think a review is bad on a show now just to be clear here i don't like i'm i'm not particularly interested in watching heavenly delusion it's it's okay i'm not playing defense for the show it's not a show i particularly i'm like invested in uh, it's just that this would, like, I probably, I mean, what, he gave it a four, I would probably give it a five, right, like, I don't have that much of a difference of opinion with that anime snob here, which is a wild sentence to say, but, yeah, don't mark reviews as confusing if you don't like them, instead, just upvote other reviews that you think are better, that's what you should do. Man, I, I fucking hate my ISP. I gotta... I just gotta say it, man. They're evil. I don't know how... I, I gotta... I, I booked a fucking... I booked... I've booked one of them. I've booked a technician to come. So I have, like, two days to... Make it so that my front room is possible as a space that a human being might live in, i.e. clean up all the trash, which I've been doing. I just have to do it slightly faster, which is good. I want to do that. It's good. It's good to have a time pressure. I mean, I don't, I, technically I don't have to. Like, what's he going to do if there's trash in the front room? Fucking call the cops, you know. But just for out of uh, a sense of shame... <laughs> anyway, um, I am currently finishing episode 12 of Brave Witches. Uh, there's like three minutes left. I'm sure one of uh, some of that is also credits. So, uh, I finished Brave Witches. I gotta say, you know, th this might be crazy. The ending of Brave Witches... Well, it wasn't good, okay, so the, what was actually happening, the the plot, the characters, I've already talked about this, it wasn't necessarily good, but the final battle actually did feel more intense and special than it did in Strike Witches. They did a better job with the stakes and with the, like, setup of the final battle, because... The like un it wasn't in the middle of the fucking ocean. It wasn't, you know, just the witches with no military support really. Like it wasn't. It felt like an actual military action. You see the commands chain. The entire strategy relies on rail mounted guns. There, there's like coordination with the ground troops it felt like a real military a action which is something that hasn't happened in this show up to this point but it it actually gave me the sense of like oh yeah these are in these guys are in the military you know so that is good that is the one good thing this show has done um the setup the lead up to that episode was fucking garbage <laughs> With, like, the sister coming back, and there was just forced melodrama that was completely pointless and out of character for everyone involved and stupid. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know what to say about it. I, I gotta say, I don't... I can't really recommend Brave Witches to anyone. Um. Yeah. That's that's about it. I find it hard to think of people unless you unless you're already a huge fan of the Strike Witches universe. I yeah I don't know if I can recommend Brave Witches to anyone. However, um, let me set that as completed. Yeah, I think I'm comfortable giving it a three. 
it's a high three. It's closer to a four than a two, but I still think it's a three, just because pretty much every aspect of the show, except for maybe the last episode, was garbage. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I'm now gonna watch the OVA, which apparently is more slice of life focused. May it has a higher rating on Mal, but that makes sense because the only people who are watching the OVA would be the sort of people who already liked the show. This is a typical thing you find with OVAs; they're generally high, highly rated because people aren't stumbling onto them and watching them randomly. The only people that watch OVAs in second seasons are the people who already liked the previous season. So, of course, it's going to be higher rated. But I will now watch the OVA, and hopefully, um, it's a good send off to these girls. So the OVA, Petersburg, or as they say it in Japanese, which I find funny every time, Petarusubergu, because <laughs> it kind of sounds like they're gonna say Petarusubur, Petarusubaruguru. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me. Petaru Subaruguru. Daisen Vyaku. That was pretty fine. I'd give it like a six. Yeah. It was... The reason it was better than the show is because it's just characters from Strike Witches instead of Brave Witches. And it's fucking Sanya, who's like... Maybe my favorite character from Strike Witches. Uh... Maybe my second favorite, uh, but one of my favorite characters from Strike Witches, and these bitches are being gay, which is always cute. Uh, the final Neroi battle is nothing special. It feels like it's just there for obligation's sake instead of because it's, like, good. Um, but, yeah, it's just mainly cute. It's got some fan service stuff that is pretty mid, nothing special. It feels it, it feels obligatory. It feels like they put the fan service stuff there because it's like it's an OVA. We have to put fan service stuff in here, but it's fine. Um, look, it's got Sanya being cute. Okay, that's all I fucking care about. Uh, so I'll give it a six. I think that's enough world witches for today. Um, but we are now more than halfway through. Uh, completing everything. All I have left to watch that's a full anime series is Strike Witch's Road to Berlin. Uh, actually, that's not true. I also have uh, uh, fucking Luminous Witches. So I have Luminous Witches and, and Road to Berlin left to watch that are full series. And the rest are all um, short series. Uh, so we're going to get there. Now, Luminous Witches... I don't expect to be very good, because uh, it's an idol show, and I'm not into idols, uh, but Road to Berlin, I do expect to be good, because it's actually the highest, the single highest rated piece of Strike Witches media, except for the movie, but the movie isn't good, so I don't know why that's, like, really high rated on Mel. Uh, I did not like the movie. Anyway, uh... Oh, I did like the movie up until the ending, which ruined it for me. But I guess most people don't didn't care that much about the ending. The ending just made me mad. Okay, I don't know. I don't think I'm gonna watch Road to Berlin today. The main reason being, uh, main reason being that there's a possibility that my internet goes out tomorrow, and in that situation, I'd like to have something to watch. I guess. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. You know what's kind of wild? So in TF2, um, the GOAT, right, the, the, the best, the greatest to ever do it, the best player in the world, is a guy called Banny. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, I'm, I'm assuming that you don't, but maybe this is more well known than I just happened to not know this until I started playing TF2. But yeah, best best guy, best TF2 player of all time is a guy called Banny, uh, and it's not really disputed. Like in CS:GO, you know, there's a bunch of people who are like Simple's the best player, there's a bunch of people who are like Zywoo's the best player, and then you know, there's there's other people who I'm sure I'm out of touch with the CS:GO pro scene who are now considered better than that. Um, 
right, there's some debate, even though most people considered it, at least the last time I checked, to be simple, th there's there's ongoing struggle. TF2 is not like that. TF2, there's been this one guy, Banny, for forever, and he probably will continue to be the greatest player. <sighs> For a long time. And the thing that's weird about it, firstly, everyone seems to, to agree that he's a really nice and chill guy, which is always good, right? And he does just genuinely love the game. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the thing that's weird about, about Banny, or interesting, I guess, is TF2 is a game with a lot of potential for skill expression, right? For like, and you you watch the high level TF2 gameplay. There's a lot of crazy soldier rocket jumps. A lot of a lot of crazy strats, right? People who are really impressive at doing all sorts of things. Um, Banny is not like that. Banny's the reason Banny is the best player of all time is he just doesn't make mistakes, ever. Like, you watch his gameplay, whether it's in a 6v6 format, uh, or whether it's in a, um, a casual format, right? Like, sometimes he dies, he's not invincible, right? Like, he, he, does, he does die sometimes, but it's almost never due to something he did wrong where you can point to it and be like, ah, oh, yeah, he shouldn't have done that. Unless he's playing stupidly on purpose, because it's TF2. Everyone does that, right? Like, maybe he's he's pushing in really deep to do a silly strat. But if he's actually trying to win, he just never makes mistakes. And it's insane to watch. Because, obviously, his aim is, is godly, because he's, a, you know... A really good player, like his aim. His aim is next level. His death matching skill is next level. His movement is next level. But like, the reason he's the best is that not only is his like he's just always in the place where it's worst for the enemy team that he's there. He's he's always in the place that you exactly where you don't want him to be. At exactly the time you don't want him to be there. And I don't understand how. Like, I watch him play, and it's like magic. Like, he's just always somehow in these situations. He just manages to put himself in these situations. And every time he deathmatches someone, it's, it's like all his shots just connect. <laughs> they just move exactly where he wants them to move. It's like he's got mind control powers. I don't understand it. Like, you watch this guy's stuff, and, like, yeah, it's impressive. But it also just seems like, yeah, this is what a good player would do. And yet, somehow, without doing anything, like, crazy, wild, insane, you know, not, like, so, you know, he hits the occasional air shot, and he can do some, some stuff from time to time. But, like, he's not, that's not his play style. His play style is very much focused on, like, strong fundamentals. In fact, the strongest fundamentals that anyone has ever had in a game. Uh, so you watch him playing, and you're just like, yeah, I mean, this guy's good, you know? And then he just doesn't die, or he just doesn't miss. Like, he's just like any pretty, like, very good TF2 player that you might see. You know, you come across really good players, right, from time to time. Except he's that with every class, with every loadout, in every situation, on every map. And he never fucks up. It's insane. Like, I, I, it's it's such a strange thing to see in a video game. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Because it's, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is it's not like his technical skill is like, miles and miles ahead of everyone else in a really flashy way that you would notice where he's like going for these insane shots that like you or I would never even go for these strategies because we're not good enough but he can go for it because he's cracked like it's not even that he goes for the same he's he's playing like a normal person 
It's just that he never fucks up. That's what I'm getting at. It's like, you, you, if you came across him and you were just watching his perspective, you didn't know who it was, and you just had a short clip to go by, you might think, yeah, this is just a random guy who had a good game, right? Or like, that was a good fight. But the fact is, every fight he's in is a good fight. It just never goes wrong for him, somehow. He's just, he's just got that, that godliness to him. He's just chosen by God. I don't understand it. He's, he's, I mean, don't get, I don't mean to talk down the guy's technical skill. Like, the fact that he doesn't fuck, like, when I say he doesn't fuck up, I mean, his brain is operating on another level. Like, every, like, he's not just thinking about the fight in front of him. He's got, like, all crazy shit going on in his mind that I don't even understand. Like, he knows exactly where every player is. He's got a natural, ingrained sense for respawn timers. Like, he just knows when people are going to respawn. He's always in the right position because he just has this insane game sense. And he just hits his shots to an insane degree. But he, he, even though he's got incredible aim... He doesn't need to use it because he always puts himself in a in a situation where he doesn't need to, where he has an upper hand in the first place. But then when he is pushed, right, into a death match, like a, an, an even death match, 1v1, he's, he always wins because he's Banny, <laughs> right? Like his pipes connect, his rockets connect. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy to see because... Like, each individual part of him fragging out wouldn't be that crazy. But you stitch it all together, and then it's like, he's just so consistent. Without being, like, flashy at all. Like, it's just very much the fundamentals of the game. He's 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 very good at video game. So there's been a little bit of a debate over the past like few years, I would say, but it, I feel like it's kind of coming to the surface now, even more than ever, about well, it's about video games, and the debate is in particular about uh, the complex interplay about like how much a game should cost versus like how much developers are getting paid, how much time they have to work on it, and the quality of the final product. So there's been a lot of calls in the, the AAA games industry that the £60 or $60 game price is too low for modern games. You know, it's costed that much for multiple... That was my Discord notification, not yours. Uh, for multiple console generations and the amount of people and money and effort and time required to make a game these days is much higher than it was back then to meet the standards of AAA development that they should really cost more to buy. Again, my Discord notification. Um... Right, like they should really cost more because the t- it's they simply cost more to produce, and you know if people if consumers want their games to meet a certain standard, then you know blah 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 blah. It's a bit of a weird argument because there's please stop sending me notifications. I'm gonna fucking mute my 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 speakers anyway. Um. It's a bit of a weird argument because there is absolutely nothing stopping games companies from charging more for their games. There is nothing fucking stopping them. In fact, they've been doing it now. There's, like, complaining about it is weird. Why not just... Like, it's... If developers are consistently saying that their games are selling badly because they're unfinished and unpolished and they're getting really bad PR for it, maybe they think to themselves, well, if we charge an extra 10, 10, 10 quid for it and we can do an, an extra six months of development time for polish then maybe people will like the game and they'll say it look i know it's an extra bit of extra money but it's worth it which is what fucking happened so i don't understand the point of complaining about any of this but then consumers on the other hand are like well look now that there are some games that are, that cost um you know extra money not just sixty dollars anymore but seventy dollars and they're coming out and they're still fucking unfinished because these AAA studios are just, ter- you know, poorly managed, poorly run. They don't allocate time properly, and developers are overworked, and some of them, are, you know, they maybe don't have good hiring practices. There's lots of different issues at play here. Uh, 
these AAA games are coming out fucking completely broken and unfinished, and you're paying $70 for it? Like, the, really? The, it turns out the price of the game, you know, just raising the price doesn't necessarily mean the studio will actually pay its developers more or give them more time. It just means that they'll rake in more profits for themselves. Or if they do, then because these studios are so big these days, even if they do decide to do the, the like, you know, smart thing and try and distribute the extra money through the studio where are they getting them I mean there's a bunch of questions right like maybe the amounts distributed once it covers the entire studio and all of the different uh, costs it might be worth very little individually you might not notice that much like there's a whole bunch of different problems what's weird to me is that no one's brought up the really obvious solution to this which is just make smaller games if you don't have the budget to make a bigger game don't make a game that big. All of the best games that I can think of in recent memory have not... Like, no one thinks that these massive, sprawling, AAA adventure game, Horizon Zero, fuck you, bullshit. No one likes these games. I mean, people like fucking... Hold on a second. Apparently people like these God of War games for whatever reason. I don't understand it myself. If I wanted to watch a movie, I'd watch a movie. I don't want the puzzle sections in my game to just tell me the answer to the puzzles with the NPC dialogue. Kind of bad design in my opinion. Uh, and I don't, just don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about these games because the games I like are games with some level of uh, artistic control <laughs> where they're not just made in a boardroom where someone goes, what would appeal to the most people? Like Last of Us or like, you know, God of War. These games where... Uh, they're so high budget that if they fail, it's a massive problem. And so they can't do anything interesting. And oftentimes if they do, as in the case of Last of Us 2, right, where they tried to do something interesting, the problem is that these people they put in charge of these games, they're not actually very good narrative designers, right? They're not very good writers. They're not, they're not great. They're, they're like good at some other stuff. They might be good at marketing games. They might be good at marketing themselves to studio execs to uh, pitches and stuff, but that doesn't make them good at designing games. And the problem is, even if they are good, these teams are so big, right, that it's just impossible to coordinate everyone towards one single vision. Uh, what you need, like, I don't understand why this is such a weird thing for the games industry to understand. Like, where are the, just make a mid-budget game. <laughs> Not every game has to be, you know... T has to take 10 years of development time, have a massive, you know, open world map made on Unreal Engine 5 with, uh, you know, all of these crazy high pixel counts and everything. Just make a game that is, like, normal, <laughs> you know? Like, what happened to games that are just normal? If the games are too expensive to make, instead of raising the price, how about you just make smaller games? Like, why is that so fucking crazy to these people? Just make smaller games. People like small games. Portal is one of the best-selling games of all time, you know? Like, there's nothing wrong with just making... And that's, like, an extreme example, you know? That game's really short, but... You know, there's no law that says you can't make mid-budget mid games. If you don't have the... I don't understand. If you don't have the budget to make these big games without fucking making... Well, they don't, because even if the developers are overworked and underpaid, the games still come out unfinished. Well, if you, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. I'm not paying you more for that. Make the game scope smaller. Make the scope smaller. Have fewer mechanics that are more, you know, cleanly implemented. Have fewer characters. Have, uh, uh, you know, less detailed models. No one's gonna give a shit, right? You go look, go back right now and look at, look at Sleeping Dogs. Look at some gameplay of Sleeping Dogs, right? Sleeping Dogs, that came out fucking, when, is, when did this come out? When did this come out? what 2012 is that when it came out 24 I, I don't know I, I i can't tell when it came out 2012 right that game looks amazing to this day okay go back and watch some for gameplay of this game or, or play it yourself if you have it right the fucking og version of sleeping dogs looks great to this day there's no reason why you know i, I mean even look at like some of these new zelda games and switch games right they're made on uh essentially the same hardware as the Wii U, right? But, and yet they look amazing. Or, you know, they look passable, at least. 
to most people. There's just no need to make your games look the way modern games look and play the way modern games play and be so fucking big. Like, make a lower budget game. I don't, it's so baffling. If you, it's actually so strange. I, I can't get this. Like, what, why is the debate should games cost more or less? The debate should be why do games cost so much? Like, why are we even, the fact that we're having this debate means games are too big. Makes lower budget games. I, it's crazy. Can, can you imagine if movies worked like this? If they were like, well, the new Avengers movie, it's, it's you know, it's three hours long. It took so much to make. So actually, if you want to go see it, you're going to have to pay extra for it. No one would fucking, they would be insane. No one would believe that. Man. man, these game devs are taking the absolute piss. I swear to God. <clears throat> like... Why? Okay, this is how Western game devs are. And to be fair, some Japanese game devs are like this too. But it's 99% Western AAA game devs. They're like this. They're like, hmm, here's our game. It's 700 gigabytes, which you don't have space for. So you're going to have to delete some shit, right? Fuck you. 700 gigabytes. It's, it's 900 gigabytes, right? These games are insanely big these days. Like, yeah? You know, you see how it's... Look, we had to work so hard to get it to be 700 gigabytes. Isn't that so big? It looks like we did a lot of work, right? It's an open world adventure game where, uh, you know, <clears throat> either it's ridiculously hard because one of our lead developers played Dark Souls and was like, the game is good because it's hard and for no other reason. And so made the game really hard for no reason. Or... It's a ridiculously easy baby game because the guy who made it really just wanted to make a movie and doesn't want players to not be able to see the end of it. With no in-between, if you want the game to actually be fun, you're not allowed to optimize it, right? Because gamers will optimize the fun out of any game. It's like the Tomb Raider remake, right? If you want the Tomb Raider remakes to be fun, you can't play it like a cover shooter where you take cover. You have to put yourself in danger so that you're actually in danger. On purpose, against the how the game wants you to play. Anyway, these sorts of things, right? So, so the game doesn't make any... It's also like five different games, you know? It's like a super heavy story-focused game. Probably a dad and son game or something like this, right? Or some stupid, you know... It's it's a game. It's about family. That's the thing about the game. Is it's about fa it's really about family. It might look like it's about shooting uh, monsters in the face, but it's actually about family. That's the thing about this game. It's 800 gigabytes. It's about family. It's going to be broken for the first three months until we finally patch it up to being, like, you, you know, playable. It's not going to work on Linux. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's got, all, it's got like, all of these crazy fucking, like, NVIDIA proprietary hair technology and, like, uh, RTX that doesn't do anything and no one really cares about but makes the game, like, five times bigger and run five times slower, right, <clears throat> uh, it's five games in one, because it's this, like, story-focused, linear, first-person adventure, but then it's also open world, with a bunch of copy-pasted side quests everywhere that don't do anything, uh, and it's an action game, it's a third-person action game, uh, but also, it's got, like, these puzzles for no reason that are terribly designed, uh, and you know, way too easy, because God forbid someone have to, like, think, like, oh, in the night, you know what we had back in the 90s, ha ha ha, we had this game called Riven, we had this game called Mist, right, and these puzzles, they were completely arbitrary, look how everyone hates that game, everyone hates Mist, because the, the puzzles are completely arbitrary, we should not make that mistake, our puzzles are intuitive, and by that we mean the characters tell you the answer if you spend more than two minutes in this location. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and it's insane <laughs> it's fucking insane oh also uh, here is like the lead developer's uh, ham fisted attempts at political commentary despite the fact that this guy knows absolutely nothing about politics and, his, and the studio ha he doesn't know anything about politics the studio the, uh, it has like neutered all of the commentary out of the game so that anything he could say that could be mildly interesting has been removed Meaning that instead it's just this, like, you know, classic liberal 
commentary with nothing really to say, except it's really preachy. Oh, also, we have a morality system. Do you want to side with the uh, fascists or the insane people? That's every every game's morality system, right? It's like, you want to side with the insane hippies, who are clearly insane, or the fascists. Uh, and when you kill people, your morality meter goes down. Ooh, uh, who's the real monster? Maybe we're the real monsters. <clears throat> uh, no, I'm not... Oh, and also, by the way, when you download the game, you don't get to play it. You don't get to play it. You have to make an EA account, right? You have to make an EA account, and that means even though you downloaded the game onto your system, you can't play it without an internet connection. It has always online DRM. You're not allowed to play it without an internet connection. Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> no internet connection for a single-player game that you downloaded onto your computer? Sorry, not allowed to play it. This is why I haven't played Titanfall 2, by the way. Because uh, I boot it up and it kicks me straight into some stupid EA login that I had to make an account for. And by the time I finished making the account and setting that up, I didn't want to play the game anymore. Uh, <clears throat> like what? Oh, what if I my internet connection is like spotty because like I don't have you know my ISP is fucking me right now. Sorry, can't play the game. Sorry. Versus, here's indie dev right. Like I am, I'm a fucking one guy right. Here's my, like, Quake-inspired boomer shooter that I've poured my life into. Uh, you don't need an internet connection. It costs two pounds. <laughs> it's on Steam. It's on H.io. It's everywhere. It's cheap as fuck. It, it normally costs five pounds, but you know what? Fuck it. It's on sale now. It's, it's 1p. Just take it. Just take the game. We don't care. Just take it, right? Internet connection? Pff, no, you don't need an internet connection. Oh, the game is two gigabytes. Like, th why would anyone ever play AAA games? It makes no sense to me. It, it's baffling. Or, like, the idea of console exclusivity is, in like, oh, and by the way, you can't play the game unless you give money to Sony or Microsoft. Yeah, how about you suck my dick? And I know people are going to be like, well, people, maybe people won't be like this, but <clears throat> you, you might, you know, there's a possibility, there's a small possibility that someone out there is thinking, well, hold on a minute, you're complaining about having to make an EA account, but you don't complain about having to use Steam. Motherfucker, I do. I want all my games to just be files on my computer. I use itch.io a lot of the time because the games, you download them, they're just files on your computer. That's what a game is. It's a program you run. On your system. It doesn't need to be exist in Steam. I don't need to, I don't want to have to have Steam open in the background just to play a game. It's annoying that I have to do that. But Steam also provides an actual service that, that like these EA and Origin or I don't even know if Origin still exists. All these other like service live platform things don't do, which is that like everyone has Steam, so it has that as an advantage. And uh, it it <clears throat> you get like a bunch of social features like the the market and like all of these like party mechanics and the 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 workshop you know all of this stuff where game devs don't you know like all of that infrastructure is already there and it's actually useful stuff that you'd want like the the workshop is is like one of the best things in gaming right everyone loves the Steam Workshop uh, most of the time <laughs> sometimes it's sometimes it's got problems with like scammers and bots and fake upvotes and all of this shit, but, like, generally speaking, it's pretty good, uh, <clears throat> and it's actually Unix philosophy, right, like, all of the party mechanics, the, the, like, the, the social stuff, like, having a chat, and having, like, voice chat and stuff, which is, apparently, you know, these days, the Steam inbuilt voice chat is actually really good, like, no one uses it, because everyone just uses Discord, but the Steam voice chat's actually pretty good, um, and, you know, the, the, all of the, the stuff that Steam does, it's actually kind of Unix philosophy. It's not really, because Steam does too many things. Um, but, like, it does make sense. If I'm a game dev, I don't want to have to put all of the stuff in my game when someone's already done it for me, and everyone already has it. So, Steam does provide some level of a service, but... And it will let you play a lot of your games offline, which is good. Um, <clears throat> and Proton is, is really, really good. Proton is, like, the, the obviously the best thing to happen in Linux games forever. Um... But, you know, I still would rather not have to deal with it. I would still rather that, uh, you know, 
there's a standalone proton that exists. I use this, right? There's a standalone proton, you don't have to use Steam. And the game is just a file on your computer. That would also be really nice if more games did that. But Steam is the, the best of a bad bunch, by far. Um, yeah, motherfucker, I'm not paying extra money for your game. If you, if you, you, when you were developing it, didn't do any job compressing or optimizing the game at all, right? You, you didn't even try. Because, well, because, I'll tell you why, it's not, I, I talked about this thing about graphics, right? Like how Sleeping Dogs looks great. It's just because I just recently saw a, a, a video of Sleeping Dogs and I was like, damn, this game looks good. Right, but like, there's a whole bunch of old games that look great. Some of them are more stylized. Like, I think TF2 still looks amazing. Uh, obviously, Wind Waker looks amazing. Everyone talks about Wind Waker. Uh, <clears throat> there are lots of. I mean, Sunshine still looks great to me. Mario Sunshine. Uh, you know, a lot of games from that sort of PS2 era, uh, maybe the PS3, uh, still look amazing. Right, the the graphical difference between PS4 and PS5 games is like very hard for me to even tell the difference. And the reason I said PS4 and PS5 there is because I don't even know what the Xboxes are called these days. They have the worst name. Like, I mean, they fucked up. Everyone knows they... I don't know how they fucked up that bad, but they fucked up. It's like, I don't even know what the new Xbox is called. I literally don't know. Uh, anyway. Uh, so if, ga- if games were fine, you know, and people still buy indie games that are, uh, you know, have retro-inspired graphics or just low poly graphics or you know stuff that doesn't look like a stylized graphics stuff that isn't super super heavy on your system is what i mean right and that these older games like half-life one or quake for example are still masterpieces to this day even though they look old right if that if that if all that stuff is possible why do game devs push graphics so hard well i'll tell you why it's because all of these game devs have deals with GPU manufacturers. I'm sure everyone knows this, but like, it's literally a conspiracy. <laughs> like, game devs and, uh, you know, NVIDIA and AMD and all of these, uh, you know, PC parts manufacturers and uh, console manufacturers, they all have deals with each other where they literally say, and this isn't like a secret, this is like very well known, like, you have to make the game only capable of running on the newest hardware. Like, you purposefully make the game so that it looks like shit if you have old hardware, because, uh, you know, then NVIDIA gives you access to their development tools and so on, right? And that way, when, when you know, someone with a mid-range or low, low-end low PC goes to play your game, they go, oh man, the game feels really slow and sluggish, and, and it's like running at 20 FPS in the graf- it, on the lowest graphic settings, it looks like shit. Like, there's no reason lowest graphic settings have to look bad. Right, you you could put a bunch of effort into making it so that the lower graphic settings still look good. They don't do it because, uh, you know, the point is that that Joe Joe Schmo who has this low end PC or a uh, last gen console is supposed to look at the game and be like, man, I wish I could experience this game in it, how it's intended to be played, and then go out and buy a new GPU and buy a new you know console and whatever. It's literally a conspiracy. Uh, so fuck all of that shit. Um, yeah, I don't understand. The fact that these guys are doing all of that and then expecting people to pay more money for games than they're already paying is insane. I have never bought a game for full price uh, that was like $60 or whatever. I, w- I would I would never and I will never do that. Uh, simply not worth it. No, There is no AAA gaming experience that could possibly give me enough value for that amount of money. I don't give a fuck. It doesn't exist. I am perfectly comfortable playing games from 2007, right? They're, those are all great. <laughs> and playing... You know what? I played this great game recently called H-Rot. Really good boomer shooter. Just came out. Play that shit. How much is H-Rot? I bet it's like 10 quid or less. It's it's on GOG as well. Uh, It's 15 quid. 15 quid for HROT. It also has a free demo that you can try out on Steam. Uh, it's It's got no DRM. It's this great boomer shooter. All of the weapons feel great. Like Hexen inspired, I guess. Or uh, 
definitely Quake and uh, yeah, it's fucking great. It's a great game. It's a really good game. It's got horses. It's sick. Go play H Rot. Fucking brilliant game. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know, man. I hope all of these studios fucking die and all of the game like if 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 you're a game developer working at these studios. I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you. You don't have any power over anything, but don't get mad at the fucking, you know. It's it's not our fault. <laughs> it's not my fault for not wanting to pay this. No, you ha you're morally obligated to buy our products because the the you see the studio treats treats its employees badly, and unless you buy our products, they'll keep playing. That that is literally blackmail. That is not our responsibility. The reason the studio is paying you badly and working you too hard is is entirely management decisions that are bad. <laughs> Big game studios, they either have the money to be doing it and have the time to be doing it and aren't, in which case that's poor management, or they don't have the money to be paying you properly and working you reasonable hours, in which case they should be making smaller scope projects and it is also poor management at no point should this cost be offloaded to the consumer and i really hope that the average consumer rises up to this fact and doesn't pay that much money for a fucking video game and that these but the studios are dumb that's the problem is the studios are fucking stupid and instead of realizing this they're just gonna keep trying to reach this insane scope that they've set for themselves with feature creep and bloat uh, and if the consumer doesn't pay for it then and if they don't have the money and time to build it off they're just gonna make broken games and then no one's gonna buy them but they're gonna keep doing it because every game studio has been making broken games forever putting them out and somehow they haven't learned their fucking lesson yet I don't understand it gamers are stupid people who buy this shit are absolutely stupid it makes no sense to me I am going to do my strike, which is chores for today, okay? But I wanted to... Uh, listen, okay? Something that most people won't remember. You know what was fucking sick? The CSGO wingman map, Rialto. Okay, that map was... <clears throat> there was something about the gameplay of that map that was just completely unique. Like, no other map in the game before or since had vibes like that map did. It was, like, so strategic and per like I used to bang that map out like I used to play that map like crazy it's like I, some of the I just remember the map was just constantly like it was very brainy map it was a very brainy map about braining on people you know something about Rialto man it was fucking all about sneaking around trying to outmaneuver your opponent You'd like, it, there was no, you know, a lot of wingman maps suck. Uh, some of them are good. <clears throat> a lot of them suck. Um, like, like, Bowyard. I don't know if that's still in the game. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can look at all the wingman maps. Yeah, Bowyard fucking sucks ass. One of the worst maps I've ever played. All the angles are really awkward. Everything about that map is just feels wrong. Every time I get a kill, it feels like luck. Every time I die, it feels like luck. Not that I play CSGO much anymore, but... Yeah. Fucking Rialto, man. That was... A, and and the, a lot of the other ones, you know... Like, I think Short Dust is a pretty good wingman map. Um, and, uh... You know... Hold on. <clears throat> what do we got right now? Boyard sucks ass. Chalice. What the fuck is Chalice again? Oh yeah, this one. Chalice is okay. It's not great. It's low. It's it's it has a very long orb sight line, like, and but it it's really it's kind of weird. Chalice is kind of a weird map. Like I don't know if I particularly like it. Like what I what I don't like about Chalice is <clears throat> you there's there's like this particular. Like, when you, when you leave spawn, you can go one of two ways, basically. There's two paths. One of them is the outside place where some, you know, 
which is really open with a very low cover. And the other one is this hallway that has like a corner in the middle uh, that you have to go around. So the you can't like stare from one way all, from one end all the way down to the other end like you can outside because there's a corner in the middle. But the hallway has literally zero cover other than that corner. Um, the outside at least has like a little bit of cover. Um, but yeah, basically the entire map is T's pushing in this area where they just sort of have to take fights around like single angles and you know r rather than there being like a lot of variety there's really only two major angles in the entire map which is that corner of the hallway and the corner of the wall in front of sight <clears throat> and uh the big problem i think is that if someone throws a molly early enough in that little hallway it becomes very you know you can't really push it um and especially if they double molly, like if they time it, so one molly and then when it goes out the next molly, you, you're basically like held there for so long. They have opportunities to push up so much that you just like as T as CT, they can push up so much. So that's definitely a problem. I don't know. The map's not great, but it's, it's I don't know. It just feels kind of bland mainly. <clears throat> um, Cobble is cobble. You know, Inferno is Inferno. Lake is fucking weird lake is such a weird map <clears throat> yeah all the other ones are just like you know fucking maps from the game um but then you used to have all of these other ones right and some of them were were, were sick <clears throat> like rialto for example rialto was really cool pit stop was really cool uh, I remember getting some crazy kills on Pit Stop. Pit Stop had a whole... At first, I didn't really like it, but I feel like a lot of people started to like it a lot. Yeah, Pit Stop was super fun. It had a bunch... It was kind of felt like a map that encouraged a little more experimentation and casual play, rather than, like, hardcore aim battles, if you know what I mean. And Hive was also... I mean, I'm a sucker for brutalist architecture, uh, Hive was pretty interesting as a map. I felt like it had some problems. But Hive was really good for going Deagle on for some reason. Uh, there was, it was very, <clears throat> I don't know, it was, it was, it was alright. Not my favorite map. Pretty interesting bombsite. Um, I kind of wish it had a little more strategic interest. It, the rounds sort of started feeling samey. By the time it got taken out of the game. What else is there? St. Mark? What's St. Mark? Oh, this one. This is like the first one they ever... Oh, this is like a... I don't even remember playing this on Wingman, to be honest. Uh, safe House. And Short Train. Oh, that's just this arms race map. And short train is... Yeah, I don't know. But Rialto was fucking sick. Ravine. What's Ravine? Oh, this map. Why is it Why is it called Ravine? It's not got a ravine in it. It's like a castle. But yeah, that map... Eh... <laughs> It was kind of too big for a wingman map. Um, I think it had a little too many flank routes to the point where you sometimes just didn't know where the fuck people were or were coming. Like, there were sometimes just so many options to flank and to escape that it's, like, hard to necessarily judge where people are going. And, like, defending, especially defending on that site. Like, the CTs can come from, like, five different entrances. Uh, you know, it's it can be pretty pretty awkward I guess <clears throat> uh, but I think it while it, and it also had some w kind of weird angles and some weird parts of the map uh, but I think that it was fine like I'm not complaining about it uh, God oh God was cool God was a neat map I feel like this was in the game for like 10 days <laughs> like I feel like it was it got taken out really quickly for some reason yeah, no, God was interesting. 
there was you could do so like a flank all the way around to CT, and then through the back of CT into the site. That was a pretty fun flank route, and then the site itself was pretty interesting because it had like a some interesting verticality, and it it was took it was like a good size for like the site that a wingman's map should have. I feel like. Um, it wasn't my favorite, but you could definitely do some wacky shit and some fun stuff on that map. It didn't get, it wasn't boring at all. Um, <clears throat> okay, Extraction. Which one was Extraction? Extraction was dog shit. <laughs> extraction fucking sucked. Yeah, that map was ass. I'd never played, I played it like a few times when it first came out and then stopped playing it because it, I just hated playing it. So, it, it, everything was just bad about this map. The angles were weird. The the map was like had some corridors that were way too narrow. It had cover in places where like the cover was just didn't make any sense. There was positions that you could just get like were way too powerful. Like utility was way too powerful in certain positions, and utility was basically useless in other positions. I remember it being a map where you could go really hard with shotguns. There were too many like weird sneaky places to, for people like for well really anyone to catch people off guard. And it felt impossible to defend the site as T uh, for a couple of reasons. M- mainly because, <clears throat> I mean, if you were. I mean, not that the bomb gets down that much in Wingman, so maybe it's not that important, but. Yeah. I, I remember shotguns being powerful. I remember there being weird spots where you could hide and then surprise people, which just never felt fun to play against. And then it wasn't. Like, sometimes that's fun, right? because it's like map knowledge but in this they just kind of fell off they weren't like natural angles if you know what i mean the map just had terrible flow in my opinion it just didn't it just didn't work it was all really awkward sized and some parts were way too like like there were parts of the map was like if you're stuck there you're just fucked because you like um like you don't have any cover in order to peek and you're like that i'm remembering a particular part of the map there's like a glass window big glass window and it's like, if you peek to, out there to, like, spot the site, you're basically, like, you have no, you have nothing. You're fucked, right? You, there's this really weird, awkward, like, table that doesn't provide proper cover. And then, like, but the, the enemies can be hiding in, like, any of four different places. Or they could be coming from any of four different places. They can even flank behind you. Like, it's just impossible. It's just a really terrible place to be. So you just never went there, which was like a big chunk of the map was all dedicated to that space, but it was way too underpowered, so no one ever went there. Um, and then the rest of the map just felt too tight and awkward. Yeah, extraction sucked. Illusion or Elysian. Uh, oh yeah, that yeah, this map was kind of fun. It had like two big main routes and then an outside balcony area. Um, I feel like it was under like there's like there, there could have been this this map felt more competitive than most uh, um wingman maps is the visibility was really good um yeah it felt like you could there was a lot of more strategy to there was a lot of strategy to happen on this map and a lot of it test it was very much like an aim test I feel like like you couldn't sort of rush you couldn't uh, do like goofy strategies. It it felt more like a comp map, uh, which is both good and bad. Uh, personally, I think it was all right. Uh, next up is Crete. Um, this is this one. Yeah, Crete. Hmm. I play. I play a lot of wingman, by the way, or at least I did. Um, yeah, it had a, an interesting orp situation going on. On the T side, uh, the bomb site was pretty unique, uh, but then I think one of the big problems with it is that there was like a stairs kind of section. I remember you'd come out of CT and go to the right, and like all the way on the right, there's like the stairs section, and this area of the map, you basically couldn't defend. Like it has a a sort of lowered down section that feels like where the CTs are supposed to sit and defend the stairs but that place has no cover so you're basically if you're going to be defending stairs you have no like there's no strategy to it you just have to hope that when the guy turns around the corner you can click his head before faster than he can click you uh, which is always feels kind of bad like it's not a good place to stand because he has peekers advantage 
and that always felt like it should be really unbalanced for me, but that it never was for some reason. Like it, it turns out that pushing that angle wasn't even that useful for the tees, even though it puts you right on site. So I didn't really understand that. But yeah, that map somehow worked, even though it felt like it shouldn't. Uh, there was a couple of problems with how like uh, some in some uh, situations I feel like utility was overpowered. Uh, you don't want utility to be super useful in Wingman, I, I think. I feel like it makes the game really boring and slow. Like, the point of Wingman is that it's like a very high-intensity, stripped-down, fast-paced version of Counter-Strike. And being able to completely deny areas with utility stifles that a lot. Um, but yeah, you, there was definitely some... I, I remember this map being way more fun to play on CT than T, even though... Yeah, it was a good map. I'll just say it was a good map. Uh, Cascade. What is this one? Oh, is my internet dying? Come on. Fuck's sake. Right, these ones are really recent. Cascade, I remember playing on. People were freaking out because of, apparently it looked really good. To me, it looked like ass. It just had a bunch of, like, detailed models, but it didn't, they didn't, it didn't look good. It, it, it didn't. Did it look realistic? Maybe. But it didn't look good. Like, it was all grey concrete, and... Honestly, a lot of the models... Looked kind of weird to me. Like, when you got up close to them... Maybe I had, like, model detail turned down in my settings or something, but... When you got close to them, it just, they, like... Looked like a lump of shit that was just stuck together, and it was like... It was all rubble, right? But when you got close to the rubble... It just kind of looked like a lump... Rather than individual pieces of rubble. Um, and then there was like a weird cave section that while it looked detailed, it didn't look like rock. It kind of looked like plastic. I remember, I don't know, people really liked, or oh, Freeclix Philip made a bunch of videos about how amazing this map looked. It also crashed. I remember when it first came out, uh, it wouldn't, if you tried to open it on, uh, Linux or Mac, it would crash your game instantly. So that was really annoying. But more than any of that, the map wasn't really fun to play on at all. Uh, it was alright, but, uh, yeah. I remember getting a pretty n nasty pistol round clutch where I hit, like, an insane one-tap on this map. I remember that. Uh, I also remember playing this map, uh, while being, uh, high on something. I don't remember what I was high on. Uh, but, yeah... I don't know what to say. It it was a it kind of felt like it prioritized, had a lot of like unnatural corners. The main inside the building section was just a weird, like the visibility. If you were a CT looking out at the the sort of entrance the T's would come through, it was kind of hard to see them. But the, it was also something that was very easy to shut down with like an AUG. Like, th that was a very powerful weapon in that spot. The sight, like, no one ever got to the sight. <laughs> I feel like all the battles happened in this, like, building section or in the other sections of the map. No one even ever cared about the, the actual bomb sight. And that's a good thing because the bomb sight was not fun to play. Like, it was all kind of centered around this big central pillar, kind of like, uh, was it B sight on Kabul? with the fountain, which is already not super fun, uh, but unlike Cobble, it was kind of awkward to maneuver around, kind of cramped. Yeah, I did not like this map very much. However, what I did like was Calavera. Calavera, all-time goated wingman map. One of the best wingman maps of all time. On the level of Rialto and, um... Yeah, it, Calavera was super fun, mainly because there were a bunch of, like, skill jumps and movement options and flanking options you could do that were just super original, didn't feel like any other map, while also feeling very counter strike -y. Um It had sort of a fast pace of gameplay that was super satisfying. I feel like it's one of the best wingman maps ever. Um, even if the actual site is kind of awkward, because it has so much verticality in so many places, uh, to like defend from or attack from uh, it's kind of hard to check all your angles uh, it really will like 
maybe I I was also just really good at the map because I I feel like I just spent like hours and hours playing this map and I knew, had better knowledge than anyone else. Like I knew all the different cheeky angles and stuff. Um, yeah, and I I would go for Zeus's and knives and shit on this map because it was very it's very movement heavy. It was very conducive to that sort of thing. Like if someone was planting, you could jump all the way from the top balcony down onto them and and Zeus them. Like that's the sort of opportunities this map had. I don't know. I just I loved this map. It was super fun. Um. And now I'm fucking waiting for my internet to come back. Okay, the last two are. The last two is uh, Black Eye. Uh, Black Eye. I remember this map being annoying to play on, but mainly because I was kind of bad at it. Uh, and it also felt like the sort of map. It there was a particular place where I felt like there should be angles, and there weren't. Uh, what I'm thinking of is there was an area of the map next to CT Spawn where there was like an outcropping and you could jump from that or oh, it was like a a little balcony over a river the map looked great by the way it was a good looking map good vis- vis- visibility for gameplay and stuff like that the actual bomb site itself was really boring every other part of the map was pretty good there was a place where that was really good for holding or pushing it was really good for holding with shotguns and deagle it was really good for pushing with SMGs, which is really good for egos um, on both sides. There was a sort of long hallway or gangway, I guess, that was good for orc battles, although not that good. And just sort of, I don't know, I liked that part of the map. That was pretty fun because it was good for rushes, basically. That was the rush B section of the map. And there was a central entrance to the site with a, with a one-way drop down that would often get smoked off and you could do a boost over the wall which is a pretty common boost and that all played okay uh the parts that were the 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 central site though built and again it's a site that's just sort of built around a big pillar although in this case it's like an octagonal building like a bell tower or something i don't know what it was yeah there was that And those battles often felt kind of, uh, if you were fighting on the site, there were these boxes, the boxes were were good. The positioning of those boxes were good. But if you were fighting around the central pillar, it was just kind of awkward. It felt kind of like, uh, what's that fucking, Benny Hill, kind of felt like Benny Hill running around this pillar. Bit weird. There was also this, the stairway down to the, the sort of Rush B style gangway couple of awkward fights would take place there sometimes people i think cts thought that they had more of an advantage there than they actually did they would get overly confident but then other times there was a really annoying like head angle where you could like peek over the railing of the stairs or the wall of the stairs and have a really big advantage and because the wall was kind of long you never really knew how to pre-aim when you were turning that corner which is kind of annoying because also some a place that's relatively hard to like pop flash well. Anyway, uh, it was fine though, not that bad, because if you killed that guy, you were rewarded. Like that's a difficult fight, but it has a high reward. If you manage to push there, you're on site in an advantageous place. Like you're basically in the best place to defend site from. So I think that's like fine, even if it's a little awkward. Um, but yeah, there was a bit at ct where you could go out onto this like this like overhang over the river and you could do a skill jump like a a, a strafe jump over to these rocks and it felt like that should be rewarded with something because that was like the rocks had collision they must have been in the map for a reason it was a fairly difficult jump and like i always felt like you should be able to go down to ct go up this railing and jump over to the rocks and then strafe jump all the way around to the bottom of the gangway to get a crazy flank. Like, it should be difficult. It should be, like, as difficult as the the roof jump on cash, right? Like, it should be a hard jump, but it should be doable. But in all my tries, I never got it to work. I don't think it was possible because there was an invisible wall uh, that extended, like, too far. That always annoyed me. <laughs> 
because it felt like a jump that was really like it felt like because if you fall that jump you land in the river and die like even if the jump isn't that hard maybe it doesn't have to be as hard as the roof jump on cash maybe it could be like you know just semi hard but the fact that the if you miss it you die instantly is good enough punishment for it to be a powerful flank route and yet it didn't exist and that always made me mad about the map also the drop down was really awkward to fight around uh i don't like drop downs in maps personally one way drop downs like that that are just sort of there for the sake of them being there uh yeah i think that's every map oh bank was apparently a wingman map for a while i actually do remember that uh bank sucks we all know this so yeah the best maps 100% um calavera one of the best maps um Elysian, one of the best maps. Pit Stop, one of the best maps. And Rialto, one of the best maps. Anyway, that I didn't mean to do this. I was just going to talk about how Rialto was cool. I didn't mean to talk about every single Wingman map. Rialto was fucking sick, man. Rialto had all of these... It had this like whole like double roof section where you could do like jumps from the roof to the roof. And you could drop down and do silent drop downs and then take full damage. And all of these different off angles and a building that had like a window where you could orb from, but if you know, and it had a wall banger ball like building that you could shoot people out of spawn if you got lucky with an orb. Uh, it had a bunch of places that you could like strategically molly and like a bunch of really good, like, it you there. This is how utility should be on a wingman map, right? Where you can you can throw utility down one of the walk like. If you've never played Rialto, this, this might not be making any sense to you, but the main thrust of the map is a bridge based on a real bridge in Italy. And the bridge is sort of divided into three lower sections with buildings separating these sections, two buildings. And you could also get on the roof of those two buildings, which kind of acted a little like the trains on train, but way more interesting because they aren't just rectangles. They had like a shape to them that was really unique to play around and you could yeah but um the the three walkways like you could molly off one of them or smoke off one of them or even two of them but because they were all separated and visually separated pushing through smokes is a perfectly valid strat so it's you know it had a whole bunch of interesting shit, man. I loved... I, I put it back in the goddamn game. Put it back in the game. Let me just tell you... 99% of shit people say... About music gear... And all of this... Sh- it's all fucking... Not- okay, listen to my bass right now. And it's gonna be unplugged, but you'll actually be able to hear it more. Okay, so this is my bass right now. That's the G string. A, another A, and then my E string. Now, I don't know if you can hear that. That's me slapping the E string versus slapping the A string. They have very, I don't know how well it's coming off, but they have very different sounds, right? That's one of my A strings. That's another of my A strings, which is slightly out of tune. You can clearly hear the E sounds completely different, right? Or maybe like a you know, this is the A on the E string, A on the A string, the point I'm trying to get across, the point is, yesterday while I was recording, my E string snapped, 
I've never had a bass string snap on me before. It took a long time for it to happen, but it finally happened. So I went on Amazon and got some new bass strings. Ernie Ball custom gauge round round wound bass strings. If you're interested. Because they were the first thing that popped up and they were cheaper than the ones that were next to them. And I didn't look any further than that. And it sounds super bright and very different from all the other strings. These other strings, I assume, are rather old because... They came with the bass, you know, like, they're definitely pretty old. And I know, you know, every... They always say you got to change your strings regularly with bass because they'll start to sound dull. Now, this bass never sounded this as bright as this E string sounds. This E string sounds brighter than the bass was when I first bought it. And now it's even bright, like, comparatively. The point is... One of the things they'll always tell you, whether you play guitar or bass, is that if a string breaks, if you want to replace a string, you've got to replace all the strings, or they'll sound really different from each other. And in my opinion, that's cool, that's chill, that they sound weird. That makes the sound of your instrument more unique and interesting. It sounds like your instrument instead of just bass or guitar. Now, your instrument has some sort of unique history to it. The E string snapped. So the E string sounds different. Or I currently have two A strings because the nut on what should be my D string is broken, but it happens to be tuned to an A, so I'm just keeping it like that. I can also tune it to a B or a G sharp, but that's it. No other notes are allowed on this string because the tuning mechanism is broken. Uh, so I have to pick between G sharp, A, or B. I went with A because it makes sense, but I've actually been using it in B as well to make some like more dissonant music, because it's the, the B, I don't know, it's kind of interesting, you can, some weird tunings, but it can't be what it's supposed to be, because the tuning thing's broken and I haven't been able to fix it. I probably could, I think I have an idea in my head about how I could fix it now. Also, no one ever taught me how to string a bass or a guitar, no one ever taught me this. Uh, I just figured it out. It's, you just look at the other strings and trade, I don't know, I've definitely done this incorrectly. Okay, I don't know how the fuck I managed to tie this string around the, the, the tuner, the peg, right? I don't know how I managed it. It doesn't, like, I'm, I like tied a knot in it because the other ones don't have knots in them and they're like poking down into the middle of the, 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 the peg, but mine doesn't do that. <laughs> Who gives a shit? It works. It's attached. It's not coming off. It looks a bit weird, but yeah, you don't need it, this is, it. listen, if you, what I'm saying to you right now is, you know, you know fucking, uh, you know band, uh, Lightning Bolt? I like Lightning Bolt, they're not my favorite band in the world, but I like some of their songs, right? The guy from Lightning Bolt, what he plays is a bass with the two bottom strings normal, and the two top strings are cello strings, tuned weirdly. Right, and that's why that music sounds interesting. You listen to Show Me The Body, and you're like, how is that guitar so twangy? That's because it's a goddamn banjo, not a guitar. And you're like, but there's nothing wrong with having your instrument be a, a little tiny bit weird. Like, the only reason you'd want, unless you're making hyper-produced pop music, in which case, you should consider not doing that, because there's enough of that in the world. Like, where's you? Where's you in all of that? And, yeah, I don't fucking know. When you layer it, layer it with all the distortion and shit, I'd be putting on my bass. You can't even really tell the difference anyway. But the point is, I'm, I hate this, all of this music nonsense that there's an entire industry built around selling you shit and selling you ideas, right? Fuck that, okay? You know... I, I made a tweet about this. I don't tweet very often. I made a tweet that was like, oh great, hey look, there's a new teenage engineering product. I can't wait for this to cost five times more than it should cost and just to do something that any door can already do. You know, fuck teenage engineering. Okay, they're fine, right? But... There's, I don't understand why people spend so much money on shit from Teenage Engineering to do stuff that is default in every single DAW that you already use. 
And I understand trying to go doorless as like a an extension of like, you know, musicality that like going doorless can open up a whole new workflow for you and uh, be really interesting to a lot of people. Like that's that's chill. And maybe if you're that, you might want to buy a teenage engineering product. But for 99% of people, it's fucking waste of money. It's a waste of goddamn money. You're giving money to these people. They don't need it. They don't need the money. It's like, I'm not going to buy a play date. Why would I buy a play date? If I want to play games, I'll just play games. <laughs> I've seen all the games on the play date. They don't look that good. But why would I do that when I can just get a, like, SNES emulator? If I want to play, like, 2D games that have, like, kind of a... You know what I'm saying? I don't know, man. People get schemazzed all the time out of this shit. You know, people are buying plugins. People are buying plugins. People are spending money on software. It's insane. And all of these music softwares, they have these insane anti-piracy measures. Uh, you know, you and the stuff just makes it fucking... It's pointless. Because all of this stuff doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a fucking difference. You're never listening to something, and then you're going, hmm... The reverb on this song, it should have been Valhalla reverb instead of the default Logic IR reverb, which is an IR, so it sounds the same because it's a fucking IR and every IR plug, every IR capable reverb plugin is the same because it's just fucking impulse responses and you can, they're, they're all compatible with each other because it's a standard. Oh my god, it fucking pisses me off. Why pay for that shit? You're paying for a fab filter? Well, actually, does fab filter cost money? I actually have no idea if fab filter costs money. I don't understand why I need fab filter. Why do I need fab filter? You know, I've been in professional studios. I've been in professional studios. They all use fab filter. Why? Alright, well, give me fab filter. Which one's this? This one, right? Pro Q3. Buy now. How much does it fucking cost? Eight hundred and ninety-nine pounds. <laughs> Wait, you're telling me motherfuckers are spending one hundred and sixty-nine euros for a fucking EQ plugin that comes for free with your door? Are you insane? People must be just pirating this, right? Surely no one's buying this. Why would I need that? Why in the goddamn fuck would I need that? <laughs> This sucks. People are so stupid. They'll just spend money on anything. Now I've used FabFilter. It's a great piece of software. Listen, I'm not gonna deny it, okay? FabFilter has a lot of it has a lot of options. Responsive options. Uh like it always can act like a you know, it can do a bunch of interesting stuff that the default logic thing can't necessarily do. But you can use weird chains to sort of emulate that sort of thing. And also, that, like, is never going to be important. These audio plugins are always so fucking expensive. Like, I really hope no one's buying this. It's insane. Don't do this. Don't spend money on this shit. Why on earth? I don't know, man. It's, It's all fucking insane. It's all bullshit. You know, you go and go. Here's what you want. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. Okay. Just one second. Well, I said I would watch more Strike Witch today, but I lied. I, I instead, I've been playing Neon White. Um. I think everyone knows what Neon White is by now. Uh. And. Uh. Uh, that was weird. It was like a voice crack yawn, but they didn't actually yawn. It was weird. Um, you know, the thing with Neon White, I have very mixed opinions about this game. It's a good game. I will say it's good. But, it's, it's, it's a good but game. The first but, I will tell you. So, every review of Neon White goes the exact same way. Every single review of the game is exactly the same. Sorry, I'm looking for something. The fuck? Every single review of Neon White is, the game's amazing, except for those cringe weeb bits. Why, you know, the cringe weeb bits, they really suck in a cringe weeb bits. 
but uh, the rest of the game is amazing. And I, watching these reviews, was sat there thinking to myself, there's no way, right? Like, sure, it's just not, you're not a cringe weeb, but I'm the kind of guy that reads real visual novels, that, like, Moe gay visual novels. Surely I'm going to like this, or at least find it possible, right? Um, the thing about it is, it doesn't actually read, like, Japanese anime visual novel. It reads like furry visual novel. It reads like western furry visual novel, not Japanese visual novel. And it is cringe and bad. I'm sorry, uh, it unfortunately is cringe and bad. Which I was, uh, I, all the reviews are correct, the, the visual novel sections are cringe and bad. Partially because the dialogue is bad. It's not that bad, it's just kind of bad. In large part because the voice acting is god awful, um, because Western voice actors bad, probably bad direction as well. Um, and honestly, the biggest problem with it though is just that it shouldn't be in the game because you're. It's. I understand why it's there. The 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 developers think this is like a super high high action fast paced game you have a contrast between the fast paced sections and then you get a break at the end of each like chapter where you get to read the thing is you don't want to fucking i don't want to read i want to keep playing the goddamn game i understand why the developer might think oh people need a break after such intense shit but in reality you want to get through the boring ass text stuff that sucks and back to the fucking game that's the that's the main problem with it the biggest problem is that it's interrupting the gameplay. I don't well, I don't care about the story. I don't care about the characters. I care about the gameplay. And the fact that it kind of is bad, it just reads like a bad furry no visual novel, uh, makes it worse. <laughs> I probably wouldn't even like it if it was half decent. Uh, so that's the big problem with the game that everyone points to. But now, I'm going to give you my more new, that's you know not really gameplay right that's the bits in between gameplay that, that are just kind of annoying filler between the good bits that are the gameplay at least what's supposed to be the good bits that are the gameplay uh now i have a couple of problems with this i have a couple of problems with the gameplay that no one else points out and i say this as someone who comes from a background of first person movement games i main TF2, which is the most movement-heavy first-person shooter, at least the most, the one that's popular. I've played a whole bunch of other movement shooters. Uh, if you want a good obscure one, so I can prove that I know shit, uh, Cocaine Diesel, really good. It's like Counter-Strike movement shooter, kind of. It's kind of like Quake as well, a little bit, or maybe Unreal. I'm not sure what. It's pretty good. I think that movement engine also has some problems, but anyway. The Source Engine is the best. When I played Counter-Strike for 3,000 hours, I was a movement player, right? I used to speedrun Half-Life 1. Um, I've uh, speedrun, or at least, like, I mean... And when I'm also big into, like, speedrunning game. Right? I've spent a lot of time surfing in CSGO and CS Source. Uh, I'm, like, a Tier 3 surfer, which is not very good on the grand scheme of things, but better than average. Uh... Um, not very good for a surfer, right? Like, pretty fucking bad, actually. But slightly better than the average CSGO player. It's like a one step... Like, I'd say Tier 2 is, like, average for someone who knows how to surf. Uh, tier 3 is, like, someone who's actually spent time surfing, but not... It's still, like, the upper end of beginner. Uh, but I have spent a lot of time surfing, is my point. Um, and I really like speedrunning short individual levels. So I've speed run Counter-Strike Condition Zero Deleted Scenes ILs. Um, I've speed run, well, I've also, you know, gotten most of the author medals in Tragmania Nations Forever. Um, I speed ran for like two days, not out of any sort of competition, but just for fun, trying to improve my times. Uh, what is it called? Sonic GX, I think it's called. The best 3D Sonic game. No, well, that's not what it's called. Hold on. 
Hold on. I've forgotten the game. What's it called? Hold on. I gotta look through. It's not Robo Blast 2. GT, that's it. Sonic GT. Uh, fucking amazing game. I believe this is it, yeah. And honestly, if I had to pick any game that Neon White reminds me of, it would be Sonic GT. Um, anyway, the thing is, I'm really big into Source Engine first-person shooter movement mechanics, right? And I'm also big into big into speed short individual level speed runs uh, and games like that. This is like, by all means, Neon White should be my shit. Here are my problems with the mechanics. The movement is unnuanced, as in the actual movement of the player character. Uh, they're, they're, unlike in the Source Engine, you don't have air strafing in any real capacity. The movement engine, if I had to compare it to a game that I've played, it's more like Minecraft than anything else. As in, like, it's you hold, you don't strafe, you just hold W. Uh, and the, you move where the camera is, basically, when you're holding W. Now, what this means, and also momentum, not a thing. Like, if you're in the air and you press S, you just instantly come to a stop. But then, unlike in Source, if you start holding W again, you'll start moving forward again in the air. So you can, like, stop in the air and then gain momentum again in the air without any mechanics it's just holding the direction you just move in whatever direction the arrow you're pressing without any deeper mechanics than that there's no strafing there's no smoothness you know there's no sv air accelerate there's none of that you just move where you're pointing and you and whatever arrow key you're, you're holding down which is frankly pretty boring <laughs> um and it you know Adding air, I'm not saying it has to be exactly like source, but it would be nice to have air strafing. Air strafing is a good mechanic, uh, like the way it works in source. It would make the game better, in my opinion. There's a reason that most people consider source to be the best movement engine, first person movement engine. But anyway, maybe you can pass it off as personal taste. All of this you can pass off as personal taste. But one thing again, there was a huge annoyance to me, is how fucking floaty the game is. You press jump, and it's like you're on, like, a low-gravity server in, like, you know, a source game or whatever. It's like, it's like, you're, it's like you're playing in 20% 20, 20 gravity. Like, you, you jump, and you just float in the air forever, and you have so much control that the game feels super floaty. And honestly, being, like, floating through the air like that, it feels bad. <laughs> it doesn't feel visceral and, like, precise. It feels weightless and uh vague and uh, and slow to be honest it feels slow because you know this is i heard someone describe this i forget what review it was in i think i might have even mentioned this on a podcast at some point as to why i didn't want to play the game uh i i, I watched a review of this where someone said it's like speed running for non speed runners it's like giving you the feeling of speed running for someone who doesn't actually want to speedrun a game. And that put me off because I was like, I don't want the feeling of speedrunning for someone who doesn't speedrun. I want the feeling of speedrunning for someone who does speedrun. Uh, and this game is very much like that, where, you know, in reality, if you pay attention to what you're at, what's actually going on, there's the, the, the actions per minute is actually pretty low. Like, compared to just playing TF2, you know, where there are all of these interesting movement mechanics and movement is such a big part of the game. And, like, you're constantly, you know, whatever the wazd keys you're holding down is constantly changing. Your mouse movement is super important because of smoothness and strafing. You know, super important. Uh, and then you have to combine that with aiming Plus the fact that you're looking, you know, if you're playing Soldier, for example, you're you're flicking backwards to, to rocket jump. Uh, if you're playing Demo, you're, you're like aiming to shoot stickies while you're midair or something like that. Like there's all of these other, there's all this other stuff that you're doing, right? Whereas in Neon White, you just sort of press, like the, the, the WAS doesn't matter. What matters is space, 
left click, right click. Those are the only things that actually matter. You know, aim is not a problem in the game. It's not a big deal. There's like one level that requires you to have decent aim. That's it. Like all it's, you know, aim doesn't matter in the game, which is probably good. Uh, but yeah, aim, aim doesn't matter. What, and your mouse pointing doesn't matter. Mo- movement doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters, it's a rhythm game where you press left click, right click, and space at the right times. So that's really what the game is. More so than a movement shooter. Uh, and it is very satisfying to get right when you actually get the combo of inputs right. But there's another thing which I think is a problem with the game, which is... Um, I I think it's too easy, at least so far, it's too easy to get the diamond medals. Like, I expected the diamond medal to be like the author medal in Trackmania, where it's like, you have to do it, like, really well. Like, it's not just, but whereas in, in Neon White, you unlock the gold medal, and then a, a little icon shows up that, that shows you the shortcut in the level, the major shortcut, then you just do that, and then you instantly get the diamond medal. The only times when it's actually tight are in levels that don't have shortcuts. Like, when if there's a shortcut in the level, the timer isn't tight to get the diamond medal, which means it's not super satisfying. Um, and you can't look at your place on the global leaderboard because the top scores are all, like, hacked or something. They're all, like, 0.0, so it's, it's clearly hacked. Um, and then on my friend leaderboard... You know, no one else on my friends list went for the medals. I guess they just like ran through the entire game once and didn't care about it. So I just instantly get top on my friend leaderboard. Because <laughs> only only two other people that I'm friends with on Steam actually played the game. And neither of them seem to have really cared about optimizing. Uh, whereas you, the, when I p- played the game, I ran through the first level and then instantly replayed it until I got the diamond thing. Like, there was no part of my brain that was like, I'll just run through the game once and then come back and improve my times. Because that's not fun. The game isn't fun to just play through each level once. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like the ability to, op- like, the optimizability of the game is really low because it's actually not that fast paced. It's actually pretty slow compared to, like, a real speed run. Of, of like a, a, a first person shooter uh, or a lot of the FPS speedruns that I've played or TF2 gameplay in general like it's ju- it's actually pretty slow in terms of action and it's very floaty which adds to the feeling of slowness um, so yeah like there's a lot about the feel of the game that I, I actually don't like uh, that being said I know I said a bunch of negative shit just then uh, you know, all that being said, I still think the game's good. Like, it's definitely, it's trading, you know, the, rather than the diamond medals being, like, hard, and being like, you have mastered the level now, it's more so that they're like, you are, you know, they're, they're one step down from that, and the idea is there are just a lot of levels, Right, and so it's like you get the diamond level, the diamond on each level. It takes you like three extra tries to get the diamond. You know, first time you complete the the level, you get you're gonna get gold every time. Like they're not hard. The the gold is not hard. I think that there was only like three levels where I didn't get gold first time, not counting the the first level because I was figuring out how to play the game, but not counting the first level. I think there was only like three other levels where I didn't get gold first time because the gold is just easy like you can just read the level and get gold without having to optimize at all like and this is what they mean by it's like speed running for non speed runners because you don't really have to optimize right like th- to get the diamond the diamond medal is isn't or oh, i think it's called like the ace medal in the game but it's a diamond medal let's be honest the diamond medal isn't you've optimized the level it's you've done the shortcut you've done the intended shortcut metal and then there are some levels that don't have a shortcut and sometimes i don't know man the controls on that also there's a particular power-up that i don't like most of the power-ups feel great the stomp power-up or weapon 
I don't like that one. I don't think it feels good to play. It feels really awkward to me. Maybe it's just me. It's hard to judge its range. It just feels weird. Um, and in fact, I will say explosive jumping in this game, I mean, it's no TF2. <laughs> it's not, it does not, like, there's no air strafing. It just, so it just feels like nothing. It feels too, like, there's no challenge to, to explosive jumping at all. You're jumping off of explosive barrels or the, the like, grenade launch jump from the purple gun. And it's like, you know, the timing is so lenient and... It, it, I don't know, man. It's it's too easy. It's too dumbed down. That's fine. Like, it's fun to blast through levels, but it's not going to be my fa- It's not going to be one of my favorite games because of like, I couldn't list it among my favorites because the mechanics are so dumbed down because they're all so intentional, rather than being emergent aspects of the game engine. They're you know all very intentional, which, and very rounded off and sanded down. I don't want to necessarily say sterilized, because it's not that bad, but, you know, they're not as mechanically complex as equivalent movement mechanics in similar games. Uh, And that, I don't know, it's a little unsatisfying to me. Someone remake Neon White in TF2, then it will be the best game ever made. Soundtrack's great, by the way. The thing about Sonic GT is that I was going for, like... I I, I know, I, I was pushing that game really hard. And that game has really good momentum physics. Like, Neon White, kind of shitty momentum physics. I think that's the big thing, really, now that I'm thinking about it. Is that, that it doesn't... The momentum doesn't matter. Like, there's no way to maintain momentum. And there's no... Like, oh, you fucked up, so you, you get punished by losing momentum. It should be like a Sonic game, or like a Source Engine. I mean, like, you get on... So when you're going on water, you move faster. But there's no way to, like, sk- do some skillful thing where you abuse that fact to maintain the extra speed boost you get from water. Because as soon as you jump, the speed boost, like, goes away. At least that's what it feels like. Uh, I don't know if that's actually true, but that's what it feels like. Which is mo- the most important thing, by the way. That's not me saying, like, oh, I might be wrong. That's me saying, like, that, that, that it's, what we're talking about is the way the game feels. That's what's important. And it doesn't, like, you'd think you could be like, aha, I will be smart and I will jump uh, off of this water thing as far as possible before touching the normal ground to maintain my speed. But in reality, jumping just slows you the fuck down. And so, there's, like, momentum physics doesn't exist properly. In Sonic GT, everything is momentum-based, right? Because it's a great game, it's a good Sonic game. Uh, Like, momentum in that game is super powerful. Uh, Yeah, I think that's really what makes the game feel kind of bad. It's the combination of, like, the gravity being so low, which makes jumps super floaty. The fact that air control is just trivially easy. Uh, Like, there's no, like, techniques to extend your jump. Tight jumps aren't tight, you know? Either you can make the jump or you can't. There's no, like, ooh, I can just barely make it if I jump perfectly. No. Like, either you can make it or you can't make it. And it's not just the level design, it's because there's nothing to make a jump except for hold W and head in the right direction. Um, yeah, there's, so the jumping super floaty, uh, the, there's, there's not proper momentum physics. Like, it, you don't have, like, situations where you are rewarded by maintaining your momentum or punished by losing your momentum. And, uh, yeah. I've said this before and I've said it again. My opinion on gatekeeping is that if you have to gatekeep your fandom or whatever you're into, then you're not into... Whatever you're into is already sort of pre It's a ticking time bomb. What you need to be doing 
is getting into to hobbies that gatekeep themselves. So what I mean by that is, it, you know, take something very wide or marketable, right? Like, it would be basically impossible to gatekeep Breaking Bad, for example. It's easily accessible by everyone. It's widely known. It's in English. You know, there's very few barriers to entry for Breaking Bad. And it's something that most people would like, right? And then you compare it to, like, you know, a lot of people talk about gatekeeping anime. Whereas anime uh, is obviously, and I'm endlessly frustrated with this fact, is that, like, anime doesn't exist, it's just a medium, right, like, there's a huge difference between, you know, the, the, the classic, well-liked, or sort of more the high art anime films, like, you know, Akira, Ghost in the Shell, Steam Boy, Metropolis, uh, these ones, right, and uh, Totoro, right, the Miyazaki films, Makoto Shinkai, right, versus, uh, Strike Witches, for example, or Nanoha, or Precure, or, um, you know, the point being, I don't have to sit here and worry about gatekeeping the, uh, Hidamari sketch, right? I don't have to worry about gatekeeping Tamayura. I don't have to worry about gatekeeping sketchbook full colors, because the only people that are going to watch that the people that are already interested in this, right? The people who you want to watch it. But even then, you know, I might have said a few years ago, I might have said this about Lane. I might have said, like, well, Lane, you know, at the time, my favorite single piece of media. I was like, Lane, you know, it gatekeeps itself. It's fucking weird and slow and ambient and whatever. Whereas now, obviously, Lane is, like, super popular with TikTok normies and has blown up massively and is sort of getting flanderized by the internet and you have a bunch of people who like maybe haven't even watched the show or don't even you know so on right i would have imagined that lane was the sort of thing that could gatekeep itself but on reflection you know lane isn't that gatekeeping i mean i i don't know i i think that a lot of people who are sort of the tiktok lane fans haven't really watched the show uh, they just sort of like the character design, or whatever. I mean, I'm not here to care about that. Uh, the thing is, the what, you don't, what I don't have to gatekeep... Right? Like, at the end of the day, Lane is a 13-episode anime series. It's not something that's crazy hard to get into. You just have to sit through 13 episodes of a show, which is, you know... Shouldn't be hard for pretty much... It it doesn't really gatekeep itself that much. It doesn't really have anything, like, that edgy or off-putting to most people other than the sort of the fact that it's kind of experimental, right? But it's not, like, super out-there art house. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, Inland Empire or something, right? Like, you're not going to see a bunch of random normies super getting into Inland Empire anytime soon. Right? Like... Uh, Lane is not on that level. It's kind of a boogie pop kind of situation, right? Where it it's it's got the well, yeah. But whereas you don't, what I don't think will ever need to be gate kept is like, uh, you know, you'll you'll never need to gatekeep um Onichan, uh Kisu or Jumbi or Madadeska because no one's gonna read that. If they don't already think it's going to be something they're going to be into. Because it's like a, 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 what, 30 hour, 40 hour visual novel that is all about a guy who fucks his sisters. <laughs> you know, right? Like, that's all that it is and there's nothing else to it. Like, that's not going to have a, a broad, wide appeal because most people are going to be off put by the very idea of it existing. Right, most people are going to have the opposite opinion. They're going to try and come at you. They're not going to say, let me like this. Let me enter the group of people who like this. They're going to do the opposite. They're going to say, you shouldn't be allowed to like this. Right, like, And this is something... So, that video about the Doom 
wad my house dot wad blew up and it's a great video and that's a great doom mod or doom custom map uh, i'm I, I i'm like slightly adjacent to the doom community but not enough for me to like claim uh you know stolen but <laughs> i'm not gonna pretend that i actually know that much about doom i I, Doom is one of my favorite games. I've, I've played a couple of WADs in the past, but nothing crazy. Um, and I played through my house top WAD as well. After watching the video, and it's great. It lives up to the hype. Uh, but I've seen some people worried that, uh, you know, because my house top WAD works in a lot of this liminal spaces, back rooms type of shit that like house of leaves the book is going to become flanderized you know due to this this doom mod that's very popular and become like a five nights at freddy's type of situation and i'm just here to tell you you don't have to worry about that okay house of leaves is a fucking massive book zoomers can't read books i've never seen any evidence that that a zoomer is going to be able to make it through uh, through house of leaves Case in point, I am a Zoomer and I haven't finished House of Leaves because it's too damn long. <laughs> no one, you're going to get to the part where like the text is like upside down and in little boxes and like there's three different texts and you're, there's, you know, no one's going to read that shit. Okay, you don't have to worry about this because House of Leaves gatekeeps itself just by being a long ass book that's weird. You don't have to, the format gatekeeps it. You don't have to worry about gatekeeping the House of Leaves community because as soon as someone... But the, either the type of people that are going to read House of Leaves are already the type of people that you want in your community or they will be by the time they finish the book. Uh, right, like they will learn to become that that type of person by the time they finish it because House of Leaves gatekeeps itself. Same for Super Hebe, right? Like I don't super have to worry about... Uh, people who, uh, you know, a bunch of Zoomers getting really into Subahibi. I think it could happen, but at the end of the day, it's a 40-hour long visual novel uh, with, like, a bunch of fucked-up degen shit in it that's very, you know, it's not something that's easily avoidable. It's major parts of the... The visual novel are, like, guru, eroguro, nonsense, bestiality, all sorts of fucked-up shit, right? shock content which is there specifically to gatekeep people and you know j just the fact that it's long is enough right like uh, you know all of the ryuki i always forget if it's ryukishi or rikishiki 07 the 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 umineko higurashi fandom you know that shit feels like the sort of thing that would super appeal to normans uh, and a lot of Normans do really like the Higurashi anime, the original one, you know, it's super popular. But the people who are fans of, you know, that's never led to a flanderization or a normie invasion of Umineko fandom. Right? Like, Umineko fandom is Umineko fandom. Uh, the, 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 you know, I'm, I've not read it. I'm not a member of this fandom. Yeah, I know, I need to read Umineko, okay? It's one of my many things I need to do. Um... Yeah, like, because it's, like, a million hours long, it gatekeeps itself. Like, you either, by having some obscurity or means test built into the work, or by having some sort of uh, themes, right, or content that is off-putting to the sorts of people that you don't like, right? Like I talked about, like I just said with... Uh, I always bring it up as like a stereotypical example of like a, uh, a, 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 a like a nuki gay. It's not even really a nuki gay. It's like an you know as like a stereotypical edo gay. I guess I could pick a different one. Um, uh, I like you don't have to you don't have to worry about a bunch of people invading any particular visual novel fandom except for like the the most popular ones like any of the you know the the moe gay or like edo gay like the, no one's gonna fucking sit through all of like, like uh, fucking i don't know koi ni kanmi o soete right love sweet garnish 
great visual novel. No one even no one who's not already deep into moe gay or at least like knows about moe gay even knows that this exists. Even if it blew up on TikTok for having like anime aesthetics, you know, just the fact that it's how long is it? Let's see. It's 10 hours long. That's like double the length of a typical anime series. I mean, that's not that crazy, to be honest. Although there are two... There's also a sequel, so I guess it's like 20 hours, assuming the sequel is the same length. Or Magical Marriage Lunatics, right? That's one of my favorite visual novels. Uh, Well, it's not one of my favorites, but it's a good one. It's one of my favorite... um, I don't know what to call it. Like, sort of generic visual novels. Harem-style fuck the girl visual novels that isn't like some sort of deep philosophical isn't trying to be some sort of you know what I'm saying like focused more on slice of life and uh, like arrow scenes and romance and stuff uh, yeah well you, you don't have to worry about that because no one's reading fucking like 35 hours no one's going to spend 35 hours of their life reading this shit if they're not already into it, right? Because it's already instantly off-putting. The whole premise of magical marriage lunatics, Magikaru Mariaji Lunaticusu, is a random guy has a bunch of supernatural girls who are, uh, for no clear reason, all destined to marry him, and he has to choose which one to, to marry in the mean, uh, meantime, you know, having sex as well with them. Like, that concept is going to gatekeep anyone who you don't want reading it, <laughs> right? Uh, or, right, like, Neko Power, for example. Neko Power is super popular for some reason. I don't know why. I've read all the Neko Power visual novels. They're all right. The first one is the best one. I- I've read every single Neko Power visual novel, and yet, somehow, despite being super popular and the, like, chocolate and vanilla show up everywhere, the only people who actually talk about Neko Power are, you know, degenerate weebs like me. And I'm, I'm using weeb media because it's just an example of something that gatekeeps itself because it generally has stuff that's off-putting or, you know, considered cringe or immoral or, or boring or bad by, um, you know, most people. Uh, that it just throws them off. But I think House of Leaves is a great example where just by the nature of it being like a weird, dense, and long-ass book, it's it. you don't have to worry. The, the House of Leaves fans who are worried because of my house.wad, you don't have to worry, okay? You don't have to. Doom might have difficulty settings. You might be able to put Doom on I'm Too Young to Die mode, you can't put House of Leaves on I'm Too Young to Die mode. You either read the book or you don't. What a day! What a fucked up day! And it's barely begun for me. So, here's the dealio. Here's the dealio. A couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, a friend of a friend hit me up and said, Hey, you like uh, Haru Nemori, right? Uh, which is true. I do like Haru Nemori. Although, I haven't kept up with anything she's been making. I just liked that one album uh, when it came out. And I used to bang it out. And I haven't kept up with her shit at all. In fact, I'm curious as to what she's been up to. But anyway, I like Haru Nemori's... I like that one album a lot. Uh... <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so a friend of a friend hit me up and was like, "You like Haru Nemory, right?" Well, look, I can get you tickets to the show that she's doing. Uh, in London, you want to come? And I was like, "You know what? No, I haven't gone to a show in ages because they're too loud and too many people, and I don't normally have fun. But a Haru Nemory show." It's probably going to be relatively chill, you know, she's not super popular, so it'll be, like, relatively small scale, you know, should be probably doable, um, 
and the tickets are relatively cheap, so sure, fuck it. So I said yes. Um, uh, right, so it was me, Lil Crazy Bitch, and Lil Crazy Bitch's friend who were going to go. Anyway, that was today. And randomly, with no rhyme or... I, it was going to be completely fine. You know, I've been waking up at like 3, 4 p.m., which is strange for a normal person, but not too unusual for me. Completely no problem because the show doesn't start till 8, right? So I was like, we're all good sleep-wise, we're all good everything-wise, everything's fine. So randomly, I slept for 12 hours last night. Just out of fucking nowhere, I slept for 12 fucking hours and missed it. Because by the time I woke up, it te- uh, I should mention, the show is on the other side of London, right? Like, it, it's it, it's pretty far away from me. Uh, it would have taken me, like, an hour to get there. Uh, so... It's an hour journey there, an hour journey back. I would have been late getting there because by the time I got out of my house, you know, even absolute rushing mode, it took me about, you know, 20 minutes to to have a shower and stuff and get dressed. And it took me about 15 minutes, actually, maybe. I don't know exactly how long. I wasn't paying attention. By the time I, I managed to get out of the house, get dressed, get a shower, everything, I didn't have breakfast. The closest train I can get is at, like, 27 minutes past. And it's going to take over an hour to get there, about an hour and 10 minutes to get there. So by the time I actually got there, uh, you know, it would already be, like, 8.30, probably. And I don't have the tickets on me. My friend has the tickets, so it's, you know, who knows if they'll even let me in in the first place. And even if they did, I'd catch the last 15 minutes of the show, probably, by the time I got, you know... Like, it wouldn't even be fucking worth it. So, I had to just... Even though I, I got ready and got out, I, I was literally walking to the train station when I had the realisation that, like, this isn't worth it. To do a two-hour journey just to catch 15 minutes of a show, definitely not really worth it. So that was fucked. And now I feel fucked because I slept for 12 hours, right? I woke up and it was like the episode of Spongebob where they, they go into Sandy's dome and they, they all dry up. Like, that's how I felt. I still feel fucked up. Uh, yeah, I still feel fucked up from sleeping so long because you're not supposed to do that. I have no idea why my meat prison decided to do this to me. Uh, this is my problem in life, is that my sleeps are just Im- incomprehensible. It's impossible for me to maintain a reg- It's I don't even understand, man. Does this happen to normal people? Do normal people just randomly sleep for 12 hours? I don't think so. I think this is just a, a rare me thing. So I miss this fucking thing. I can't go hang out with my friends. I go back home. And then I'm like, fuck, man, I'm so hungry because I slept for 12 hours. I'm super hungry. I look in the fridge. I don't really have any food. I mean, I have food, but uh, not like most of it's kind of like frozen shit, like nothing I want to eat. And so I'm thinking, you know what I'd really like right now is a burger. I consider buying McDonald's delivery, but then I'm like, I don't really like McDonald's, first of all. And secondly, it's not worth the extra money. So instead, I'm like, you know what, I'll go to the store and I'll buy a burger patty and buns and some lettuce and I'll just make burgers myself. You know, I've done this plenty of times. Normally, it turns out pretty well. The I There was two options of burger patties at the store. I know it's probably, I mean, it's definitely cheaper to make patties yourself, but... Uh, if I'm going to do that, I want to buy decent, like, the, the 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 mince that they have at the store isn't correct burger ratios of fat, right? Like, if, you, if I wanted to do that, I'd have to go to a butcher and ask specifically, which I've done once before, and it was one of the best burgers I've ever had in my life, but the butcher is really far away from me, and also closed <laughs> by the time I got there, so that wasn't an option. So I'm just buying these burger patties. They have two options, 
One of them is the fancier option, and then the, the, the normal people option. And it's only a one pound price difference between the fancy ones and the normal people ones, but the fancy ones, you get two patties, but the normal ones, you get four. So I'm like, obviously, I'm getting the normal ass ones. And then for some reason, I decided instead of making one burger, I would make two burgers because I didn't know what I was going to do. But then also for some reason, I decided to make chips with it, which is way too much food to have two burgers plus chips. Like, this is why you don't try and think about making food when you're hungry, because my eyes are always bigger than my stomach when I'm like super hungry. So I made all this fucking food. I didn't eat but like half of it. I left half of the second burger and most of the chips because it was just too much damn food. And the burgers were, they were the cheap burgers, so they were mid as fuck. Like, they were, they weren't terrible, but they were just very mid. Uh, and yeah, now I just fucking feel weird, because my breakfast was two burgers, <laughs> like one and a half burgers and some chips. So I feel fucking weird. I don't know why my stupid body was craving a burger. I don't even eat burgers often. I don't even, when was the last time I ate a burger? Like two months ago, probably. Actually, I remember the exact last time I ate a burger, and I think it was about two months ago. Maybe about a month ago. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I don't even eat burgers regularly. Oh, man, it's just fucked. <laughs> and I, now I just wasted all that food because I didn't want to finish this burger because I'm too full, and I don't want to eat. I'm not going to put it in the fridge and eat it later because I'm, I, there's too much mid-burger. I don't want to eat any more burger. But I have to because I still have two patties left, and... Ah, man. <sighs> yeah, just a weird start to a day. So, I'm still playing Neon White. Played a bunch today. Um, and it's I still think it's a fun game, but I still have all the same problems with it uh, that I've already mentioned. Even though... I'm getting into the harder stages now, which you'd expect would sort of answer a lot of my problems. But the thing is that the difficulty in the harder stages isn't... Oh, what the fuck? I just got an electric shock from my laptop. Ow. Uh, the difficulty isn't from the timer being tighter, it's just from the level being harder, right? So once you know how to play the level and you get consistent at it, it's not any harder to go for the ace um, medal than it would be in any other level. Um, I also got top 2,000 in the world on one particular level, which might not sound very good, but I'm best by far that I've done. Um, I could definitely grind that level more and probably get top 1,000 if I was to be really autistic about it, but it's basically because the stuff that's holding me back isn't execution. It's just like uh, the, the, the world record strat on that level, because I looked it up, uh, is basically to just like shoot before you can even see some of the enemies, like <laughs> pretty much, like the, the basically the frame they come on screen, you just have to already be pre-firing. Uh, it's, it's pretty much just luck, like, you have to go through the motions until you get it, which I could do, and it would probably be a decent grind, like, as in, like, it wouldn't probably take me weeks to get in the top 1,000, it would probably take me a matter of hours, um, but I'm not really in the mood to do it right now, or well, maybe I could do it if I, I don't know. I I'll think I'm thinking about it. I think when I beat the game, I might come back and grind that level. But I, at that point, it stops being fun, right? Like it's not about executing a complex series of inputs. It's just like the two inputs that are gonna reset you every time. It's kind of annoying. But yeah, I'll tell you one thing that I don't like about Neon White is the fucking rocket launcher. The rocket launcher sucks. In fact, the way explosive jumps work, both the grenade jump with the the purple gun grenade jump and the rocket launcher, both suck because they just sort of 
put momentum in you in a predetermined direction. Like, if you fire a rocket and it explodes above your head, it will still push you up. Same with grenades. They always push you up. They're super lenient. Um, and because of that, you'd imagine that would make it easier, which it does make it easier, but it also takes away control, which weirdly makes it harder because sometimes it's because it's just always pushing you in sort of a predetermined direction. It's not really physics based. It's applying a force to you. Um, it, it becomes kind of harder to predict what it's going to do. Um, and it doesn't have as much of a, as much depth, mechanical depth as like TF2's rocket launcher does, although nothing does, but yeah. Um, so the rocket launcher, while still fun, cause it's a rocket launcher and it's a, it's, they combined the rocket launcher and, uh, grapple hook into one weapon, which is the two best movement mechanics in any video game <laughs> combined into one weapon. So that's fun. Um... Uh, but, you know, the mechanics of them are a little meh. Like, they could be better. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I was going to say something else about the game. Fuck, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, some of the levels, I don't know if I'm just burnt out because I played for like quite a long time today, but I felt like some of the level design is starting to be a little unfun <laughs> like some of the levels are i mean don't get me wrong some of them are, oh hey my internet's back some of them are still good but i feel like the frequency of levels that are more frustrating than fun is increasing but some of them are st like one of my favorite levels was uh in one of the hardest stages like mid midway mid difficulty stages um but yeah a lot of the way they're making the game harder is just longer section like longer stages so like more stuff to memorize um i really wish like it would be nice if they would make it so that you have to do more actions per minute like this is still like one of the big ways they're increasing difficulty is just making shooting more precise and that is not like that's fine i guess but what I really want is not to have to shoot more precisely, but have to shoot more often in lots of different directions. So it's like, boom, 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 boom. You know, like much faster rhythm rather than sort of <clears throat> having moments where you're just holding W and not really doing anything. Which, again, they're lessened as the levels have gotten harder. There are fewer moments like that. Uh, but yeah. There's also, a, I still have this problem with this, some of the ace medals are just, like, way too easy. Or it's like, I'm beating them by, like, two seconds when I'm actually going for the shortcut. To the point where I started trying, like, I started ignoring the shortcuts purposefully and trying to get the ace medal on certain stages without using the shortcut. <laughs> That's how easy they are, is that they're supposed to be the time you can only get using the shortcut and yet some of them are very doable without the shortcut with just really optimized movement and you know some of the stuff i said about the game being like speed running easy mode and me being frustrating frustrated about that i've changed my mind on some of this because uh like i the game what the game is going for is to give you the feeling of having optimized the level without the actual arduous process of optimizing a level right and i imagine a lot of the people who really like this game have never really done like individual level speed runs where they're trying to shave you know 0 0.1 second off their time or whatever and playing the same level over and over again like i you know with sonic R or something when i was doing that like uh it's trying to compress all of the experience it's trying to compress routing and then uh learning a level learning a run and then practicing a run learning skips for the run and then optimizing all into one compact gameplay loop that goes over and it, like it repeats with every new level and um it's more so going after the feeling of doing that than the actual you know 
reality of doing that i.e the times that are the supposedly optimized i mean there there is like a i i with the level that i got top 2000 in it gave me a red uh it gave me a different medal a new medal so uh, i guess there actually are there is like the equivalent of a trackmania author medal for stuff that is genuinely really optimized so I don't I don't know I might end up going for all of those in the game. I don't know if the game's fun enough to do that. I might just go back and play some of the levels that I particularly like and try and get that red medal. I'm assuming it's like a new game plus thing because it didn't give me any like it didn't tell me I got it. I just saw that I had it. So maybe it's just something that like unlocks once you beat the game. Uh, yeah, I don't know if the, the mechanics are fun enough to go back, although I still think that gr- there's a couple of levels that I might want to grind. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of the precision aiming stuff is one of the less fun parts of the game. It's not unfun, like I still like it, and I'm pretty decent at aiming just because I've spent a lot of time playing FPSs, so none of it's like super hard for me. I mean, it's not that it's super easy either. It's like a good level of difficulty, um, but it's it feels. I don't know. I'm fine with it existing in the game. I just the, the, what I want from the game is like very slightly different from what the developers want. Like what I want is like something where, kind of more like a Kaizo Mario level, I guess. But in th- in three D space with F- FPS Kaizo Mario type of thing where you're you're clicking all kinds of buttons and it flows together well, I guess that's kind of more what I'm looking for. And maybe the later like hard I I'm probably speaking too soon because I still haven't finished the game. Like I'm maybe some of the later levels are like that. I haven't looked them up because spoilers. Uh, so maybe I'm complaining about something that just already is fine. Maybe there's like some of the levels towards the end of the game are like that they probably are so i don't know what i'm complaining about anyway uh i my internet is being bad right now so i can't play tf2 so instead i'm going to watch strike witches road to berlin yay more strike witches okay every every strike witches season begins with a battle right where they show off the animation Road to Berlin has by far the best beginning battle ever in a Strike Witches series. The animation is super dynamic and and flows crazy well. The cinematography is like sweeping and epic and gives you a good sense of scale and space. It's fucking sick. I'm pretty sure they're like seamlessly transitioning from 3D... CGI and 2D animation for the characters and it is fucking seamless like it looks so good it's it's great that's really good Ho- hopefully the whole show looks like that <laughs> i recorded a video about the arc web browser which you can see on my channel if you haven't already watched it it'll have already been out for quite a while i'm assuming by the time you you guys get around to listening to this podcast, which is coming to an end, because I think when I finish Strike Witches, I'm going to end the podcast, so hopefully I can do that within the next few hours, for you, for me it'll be the next few days, uh, uploaded that video, and then I watched the new Nick Robinson video, and uh, man, that video has a crazy twist at the end, I'll tell you that much. It's a good video. I recommend watching it. Uh, but it, it. So it's about. I, I've seen this guy around. I've seen this guy around, who's the subject of this video, and I've always been slightly confused by it, but I think just sort of moved on because that's how the internet is. Uh, uh, that was a weird yawn. Sorry about that. Uh. But it makes me wish, man, that this guy who's making all of these cut giant anime cutouts and and stuff, as based as he is, right? Because he's clearly a based giga-autist, 
and I respect it. Like, clearly his deal is he thinks giant cutouts of anime girls just look cool. Like, he's just categorically attracted to that vibe. He just likes that. He just thinks it's cool. And it is cool. Like, it's, it's uh, to me, I get it. Like, I 100% get it. I don't know about the having loads and loads of, like, picture, same picture on the wall. That aesthetic, I don't vibe with. He goes with that aesthetic where he'll cover, cover a room in, like, repeating pictures. I, I, don't, I don't know about that aesthetic. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a variation. It's too ordered, to too too much pattern for me. It, it just looks a little. I don't know. It's like a weird version of the the standard otaku room. Uh, but anyway, that guy he could be so much more based. If only he was into better shit. He's too busy cutting out pictures of this anime girl and listening to the Trash Taste podcast to get good taste. I know, I feel like an asshole saying this, but Danganronpa sucks, okay? Fucking, what, all of the anime girls he has, it's all Hololive shit and Danganronpa and ReZero. I mean, there's a, some Misato from Evangelion. I mean, that's kind of kind of based, but kind of basic as well, you know, give me, uh, I don't know, man, this, all the Sea Dog VA cutouts, yeah, but the guys, the thing is, he, he's never, I, I want to, I don't know, man, this is the thing, this is the thing, is that, that we, it's just different branches of autism, because he's not, like the guy's autism is the aesthetic of making lots of life size cutouts of anime girls. The particular, you know, shows they come from isn't necessarily important to him. And I suppose that's fine. Uh, but. Like, I feel like that you can't be that dedicated to a particular thing and also be dedicated to being a hardcore otaku, you know? You got, like... But maybe you can. Because I think there are lots of people who are in similar positions, right? Like, I've seen lots of stuff on Japanese Twitter where... There are Japanese otaku who do similar, I mean, not to the extent that he has, but like buying all of the merch of a particular character. And a lot of the times it's for good shows. Like I've seen Squid Girl person do. <laughs> I've seen Squid Girl person do. But I don't know, man, I'm fucked. The weird sleeps combined with the weird sleeps combined with the weird sleeps. You know, uh, today there was supposed to be a guy from my ISP coming to look at my router, even though I'm 90% sure that it's not anything to do with my router and that they're fucking up on their side, I'm, like, almost certain that it hasn't, that nothing he can do, you know, on my end will actually fix anything, but, uh, I figured, what the hell, it's free to at least have him take a look at it, uh, and that was supposed to be today, but then I realized the time that I'd booked would have been perfect timing if I hadn't randomly slept for 12 hours, but because I did randomly sleep for 12 hours, he was going to be arriving while I was asleep. So I had to, I was like, just, I wasn't even planning on rebooking it. I was just checking. I was like, I guess if I get two hours less sleep, it's not even too crazy. I can survive one day on like six or seven hours sleep. It's not a big deal, right? But I went to go check, and I was like, let me just go check to see if there's an earlier slot available. I just went to go check on the website. It doesn't, if you select, like, manage my appointment or whatever, it automatically rebooks it. I, I couldn't go back. Like, it auto, the, the second I selected it, it automatically forces you to make a new booking, and you can't book for the same day, right? So the second I pressed manage my thing, my appointment, right, automatically put me on tomorrow 
and it's making me set mainly set up an appointment for tomorrow which I did but now I've got another day I mean I guess it doesn't really matter uh anyway strike which is road to Berlin is pretty damn good so far enjoying it even though I haven't watched that much of it because I got distracted by making a YouTube video so in the end I ended up rebooking it for two days from now in the morning when I'm sure I'll be awake uh, but I've run into another problem today which is the next day for me which is that I didn't fucking sleep properly I don't know what's going on with me my sleeps are just fucked I slept like six hours maybe less because it, it wasn't very good quality sleep and I'm saying I don't know what's going on with me I actually know exactly what it is it's these fuckers next door digging up their entire garden for some reason I don't know what this guy's doing it's just power tools all fucking day long man it's goddamn power tools all day long uh Anyway, now the internet's gone down because it's approaching midnight, which is when the internet goes down every day. Uh, which is why I know that it's not something with my router. I'm 100% sure that it's they're doing, that they're fucking with shit and they're doing it like around midnight and then in the early morning to, uh, so as like not to bother Normans. But I ain't no goddamn Norman, okay? I'm awake at weird ass times because I'm just fucking sick with it. Because I'm nuts. Because I'm insane. Because I'm, I'm off me fucking rocker, mate. Alright. Oh, man. But, I'll tell you what. For a shit day, where I woke up fucking bleary-eyed and not knowing what was going on. I woke up, I immediately was like, I need to get, use my trickeries. And my trickery was, go out to the shop immediately after waking up. Because going on a walk in the sun is going to wake you up correct good idea go to the shop and i'll buy a monster because today's you know i need caffeine so that's what i did and it worked pretty well i still feel i mean it's there's no instant cure for tiredness but it did help me to not feel so delirious but then i had a breakfast which was a, a breakfast burrito kind of vague thing which i just sort of improvised with eggs and, and cheese and shit and some refried beans, and that shit was really good, so, so, after eating that breakfast burrito that was delicious, I feel, that, that, that made me feel a lot better, and then I just sort of hung around all day, and I say all day, because for some reason it feels like I've been awake for ages, even though I've only been awake, I, you know, it's still the morning from, from my sleep, as far as my brain's concerned, uh, should be concerned, it, it's still the morning, so it's weird. I woke up at six, by the time it was eight, I was like, feeling like it should be approaching the time to, I don't know, like I'd been awake all day, but I'd only been awake a few, anyway, sorry, this is like a weird, uninteresting subject. But I have a lot of weird, oh, my posters came, my anime posters, I ordered three new anime posters, a Hidamari sketch one, which I put up fucking sideways and now it's sideways it's I, I put it up in like a vertical portrait configuration without really paying attention to it because the other one was a vert all, most of my other po posters are portrait I didn't really think about it and then I just realized after I put it up oh wait it's supposed to be landscape configuration so I'm gonna have to tip I thought like maybe it won't bother me but now that I'm looking at it it really doesn't make it's it yeah, it's definitely not the wrong way around, you can tell. So, I gotta somehow figure out another place to put this here tomorrow. Because it's in a perfect, it slots in really nicely on my wall between two other posters. It's like the perfect size, but it, it's also the wrong way around. So I need to fix that and move it somewhere. Uh, which I'll do that at some point. And then I got this Mia Fuji from Strike Witches poster to commemorate the fact that I'm watching all the Strike Witches stuff. And we're commemorating this podcast that you're listening to right now with a physical, actual poster on my wall that I bought for real money. Um, so yeah, I've got Mia Fuji. It's a small one. I didn't know it was going to be that small, but yeah, it's just, it's the smallest one. And it's a little Mia Fuji. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. She's cute. Uh, and then, 
the biggest poster I own, this giant fucking Squid Girl poster, which is hilariously big. It does, it, it's, it, <laughs> I don't know, I like it a lot. It's, uh, it's definitely the closest to being, like, slightly lewd, because they're in swimsuits. Uh, I don't think it's particularly lewd, right? Like, to me, it doesn't come off as lewd, but it's, it's the closest to being lewd, because they're in swimsuits. Because it's a, uh, the original image is from Megami Magazine, which is actually where m- most of my posters come from, because it's a reliable way to get official art um, in poster form. Uh, so yeah, it is Megami Magazine, and if you know about Megami Magazine, then you know that they do, like, slightly risque, when I say slightly, it varies a lot, sometimes pornographic, sometimes risque posters, um, and it's fucking huge, and I made a, I made a silly little TikTok video, which is cringe, because it's like a TikTok format video, um, on IDMR about it, uh, which is a bit silly. Uh, I spent way too long editing it. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I also I made this review of the Arc browser. Did I already talk about this? I don't know, but um, okay. I have a I have a lot of fucking weeb work to do today. I plan on watching. All of Strike Witch's Road to Berlin. I've got to. I'm gonna try and fucking power through it and watch the whole thing because it's good so far. Like it, it might be my. I mean, I'm only two episodes in, but it, so far I'm enjoying it a lot. The anime, David, David Productions, great job on the animation of this series. It looks really good. I mean, it's just more Strike Witches. It's you know, Strike Witches season two, and so far Road to Berlin have been the the peak of the series by far. Well, it's, it's too early to judge, so I probably shouldn't really be speaking on it. But yeah, I really want to try and finish all of Road to Berlin. And then, I've got this visual novel that I'm like almost finished with, that I've just been putting off finishing, because it's not very good. But I'm like so close to finishing this visual novel that I may as well do it, and it's called uh, Island Diary. Uh, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it. Uh, it's pretty short for a visual novel. I think it's like 10 hours or something, 15 hours, I don't remember the exact length, but uh, yeah, it's pretty short for a visual novel, so I can definitely just blast through it t- today, there shouldn't be that much left, uh, just judging from the plot. So I want to try and finish Island Diary and uh, Strike Witch's Road to Berlin today. And then maybe even get some levels of uh, neon white done, although that's optional. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to watch Strike Witch's Road to Berlin. You know, I'm wondering if I should do, like, Digi back in the day. One of the best series or videos that Digi ever made was their uh, Nano Her franchise retrospective. Uh... It's maybe my favorite main channel Digi content, and it's like a three-part retrospective into the entire Nanoha series. Uh, and I'm think I wonder if I could maybe do something like that for uh, for uh, Strike Witches. Maybe I'll think about it. It would take a lot of writing, but I'll think about it. You know, I gotta say, this is in the pre look in in season one. The whole show was mid. But in pretty much every Strike Witches show or World Witches show, the the vibe has been that you that I sit through the battles that are kind of boring so that I can get to the character stuff, the slice of life stuff, and the the world building stuff. The battles are just you know they fight generic monster of the week kind of guy, and it is what it is. In this show, in Road to Berlin, they finally like the difference that it makes to have just higher production quality all around just like the sound design so much better there's a lot of like liberal use of cg and it really works to make these fights like more dynamic the directing and i don't know man like every aspect of this the the neroi fights is just leveled up 
and it makes it so much better. Like, I'm really enjoying watching these, like, battles. Like, they're fucking sick. I'm watching this this stuff, and I'm like, hell yeah, this is fucking, you know, not just on a conceptual level. Like, you know, uh, the end of, of Brave Witches, I think the fight was kind of cool, on, or maybe the end of uh, the Strike Witches movie. You know, these fights may be cool on a conceptual level, Actually, the Strike Witches movie fight was just kind of cool, except for the bullshit regenerating magic, but it's fine because it's sequel bait. I'll allow it, even though I think it ruined the movie itself. It makes the franchise make sense, and it allows for the existence of Road to Berlin, which is the best part of the series so far, so whatever. Um, what I'm saying here is, it's the, the, the this is sick. I'm enjoying it on its own terms, without, like... Not because it, not just because it's part of some category of thing I like, not just because I'm like thinking about the behind the scenes or, I mean that that's part of it. Of course, it's always part of it, but in this case, like I feel like I could show this to anyone and they would appreciate these as like well done action scenes, and that's something the show hasn't had before in any of its seasons that I've seen. Man, Strike Witch's Road to Berlin is the best part of the series, no question. Every aspect is just all of the the good stuff that could have been dialed up to eleven. Even like there is a there's there's a, a a a decent amount of kind of drama stuff which you'd think I wouldn't like, but it's just well done. Some of it, you know, is a bit over the top, but at this point we've spent three seasons with these girls, I think they've earned a bit of drama, right, like, the, the, I feel it endeared enough and attached enough to their characters that when they're going through some shit, it actually fucking works for me, right, um, it's not, oh, we just met these people two episodes ago and now I'm supposed to care about their, like, internal life problems, no, this is, you know, it works super well, and it's well done, like, it's not bullshit drama, it's not, like, made up or some random thing like episode six is what was my favorite episode of the entire show so far for multiple reasons but um the dra- central drama of episode six does it really make logical sense some of the stuff that happens in the episode no like some of it is a little wacky bullshit anime stuff but that's fine i'm here for pulpy anime stuff it's strike witches okay that you can't get more pulpy otaku anime stuff than strike witches and the central drama of the episode is based around, like, stuff that happens in war, because they're in a war. It's about trauma and loss and revenge and camaraderie and uh, lesbian love, because those are the things that war is about, <laughs> you know? It's about lesbian romance and the pain of loss, <laughs> even though lost in well, spoilers. Uh, it's not actually spoilers. You, it pretty much happens. You know what's happening in the episode. It's only the characters that don't know what's happening. Um, but, yeah, and the reveal at the end of, like, what's actually been happening the whole time, as dumb as it is, like, it's definitely dumb, but it's also kind of works, and it's kind of sick. Fucking moth. Get out of here, you bastard moth. Uh, sorry, there was a moth that was flying in my face. Um, but yeah, and the final fight that happens in that episode is super fucking sick. Like, it's just sick. It's just a, it's just great. And also, I'll tell you another thing about Road to Berlin. It retroactively makes the Strike Witches movie better. Because at the end of the movie, all that you hear is that Mia Fuji got all of her powers back, right? But in the show, she's, like, not, it's not the case, right? Like, she, the whole sort of running through line of at least the first half of the show going up to a certain episode where the the partially gets uh it seems like it's been solved some of these issues but i don't know fully yet it seems like the next episode might deal with some of this as well but um where mia fuji's powers aren't fully back and, and she is having like problems with them meaning she can't fight and so she's not on the front line for most of this show. Uh, which retroactively makes the movie better. 
and thinking back on it, I think I might have been too harsh on the movie, because while some parts of the movie, the main chunk of the movie I thought was kind of boring, uh, and, you know, that character that they introduced for the movie is a main, part of the main cast in season three, and after hanging out with her in season three, you know, it makes her character better in the movie. All of the stuff that they set up in the movie is explored way in way more depth, and you're way more endeared to her in season three, so it retroactively makes the movie better. And now I'm thinking back to the movie, and I'm like, that, like, big last final boss scene from the movie where Mia Fuji is running around, like, on the fucking ground, you know, in a truck, shooting this Neuroi, takes down a Neuroi without magic, without fly, like, that is fucking sick. So I might have to bump the movie up. I mean, I gave it a four. I don't think I feel comfortable saying the movie... Like, a four means bad. Like, I don't think I feel comfortable saying the movie is bad thinking back on this. Like, thinking... Now that I have the context of season three, reframing lots of parts of the movie that I didn't like, and I'm thinking back on it, and like, yes, I think the main chunk of the movie was kind of boring and... Um, the way they were dealing with, I forget the other girl's name, but her character was, and the dynamics there were kind of annoying. The main thing I got mad at the movie for was this, like, oh, and then Mia Fuji magically gets her powers back with no consequences, um, thing, right? But it turns out that that wasn't the case. I mean, at least in the canon of the story. Maybe it was when they wrote the movie and they hadn't written season three yet, but, you know, that's just theorizing. With season three existing, we know that's not the case, that that it, it wasn't just a, like, and then magically it's back so we can have another season. It's more complicated than that, which is great, right? That's that's the thing that they should have done. Um, and it, it kind of makes sense emo- in the emotional, you know, I said, like, oh, it's kind of lame how it's a, like, the power of friendship brings her powers back ending. Like, that's kind of an overdone trope and, and so on. But really, like, that's what the whole series is about, you know? Like, that that does, it's not like that doesn't fit with the themes of Strike Witches. It, I can't think of anything that would fit more with the themes of Strike Witches, really. Um, and uh, purely from, like, a, a functional utilitarian standpoint... Mia Fuji is, like, my favorite character, so I'm glad that she's still in the show and able to get to the best season of the show with, you know, and be able to participate in the plot. So, like, I don't know if I can say the movie is bad. You know, now that it's sort of reframed by this third season and I'm thinking back on it in my head... Uh... You know, I'm 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 starting to think maybe I was too harsh on it. Maybe I bump it up at least to a five. I bump it up at least to a five. I mean, there were some bits of it that I think are like a seven, and there's a lot of it that I think is not very good at all. So maybe this I don't know. It it I might have also just been kind of burnt out on the series when I watched it. You know, I was kind of blasting through it rather than try, taking my time and enjoying it. So I don't know if I gave it a fair shake. I'm wondering if I gave it a fair shake. I don't know if I want to rewatch it. <laughs> that might be too much. But, uh, you know, I am wondering if I was a little too harsh on the movie. I, I don't think, yeah, I bumped it up to a five. Um, but I'm going to keep watching season three because it's, it's great. It seems like there are a few... Hmm... I actually have two things I want to talk about, and I'm seeing if I can, like, come up with some weird segue to to mix them into one thing, but I don't think I can. Uh, seems like there's been a few... Uh, how do I put it? It seems like <laughs> there's a bit of an effort right now to kick up anti-piracy efforts. I used the word effort twice in that sentence. Do you know what I mean? Am I, I, I feel like I've seen slightly more, like, stories, news stories, and articles, and discussion about piracy recently. For example, uh, on the news in the UK, there was a big, um, 
like sports live streaming website they got taken down and the guys got arrested uh fuck oh yeah uh, uh a big big uh tone what's it called r a r b g raw b g got taken down although that didn't get taken down by the cops they just couldn't afford to run it anymore and various reasons uh and there was a big article about how some people are going to start trying to target nine anime and get it taken down um so just in general i mean that's just a few examples i've seen more like it seems to me like there's a bit of an anti piracy crackdown happening a mild one but i think it it is it is slightly happening and uh i think this gives me an excellent opportunity to talk about something that uh i like to talk about which is uh uh network structures systems architecture i suppose you can call it uh because it's very possible that a site like nine anime can just get taken down right like it's very very possible um however you could ne- you could never do the same thing with torrents because torrents are distributed they're not centralized and this is one of if not the main advantage of distributed systems in general is that they are always going to be more resilient uh so you you know nine anime or some direct download site or streaming site is centralized on a server now i know technically these anime streaming sites they don't host the content themselves really they host the content on other platforms and then they just sort of embed the video onto their website um <clears throat> like they have various servers that I think they somehow pay for I don't know exactly how it works but uh you know still if someone takes down the nine anime website that's gone whereas with torrenting you know it even makes even less sense so like if if someone tried to target nya for example it wouldn't work cuz nya is literally not breaking any laws right like as far as i understand it they're not hosting any illegal content uh on their their website there's nothing right it's entirely torrents and the the even if like one like nothing happens to the torrents themselves if a website goes down that just essentially just links to them right that they because torrents are distributed you know often people who are seeding torrents exist in like multiple different continents across the world it would literally require a joint collaborative exercise like you know what i'm saying it's just infeasible to pull off it makes it resilient to attack even if like some authoritarian government decided to break into your house and arrest you for seeding an anime torrent or something like japan i mean they do that in japan but specifically in tokyo they have the uh i believe they call it the download law where uh you can get extremely harsh punishment for downloading pirated content um but even in that situation it doesn't matter because the the file is distributed and this is what makes distributed movements powerful or the d- distributed systems distributed anything and so that's yeah just what I don't know I I don't know why I'm mentioning this it's kind of obvious but the thing is that it, you can take this example and apply it to anything I think is the thing that that I'm trying to point out like you could apply this to uh civilizations right like right now we live in a very centralized civilization and it is working really well for us because centralization comes with a whole bunch of benefits you know uh <clears throat> it 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 comes with the whole whole load of benefits like being able to make change relatively effectively and there's lots of other stuff uh 
but it also means there's sort of a single point of failure that like in if the u.s economy collapses the world economy collapses we saw that's what happened in 2008 right this that's just how the world is organized or if you're a country that isn't aligned with the u.s you're kind of fucked right um And a lot of industrial society and its consequences are arranged like this, where they're very dependent on one thing, and they're not distributed enough. Uh, they're like very large in scale, and yet centralized. Because, you know, that's basically what's responsible for a whole bunch of advantages that we take for granted in our modern world like a lot of the stuff that's great about the world as it exists is because you know rather than living in little tiny separate villages or you know warring uh local warlord factions or warring kingdoms now there's you know larger centralized governments and countries late nation states and those nation states even conglomerate into larger groups like the EU or even the UN like this centralization allows for a whole bunch of useful shit but it also makes the entire system less resilient and you can basically apply this to any system like it doesn't matter what it is if it's technological if it's a way of arranging people if it's a way of arranging commerce or money if it's a way of arranging anything it all follows this this rule that centralization has a whole bunch of advantages but it's biggest but but the, you know it's always sort of a uh weighing the advantages of resilience versus centrality i i yeah and it, i think depending on your use it's sorry, i don't know why i'm writing about this best girl in strike witches is probably Sanya, but I do like Yoshka, or as I've been calling her, Mia Fuji, because that's what the characters call her. But I guess that's, is that her second name or her first name? Honestly, I have no idea. I, mean, I think Mia Fuji is her first name. Everything's backwards in Japan. Honestly, I don't know, but I think Sanya is probably best girl, but Mia Fuji is also up there. The only problem is that... Okay, so I thought that having her lose her powers was a ballsy move. So th this basically is the decision that fucked up the series for me. <laughs> Not that it's fucked up, because, again, Road to Berlin is by far... The, well, I say by far. I, yeah, it's by far the best in the series. But, so, the ballsy move is, and you should have picked this up because I've it's all I've been talking about, is at the end of season two, Yoshika sacrifices the use of her powers by using a special attack, basically, special technique, using up all of her magic to do this one special technique. And this is a very ballsy move, right? For the writers, because this is your main character, and now she can't participate in the story. But they couldn't commit to that, because they needed to make a, a movie in another season. <laughs> so what they've had to do is like half ass this thing. And this is what annoyed me in the movie. Because the movie was very ballsy by not giving her powers back until the very end. But then disappointed me by giving it back at the end. You know, she had a whole arc. She lost her powers and she was going to become a, a doctor. And it made sense with her character, and it was all cool. But I guess they got a mandate from, from up high that they had to make another season. And so they had to give her her powers back and come up with some plot reason. Except they didn't come up with a plot reason. It's just the power of friendship with no real explanation in, in how the magic system works. In Road to Berlin, they've actually started to do a bit more explanation of the rules of the magic system. And still... You know, in-universe, no one knows how the fuck Mia Fuji got her powers back. 
It's just, it's just, it's extra magic. It's magic on top of it being actual magic. It's a miracle, right? <laughs> like, it's just kind of nonsense. So this was the big fuck up in writing, is that it's a very ballsy move, and it's the sort of thing that either you hard commit to, or you don't do. And, and you know, Strike Witches is lucky that it has such a strong cast of secondary characters, but... Mia Fuji is also a great character, and one of her, one of the main, you know, I what I like about it and don't like about it, I don't know. I'm very, I have very mixed feelings on this, because you know, the the what they did in this in the movie, right, by having this bullshit thing happen where her powers come back is bad. Like that sucks as writing. However, it allowed for the best part of the show. So, does that make me okay with it? I don't know. I don't know if that makes me okay with it. And then, in Road to Berlin, it's the best part of the show, so it's hard for me to be like, but it's but this sucks, right? But, but like, some of my favorite moments in the rest of the show have been Mia Fuji popping off because she's, like, OP, and I like to see that occasionally. And I know they're just baiting, like, I... We all know, okay, we all know, I'm just going to make a prediction here, and if I'm wrong, you can laugh at me, but I'm, I, I mean, I'd say I'm 99% sure that there's the running, you know, running plot point through the whole season that Mia Fuji's powers aren't fully, truly back, she's kind of nerfed, and then I'm guaranteeing that when the, they're, they're fighting the final big bad guy, she's going to get her powers back full time and do some crazy attack, and it's going to be crazy, Right? Like, that's 100% going to be the turning point of the final battle, because otherwise the plot doesn't make sense. It's the only thing that they can possibly do. And that moment, you know, given that they've shown that they're pretty good at at making this show, I reckon that moment will probably be pretty cool in the final episode when it happens. Uh, So, do I, am I, like, mad about it? I don't know. I don't know how to feel. I have problems with it. Like, I like Mia Fuji being, she's one of my favorite characters. You know, probably the second best girl. Um, Best design from the shoulders down um best design from the shoulders down and maybe not even that maybe best character design as a whole in the show i think yeah quite possibly best character design in the show you know what i'm just gonna say i'm gonna i'm gonna go i'm gonna say best character design from head to toe i don't know why i said shoulders down uh you know, which is definitely important. Her voice actress is great. Um, you know, and her personality is cool too. Like she's, she's cool. She's just not quite as cool as Sanya. Um, but she is very cool, right? Like second best out of a cast of nine is still pretty damn good. Uh, uh, and I mean, you're competing or whatever. Sanya just has the coolest weapon the coolest magic gimmick, uh, a really great character design, really great voice acting, and a really nice personality. I- I'm not alone in this. I'm pretty sure that Sanya is one of the most popular characters. I'm not going to say why I know that. Um, so yeah, I kind of... I don't know how I feel about it, man. I don't know how I feel about any... I don't know how I feel about it. Because cause on the one hand, it was nice watching Mia Fuji be kind of god tier and powerful but it's also kind of nice having her be a bit more background and having a focus on the other characters because i like the other characters as well and having these episodes that are like vignettes dedicated to two of them because a lot of these episodes are also uh, every single episode seven is a particularly goofy wacky and etchy plot and the episode seven in vote to berlin is the most insane one yet uh, it's, it's a breast inflation fetish episode, uh, is that what it's called? Boob, boob expansion, you know what I'm, chest expand. you know what I'm talking about, it's a that fetish episode, which is pretty wild, uh, it's very funny though, in my opinion, it's pretty funny, uh, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know how to feel about it, I, I, like, the, I'm, it just, I feel like I should be more upset than I am, because I think the show would have been more interesting if they either 
Like, I'm trying to figure out why her powers need to be nerfed in the first place. Is it because they made her too powerful? Like, they made her too strong? Because... I don't know how true that is. Maybe they did? Maybe the, the, the power scaling in this show is kind of hard to tell a lot of the time. Uh, maybe the, so maybe they weakened her because they, and generally I like weak characters, but also they haven't gone all the way with it, which is kind of weird. I don't know. You know, I think I'll just have to be confused about this and have mixed feelings. So one thing... One thing they mention in Strike Witches, in the final episode, or is it the second to last episode? I don't know, one of them. I think it's the final episode, is that they're they're talking about this uh, world city Germania that shows up in the, the show. And they literally mention, like, it was a planned city by Germany's former, I think they say emperor or president, uh, who was forced to step down. So, this answers the question that the Germans in Strike Witches are not fighting for Hitler. Hitler is not in charge of Germany in the Strike Witches universe, uh, which definitely answers some questions, because that was always a little bit of a weird thing to me. I was like... These guys are Nazis, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> but okay, Hitler not in charge of Germany in the Strike Witches universe. He was vaguely forced to step down, which you find out three seasons in at the very end. Okay, so I just finished Strike Witches Road to Berlin. Uh, pretty funny in the the very short epilogue of the final episode. They do a a recreation of the the famous picture of the. Soviet flag or the communist flag being raised over the the Reichstag, which is pretty funny. Um, yeah, as, I mean, as I've heard, all of the World War Two stuff in the show is supposedly extremely accurate, like very nerdy detail. Um, I wouldn't know, but uh, yeah. Um, so what did I think of Road to Berlin? I think it's the best of the Strike Witches franchise. It. Uh, Definitely. I've said that multiple times already. But yeah, everything about it is all of the stuff that... all of the It's all of the good with very little of the bad. And the good has been stepped up as well. Um, uh, I saw a Mal review that said that, like, uh, just like in every... Like, every Strike Witches season, uh, episodes 1, 2, 11, and 12 are always the worst episodes because they're the ones that focus on big Neodai battles and plot, rather than slice of life and character. Uh, and I I think that's the least true in this season, because uh, the opening two episodes, the opening fight is really well done. Like, it's it's very uh, well choreographed and well animated. And, um, you know, I wonder why my voice seems to be coming in quieter. Is there something I can do about that? Nope, nothing like that. Maybe if I just get close to the mic. <laughs> um, or whatever. Uh, the final two episodes, however, the final battle, I will say I complained in Strike Witches Season 1 that every troop aside from the actual Strike Witches are useless. They seem to have noticed this and tried to, like, shoehorn in times when ground troops are, like, useful. Which is good. You know, tanks play a pivotal role, or at least one one particular tank plays a pivotal role in the final liberation of Berlin from the Neuroi. Um But the final battle... I like that it felt more... Again, it felt more like a military exercise. I said this about Brave Witches, right? That the final battle actually felt more like a military battle than a anime shonen wacky battle like strike which is seasons one and two um <clears throat> it definitely felt more like a real warfare which was good as i predicted the battle is won because mia fuji or mia fujisus 
as she should be referred to. Mia Fujisus pulls some shit out of her ass to make her magic work again. And damn, at some point when I wasn't paying attention, they made her ridiculously overpowered. She's just like the most overpowered witch. Like she was before, it was like, yeah, she's a powerful witch. She has a really good shield and she has healing magic. And the healing magic is like pretty good. You know, at the in season one, it's like, you know, pretty good. It can heal stuff, but it's not like magic. It's not, well, it is magic. But it's, it's not like miraculous. It can't bring people back from the dead or anything. Well, uh, apparently now it can. <laughs> um, uh, and her like having impressive, impressively effective shield is now like shields that are 10 times or, oh, it's my alarm going off. Uh, 50 times the size of her body and she can make two of them on either side of her and control them perfectly and move them away like and she's al- she's also ridiculously fast and mobile she's just she's just too she's just so op now she's just so op in this final battle and because they fucked the magic system twice now where it's like oh if witches lose their magic power which is at this point pretty baked into the magic system like they've explained part of the magic system and how it works right like how magical powers in this universe actually function they just throw it out the window like it happened in the movie and then they just were like well we did it in the movie so we're just gonna do it again for the end of season three i didn't like it when they did it in the movie and although i saw it coming this time i didn't think it would be as bad as it is they do it again in the movie does it work on an emotional level yeah, I think it kind of does. I have to begrudgingly ad- admit that it, this is like a, you know, I I just personally want them to be consistent about their magic system. If I'm going purely on like emotional storytelling, it serves its function in the narrative, you know. I would rather see the battle won with like better strategy and cunning and stuff like that <laughs> rather than or d- determination and cooperation rather than oh the one really OP guy came along at the 11th hour and won the battle for us like that kind of sucks uh also i think a lot of the uh Especially in the... Because the the final battle takes place over the last two episodes. Technically the last three episodes. And episode 10, I liked. And then episode 11 had a little more interesting Nero gimmicks. But the final episode... The, the actual fight is... Like the final fight where they all group together and fight. It's pretty short and pretty boring. Or there's not really anything super interesting gimmick wise or choreography wise that makes that fight particularly interesting um which is a bit of a shame but you know the mal review was right like definitely i think the last two episodes of the although they're not bad and they're better than the endings of season one and two uh i still think it's probably the weakest part of the show although actually you know what there's the Actually, the weakest part of the show was in episode... Was it 9 or 10? I forget which episode it was. I think it was 10. So, they really um, ham up a character death. There's a character who... Uh, you know, they've sort of done some mild baiting of like... Oh, this character's in danger. Because, you know, stakes exist, right? They've done that before. But this is something that's unprecedented like the character literally has solid motivation as to like why their arc is over so it makes sense like narrative wise that they would die at this moment right uh they literally they give a final monologue right it's they had they set up death flags foreshadowed earlier in the episode that this character like is gonna die um you know and then when it's happening She's die. She's sacrificing herself for a noble cause, uh, right? Like, and when she's she's going in on her like suicide mission to sacrifice herself, like, uh, all the audio cuts out and you get like this piano ballad playing. It's pretty like ham fisted, like they really. 
and they spend a long time on it as well. It's not a quick throwaway thing. They the 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 it takes a step back and takes its time to let you like soak up the emotions of this character that we've known for all three seasons, finishing their arc, sacrificing themselves for the good of the group, and then. They just pussy out at the end for no reason, and the character doesn't die. Uh, it's really dumb. <laughs> because immediately after, the character is rescued from the brink of death after hard signaling that they were about to kill this character to the point where I thought they were going to do it, which I normally, you know, I'm pretty good at picking up cues of when they're bait when um, anything is bait. Like they really, just by m- throwing maximum ham at it by like making it as obvious and apparent as possible, using every trick in the book. You know, I said monologuing, piano ballads with no audio, uh, noble sacrifice, end of a character arc, foreshadowing. Everything is set up in the perfect way for this character to die right there. And then they don't do it. And then immediately the character is rescued. They fly back and then all three of them get covered in liquid which melts their clothes off. Immediately after the super emotional moment where you're just about to think like, oh, this character's gonna die. This is actually like a serious moment in the show, a main character dying. Or like a, you know, member of the group dying. And then it's like, nope. By the way, they all get naked now. For no, like, seriously undercuts the emotions. That shit is just, like, it's not even... It's, it's just dumb. Like, it's just extremely stupid writing. It's not, like, egregious, but it's pretty fucking egregious. It's pretty egregious, but there's, I don't think it's, like, I'm trying to separate in my mind, like, bad from stupid. Like, this is bad, but it's bad because it's stupid. It's not bad because it's bad, if this makes any sense. I mean, it's also bad because it's bad, but it's mainly bad because it's stupid. This is the worst part of the, the, the... the season for for sure is that part like they should have just killed the character off she's not even in she doesn't even it's not like she's needed to be in the the next episodes she doesn't even really matter in the they could remove she could have died and nothing about the plot would have changed except it would have given the other characters more motivation it would have been good they should have done it it almost feels like they were going to do it and then maybe like the studio told them they weren't allowed to because they needed so much or something like uh in fact, now that I think about it, that's that feels very much like the sort of thing that ha- would have happened. Like, it really feels like they wrote this script with this character to die, and they took it to the execs, or to the producers or whatever, and the producers were like, nope, you are not allowed to do this, change it. And so they had to, like, quickly write it out of the script so that she wouldn't die. Uh, that's what it feels like. I don't know if that's actually what happened. It could. They could just. It could just be really bad writing. <laughs> but that's what it feels like. Uh, yeah, that's definitely the weakest part of the entire season is when when that stupid shit happens. I mean, if the character died, it wouldn't have been handled like subtly and with like taste. But at least you know, it would have been basically emotionally effective because just by nature of it being a character we've known for a long time dying for a noble cause, right, to sacrificing herself to save others, right, like, that's, at least it would have been minimally emotionally effective, it would have worked, it would have given the other characters, like, a lot of motive. I don't know, I wish they just killed that character off when, when that happened, um, not that I have anything against her, you know, she's chill, fine, she doesn't, she's not even a main character, she's like a side character, uh, I don't know, I feel, like, weird about that, um, yeah, some of my favorite episodes in this season. Uh, it's a shame, because, you know, I wish the whole show was as good as this season, but in order to recommend it, you know, I have to say, sit through season one, which is not very good, season two, which is only marginally better than season one, and only if, and you might not like season two, right? Like, if you hated season one, you won't like season two or three. Right? Let my, if you thought season one was okay with some good ideas which is what I thought, then you'll probably like season two. And if you like season two, you will definitely like season three, because it's better than season two in every way. It's everything good about season two, but better. Um, But you have to sit through two seasons of, you know, mid to decent to get to the really good. 
Uh, actually, I mean, I'm I'm underselling season two here. Season two is good. It's it's solidly good. It's like a seven out of ten. I think is what I gave it. Um, I can see people not liking this show for many reasons, but. Also, I've noticed that conspicuously missing from the Strike Witches universe is nukes. Uh, maybe that's just because it's a Japan thing. I don't know. They definitely have a different cultural relation with nukes than, than we do in the West. Uh, yeah, I don't really have that much else to say about Road to Berlin. Uh, yeah, I mean... If you somehow are a Strike Witches fan that's seen the first two seasons and not Road to Berlin, you definitely should watch it. But that's probably a very small group of people, so it's kind of hard to recommend. Like, generally when I'm talking about anime, I try and frame it in the space of, like... Like, you'll notice when I do my season, seasonal watch everything, I always say, like, uh, if you're into this, 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 I can recommend it. Or, or even with shows I don't like, I say, like... Don't watch this unless you're a hardcore this 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 fan or completionist or whatever. Like I always I always try and frame it when I'm doing recommendations as like, uh, yeah. I I mean I'm I'm trying to give some sort of recommendations system here, but with this it's like a little hard to recommend. Like obviously if you're a World War Two nerd you're gonna like the show or at least I think you will. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, whatever. Okay, well that leaves me... The market is completed on Mel. Uh, do, do, do. 10, 11, 2. Mark has completed. And I think, you know, I'd like to give the show a strong 7. I, I don't know if I can really feel comfortable giving it an 8. Uh... Just because it has, like, the... I don't know. It's almost an 8. It's really close to an 8, but it's just not quite there, I think. Like, it's... It's really borderline. It's like a 7.9. <laughs> it's... it's it's. Let me see. What other shows have I given an 8? Let me do... Let me just com- do some... Do some comparing here. Uh, I used to be more liberal with my 8s than I am now, so I'm sure some of my older ratings... What's in my 8s category? Maid Dragon, I gave an 8. Yeah, I don't know if I'd give that an 8 now. I gave Blend S an 8. What the fuck was I thinking? I'm moving this the fuck down to a 7. Maybe even a 6. Damn. Okay, what else did I give an 8? I gave... I mean, yeah, these are all 8s. I'm right about all of this. Tamako Market, that's an 8. Inferno Cop, that's an 8. Log Horizon, that's an 8. Yeah, I'm comfortable with all of this stuff. Uh, honestly, I think... Pff, Alien 9, 8. Yeah, I feel okay about that. Uh, no, yeah, I don't know if it's quite as good as any of this stuff. Yeah, it's just not quite on the level of, like, any of the stuff that I've given an 8. It's not quite there. You know, 8's like Hidemari's... Wait, why is Hidemari Sketch SP? Oh, that's a special. Yeah, I, that's the special that I thought was good, but not amazing. Um, Mushishi, Barakamon, Yuri Yuri, Hibiki, Phonium, One Punch Man, Flying Witch... Did I like Flying Witch that much? Uh, yeah, I just I just don't know if I can really quite say it's as good as this stuff. It's it's almost there. I know I'm kind of repeating myself here. It is very close to being being an eight out of ten to the point where I'm I'm thinking like, what's the point? <laughs> like if I'm taking it as a rounding to the nearest, but you don't you round it to the you round it down always. You don't round it to the nearest. So I guess I'll give it a 7 on Mal. But just try and remember that it's a really strong 7. Maybe the strongest 7 I've ever given. Okay, and that puts me 
uh, where exactly? Uh, in the Strike Witches 4 collection, that puts me at 8 out of 13 shows completed. Uh, the only full anime left I have is uh, the, the, the idol one, Luminous Witches. Okay, now I have to go fucking do some chores. You know what's something I'm tangentially interested in? Uh, is Sumo. Sumo? And I know I'm a weeb, yeah, okay, it's Thing Japan, blah, 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 blah. Sumo is just objectively cool. Everyone knows this, right? Everyone everyone accepts this fact. Sumo is just objectively cool, right? I'm, I hope we've gone to a, a place as a society where everyone can admit this. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stuff, like when you think Sumo, I'm trying to imagine... Like, because I, I think that there's a big aspect of sumo that most people in the West, and probably even in Japan, don't really know about, or think about. So when you think sumo, you probably, first thing you think is, oh, it's the one with fat people, right? And then you you might think, like, what differentiates it from other combat sports? So the, they have a very different body type from other combat sports. Bouts are much shorter than other combat sports. Um... They wear like a weird, a weird thing, you know, instead of just normal clothes, they wear weird, weird ass clothes. It's not a fundoshi, I, I don't know what the specific thing that they use is called. It's kind of similar to a fundoshi though, but, um, you know, <clears throat> I imagine these are the sorts of things that people will think about with sumo. Um, when you watch sumo... You know, the first thing you'll notice, or at least the first thing I noticed, is that watching sumo is mostly not watching the fights. The fights are like 10% of the time spent during sumo happening. Most of it is ritual. And that's, I think, the key aspect, or at least one of the things that helped me to understand the appeal of sumo, or just the nature of sumo, which is that it's as much a religious ritual as it is a sport. In fact, it might even be more so a religious ritual than a sport. Um, the origin of sumo was to, to create uh, something to entertain uh, the kami so that they would bring you a bountiful harvest, right? Like, so much of sumo is based on ritual, you know, the stuff you see during the match, like throwing salt on the ring, um, but also stuff that you might not see, like every uh, sumo arena, like the little central bit, the ring they fight in, it has uh, offerings like rice and sake buried uh, underneath the center of it. Um, so, you know, it's very religious, uh, sumo even, like, the sumo wrestlers even have various, like, religious duties that they're supposed to do, like, they're supposed to go to shrines and do some shit, I don't really know that much about it, but they, they, like, they are not just, I mean, even the way they dress, like, you'll see the, you know, when they are fighting, they sort of take off the fancy gear, but before they fight... I've seen some of them, they wear, like, around their belt area, like, a, a belt that is the same sort of rope with these paper streamers and shit that you find in Shinto temples. And when they do the, the crouch thing, like, the squat, it sort of, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to represent, like, a tori gate. The point being that sumo is very much based in religious practice as much as it's based in, in being a sport which and I think that's like I don't know of any other sport that is like that it's, it's not just you know I've seen a lot of people talk about tradition it's not just tradition it's specifically religious tradition um, there are other sports with tradition 
But sumo is specifically a religious tradition. Yeah, and that makes it completely unique as a sport and pretty fascinating. Um, there's such a heavy focus on ritual. And it gets, you know, if you, oh, by the way, if you want to watch sumo, if, you, if, you, if you're like listening to this and you're like thinking, I want to check out some sumo just a little bit, just to see what, the, what it's like. Uh, my suggestion is there's a Twitch channel called Midnight Sumo. And they just 24-7 stream, like, sumo reruns. And you also get to watch weird-ass Japanese adverts uh, <laughs> on that stream. So that's and But yeah, you get to watch sumo with Twitch chat. It's pretty entertaining. Um, yeah, I don't really have that much to say about it. I don't really know that much about sumo. Uh, I just think it's cool. There's big-ass guys fighting each other it's sick I, how can it how can you see the see it and not be like that's fucking sick they just throw each other around it has so much unique aspects compared to other combat sports you know i like mma i like boxing i like muay thai not that much i mean yeah to some extent i've i've seen a boxing event live boxing live is crazy hype um, <clears throat> although, yeah, it wasn't like a super preferred, preferred you know, high tier boxing match or anything. It's like a low tier box. Yeah, but I, it's still hype. Uh, yeah, sumo kind of has a similar flow to like, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it has a similar flow to. It's a weird fucking thing. But it's cool. You know what other sport I'm really interested in? Is a... Goldeneye and Perfect Dark speedrunning. I think the best speed games in the world are... Mario 64, Half-Life 1, and Goldeneye. Uh, But Goldeneye and... uh, Perfect Dark are very different to any... Or maybe Quake is one of the best as well. But yeah, GoldenEye and Perfect Dark are completely different to any other speed game. Uh, because, well, there's there's two main reasons. Well, I guess they're both kind of the same reason. Which is that every other speed run is a speed run. Right? Every other speed run is about getting the fastest time. Whereas... Goldeneye and Perfect Dark is about getting the fastest time that the game will display. Uh, And you might not think that makes a big difference, in-game time versus RTA. But in Goldeneye, it makes a huge difference for two factors. The biggest one being, the in-game timer is only accurate to the second. And it's entirely individual level focused. You'll probably know this. I mean, I don't know how many people... Like, you, you've... Carl Jobs is, like, one of the biggest speedrunning YouTubers, right? And he, he's a golden eye and perfect dark speedrunner, so he makes videos about it. Uh, what's funny is... So I, I started getting into golden eye speed... Well, I never played golden eye uh, single player myself. I've only ever played the multiplayer. I've So never let alone speedrun it myself. But I started to, you know, be interested in the scene because I watched GDQ once and there was a GDQ run that was a two-player, one-controller, full-game speedrun of Goldeneye. And I thought that one of the guys running it was really charismatic and fun to watch. And so I looked up who it was because I was like, I'd watch this guy on Twitch or whatever. And his name was R. White Goose. He has since been banned from all GDQ events because he uh, once said some questionable things about the Jews. <laughs> um, yeah. He claims to be reformed now, so I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but but anyway, uh, that guy, <clears throat> R. White Goose, I, I found his YouTube channel... And, yeah, he made some speedrunning documentaries about Goldeneye. And then one day, he's like, 
Oh, and uh, at the end of this video, he's uh, one of his like Goldeneye videos. He's like, oh, and uh, my my buddy from the Goldeneye community, Carl Jobs, has just made a YouTube channel. So check him out. And then Carl Jobs went on to like massively outpace him in subscribers and views, which is, uh, I don't know how that must feel to Goose. They do make the, the I don't know Goose content is so much. It's the comfiest speedrunning content on YouTube by far. Uh, and it's entire, it's almost, I guess he also talks about Pokemon Snap, which is like super and other, some other N64 games, but it's mostly focused on Goldeneye and Perfect Dark and mostly Goldeneye at that. So anyway, the two, so the, the fact that it's, that the timer is only one second, or only accurate to the second. So if you want to beat a world record, you have to beat it by a full second, or at least you have to break the next second barrier. You can't just, you know, get a run that is... 0 0.01 faster like you have to get up so which means every world record is incredibly impressive world records mean a huge leap in, in accomplishment um and the second thing is that the game is old and buggy and so the timer is uh well actually i don't know how much that affects the game but the fact that the timer is linked to lag so reducing lag actually makes the time move faster or slower or whatever in game. I don't know how it works exactly. Maybe it makes bond move faster. I'm honestly not sure. But uh, look down is an interesting aspect of Goldeneye. I think uh, also <laughs> the fact that it's one of the oldest speed games. It's one of the OG speed games. I mean, Quake is the old OG speed game, but yeah, Goldeneye has also been speedrun since the late 90s, which makes it one of the oldest speed games. So it has a very long history, and that history is very well documented because the community, you know, early speedrunning communities were often, like, not really communities at all. They were just, like, random people who uploaded shit to Speed Demos Archive or whatever, but Goldeneye and Perfect Dark have always had a centralized community on the elite.net. And so the history uh, of the community is super well preserved. I mean, some stuff doesn't have video proof, but generally speaking, you know, compared to pretty much anything else except Quake and Doom, uh, where demos were easily shared about, uh, you know, Goldeneye has this super long history and also is like the his that history is very well kept which is really fascinating. Um, yeah, and the game is just so... Like, the way that the game is speedrun, the, the, the focus on individual levels, the concept of, like, tied and untied world records doesn't really exist in any other game. The, like, GoldenEye rankings, the way they have, like, a score for each player based on their times is super interesting. The game mechanics itself, I mean, the fact that there's no out-of-bounds glitches really in the game, I know someone's going to be like, I watched a video where it shows that there was actually a way to get out of it. You know what I'm saying. There's no useful out-of-bounds glitches, even the ones that have been found have, haven't been able to be reproduced. Right? Like, there's the the game is pretty much... Speedrunning the game isn't really about... And I, listen, I'm a big fan of glitches and speedruns. But these Goldeneye IL runs are pretty much just doing what the game intended you to do as fast as possible. Most of the time, they are that. I mean, and then there's also I don't know. It's such a cool. It's such a cool speed game and such a unique speed game. Like, I'll t so the lag thing, right? What the lag thing means is that there's there's sometimes been times, no one knows exactly how it works, but there are times when a time on the in-game timer will be faster than another time, but in real time, it will actually be slower than the other time. Normally by not very much, right? It's But it can be enough if it breaks the second barrier, if it happens to hit that, if, if it happens to be around that, that border... You know, it can be the case that a slower run is faster or that a faster run is slower because of lag compensation and stuff like that. 
and uh, that's just a weird little thing. <laughs> I guess that's kind of neat. Okay, so do you know what's fucked? So obviously the idea of the poster wall in my room, you know, I I have I have four walls, these four walls, and they're split up into sections. You know, one, like particularly. So you have sort of the the blue wall. That one I'm keeping clear. It's the clear blue wall with a mirror on it, right? It looks nice and clean as is, and it's already blue, so it already has something notable about it. It's in my room, right? Then you've got the wall on the opposite side of the blue wall, which is the window wall. The majority of that space is taken up by a window, except for some area to the side of the window, which is adjacent to the anime wall and the or the otaku wall. And so that corner is also going to be filled up. It basically counts as part of the otaku wall. So the otaku wall is going to go from the door all the way down that side of the, the or that wall and then onto the around the corner onto the where the window is. And then on the other side of the window, there's there's another wall, and that wall is divided into three sections. Uh, in the middle, there's a fireplace with the iconic no thank you painting with the purple and the blue swirl on it, and some electronics and stuff. I think I'm going to keep that as is. It's basically an old disused fireplace. On the side of that, on towards the blue wall, there's my cupboard, which just sits there. And on the other side, you have the wall of text which is basically done, right? The wall of text is completed. I mean, there's still space if I want to add anything onto it, but it, like the wall of text is the wall of text. That's done, because that's free. <laughs> the anime wall is far from free. Like this is almost, just the posters I have right now is like probably around 200 quid, <laughs> which is not sustainable. This is not a sustainable amount of money to be spending on a wall because I mean, Let's just see, assuming the posters are the same size, how many more would I need to fill up what I want? Uh, so, what? Okay, let's say it's about that size. A one could go there, two, maybe three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe eleven, and then twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, at least sixteen. We're talking at least sixteen uh, more posters, or could be fewer if some of them are bigger. Right, but we're talking about, you know, that sort of range and right now I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 so I basically have to at least double the amount of posters I have uh, now to be fair um, so two of them are from the Lane Art Book one of them or two of them are wall scrolls that were cheap on Amazon or eBay or whatever I got it from and one of them is not a poster at all but is the old keyboard from a ThinkPad so uh, some of that is doable for cheaper, and this whole shtick gave me an idea, which is that these cheap wall scrolls from Amazon are much more sustainable investment than the super high quality expensive posters. The problem is, I've just been looking on Amazon and eBay, and they only have bullshit. <laughs> they only have bullshit that I'm not interested in. Obviously, the only stuff that is cheap and widely available these like stupid knockoff wall scrolls are the super popular anime series and the only show that I like that is easy to find wall scrolls of is No Game No Life and even then the quality is so like you have no idea what you're getting when you buy one of these wall scrolls you could be getting a JPEG with four pixels well how do I know this because the first ever anime poster I bought, okay that's not true the first anime poster I bought was a bleach poster for my first convention which I already told you about um but the first when, a long time ago, um, back when I lived with my dads, I bought a the Monogatari po wall scroll that I have on my walls to this day, and another wall scroll that was a No Game No Life wall scroll. And that No Game No Life wall scroll, I didn't take with me, because it was the same size as the Monogatari one from the same Amazon seller or eBay seller, wherever I got it from, but it was such a low-res image that it just triggered the fuck out of me. Like, the the Monogatari one, if you look closely, you can see that it's, like, low-res. Like, but it doesn't stand out too bad. The fucking No Game No Life one was, was 
low it, like i don't know how they fucked up this bad but yeah it was like super low res you could see the pixels and like jpeg artifacting. affecting actually it wasn't even like necessarily the that it was just low resolution but like it, i feel like it had jpeg artifacting affecting on it which is just cringe so i left that one and so now i don't trust these shits right which is why when i bought the uno one i purposely bought it really small because I was like, at least if I buy... Oh, sorry, when I bought the Chino one, not the Uno one. When I bought the Chino wall scroll, I purposefully bought it in the, like one of the, in the smallest size. Because I was like, if I buy it small, at the very least, I know it's not going to be pixels. And I was correct. Uh, you know, Chino looks very high quality. Um, so I guess I can buy these like small posters... But, yeah, I don't know. And so, the, the, the yeah, the whole problem is that it's really hard to find wall scrolls with... I mean, I generally prefer... I mean, literally, the Chino poster is the only poster I own that isn't official art. Mainly because all of the official Gotcha user posters kind of suck. Like, I don't know what it is. I've looked through all of them on all of the Borus, right? I've looked on, like, Konachan and Dan Boru and Gero Boru. I've looked through every piece of official Gotcha Yusa art with Chino in it, and they all suck. But for some reason, the characters just look soulless. Like, they, I don't know how to explain it, but, like, their expressions are so blank that it's kind of creepy. And I think that's just how the show looks, but in motion you don't realize it. Except that's not true, because I go on these Gotcha Yusa threads in A, and people are posting reaction images, and it's all chill. So for some reason, the art, the official poster artwork from, like, Megami and Newtype and stuff, which I don't think they ever did anything for Newtype, I think it's only Megami, but all of the official poster artwork that I could find is really bad. <laughs> like, it either looks like an un... I don't know, man, it just doesn't look good. Uh, so that's why I ended up going with a piece of fan art for the Chino poster, because it's the only thing I could find that looked good and wasn't too lewd, because I... I don't want to play no games with UK uh, <laughs> laws and risque images of Chino, okay? We, we don't we don't play no games with that. I don't want to get on a list or anything. Uh, so, yeah. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, these fucking wall scrolls and posters. So these posters are too damn expensive because they're really high quality. Like, they're really nice. I wish I could cover my wall entirely with these posters that I have. Right, because they're they're super high quality. The the finish and the paper is super nice. They look great. Right, I'm very happy with them. They're just kind of expensive. I mean, individually they're not too expensive, but you know, you buy. They it quickly adds up when you buy more than more than one at a time, and you really should be buying more than one at a time because you save money on shipping. Uh, but yeah, the money really does add up. Uh, <clears throat> so, I'm trying to think of how to solve this fucking problem and. I think I've, what I'm about to do right now is maybe the wackiest way to solve it, which is what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for cheap merch of things that I don't know about, and then when I find it, I'm going to try and get into it. So, what I'm, I've, I, oh, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing, really important that I was going to talk about. So, um, one of the things that, the, that has been bugging me ever since I discovered it or noticed it is, right, so the whole point of this is to be an otaku room, right? That is obviously the point. That There's this iconic imagery of the otaku room, and that's the point. Uh, now, I, what I noticed that has ruined my fucking life is uh, that when you look at Japanese otaku rooms, right, if, uh, I'm going to go Google it right now. Fucking hell. Otaku room. It's very easy to tell which ones are Japanese and which ones are Western. Because, okay, these are all fake ass fakers. Western ass bitches. That's not real. That's not real. That's not real. Where's like a proper one? I mean, these are all like way too clean and, and organized. Okay, that looks kind of real. Let me look up Japanese otaku room. I guess that's closer. 
Okay, I don't know why. Yeah, this is that's one I was thinking of. That's one of the examples I was thinking of. This image, this image. Yeah, you, I mean you can go on Google Images and find a bunch of these pictures, right? There's a very specific look to them, and what I noticed that fucked me. And it's not just from this, it's also from, like, documentaries I've seen and just footage of Japanese otaku in their native habitat. Is that the posters and merch they have is very often, you, you know, I, I noticed this because I was watching some sort of uh, YouTube video by, like, a Japanese otaku or something like that. I don't even remember what I was watching. But it was in his room. And his room was covered in anime posters and, and models and or like figures and, and merch and stuff. And I was looking around and I was like, trying to, I was like, oh, well, you know, I should know some of this. And I didn't recognize any of it. I didn't recognize a single character. I was like, what the hell is this? And then, you know, I'm looking at oh, I- Itasha meets on YouTube, right? You, you've all seen the videos. And I'm like, yeah, I know some of these. I know Garupan. I, there's always a Garupan guy. There's always a Kaon guy or two. You know, there's always a, a Umu Musume guy. There's always a, uh, an Evangelion guy. But then a lot of them, I'm like, I've never even seen these characters around. Like, I've seen every Moe character at some point. Even if I haven't seen the show they're from, someone on 4chan will have posted their face once. Like, I should recognize it. I'm like, I don't recognize any of this. And that's when I realize, you know, I, I'm realizing that these... The, the 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 Japanese otaku rooms and Itasha and a lot of this stuff is all about eroge, not anime. Like all of these characters that you'll find in posters in Japanese otaku rooms are all from eroge, uh, or at least majority from eroge. You know they have some anime posters as well, but a lot of them are from eroge, and it's the same with Itasha. And so that's actually what got me to start reading visual novels in the first place. Um, so that's fucked me up because now I, you know, I look at my wall of all of these great anime posters and these are all from anime I really like, but at the same time, I can't help but feel like a poser because none of these are from visual novels. And, you know, I'm not the world's biggest visual novel guy. I think I've, I can probably count exactly how many visual novels I've read. Um... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. Twenty-five. I've only read twenty-five visual novels, right? Which is, yeah, not very much. I mean, those are much longer than twenty-five anime, but yeah. And the reason is I have... Tr- oh, actually, that's not true. Wait, it literally tells you. I didn't have to count. <laughs> 25 finished and 13 dropped and uh, yeah, it's actually should be 26 because I'm about to finish Island Diary like in five minutes. I'm like reading it right now. Um, But yeah, the thing that's difficult about visual novels is so damn long, man. They're all so fucking long and I'm like ADHD as shit. Uh, It's a lot of reading. Like again, I've said this before. If you... uh, I imagine if you speak Japanese, it's way easier to read visual novels for a long time because you don't have to actively read, right? You just listen to the voice acting. Um, so that probably helps, which is kind of makes me want to learn Japanese again. But... Uh, yeah. It's too, kind of effort. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it takes longer to learn Japanese than it does to just read a visual novel, so I don't know. But, right, so so here's the combination of these two things, as I'm looking around, so I've, you know, I've read a bunch of visual novels, not uh, not like a shitload, but there's a, a, a quite a few visual novels that I have a strong attachment to, right, a lot of them are Yuzusoft visual novels, or, um, you know, Chaos Head, uh, Subahibi, uh, there's a few others, right, like, there's definitely visual novels that I like, uh, and I would love to get posters of them, like, if I could get a, a Sangaku Renai, uh, Love Triangle Travel poster. That's that would be great. You know that would fit my my the the aesthetic of the wall very well. If I could get a, uh, I don't know any like Sunnable Witch. Sunnable Witch would be perfect. Like any Ubisoft visual novel would fit the 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 Moe focus of this wall. Um, but none of them exist because no one in the West is reading Ubisoft visual novels, except. 
except like they're not the ones I've read, right? Like the only ones that are there that I can find, I could find like some really expensive. We're talking hundreds of dollars <laughs> shipping from Japan. So that's not counting, not even counting shipping over a hundred dollars for like a, a Dracu Riot thing. I don't even know if it was a poster, but I don't like Dracu Riot. I, I dropped Dracu Riot. I didn't, I didn't like it, which is a shame because I thought I would, but yeah, Dracu Riot, not my favorite, probably my least favorite user soft that I've read. Um, and the other user soft games that I've read are uh, uh, Then I Royale, which was decent. It's not my favorite. The Emoto character is really good. If I could get a ca- uh, Matt, if I could get a fucking poster of the Emoto character from Renai Royale, that would make me happy. But I don't think it exists. Um, I mean, I can look for it, but I don't think it exists. Yeah, it's just giving me Fortnite. <laughs> It's giving me Fortnite. Uh, Hold on, I'm gonna keep looking. Uh, Don't need that, don't need that, don't need that. What I need is... Wait, did I mark Renai Royale as finished? Where is it? I, oh, here it is. Oh, sorry, okay, I'll do this later. Um, but, uh, right, so the, the only Ubisoft property that I can find posters for, and they're cheap, is Senden Banker, Banker, Senden Banker, which I haven't read. So, my plan is to read Senden Banker so that I can get the poster for it. That's my plan. I'm like, if I get if I get into Senden Bunker, I can then find the easily available posters for it, which I think is a very backwards way of doing things, right? I <laughs> instead of buying posters for stuff I like, I'm gonna try and like something because posters are available for it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I guess Senden Bunker is pretty popular. I, I don't really know anything about it except that it's Ubisoft and it's pretty popular. Um, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I guess, download it and, and read it and hopefully enjoy it so that I can buy poster for it. You know, while I talked about um, Japanese otaku in that last segment, I think I want to mention some other things that I've noticed seem to be the, that this, I remember I was speaking as a stupid uh, gaijin here, baka gaijin, who doesn't know any Japanese otaku personally, has been to Japan once many years ago, and, you know, I'm not super involved with the culture, I don't speak Japanese or read Japanese, uh, so take this with a grain of salt, this is just stuff I've generally noticed and reasoned out. As the difference is, I think, you know, I think otaku culture is really split into a few different spheres. You have the Japanese otaku sphere, and these spheres are kind of disconnected from each other. You have Japanese otaku, then you have Southeast Asian otaku. And now, in Southeast Asia, they take this shit real fucking seriously. Like, these guys are some of the most based otaku in the world. Um, you know, these guys are, are, are based. But they don't really seem to interact with, like, directly with... Um, either Japan or the West. They're kind of in their own place. Then you have uh, the West, which includes all of Europe, uh, all of North America, and Australia, which isn't in the, and New Zealand, Australasia, which isn't in the West <laughs> geographically, but politically is in the West. Uh, <clears throat> and those are the major ones. There's also South America, which is kind of its own thing. Um, but I don't know that much about it. But yeah, I know that there's a lot of anime fan. I mean, obviously in South America they fucking love Dragon Ball. Uh, everyone knows that, especially in, yeah in Mexico as well. Um, Goku is one of the most popular male names in uh, Mexico, I think, which is really funny. Uh, 
or maybe it's not one of the most popular, but it's been going up and popular. I, I read something somewhere about how people are naming their sons Goku, and that's fucking base. Uh, but yeah, and I know there's a lot of anime fans in Brazil because there's a lot of everything in Brazil because Brazil is like the central hub of culture <laughs> in the world. Um, uh, so those are like the different spheres. I feel like the South American and Central American anime community or otaku community doesn't really communicate with like it's kind of its own sphere like the west which is like europe Amer north america and australia are like its own thing and then southeast asia and then japan uh and i get you know chinese otaku is kind of also maybe its own thing they don't really communicate that much with the outside world for obvious reasons uh but i don't know shit about them uh i know they exist but and i know that it's more popular there than the government would like it to be uh, but, yeah, so China, you know, Chinese otaku probably also its own sphere. Um, anyway, so those are like the spheres, in my opinion. Uh, they kind of stick to themselves. Uh, now, I don't know anything about any spheres other than Western and Japanese, right? So I'm, that's the ones I'm talking about here. Uh, so here's the differences that I've noticed. I think Western otaku are way more focused on anime exclusively than Japanese otaku. Uh, I this you know I told I said that Japanese otaku are way more into visual novels than western otaku, but it's not just that. Like in the west it's really rare to find tokusatsu fans and tokusatsu is less popular now in Japan than it used to be, but it's still a big part of otaku culture. Like otaku includes tokusatsu like definitionally almost whereas it's really rare to find i mean maybe I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the west don't even know what tokusatsu means um you know and i'm not you know i've seen kamen rider double or kamen rider w and i loved it but i've never seen any other kamen rider i'm planning to watch more but i haven't gone around to it yet uh, but yeah, like, I'm guilty of this too, is what I'm saying. And by the way, like, I think I said this before, but Kamen Rider's fucking sick. You owe it to yourself to go watch some tokusatsu stuff, because that, that stuff is popular for a reason. Like, it's really good. And I'm not saying there are no tokusatsu fans in the West. There obviously are. Uh, there's just way fewer. That's just my impression. Uh, and yeah, obviously visual novels, much bigger deal with Japanese otaku than Western otaku. Uh... And in part, I think that's because of this factor, which I think a lot of people in the West just forget about, which is that in Japan, anime airs on TV. Like, everyone seems to forget this. Anime is a TV show, right? Which means it's kind of a limited time-only thing. Like, over here, we're generally fairly critical of people who only watch seasonal anime, right? Like, that's kind of looked down upon a little bit but you know in japan that is that that is what it means to be an anime fan is to keep up with seasonal anime particularly late night seasonal anime right now you know it's really hard for me to find details about this in english but from what i've read streaming is picking up in japan but it's nowhere near as big as it is in the west like there are similar things kind of, to Crunchyroll in Japan. I forget the names of them. There are like three different services that do anime streaming, and I'm forgetting the name of them right now. Um, one of them, I mean, one of them is Nico Nico, or I was going to say Nico Nico Dogo, but it's not called that anymore. It's just called Nico Nico. Um, they do anime. They host anime on their site with like a pay-per-view or like a subscription system. I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, but from what I understand, a lot of these ways to view anime on the, online are time-limited. Right? Like, you can't just go back and... It's not like Crunchyroll or Netflix where you can go back and watch anime from whenever. Like, as I understand it, I think a lot of this stuff is uh, generally limited to the run length of the show or sometimes even, like, certain episodes will air and they'll only be available to watch online during a set time period around the airing of the episode and then they'll go offline. I don't know if this is outdated information it's again it, it's really hard for me to find english language stuff on this but i know that is at least how it has worked at some point in the past in the like late 2000s and 2010s i don't know if it still works like that 
Um, I know Netflix has been steadily growing in popularity for a while in Japan. I don't know if it's still growing, if it plateaued. I, I have no idea. But Netflix doesn't have a super wide, you, you know, amount of uh, anime available. Uh, the second thing is anime piracy in Japan is borderline non-existent and extremely frowned upon. Uh, obviously, the Western anime fandom is basically built on piracy. It wouldn't exist without piracy. Um, and there are lots of reasons to appreciate piracy in the West, right? Because fan subs are often better than official subs. It's often, you know, there are many reasons why piracy is a very important to the Western anime fandom. Uh, yeah, in Japan, especially in Tokyo, piracy is very looked down upon. It's considered to be like a uh, a huge sin. I, I, I think you would, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this is the case everywhere. Obviously, I'm talking as if it's a monolith here, but uh, at least that's the impression I get, is that it, it's seen as sort of betraying uh, the people who worked super hard to make your anime if you pirate their shows. And on top of that... Uh, we need to talk about how anime is actually profitable. So obviously shows are on TV and they have a commercial break, but most of that commercial money goes to the TV station. Not that much of it goes back to the anime studio, right? How anime is mainly funded is before, when you want to make an anime, you get together a production committee, which is a bunch of distributors from TV networks and so on. They'll have a representative from Crunchyroll there these days, maybe one from Netflix, but it doesn't actually matter. Like, nothing about the way that anime is distributed on streaming services changes the production process or the amount of money that anime makes. Except for Production IG, because they're a weird example, but, you know, other um, studios all work the same way. So you have this production committee where you basically set up, set out, like, this is the anime we want to make, and then you basically sell the license, right? And uh, the way it works is these studios will pay you in advance. They pay the studio in advance. They say like, okay, if you want to make this show, that's fine. Here's your budget. You get this amount of money in this much time. Here are your airing slots. You have to have the episodes ready by then. And uh, that's how it works. Again, it doesn't matter. Like, whether Crunchyroll is in the room or Netflix person is in the room, they just function the exact same as like, any other Japanese TV network or streaming service, it makes no difference. You know, there's a bunch of these people in the room. And probably someone from a, deep, or a Blu-ray distributor is there as well, right? Like, uh, this is, that's how anime gets funded. So they give money. They just say like, okay, you're going to make this show based on this, this popular manga or whatever. Uh, okay, we can give you this much money. Then they go make the show and then the, they recoup the costs, um, you know, by mainly selling goods uh, and in particular selling Blu-rays. So you probably know this, but Blu-rays in Japan, especially anime Blu-rays, are ridiculously expensive. Um, most anime are basically propped up by a handful of sometimes like a thousand hardcore fans who will buy a Blu-ray because uh, I took it as an example here. So Onimai, Onichan Woshimai, right? One of the best shows of this year, right? Definitely the best show of its season. I went on their website and looked up how much the Blu-ray cost. The Blu-ray for Onimai costs uh, 21,780 yen, which is $156.91. Uh, so that's quite expensive, right, for one Blu-ray. Now, it comes with a bunch of shit, like, like you know, it's it's like a special edition Blu-ray, but it's still a Blu-ray. Um, so you can imagine, if you have, like, a thousand hardcore fans all buying a Blu-ray for $150, that's how they're making their money back. Um, you know, when you give money to Crunchyroll, <laughs> it's not really, like... That, that That is not how these studios are making money. They're not making money from Crunchyroll being like, ah, we give them a dividend in royalties. No, no, no. Anime studios don't make royalties. That's not how the industry works. Um, you, you sell the show once to a distributor, and maybe in the future, if you have some sort of contract 
negotiation, you might resell or renegotiate the contract with someone else. But generally speaking, before you make the show, you sell the contracts to distributors and a production committee, and then you recoup the costs almost entirely by hardcore fans in Japan buying Blu-rays and very little else. Um, yeah. Uh, anime that are made for Netflix specifically, or Crunchyroll, actually there's no Crunchyroll exclusive anime, but anime that are made exclusively for Netflix don't get any extra money, they don't, there's nothing different about the production process for Netflix, except that it has a heavier focus on like, uh, dub production, so, uh, yeah, but that's not even really a big deal, it's basically the exact same whether an anime is being made for a streaming service or a TV broadcast or anything. Uh, and that's the way it works. So the point of that is that, um, as I understand it, in Japan, paying for goods, paying for a Blu-ray and stuff like that, is because it's widely known that that is how studios make money. That is you directly giving money to the creators. It's basically seen as like, uh, a, I don't want to say a duty, but kind of like that, right? Like. If you like something, because you're watching the... I mean, there's a reason why piracy is popular in the West, right? Because it's the same in Japan. If you're watching an anime on TV, you're watching it for free. Like, you might watch an entire season just on TV. You know, you pay for a TV license in Japan so you can get NHK, but that's it, right? And, and you're watching it for free. And then if you really like it, you go out and buy the DVD, which is basically how... Westerners watch anime too, except they almost never buy the DVDs or anything like this or the Blu-ray, because it's not available in the West. You know, if I I think if if you know these uh, studios, it's probably too expensive for them to be worth it. The margins are probably too slim once you account for distribution. But I think if they started shipping out, I mean, I guess you can buy online these Blu-rays and then maybe use a proxy buyer to ship them outside of Japan because international shipping is a fucking logistical pain like I don't think people realize how annoying it is as any business to ship stuff internationally it's really annoying no matter who you are whether you're a fucking Amazon or whether you're some tiny business like shipping stuff internationally is a huge pain uh, and it so that's probably why they don't do it um, but I think they could make a bunch of money if they did do it. Uh, so yeah, the, the idea of like spending money to support studios and to support your favorite anime is a much bigger deal than it is in the West. Like, it sort of seemed like an offering. Like, if you really like a particular girl, if you have a waifu, right? Like, spend your, the way that you show that you like your waifu is by spending a bunch of money buying her goods, which supports the studio. Um, it's almost like you're directly giving the anime girl money because you're giving money to the people who manifest that anime girl. So that's definitely a big difference, is that that culture does not exist at all in the West. Like, the idea of, like, you know, Japanese otaku literally think like this. As far as I understand, there are people who think, I'm not saying everyone does, but there are people who literally go to work every day, and while they're working, they're thinking to themselves, I have to work hard so that I can give money to my waifu, right? <laughs> so that I can support, like, if I work hard, I can afford to buy these Blu-rays and give that money to the studio so they can, you know, as like an honorable offering to them, right? So that my waifu can be real once again. Uh, because it has a real impact. Like, buying a Blu-ray is like a vote for a second season or something, right? Like, it's a big deal. It's not just like, oh, I want the Blu-ray in my collection. It's like, I am right now funding a second season of this show out of, out of my own pocket, right? <laughs> like, it's a big deal. And obviously, none of that culture exists in the West. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, most Japanese otaku won't go back and watch... Like, they won't do what I, I'm do, I do, generally, with anime, which is, like, most of my favorite anime come from 
about the era of like 2004 up until like 2014, like that kind of 10 year span, most of my favorite anime, maybe a bit later, but that's where like most of my favorite anime come from. Uh, that probably is a very rare situation in Japan for someone who didn't start watching anime until after that era, or at least during that era, right? Like that's, that I, I suspect that is very rare because most people watch currently airing shows predominantly and if they do watch older shows, they're classics, you know, that they might have on, on DVD or VHS or something. Like, you know, the absolute classics, the your Avas, your Dragon Balls, your, you know, your, your Cowboy Bebops, the, the, the ones that everyone knows, right? That's the only old anime that most, most people are watching. I think I, I, this is all just speculation. Um... But yeah, I think it's pretty rare that you'd see someone who's going back and watching shows from like four years ago. And that's why it seems to me relatively rare the Japanese otaku have watched as much anime as Western otaku have. Like hardcore Western otaku, it's not uncommon for them to have seen thousands of shows. How are you doing that in Japan? Unless you've just been an otaku for like decades and you're watching every currently airing show every season, you're not watch you're not it's not possible. You'd like that's just not how it works. Um, I I think it's very rare, and that's why visual novels are such a m- more of a big deal. Manga is such more of a big deal because these are mediums where you're going out and you're buying a, a like a a CD ROM because that's how most visual novels are distributed in Japan. Physical, right? Japan's still big physical media country, the last remaining large digital physical media market. Um, even though they're moving away from it slowly. Uh, they they have been moving away from it slowly for the last like 10 years they're still doing it slowly it's a conservative culture what can I say um, you know you're buying physical releases of Eroge and these will be available you know in multiple they won't just be available when they come out they'll stay in the stores and that's and they're not you know crazy ridiculously expensive like anime blu-rays are um, so that's, I mean, that's a huge reason why Eroge is such a bigger deal in the otaku sphere in Japan. And manga, again, will be around for a lot. You can go to a manga shop and it's everywhere. Now, manga in Japan is quite different from manga in the West, right? Because in Japan, manga isn't an otaku thing necessarily. It's just a young people thing, mainly. Like, I know people say, like, oh, everyone in Japan reads manga. That's not necessarily true, mainly just because, you know... Everyone probably reads manga from time to time. But people who read a lot of manga, generally young people, just because they have more free time. Uh, if you're a salary man, you might read a chapter on the way to work, right? But you're probably not, you know, sitting there reading through volumes of manga in your free time every day. Um, not that it doesn't happen. It's still pretty much more widespread and popular throughout the adult population than it is in the West. But um, it's, you know mainly young people who read manga and it doesn't they you know reading manga like if you've read 50 100 manga that doesn't mean you're an otaku necessarily it just isn't even that unusual um if you've read you know maybe if you've read it depends on the type right if you're just reading regular manga that's not particularly unusual or otaku whereas people in the west don't read manga unless they're already interested in weeb shit uh there are a lot more sort of widespread access manga stuff in Japan. Um, and then, again, another thing is light novels. Um, now, light novels have changed uh, quite a bit in Japan, uh, but, uh, again, light novels are really a young people thing. Most light novels are targeted at uh, men in uh, high school. Uh That's the biggest demographic for light novel readers. And light novels are fucking huge in Japan. But there's something else to add on to it, which is the prevalence of Shosets Kami Naro, which is a website where people write light novels. A lot of popular isekai that all got turned into anime that you know originated from Shosets Kami Naro. Web novels on this website, right? And this website is super fucking popular. Like, people will keep up with chapters there 
And these are just am amateur authors who like aren't getting paid writing on this website in the hopes that like someone will pick them up for a publishing deal. And this is a culture that just doesn't exist at all in the West. I mean, it's most comparable to fanfic writers, but even then, you know, no fanfics are really getting picked up and published. Like it's a a whole different ball game that just doesn't exist outside of Japan. Like we have no context of like what this means. Um, Whereas it's, de you know, I'm not saying it's like widespread in the general populace, but people who are into it are into it. Um, so yeah, that's like a whole thing that exists in Japan and doesn't exist here. Um, what else? Uh, there's, there's two channel existing, Futaba channel, right? That's like kind of a very different culture from 4chan. I mean, it's not that different. They're still racist. <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, except it's it, it's it's like 4chan, but replace black people with Koreans. Uh, that's like the culture of t of Futaba channel. Um, but it, it's also like uh, there's a lot of subtle differences. I don't know that much about it because it's hard to gather from Google translated browsing. Um, but yeah, as I understand it, it's it's got quite a different culture. Like uh, Futaba channel is very centralized. Right, like you have like a few boards, like two or three boards, uh, maybe three or four boards that are ridiculously fast, like 10 times faster than B, right? Like the, fa the fastest image board in the world, no question. And then the, all of the other boards on the website are barely fucking used. <laughs> like you have these ridiculously fast boards with like hundreds of thousands of daily users, maybe millions. And then no one gives a shit about the rest of the site. They're all super niche and they get like 100 posts a day, 10 posts a day, 5 posts a day, you know. Right, like there's a, a big difference on 2chan between the popular boards, the, the, the very few super fast popular boards that are way faster than anything we have versus the rest. Um, yeah, let me see. Anything else that I can think of? Oh, fanworks, doujin, huge deal in Japanese otaku. No one in the West does it or cares about it. Doesn't exist. Like no one cares. Like who? Do you know anyone who does doujin works? No. Like no one. No one does this shit. People might m make original stuff. Oh, also, people in Japan still read blogs. That's another thing. Anime blogs were a big deal. You know, for a while in the West, everyone transferred over to YouTube when that became a thing. So now, like, there's a lot of anime YouTubers. Um, now, there are Japanese anime and otaku YouTubers, but they're not super popular. Or they are, but they're not, like, as trendsetting. But people still read anime blogs in Japan. Like, there are still super popular anime blogs, and, like, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, yeah, what was the other thing I was just talking about before I talked about blogs? I don't remember. Right, I was talking about doujins. So, doujin, both... Edo and non-Edo doujins is, like, massive in Japan, right? Like, the most popular centralizing event of Japanese otakudom is Komiket, which is a doujin event, right? Like, if you're a Japanese otaku comic... I mean, Komiket is less... I, I don't know if it's... I don't really know the history or the current status of Komiket, but it's still fucking huge, right? Like... Komiket is the centralizing event of Japanese otaku, and it's focused on doujin works. Like, if that doesn't tell you what's going on here, then I don't know, nothing will. Like, like doujin works, huge deal. Virtually non-existent in the West. Like, no one in the West does it, which is a crazy difference. Um... Yeah, I think that about does it for my knowledge. Okay, so I've basically been reading Senen Banka all day. Uh, and the common route is, is really good, at least so far. Best common route in a Ubisoft V... I don't know about... It's, it's more plot-focused than slice-of-life-focused, but I don't know, I'm really enjoying it. It's got a lot tons of good intrigue and stuff. Which is a bit, because... Maybe I need to give Dracuriot another try. Because... I remember... The reason why I 
dropped Dracula. Well, there was a couple of reasons. The first one was that at the time, Proton and Wine couldn't deal with Ubisoft VNs very well. Like, whatever engine they use uh, just didn't gel with Proton or Wine. And so it was super laggy. Like, I think, like, it, it would make my computer go brrr, right? It would make my computer go brrr, the fan go and it would run at, like, 10 FPS, uh, which was kind of annoying. So that was definitely uh, a reason that contributed to me not liking it, right? But the second thing is that while I was reading it, the common root, I expected going in for it to be a bit more of a slice of lifey kind of situation, and it turned out that there it was actually more of an action plot, right? Like a, kind of an action thriller plot. Uh, and that by itself is fine. Like Senran Vanka is somewhat of an act. I mean, it has action thriller elements. Maybe not thriller, but action elements at least. Uh, there's a lot of visual novels I like that have action and thriller elements. That's not the problem. It's just the way it was done where... I felt I felt like I saw the stakes ra- like raising to the point where it just became absurd. Like it went from a oh, there's vampires in this place and we're going to do a plot with vampires in this place. It was like no, actually there's this evil bad blood drug and this drug and they're going to take over the world and the whole world is in danger from this drug and this vampire drug, unless you save the day. And that was just too far for me, (laughs) I guess. Uh, I don't know. Not the worst thing I've ever... You know, one of the most popular visual novels is Grisaya. Grisaya no Kajitsu, right? The Fruits of Grisaya. Um... It's often considered to be one of the best visual novels, and frankly, I have no fucking idea why. It's super popular. I mean, it has uh, Akio Watanabe character designs, so it looks great. Some of, you know, great character designs. Um, and the common route is really fucking good. The common route is, like, the best slice-of-life visual novel. Maybe not the best, but, you know, it's up there. It's, it's one of the best that I've read. It's really good. All the characters are super cool. The location, the school, the weird school. It's cool, right? The reason I dropped it is because I decided to play the character roots in the order that they came up chronologically. I.e., like, whichever one branched off from the main story first, I selected that, and then I was going to go back and pick the second one and so on. It was one of the first visual novels I'd read, so... You know, that was my idea. It's not crazy to do it like that, right? That's a reasonable thing to do. And the first uh, character route that comes up in the game is Makina. I think that's her name. Makina. And the first half of Makina's route was okay. It wasn't as good as the common route. But it was fine, you know, it, there were some parts that had me genuinely invested. And then the, the ending, like the whole, the entire part of that route that's the ending was just so bad <laughs> that I remember what happened when I finished the ending of that route. I sat there and I thought to myself, I don't trust the people who could write that, who could, if someone could write this bullshit, do I really trust that they can write something good? Like, you, I don't think it's possible that someone can write something this bad and then also something good. Like, I just don't believe it. And so that's what I was like, I don't, because, you know, previously the Machina route was fine. It wasn't my favorite thing in the world, but it was okay leading up to the the whole ending arc. Uh, and especially the the ending ending. It's not just the ending arc, it's the 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 literal ending, the conclusion 
it's kind of a twist ending. There's two. There's a good and a bad end, both of which are equally dog shit. Um, I, I won't spoil it, but here's what I remember thinking. I thought to myself, oh, okay, so they took this reasonable story and they just went, what's the most edgy thing we can possibly do? Like, like throw all the rules of storytelling out the window, throw any aspects of characterization out the window, anything that could be appealing or good about this story. Story doesn't matter anymore. We're no longer trying to tell a story. What matters is how can we shock people with this ending the most? That they threw everything out and they were just pure shock value. And it fucking pissed me off so much because visual novels are long as shit, okay? I read, I'd been reading this thing for ages, it felt like. And this was the first route, so obviously I had the route. But, you know, we're talking at the very least, like, what, 10 hours, something like that, maybe more. You know, I'd been, I was pretty invested time-wise in this thing. And then they just throw everything out the window so that they can go with pure shock value ending that just undercuts everything and makes it feel like the whole thing was for nothing because it's just pure and I was just mad I was so mad that I was like I don't even care if other roots in this visual novel are good I don't believe it I do not believe that other roots could be good if you can write something this dog shit like what if every single I have no idea what the other roots are like it wouldn't surprise me if they all end with some bullshit shock value thing So, that's why I dropped Fruits of Grisaia. Even though it's one of the most popular visual novels and it has a really good common route and it has character designs by my favourite character designer. <sighs> yeah. Not happening. I, I think I'm going to be taking a break from the Strike Witches slash World Witches universe because... Honestly, Strike Witches Season 3 was really good, and I enjoyed it, and I don't want to ruin that feeling within me, where I'm like, well, it had some it had some questionable parts, but it ended on a good note. I, right, I don't want to ruin that feeling by going back and watching the less good parts of the franchise, which is what I'm going to have to do if I'm completing it. So to tackle, to, to avoid burnout and to avoid that negative feeling... And also because I'm enjoying Senmen Banka and I want to put all of my effort into finishing that. Uh, I think I'm going to take a break from Strike Witches, which is strange, but <laughs> which is Strike Witches, which is, which is, which is, yeah. Because uh, <clears throat> I said I would end this podcast when I finish Strike Witches, but I don't know what's going to happen anymore. This podcast got really long, really fast. <laughs> Like, I feel like I haven't even been recording for that many days, real time, compared to my previous podcast. And yeah, I'm already at the 10 hour, 10 and a half hour mark. This will hit 12 hours. I have two more. Like, that. this will hit 12 hours, like, in, in within the week, within, like, a few days. Um, I'm not sure what to do about that. I've just found out that my banking app has a whole bunch of, like, I don't know why I didn't know about this before, or maybe I tried, actually, I'm pretty sure what happened is, oh, well, whatever, that doesn't matter, but I just found out that this, or I just got access to this, this, uh, this part of my banking app that shows what I spend my money on, and it's like, god damn, these motherfuckers at the bank were lying to me, they were saying, oh, you spend, like, a thousand pounds a month, Bro, I don't spend anywhere close to £1,000 a month. You know how much money? Total exp... Okay, let me tell you. April. This April. Total spending in April, £246. I'm living so cheap. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, April was a particularly low... Um, it was particularly low. But, you know, I, I'm spending very little... What the fuck did I spend a shitload of money on there? Oh, that was when I bought my Mac. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm spending like nothing. My main expenditure by far is groceries. Uh, 
and even that, I'm spending like, what, between 200 and 400, maybe 500 max pounds a month, which is crazy low. And honestly, I I could see how much money am I making on I mean, I'm, I make most of that back. Like, I make about £100 a month from, like, Spotify and streaming services for my music, right? Like about £100 a month. And then Patreon, what am I making? Like, 40 something like that? 30 something Oh, damn, it's dropped. <laughs> it's, just, it's dropped significantly. Okay, I'm making very little from Patreon. Uh, oh, yeah, because this... Okay, so there was one guy who was donating 20 who just deleted their shit. So that's why I'm making less money. I need to be shelling the Patreon harder. But my impossible goal of... I didn't realize how cheaply I'm living. If I can... If I can fucking shell my Patreon harder... And by that I mean not just advertise it more... But also give better benefits so it's actually a worthwhile um, thing. Right? Like, if I can if I can create my Patreon into a more worthwhile thing that's worth paying money for, um, I think I could easily make, like, just as a very low goal, £50 a month, right? I, I don't think that's that crazy. I've, I've made £50 a month on Patreon in the past. Not too crazy, right? I could make £50 a month on Patreon... And then a hundred pounds a month on from music streaming. That's like half my expenditures just recouped. So I'm, um, you know, um, that makes me halfway there to being financially sustainable, which is better than I am right, or better than I thought I was. This is generally speaking. The problem with arrow gay slash be shoujo gay slash visual novels, whatever you want to call it. The number one problem with the medium is nothing. I mean, it's just. I don't know why it's like this. But almost always, these VNs have. There's, there's lots of VNs that have good common roots. And then once you get into a a heroine's root off of the common root, it just becomes bad. <laughs> and now I'm not saying that Senden Danka is like that. There's a couple of things going on, and I think it's all combining. The first thing is that the common root tends to have the bulk of the plot in it, right? And then this is the stuff that I don't like, is when common root is a full plot story arc, and then the character roots are just romance with nothing else going on. Because, let's be honest, none of these writers are really that good at romance. Some of them are. It can happen. But it's pretty rare. And it's also always, like, very first lovey, you know, first girlfriend, idealized romance, like... Because it's supposed to be wish fulfillment, right? I've never been super into that, you know. Not that I'm hard against it, either. It's just... I was into it when I was, like, 14, 15, you know? When, like... <laughs> there was a t- When I was a teenager, I was more into it. Te- the, the sort of adolescent high school love stories. But I'm 24 now. It's a bit much, right? Now, I don't know what I'd want instead of that. Maybe just something with a little more individuality to it, you know? Characters who aren't just... Look, I'm not saying... Set, like, I'm on the main heroine roots of, of, the root of in the Senran Banker. And it's fine. But I think that's part of the problem, right? It's like, they kind of all become the same, right? Every time it's like, oh, the girl's flustered because she, you want to go on a date, oh? Oh my God, we're going to kiss you. Oh, oh no. I'm so hazkashi, you know? 
there's only so many times you can watch the same plot unfold. Um, and this is not just my obs. I mean, they talk about this in uh, fucking that one anime, Setokai no Ichizon. Uh, the main character literally brings this up: how every eroge has the same plot, um, and that's what he means: is that the character roots in every eroge are basically the same, and that gets a little tiring, to be honest with you. Um, but there's a there's another big problem here, which is not the game's fault, and that is me, that I am someone who just doesn't have a particularly long attention span. I'm not good with long term shit, like like generally speaking, I blame it on growing up watching episodic TV shows instead of lo- this. Is not actually true. I don't know why I said that. Who knows why I'm like this? Maybe I have ADHD or something. Like, I'm fine w- with stuff that lasts, like, a week. Like, I can do something consistently for a week. And this is something, I, I understand this is a flaw in myself, and I'm working on it. Okay? I, I This is something that I'm continually working to try and improve about myself, is my ability to stick to things for longer than, like, a week. Um, but, yeah, I do tend to get bored of stuff pretty easily and move on. Uh, and I think this is one of the problems, is that by the time I'm done with the common route, I'm often already starting to, like, slightly lose interest. And so, you know, I'm maybe fine with the first heroine's route that I do, maybe the second one, but by the time you get to, like, the third and fourth heroine's routes that I'm going through, and, you know, sometimes I'm completely uninterested in some of them, but I play it anyway because I'm like, well, it doesn't count as finished unless I play all of the routes. And so then I'm like, well, I've just sat through this whole thing that I don't even care about. And, you know, at that point, when you're playing all the heroines' routes one after another, you're basically playing through the same story like four times. (laughs) I mean, normally visual novels have four girls. That's like the typical amount. Uh, so you're basically playing through the same story four times with, like, slight variations. And that, yeah, I'm going to be honest with you, it gets a little tiring. I think it's the main problem with visual novels. Uh, and another thing, and again, Sinan Banker doesn't have this problem because it's actually pretty well written. Not amazing, but, you know, fine, possible. Pretty good. Uh is that a lot of visual novels are just terribly paced. They are overly long. The worst example of this is Chaos Head. Chaos Head is at least twice as long as it needs to be. Because I think, you know, if you're... I think the reason they do this is that, uh, you know, you're spending real money on a game, right? They they, they want to pad out the runtime. I mean, I think that's literally it. It's like if you spent, you know, how much does Edelgeist cost in Japan? Should I look it up? Right, as I as I remembered, in Japan, visual novels, just like every piece of otaku media in Japan, is ridiculously fucking expensive. Uh, a visual novel will set you back like 80 quid, sometimes more, right? There are sometimes visual novels that cost like $100 for one game. It's insane. So I think they pad out the runtime. Like, I think that's literally it. Uh... They just, they, they're like, well, you know, people are going to complain if they spend $80 on a, on a game and it's 10 hours instead of 40, even if the script really should be 10 hours instead of 40. Uh, and that shows a lot in the final product because it often feels overly long and dragged out. Again, I'm not complaining about Senen Banka here specifically. Senen Banka is actually pretty good when it comes to the script especially in the common route, is, like, pretty fucking tight, especially for a VN. Like, it's fine. I The, the game's good. I'm just thinking about other visual novels I've played, especially Chaos Head, which is, like, the work. Chaos Head's such a, like, mixed bag for me in my mind because it has such a memorable moment. Like, I remember reading it, and there were certain parts that did really affect me and put me in the Denpa headspace because, you know, it's one of these Denpa visual novels. Uh, 
and it you know there were parts that were very effective and parts that are very memorable to me even now the ending fucking well all of the endings were ass right um but the main thing i remember is that all of my positive feelings towards the vn were fucking like overshadowed by the fact that it was just too long like it's dragged out i i complained about this i've complained about fuck that game enough i should stop uh yeah the th- i'm i'm worried the th- this is the thing that happens to me every time i read a visual novel and i get like decently far in is that i get worried that i'm going to fucking not finish it this is why if you go on my vndb which I don't know if my VNDB is public, so I don't know if I've actually announced what... Actually, you know what? I'm going to keep my VNDB hidden. You're not going to know what it is. But uh, unless you're really smart and you can stalk me hard enough. <laughs> but, like, that's why I have 25 finished visual novels and 13 of thirteen dropped visual novels, right? And five stalled. Because I just, you know, like, take... Okay, here's here's some dropped ones. Some of them I dropped for reasonable reasons, right? Chrono Clock, I dropped because the translation... There was a British character in Chrono Clock, right? And a British... One of their heroines is British, right? And this fucking retarded translator made all of her dialogue, like, ridiculously, obnoxiously, like, over-the-top stereotype British accent in text and it was just unreadable it was so annoying that i had to drop the visual novel because it was so bad uh or dracuria i already talked about why i dropped that uh Furaraba, i got through the common route and then the romance the 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 character routes were just bad um in my opinion uh but then you look at like uh, that was, shit was good it's just also uh, 62 fucking hours long <laughs> according to VNDB like I enjoyed uh, uh, Magikoi you know I, what I read of it I enjoyed it and I'm pretty sure I got halfway through I probably read about 30 hours of Magikoi and enjoyed it but by that point, you know, I just didn't have the... I might have read more. I might have read 40 hours, you know. Like, I was pretty deep into it. And eventually, you know, I started not reading it. Not because I sat down one day and I was like, this is too long. I give up. It wasn't like that. It was just that, like, you know, you read it. You read a bit every day. And then one day you miss a day. And then, you and then you know, the next day you're like you forget to do it and then next thing you know it's been like a week since you've read it at all and you forgot what's going on and you're like uh ah, fuck it and then you give up like that's what happened with magikoi um the same thing happened to me with uh wagamama high spec although that one was not very good to begin with but yeah i got i finished the first heroines route that i did and then uh halfway through the second heroine's route the same thing happened i just like one day i stopped playing it you know i just forgot or whatever and then the next day i forgot again or i just moved on to something else and didn't even think about it didn't even notice and then by the time i realized that i'd stopped playing it i realized i didn't fucking care about it anymore and so i just dropped it same thing happened with uh well Actually, that's not true, but... Th- th- okay, let me pick a different one, because that, w- that one was just kind of bad. Or oh, I wasn't in the mood to read it, because it's like a Nukige. I didn't realize it was a Nukige when I started reading it. Um, Sharin no Kuni, Himawari no Shoujo. Same thing happened. Same fucking thing happened. I was enjoying it. Like, it was, it was pretty good. There were some good bits to it. It wasn't the best thing I ever read, but it was pretty good. And I got, like, most of the way through the f- the the first heroine's route that I was doing. And then, same thing happened. One day I just uh, forgot to keep reading. The next day I, re- you know, it, and so on. Like, this is something that it just keeps happening with me. And it's because these fucking things are so long. And, th- yeah, I don't know. Like, this is my fault. 
not the visual novel's faults. Well, sometimes it is, but as I said, like, you can't really blame me that much because you're reading a, a, a common route that might be good, and then maybe even a main heroine's route who's good, but then you're reading it four times, <laughs> basically, with minor changes. I mean, that's not true, I'm exaggerating, but do you get what I'm saying? How much of this is me being ADHD Zoomer? I don't know. I honestly don't know what percentage of... Because, you know, part of me is thinking, like, well, if I can... I, this didn't happen with Subahibi. This didn't happen with uh, Cross Channel, right? Like, there are... And Subahibi's long as shit. Cross Channel's long as shit. Didn't happen with those, because I was engaged the entire fucking time, right? Like... There was never a second where I was like, oh, well, what if I forget to read it today? No, when I was reading Subahibi, I woke up immediately. First thing on my mind is I want to know what happens next. And I start reading and then I go, to, you know, next thing I know, I'm going to bed. And the next day I'm like, what the fuck happens next? And I figured up like, that's like, you know, Subahibi actually interesting. Maybe I'm just reading Moege and like Eroge instead of better shit. I don't know. But I liked, um, you know, this didn't happen with uh, Love Triangle Trouble, Sankaku and I Love Triangle Trouble. Uh, it didn't happen with um, Koini Kanmi or Soete, although that game is pretty short. Uh, it didn't happen with... Magical Marriage Lunatics. It didn't happen with any of the Neko Power games, although they're pretty short. Um, yeah, whatever. I I think, you know, sometimes I play a game, I think this is another problem, is that even though I know that I can't stick to things for a long time, I also still have a completionist mindset. Um, as you've seen from this Strike Witches quest that I'm taking a break from. I still have a completionist mindset, so when I see a game and there's like four main heroines and then two side heroines, I'm like, I, even if I'm playing this game and I'm only interested in one girl, which is pretty common, I, p I, I pick up a game because one particular character design stands out to me, and uh, like I'm only really interested in that one girl, I'll still force myself to try and play through all the routes, and I feel guilty if I mark it as finished, if I, if I only play one route. Because it feels like I didn't really finish it. But I don't think I should be like that. In fact, I st I've tried to stop being like that. Which is why I marked um, Sonoba Witch as completed. Even though I didn't finish all of the routes. I only finished some of the routes. Um, I think three of the four main heroines I finished. Or two of the four. I don't even remember. But yeah, I didn't finish all of it. I didn't go through every route because... Not every girl was interesting to me. Um, so I don't know if that makes me uh, retarded. I, I'm sure that that's the sort of thing that people in the visual novel community would judge you for. But also, I don't know why I should read bullshit. Life's too short to read bullshit in the, the words of uh, Better Than Food book reviews. Anyway, I should... Uh, keep reading and try and actually finish this fucking visual novel instead of complaining to you about the fact that I'm reading a visual novel voluntarily. I am currently uh, quite manic. I haven't been this manic in quite a long time. I'd say over a year, maybe. Maybe not. I'm not sure. But I'm quite mania-moded. And I know this because I'm rearranging furniture... And my thoughts are racing. <laughs> I tend to rearrange furniture when I'm manic. I don't know why. I'm just like, I need to do something. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, one of the things I've done... This is one of my genius ideas as a mania guy. Genius idea. I've created a new setup. A new computer setup. So now I have three computer setups. I have my bed... So here's what, what happened, right? I was sitting there playing Senren Banker, right? <laughs> Which sounds weird when you say it without the Japanese accent. Senren Banker. I was there sitting there playing Senren Banker. <laughs> that was like Indian. I don't know where I was going with that. Senren Banker. 
Anyway, I was doing it. I was playing a game. And I was like, man, you know, my otaku room is coming together with all these posters these days, right? Like, it's the, the poster ball. I'm very motivated to finish it right now. To get it, like, to get more of them done. And honestly, I don't know why I'm not, like, focusing harder on doing that. Because I could... I could just be buying posters. And once it's done, it's done. And so it doesn't matter if... It doesn't really matter when I spend the money. I'm not going to run out of money. (laughs) You know, it's not going to cost me thousands of pounds. It's going to cost me hundreds of pounds. (laughs) Um... That money I will make all make back eventually. So why don't I just do it all now? I don't know. But I'm not going to do it all right now. Anyway. I was sitting there in the front room playing Senden Banka. And I was in the front room because that's where the gaming PC is. I'm going to do a room tour or like a house tour at some point video. Um, it's really just two rooms. You you don't want to see my bathroom. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, just like my, yeah, whatever. I'm going to do a tour video at some point. But I want to finish the otaku wall before I do that. And this setup. All right, the setup I can can be unfinished in the video, it doesn't matter. But the, the wall I really want to be finished. Otherwise it's like I'm showing something that's half done and it's annoying. Um, anyway, I was in the front room playing Senden Banka and TF2 at the same time. Like, I was just, t- every time I died, I would tab over and read and stuff. That's that's basically how I've been re- getting through it, is I've been going through periods where it's like I do that, and then periods where I switch off TF2 and just, just read, then taking some breaks to, like, eat and watch YouTube and stuff. And frankly... It's taken me an alarmingly long time to get through this because CSGO and TF2, like this is how I used to read visual novels when I played CSGO, but you spend a lot more time dead in CSGO, it turns out. Uh, So in TF2, you're not reading as much as maybe I should be. Anyway, um, so I was doing that and I was playing Senden Bank in the phone and I was like, damn, I wish, like this is like not comfy. My, like, the game is comfy, but my environment isn't comfy, because I'm in a kitchen, basically. Like, I'm, I'm in a kitchen, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's not, the room's too damn big, and it doesn't feel like the otaku space of the house, because it isn't, because it's the public space of the house, right? Or the flat, right? It's the public area. As demonstrated by the fact that the guy from my ISP came over to to fix my router, even though my router wasn't broken, but he gave me a new router, which is set up now. Um, and, you know, he can be in the, the kitchen slash living room, front room, which is the public space, and never have to see my embarrassing anime posters everywhere. Right? Like, that's all chill. But that's not the place where I should be gaming... I mean, I don't mind playing, like, gaming gaming over there. That's fine to me. But I feel like visual novel, I need to be in the, the otaku area of the house, you know? Um, which I have been doing. So how I've been doing it is Steam has this remote play feature. So what I'll do is when I'm bored of TF2 and I just want to read, I'll go into my room and get out the ThinkPad and then read the visual novel via remote play, right? So I leave it up on, and I, which is a really fucking useful feature. Like, it's great, and it works really well. I mean, I wouldn't want to play, like, an online multiplayer game on it because there's definitely some you notes, know, there's definitely input lag, but when you're just pressing spacebar to move the text forward, it doesn't really matter if there's a few milliseconds of delay. Uh... So the Steam remote play stuff is super useful. Um, and I've been doing that, and that's pretty good. By the way, the reason I'm doing this uh, uh, like that is because I playing modern, especially Yuzusoft for some reason, I don't know what engine they use, but playing modern visual novels, especially Yuzusoft ones, on my ThinkPad just makes the fan go fucking, you know, makes it makes it too hot, makes it makes it use up too much 
CPU or whatever the fuck, however it works, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with my X220, if it's just that low spec, or if there's something wrong with it, I, I have no fucking clue. Or if it's a software thing in Wine or Proton or something, I honestly have no idea, and I don't really care to find out, because the Steam Remote Play thing works fine. And that's kind of chill, but for some reason, I was sitting there and I was like, man, you know, the reason, I guess part of the reason is, there's this guy on YouTube called Artificial Night Sky, aka Paz, great channel, uh, check it out if you haven't, I, his channel got deleted because he posted a video with a bunch of JV in it, um, so he made a new channel, um, but yeah, uh, Artificial Night Sky, who's like the the most uh, the most based hikini on YouTube, uh, probably. Uh, big big into the uh, otaku aesthetic and and otaku ness in general. Uh, See, so yeah, I, I, it's hard to find the channel actually now that I'm looking for it because it's just all fucking NASA videos. How do I find this channel? Maybe all one word. It's like alien videos. It's like fucking alien videos. Where's this guy's goddamn? I mean, I know he's on Odyssey, but where's his goddamn YouTube channel? It's easier to find on Odyssey. Yeah, he's easy to find on Odyssey. Um. Impossible to find on YouTube through the search function, at least. Uh. Here it is. Okay, here's a link to his. U no? Wait, did he close? Wait, I'm confused. Did the YouTube channel get deleted again? Like, in the space of the... Because I was watching his videos like two days ago. Hold on a fucking second. What the fuck happened here? Wait, unless... It, 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 did that, does that link to the old channel? Or did his channel get deleted again? Maybe for ban evasion. Perhaps for ban evasion. No, his channel's still up. That just linked to his old channel. Okay. You got this one, and here it is. Okay, I found it. I found the YouTube channel. It's not deleted. Okay. F finally. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's artificial night sky exclamation mark now. Okay. But anyway, this guy, he has a based otaku room. It's pretty good. Although he does this thing. Which everyone does. Like, Digi used to do it too. Well, it's like, you have a whole bunch of fucking anime posters on your wall. And then when you go to tour them, you're like, Oh yeah, I've never seen this show. Uh, but I got it in Megami magazine. Uh, what the fuck? You can't be doing that, bro. Like, I don't, I don't know why everyone thinks this is okay. In my eyes, this is not fucking okay. Don't be putting up posters for shit that you haven't watched. At the very least, you should have some attachment to the thing you're putting up a poster of. Even if, like in my case, I have a Nanoha poster, right? And it's actually a poster for the Nanoha movie, the first, right? And I've seen that movie, I think it's pretty good. But I'm not the world's biggest Nanoha fan. You, you, you very rarely hear me talk about how much I love Nanoha. My favorite part of the Nanoha franchise is uh, Vivid Strike, which doesn't even have Nanoha in it, <laughs> as far as I remember. Yeah, Vivid Strike is, like, my favorite part of the Nanoha franchise. Uh, uh, actually, Nanoha, the movie second, or the, the A's movie, is the best part of the Nanoha franchise, followed by Vivid Strike, uh, which is more like a spin-off. Um, but, you know, I think the first season of Nanoha kind of sucks, and 
Nano Hat A's is like just all right. Uh, and then Strikers, I tried to watch, couldn't make it through the first episode, and have been meaning to give it a second try for ages. Because at the time I was trying to watch it, I was like trying to group watch it with someone else, and we were just kind of distracted because we were talking to each other, and then we ended up giving up on watching the show. Um, so I've been meaning to give Strikers another chance. Um, but yeah, I'm not the biggest Nanoha fan, and yet I have a Nanoha poster because of what Nanoha represents to me, right, which is, like, the soul of, of otaku media, uh, you know, I have a big Squid Girl poster, I like Squid Girl, but it's not one of my favorite shows, however, again, I've, I do like it, I've seen it, like, no, there's nothing even close to I haven't seen it, everything on my wall is stuff that I have seen, that I have some sort of close attachment to, I've got, um, you know, Chunibyo, which I don't particularly like that show anymore, but it was the first anime I watched, so it's important to me. Kamichu, which is one of my favorite shows. Monogatari, which is one of my favorite shows. Hidemari Sketch, which is my favorite show. Gochi Yusa, which is one of my favorite shows. Then I have Steins Gate. I haven't watched Steins Gate in like five years. <laughs> I, 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 I don't even know if I'd like it if I went back to... I mean, I probably would because it's fucking Steins Gate, but I've seen the show twice... Um, I haven't read the visual novel yet I will one day uh, and then I have Strike Witches which you guys know about and then I have Yuyushiki which is one of my favourite shows like it's all shows that I like and it's not like I, you know, maybe I don't have that many posters compared to some people, maybe if you just want to cover your entire room with posters but these people, they've seen hundreds of anime They've seen thousands of anime. How can they not find something that they like? Or, you know, there's no problem with doubling up. No one's going to arrest you if you're like, oh, and I actually have two posters for this show. No one's going to come to your house and fucking knock on your door and, and blow your door down and arrest you for having two posters of the same show. And that's a perfectly fine thing to do. Especially if you're going for the whole room and not just one wall. Like, I understand, if you're going for the whole room, head to toe, floor to ceiling, posters, you might, and you're buying Megami magazines, right, like, yeah, the things that come in Megami are gonna be, you're gonna get maybe one poster for a show you like, and then it's gonna come with a bunch of other posters, and you're gonna be like, well, I may as well put them up on the wall, but in that case, what I would do in that situation is, I wouldn't feel comfortable putting it up on the wall unless I had at least watched the show. Or at least given it a chance. Even if I dropped it, I would have to give it a chance. I wouldn't, like, it would feel weird for me to look up every day at this poster and be like, I have no clue what I'm repping right now. Like, I know the vague idea about this show, but I have, like, if I put up a Precure poster, right, like, I, I could put up a Precure poster and be like, yeah, I have a vague idea of what Precure is about, but I, but I've never seen it. You know, I've never, I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself to do it. So yeah, I don't know how the, how these people live with themselves. <laughs> yeah, and secondly, buying Megami magazines is not necessarily the best way to get a bunch of anime posters, uh, because, well. There's a video called Going Insane in a Room Full of uh, Naked Anime Girls. And that explains it pretty well. Uh, anyway, well, I got a bit off topic there, <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, so I was, pl I, was, I was in the front room playing TF2 and what playing Sendo and Banka, and I was like, damn man, I wish I was in my space. I'm said I'm in the public space. And then I got to thinking, like, what if I moved the PC setup, the desktop setup, to my room? How would I even, like, obviously I've, th like, thought of this before. There's a reason why it's not in my room. Because obviously it's weird to have your PC setup in the living room instead of your room. So, right, like, that, there's a reason it's like that. And the reason is, uh, well, the main reason is desk and chair, especially desk that I have a desk in my room, it's fucking tiny, it's a tiny-ass desk, 
and it uh, uh, it's too short. It has a drawer in the bottom, and like my legs push up against it. the The desk is simply too low to the ground, like where the bottom of the drawer is, is simply too low to the ground for where, for my legs, and so it's it. I don't fit underneath the desk, so that desk is not usable. And especially, I used to use this sort of side table ha that I have, this sort of chest of drawers that has a little side table that can pull out of it to play CSGO on my Mac. For years, I used to use that to game. And that's also small as fuck. Now, in the front room is a giant dining table. And to be honest with you, a big part of my motivation was to have just infinite mouse space because I was so sick of having this tiny ass mouse space in CSGO where everyone uses, you know, super low sensitivity. So having a big desk space is important. And I was I was just like, I just want the maximum space to move my mouse around on. So I bought a giant mouse pad and a fucking entire dining table made of stainless steel well I didn't buy that that was already there but yeah and it works like it's a it, it's a pretty functional gaming space there's enough space for two monitors comfortably I mean there's plenty of space there's there's nothing but space it's a giant fucking table it's just not particularly comfy uh, in as an environment it's not uncomfortable to sit at it's just you know environmentally uncomfy so I was trying to think, is there something I haven't realized about how I can move the desktop into my room? Like, what could I do? So the the thought is obviously, well, buy a new desk. Um, and buy a new desk is, you know, that's definitely doable. For a while, I've been, you know, I don't use this desk in my room for anything. It just is where I put junk. It just accumulates junk. Um... And so, my original plan for it, before I even got this, the desktop I have, is was to replace it with a, with shelves, and then I could use those shelves to store all my junk in an actual place, instead of it just being, like, scattered around my room vaguely. Uh, and that's not a bad idea, I just never ended up doing it. Um, yeah. But the other idea is obviously to get, like, an Ikea desk or something. And I think that's pretty doable. However, there's a secret hidden option which I've discovered today, which is that the the drawer that makes the table too low is removable, except there's a big slat of wood that holds the drawer in, right? Otherwise the drawer would just fall out. So there's, like, a big slat of wood that holds the drawer in. Except, you know... I think I could just get a saw and saw that out. <laughs> and I'm wondering if the table would fall apart if I did that. Also, I'm pretty sure this table is like an antique. I mean, I don't give a fuck about old things. I don't care about old things. So if it's an antique, I don't give a fuck. But yeah, I don't I don't know what that means for for me. Uh so I thought about moving the desktop in here. But in the end, as a gaming space for TF2, I think the front room just just has many advantages, right? Like, I wouldn't have to buy another Ethernet cable and run it all the way through to, to my room because it's right next to the router. You know, I wouldn't have to buy, buy a whole bunch of shit. I don't have to buy a table. I don't have to keep my room clean so that the chair can move around. You know, I don't have to worry about any of this shit because she's in the front room and it's kind of nice. So what I've come to realize is why not make an intermediary setup? This is my plan. My plan is to take the X230 that I own. I say plan. I've done it already. And I'm looking at it right now. I take the ThinkPad X230, I hook it up to my shitty 4x3 monitor that is, like, quite big but quite shitty. Uh, 
that's currently just sitting there unused and has been since I bought it because I bought it to use with a Raspberry Pi that I was inten intending to turn into a Retro Pi, which I ended up never doing because I realized that I have actually not that much interest in retro games. Uh, <laughs> so I ended up not really using the Raspberry Pi or the monitor for anything. Um, but now the monitor actually has a use case. So I have it as a second monitor or really a primary monitor with the laptop itself being the secondary monitor for a setup where I can play visual novels in my room and I don't need to run an ethernet cable to it because Wi-Fi is good enough I'm not gonna be doing any online gaming or anything at least I don't plan to right now but I might in the future in which case that's it's expand it's definitely possible to, to do uh, if I want to play like Quake or something, a retro online game, maybe a Team Fortress Classic, definitely possible. But anyway, and the X230 is significantly more powerful than the X220 for some reason, even though the fan sounds like a dying person, but that's just because I did some very dubious modifications to fix a loose charging port um, I'm pretty sure that's what made the fan that's why the fan sounds weird is because there's some dubious modifications in, inside of that computer uh, anyway so I have this setup and now I'm going to have three setups I'm going to have my bed which has the X220, the X60, and my Mac. Um, then I have the front room, which is my gaming area, the gamer zone, um, as I call it, sponsored by, it's the Tost Tostino's Pizza Roll Gaming Zone. It's the, the G Fuel Totino's Pizza Roll Fortnite Gaming Zone. Um, and then in the middle of it, literally physically in the middle, if you were to draw a straight line, is going to be the, the otaku zone. The otaku zone, I'm telling you. Now, I would be lying if I told you that none of this was for aesthetic reasons. Okay, there's definitely aesthetic reasons behind some of this. It just adds to the aesthetic of the room to have more computer monitors and computer setups. Of course it does. Aesthetics is everything. You know this, I know this, we know this. Aesthetics is truth. Beauty is truth. There's truth in beauty. You know what I'm saying, ho? Stupid bitch. Don't even know what I'm saying. Right. Now, I'm not going to use this setup to play Senden Banker. At least I don't think I am. Uh, oh, maybe I will. Okay, so here's the problems. Problem number one. No chair. I have a stool, it don't work. It's too uncomfortable for long sessions, not not viable. Uh, I also have some wooden chairs, also too uncomfortable for long sessions, not viable. Uh, I might try just stacking pillows on it until it becomes wearable. I don't know if that's possible, but I don't think it is. I also have two leather armchairs in the front room they don't fit through my door as I have just discovered today <laughs> I told you I was rearranging furniture right they don't they won't fit in here they won't fit through the doorway I tried every angle all my Tetris skills trying to arrange it no not happening unless I'm taking it apart it's not getting in here I also fucked up my lower back trying to lift it in here so yeah, that's not happening. Ideally, I want like, you know that guy Louis Rosman, the guy who makes like right to repair videos. He has the world's comfiest chair. Like you watch his videos, he's got this giant fucking chair. Like I want that. I want that in my room. I want to be playing visual novels on that, cause I want to melt and not not exist. You know, I want it to be like a ketamine 
trance, like a K-hole, where it's like my body just floats. I want to be in a sensory deprivation tank with just Edoge and nothing else in my brain, you know? And that's why I need a big comfy chair, ideally. Like, I don't really want a desk chair. I want, like, a comfy chair. Which is why I was kind of thinking maybe even a beanbag is possible. But that's that's just a crazy, wacky idea, okay? That's maybe too crazy. Uh, so, yeah, chair is something I'm going to have to think about. I'm going to have to put a lot of research and, and thought and effort into it. Because it needs to fit through my door gonna need to fit through my door it's gonna need to exist and then this desk problem is also a problem like I don't even know what to do about it maybe I try and saw this this thing off of the desk like I could just use a I have like a bread knife that's like serrated and I tested it it will cut through the wood I did like a little test cut and it will cut through the wood of the desk. Like, it would probably blunt the knife to hell and never be usable again. But I definitely could saw the table with that bread knife. Um, okay, my Wi-Fi is dead. So, uh, this fucking guy from the ISP didn't fix shit. What a fucking bitch. What a fucking bitch. Uh, uh. So yeah, I don't I don't know what the fuck. <sighs> the melatonin's kicking in. Oh yeah, so I'm manic as fuck, and my I'm also I didn't sleep properly last night. I haven't slept properly in days. Now I don't know if I'm super manic because I haven't slept properly in days, or I haven't slept properly in days because I'm very manic. I'm probably both, probably all of the above. Um, but today, you know, I should have been asleep two hours ago. Or like maybe an hour and a half ago, uh, but I'm I'm not, as you can tell. Instead, I have enough energy to be moving chairs around my house and and thinking about doing a fresh Linux install on this X two thirty. Oh yeah, that's another thing I need to do. X two thirty, I haven't. It's 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 broken. The Linux install is broken on it. I need to do a fresh install. I don't know what distro I'll choose. Probably. I don't know. I'll have to look up what's like the best compatibility with Proton Distro, but it's probably Arch, right? Because the Steam Deck's based on Arch. So I guess I'll just maybe just like default Arch or Artix. I don't know. Probably Arch rather than Artix. Maybe Artix because I'm very familiar. I don't know. It doesn't matter. They're basically the same fucking thing. Um, yeah, anyway. So. I should have been asleep an hour and a half ago. Instead, I have like the world, I have like delirious energy. Um, and that's bad. This is when bad things happen. You know, I've already like slightly injured myself by trying to move this chair. Like, I think I should, like, if I was being more reasonable, I would have immediately thought to myself, that's not going to fit through the door. Um, and then not tried to move it. Because uh, it's heavy as shit, right? Big ass leather chair like armchair uh i think that's an antique too everything's a fucking antique it's this old ass shit these wooden chairs you know they are their church pews they have a bit in the back to put a hymn book like a prayer book they have a little little bit in the back to put it for some reason you put a bible in there but i'm gonna put um I don't know something something in there, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Anyway, so I'm manic as fuck, and my brain is like my body is telling me go. You're you're supposed to be asleep right now, and my brain is telling me you have the world's most energy, and so uh, this is a very like I'm still sentient enough to understand that this is a very very dangerous situation to be in. Unironically, like this is the sort of time when mental illness makes you do really stupid shit. And so I'm trying to opt out. I took a melatonin, not enough to knock me out, but enough to hopefully make me a little more sleepy. And I'm just going to watch some ASMR videos and hopefully override the manic thought racing part of my brain and turn it into just a sleepy part of my brain. Um, 
because I don't I don't want to be doing nothing stupid. You know, I almost you know what I was almost did. You know what I almost did. I almost just bought a trackball mouse because I was like this third setup this this in my room st- setup. I can buy a trackball mouse for it, and I almost did it. I almost spent a hundred quid on a trackball mouse, and then I didn't at the last second. Well, that's not true. It wasn't the last second, but I can I I I say almost. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it wasn't that close, but I was thinking about it. <laughs> I was putting genuine thought. You know what I was gonna do? I was gonna flip a coin. I was gonna go on Google. I was gonna type in coin flip, and then if it was heads. I was going to literally spend a hundred quid on a trackball mouse. And you know what? I still might do it. That's the crazy thing, is I might still do it, but not today. I need to wait until a time when I'm more sensible and reasonable before I make any financial decisions. See? This is me having coping mechanisms. I've been mentally ill for a long time. I know how to deal with myself. Okay? When, when I'm manic... There's a war going on inside my head between my Jewishness and my mania. <laughs> on the one hand, my the mania is like or the hypomania, I guess, to be medically accurate. The the hypomania is like you gotta spend all of your money on this thing right now because it's the most important thing ever and it's gonna change your life. And then my Jewishness is like, never spend money. Don't do it. What are you thinking? <laughs> I don't know what the fuck joke I'm making right now. Anyway. Uh, that's the situation I'm in. Send in banker. I already talked about it. It's good. It's pretty good. The main heroine's route is a little lame, to be perfectly real with you. But, uh, I'm going to play it anyway. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to have fun with it. I also found a pretty comfy TF2 server and just absolutely demolished everyone. Bro, I found this because Uncle Topi is having some problems right now with the website. I don't know what's going on with it. But yeah, Uncle Topi is kind of broken right now. So I was just going through the server browser. I found this 24-7 like French server, although no one was French in the voice chat. So I don't know if if it was French, but anyway, I found this, like, server, and they were playing, uh, uh, what's it, Riverside, is that what the map's called? I don't even remember, it's like a cough map, I actually don't remember what the map's called, why is my internet not working? The guy just came and fixed it, you're not allowed to be not working, you're supposed to be working, the fuck is this? Anyway, that map, it's like kind of Egyptian themed. You guys know the one I'm talking about? Uh, But yeah, that one, Lakeside, I think it's called. I think it's called Lakeside. But yeah, it was that map for a while before. It was Hoodoo, but then it was Lakeside. I don't know what happened. I thought it was a 24-7 server. I thought it was Hoodoo 24-7. I'm not a big fan of Hoodoo, but it's kind of fun to play stock demo on. And I was kind of fucking destroying stock demo on Hoodoo because it's a very spammy map. But then switched over to Lakes to 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 Lakeside. Is that what's called? Yeah. And and I, I switched to Sticky Jumper demo because it's fucking crazy on that map, right? You can like cross the entire map. Uh. And man, I was top scoring like crazy. My pipes, they were just connecting, man. It's crazy how much damage you can do with four pipes. Like, I was deleting heavies off the server. I was hitting scouts from across the map. I was hitting air shots on rocket jumping soldiers. Like, everything was just going my way. Now, partially... Was this because the people on the server are noobs? Yes. A hundred percent. I saw some noob-like free-to-play behavior that I have no understanding of. Like, for example, 
there was an NG setting up a nest in a really weird spot that didn't make any sense to set up a nest in. I jumped down, pumped three stickies into his level three sentry and destroyed it, right? And then I'm behind him. He's taken damage off of this, by the way. He's also got a teleporter and a dispenser next to him. He's taking damage, so he knows I'm there, right? There's no universe where he doesn't know exactly where I am and what I'm about to do to him. Instead of, like, taking out a shotgun to fight me or doing anything, he just starts upgrading his dispenser. (laughs) He's just sitting there. He just literally looks at me, turns his back to me, and just starts upgrading his dispenser. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? But I kill him anyway, because I don't give a fuck. I'm savage like that, okay? We don't take pity on these motherfuckers. He just turns around to upgrade his dispenser. Like, this this is the sort of crazy shit that was happening. And these heavies, like, there were two heavies, both, like, getting pocketed like crazy. I'm telling you, they getting pocketed like crazy, these heavies. And they just couldn't fucking aim. They just could not aim at all. Now, I'm not saying I'd I'd beat them every single time, okay? I missed an embarrassing amount of shots on the heavies that were standing still, to be perfectly honest with you. As we all do. As we all do. um, But, you know, the amount of battles I won versus the amount of fights I should have won, very different. I should not have won as many as I did. Also, the server had random crits turned on. And, man... Random crits are the best thing ever. I don't know why the, everyone's fucking seething about random crits. It's so good when you get a when you get a crazy, you know. I got I got a random crit triple kill. It's not that crazy, you know. These things happen fairly often, but man, it feels good. I don't know why people complain about it. It still rewards you for hitting your shots. It's not like random crits just give you free kills. You can't predict when they're gonna happen. All you can do is make use of them when they do by playing well all the time. So I don't really understand why everyone's so mad about it. Does it feel unfair to die to a random crit? No, not really. Uh, I don't understand. It doesn't feel... Un- I mean, not 100%. I don't think it feels that unfair. Because you could... Well, firstly, because it's literally not unfair. I, You have access to the exact same thing they have access to. Uh, I think it's a little unfair in medieval mode when motherfuckers with the Scotsman skull cutter come up to you and just fucking insta delete you with a random crit. Now that's pushing it. That's pushing it a little bit. But in normal gameplay, what does a random crit matter? Oh, a, a scout random crits you, you were gonna die anyway. Right? You were probably gonna die anyway. At least if you're me, you were gonna die anyway. Right? If a, if a, if a hit scan weapon random crits you, it doesn't really matter. Heavy random crits, a little bit bullshit. I'll give you that. Uh, Pyro random crits. What are you doing getting in a pyro's range? Stay out of the pyro's range. Doesn't matter if he's got random crits. Doesn't fucking matter. You can get out of there. You can fight him the same as normal. Force him to air blast. If 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 he's got crits, he shouldn't be... You know what I'm saying? Like, it's the same... It's just a slightly more powerful pyro. It doesn't right and because the crits last for a while, if you if you see a pyro blasting out crit fire, you run away in the opposite direction. Same, you know, with soldier. A lot of people, I, I they 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 make a big deal about crockets, about crit crit rockets, right? The thing is, the crit rocket glows. You can see it. You can see it coming for you. And these things, they move slowly. You just move out the fucking way. If you die to a crit rocket, you're either stupid or you would have died anyway. Because the only two options are you saw it coming and yet didn't move out of the way. Which was, in which case, what are you doing? I'm not gonna lie. I've done that too. I've, I've seen a crit rocket coming and just sort of been like a deer in the headlights and just stood still and let it hit me. Because I'm just like, what the fuck? I don't know what to do. I just panic, right? But that's obviously me being bad. Or, you didn't see the soldier coming, 
and they just landed a random crit on you by pure luck when you weren't looking at them. In which case, what, one one fewer rocket to kill you? You really think you were going to kill that soldier in the space it took them to fire like one or two extra rockets? I doubt it. If the soldier is going to land a rocket on you, you're probably getting blasted up into the air, you know, losing control of your character because of it. Like, you're fucked anyway, basically. It doesn't really make the fight, like, that different, to be honest with you. Like, I think people get mad at it because they're so used to TF2 being this high time to kill game. But me coming from CSGO, I don't find dying suddenly and unpredictably to an instant kill that painful or strange. That was most of my gaming experience. That is the vast majority of the time I've spent playing video games has been playing a game where you die to a headshot instantly from a guy you can't see halfway across the map. Like, that's CSGO. And so, you can't get mad about that for 3,000 hours. <laughs> you eventually get over it. Which I think is why I just don't care that... Like, for some reason, spies, spies, they bug me. But snipers? Snipers are fine for me. But they're so easy to deal with. You just get close to them. Like... You just, if if a sniper is fucking with your team, here's what I do. I, if I see, if I'm, if I'm here, oh no, a sniper is shutting down my team. I switch to the sticky jumper, I sticky jump behind the sniper, and I take care of them. It's, it's, it's like not even hard. I don't know why everyone complains about snipers. Now, re- I've played against really good snipers, and that shit is fucking annoying. I've also been the really good sniper, and people get annoyed at me justifiably. Because you're not really playing the game. Like, if you're a really good sniper and you're not, like, pushing, putting yourself in danger, you know, on purpose to make the game more interesting, you're, like, really hanging back and playing passively and just clicking your heads. Like, I understand why people find that annoying. I find it kind of annoying. Uh, it also... I don't understand how people can do it because it feels scummy when you're doing it. <laughs> it doesn't feel good to do. Because you're just fighting people... You, You're just clicking on people who have no recourse to click back at you. So, yeah, sniper players are fucking degenerates. I I agree with that. But they're not that annoying to fight against because, yeah, they have basic... I mean, except for Jirati, but they they have basically... They're fucked mid-range. Like, even if they have Jirati, they're fucked mid-range. They're, you know... Snipers... They're, they're not that difficult. I don't know. Now, spies, that's where it's annoying. Because, cause, you know, you don't even get the chance to, to to get revenge on them. Like, if you die to a sniper, even if they change positions, they're, they're in roughly the same location, right, after they die. After you die, after you die and respawn, snipers are going to be in probably roughly the same position, you know, where snipers are, which is like back lines. I'm playing demo. I have the most movement options in the game, including the sticky jumper. So I'm a sticky jumping behind him and fucking him. If you die to a spy, you have no recourse. What do you do? Switch to pyro? Like, <laughs> no. You can't really do anything. Like, I'm playing NG on last and spies keep fucking with me. I'm becoming a schizo. You know, I'm, I'm spy checking like an actual schizo. It's crazy the PTSD I have from spies. Today I was getting destroyed by this spy using the Your Eternal Reward. And it's like, I, I even, you know, at this point, I'm playing Send and Banga, so it's not like I have a YouTube video playing in the background. For the first time in my life, I can hear spies decloaking behind me and actually react to it. But this guy's using the Your Eternal Reward. It's fucking silent. I feel like there's nothing I can do. Like, I don't even see the... He's invisible. He's literally invisible. That's how spies work. So, yeah, spies are way more annoying than snipers. I will purposefully target spies, even if they're bad. I mean, I will also purposefully target snipers, mainly because everyone else finds them annoying and they're an easy kill. But yeah, I have no pity for snipers and spies in Team Fortress 2. I don't care if you're friendly, I don't care what the fuck you're doing, I don't care if you're a sniper humping the air. I'm gonna kill you. 
Because you pressed the button to select that clause. You knew what you were doing. I don't give a fuck. Okay? Those guys... Free mean. I will bully them. I will keep target. I will continue. I will not help my team. I will continuously jump to the back line to kill the same sniper over and over again. I will continuously jump to the back line to kill Spy when he respawns. Right? If I, if I kill a Spy and then I will fucking wait for... Yeah, I've done that before on Bad Water. I've, I've, and, you know, back when I was more demo nighty, I got so much pleasure out of killing spies because demo knight counters spy. And so you just fucking own these spies and it's insane. And the thing about these spies <sighs> is they suck at the fucking game. They're so bad. They try and trick stab you. I've said this before, if you're playing TF2 and a, and you see a spy, and this spy comes at you with his knife out, like if you've caught a spy off guard, you're going to you're gonna get trick stabbed like a couple times in your life. And then, you're going to very quickly figure out the, the, the counter to all trick stabbing techniques, because there are like 50 different tricks that, you know, they got the matador... Circle strafing, like, like, like there's all these different trick stabbing, stair stab, corner stab, like there's all these different trick stabbing techniques, right? Except the weird thing is that every single one of them can be countered with one move, which is take your hand off the keyboard, just stand still, don't press any key, just stand still. And aim at the spy with your crosshair. The panic on these spies. The second you stand still. And they try and strafe around you. And slice you. Like the smart ones. The second they see you stand still. Will pull out the gun. And in that case you might be fucked. Right because these guys are actually good. But most of them. They're too cocky. They're too bad at the game. Like I don't know what it is. But like these fucking trick stabbing motherfuckers. They don't know what to do when you're standing still. You just stand still and you just shoot them. And they don't, they, they just die. Because they, they, I don't know, they just die. Like, what are they even trying to do? I don't understand. Yeah. Well, we're approaching the 12 hour mark. Uh, I'm the, I'm the human content machine. I'm the real human content machine. And, uh, but right now I'm gonna go, go the fuck to, s to sleep, motherfucker. I just watched the new Adam Something video, which is about, uh, it's called We've Been Lied To About The Classical Era. I'm gonna be quick here, because we don't have long until I hit the 12 hour mark. Uh, it's a fine video, whatever, who cares. But, at some point, he mentions the medieval period and how, actually, everything in the medieval era was super colorful, not... Uh, you know, brown and grey. Uh, people wore super colourful clothes and everything was super colourful. Now, this is a really complicated topic. Uh, things weren't all brown and grey. People did like to wear colourful clothes and stuff. However, what that misses is that most people would have literally had one pair of clothes or one set of clothes that they wore their whole life pretty much. I mean, when they were growing up, they would have had different, but once they fully grown... They basically had one set of clothing that they just wore forever because clothes were super fucking expensive and they would have taken really good care of it, but it would have faded over time. That's just how it works. And it would have gone dirty because they were working all day. So yeah, they would have tried to keep it colorful, but it wouldn't have been super bright, saturated craziness. Hopefully I can end this video off with a, a reminder, a reminder and some advice. Uh, I'm clearly not going to have enough time to uh, talk about and finish the projects that I started, Strike Witches and Send and Banker, for this video. So, if you want to hear my thoughts on the rest of that, you're going to have to stick around for the next one. Yes, also, I made this crazy fast, and I'm pretty sure it's because of mania that I'm just talking to myself a lot. But yeah, I want to talk about, or I want to end 
Oh, by the way, guys, please let me know. This is actually something important. If, if, you, if you made it to the end of the podcast, then you have my respect. And uh, I would like you to let me know if you prefer this style, where I don't do truncate silences... Versus the previous video where I did do truncate silences. So like edited or unedited audio, which one do you prefer? I'll do whatever ones you, you guys like. So uh, yeah, I know I put this at the end of the podcast so no one's going to comment it. But please comment what you think if you got to the end. I think this style is like comfier because it's more naturalistic. But the other style is more polished so they both have their advantages i don't really mind either one anyway here's the thing i wanted to talk about i saw okay i'm, I'm gonna start this off by <clears throat> so if you're in a weird community that does weird shit like weird anime shit for example or furry shit or anything that is looked upon as like somewhat degen by society it's very important at least in my mind that you don't let it become sanitized in the name of family friendliness or inclusion acceptance any of these sorts of things you don't let it become sanitized and here's why i saw a great post by a furry okay now i'm not personally that much of a furry I can appreciate some cute furry characters. I'm not opposed to furry shit. Uh, I've enjoyed a little bit of furry porn from time to time. But it's not super my thing, right? <clears throat> I wouldn't self-identify necessarily as a furry, even though I, I'm not against it either. Uh, but I saw a great post by a furry. And this post was, was talking about... There's, there's an ongoing debate in the furry community, right? Which is, furry is these two things. It's these two kind of diametrically opposed things. On the one hand, it's cute anthropomorphized animal characters. On the other hand, it's gay sex. It's lots of gay sex. <laughs> Graphic gay sex, right? Uh, and they're all gay, let's be honest. So, there's these... That's kind of the point, right? Is... There's a lot of people who are desperately saying, no, it's not a fetish, it, we just like these characters. But then it also really, obviously, is a fetish for a lot of people. I would say probably a majority of furries, it's a fetish. And there's this tension because, you know, a lot of people have fairly reasonable points. They're like, look, we gotta, like, make the sex shit... Like, we gotta chill with it, okay? There's minors in this community. We, If we want to, like, encourage people to join and to, to participate in the community, like, maybe we shouldn't be, like, really kinky about everything. Maybe keep the sex shit, like, away from, from the public space and, like, tone it down, round off our images. If we want to be accepted by society and we don't want to get bullied and harassed and, and we want... You know, we don't want to be showing sexual stuff around minors, which is weird. You know, like, let's tone it down. Let's keep it family friendly, right? Like, I'm not saying you're not allowed to do it, but just, like, keep it out of the public sphere. Like, tone it the fuck down. And, you know, those are noble goals in a lot of ways. Especially the thing about having sexual content around people who are minors. That's, you know, something that's pretty... Uh, Sus, <laughs> for lack of a better word. I don't know what's a better word. But yeah, uh, you know, it was pretty reasonable. But this guy made a good point. So you do that, right? Let's say you do that. You do that. You round off all the sexual stuff and you make it just about pu completely pure everything, right? Then br the brands move in <laughs> because, hey, look, we, we toned down the sexual stuff. Brands now see, like... There's this huge community of people that are obviously wealthy, <laughs> the amount they're paying artists and shit, right? Every, every, like, NASA employee, like, every third NASA employee is a furry. Right, these guys are, like, rich as fuck for whatever reason. Uh, probably because they're, like, autistic and big in the tech sphere. 
and the stem sphere. Uh, so you tone it down. The brands move in because they're like, these are a group that will pay money for stuff. And then, here's what happens. <clears throat> Slowly over time, the community becomes reliant on these brands for support. You build it. You're like, oh, look, these brands are offering me money to make bigger and bigger projects and more important projects. Look, I can now afford to hire people and make these instead of my little indie thing that I'm barely making money off. These brands are supporting me now, right? And they're supporting the community. And it's great at first. But then... You become reliant on those brands. They get undue influence in the community. They can tell you, wait, you're not allowed to do that. Or like, hold on a minute. That's not advertiser friendly. And so on. The second you let them move in, you know, it might be fine at first. It might be great at first. You get these big events and sponsorships and they inject money into the community. You get wider approval or, uh, you know, uh, visibility. But eventually, it becomes to the point where these brands that are sponsoring everything get undue control and suddenly it's not a movement that is owned by the people within that movement anymore it is it gets controlled by corporate interests but if all you do is spam gay furry porn no corporation is going to want to be associated with that it's not going to happen right and uh you know that's important to keep these motherfuckers away so whatever community, and this is what happened with the gay community, right? Which, you know, these guys, they were pretty fucked over by society. Of course, they wanted to be accepted. But, you know, as soon as pride became not about having sex, but about love and health wholesomeness, all the brands moved in and you got rainbow capitalism, right? Like, this is what happens when you round off the corners. And so if you're into some weird freaky shit, or if you're into a community that contains weird shit it might not be sex shit it might be uh you know other brand unfriendly shit make sure that you don't let go of that it's important it's important that you keep that around and you you make it very clear that this is a central part of everything that you can't separate one from the other because the second you do you become a marketing demographic and then everything goes great at first but eventually you become reliant on these corporations and their money. That's what I wanted to end the video off with. Thanks for listening. Subscribe. Patreon. Patreon.com. Uh, and uh, the link's in the description. Subscribe. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers. You're definitely subscribed if you're watching this. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Anyway, see ya.